Section 7 Enochian Henoch The history of the evolution of the satanic myth would not be complete if we omitted to notice the character of the mysterious and cosmopolitan Enoch, variously called Enos, Hanoch, and finally Enochian by the Greeks. It is from his book that the first notions of the fallen angels were taken by the early Christian writers. The book of Enoch is declared apocryphal. But what is an apocryphon? The very etymology of the term shows that it is simply a secret book, i.e., one that belonged to the catalogue of the temple libraries under the guardianship of the hierophants and initiated priests, and was never meant for the profane. Apocryphon comes from the verb crypto, to hide. For ages, the Enochian, the book of the seer, was preserved in the city of letters, and secret works, the ancient Kerjoth, Sefer, later on, Debir. Some of the writers interested in the subject, especially Masons, have tried to identify Enoch with Thoth of Memphis, the Greek Hermes, and even with the Latin Mercury. As individuals, all of these are distinct from one another. Professionally, if one may use this word, now so limited in its sense, one and all belong to the same category of sacred writers, of initiators and recorders of occult and ancient wisdom. Those who, in the Quran, are generically termed the Idris, or the learned, the initiated bore in Egypt the name of Thoth, the inventor of arts, sciences, of writing or letters, of music and astronomy. Among the Jews, Idris became Enoch, who, according to Bar Hebraeus, was the first inventor of writing, books, arts, and sciences, the first who reduced to a system the progress of the planets. In Greece, he was called Orpheus, and thus changed his name with every nation. The number seven being attached to and connected with each of those primitive initiators, as well as the number 365, of the days in the year. Astronomically, it identifies the mission, character, and the sacred office of all these men, but certainly not their personalities. Enoch is the seventh patriarch. Orpheus is the possessor of the four minks, the seven-stringed lyre, which is the sevenfold mystery of initiation. Thoth, with the seven-rayed solar discus on his head, travels in the solar boat, the 365 degrees, jumping out every fourth leap year for one day. Finally, Thoth Lunas is the septenary god of the seven days, or the week. Esoterically and spiritually, Enochion means the seer of the open eye. The story about Enoch, told by Josephus, namely, that he had concealed his precious rolls or books under the pillars of Mercury or Seth, is the same as that told of Hermes, the father of wisdom, who concealed his books of wisdom under a pillar and then, discovering the two pillars of stone, found the science written thereon. Yet, Josephus, notwithstanding his constant efforts in the direction of Israel's unmerited glorification, and though he does attribute that science of wisdom to the Jewish Enoch, writes history, he shows these pillars are still existing during his own time. He tells us that they were built by Seth, and so they may have been, only neither by the patriarch of that name, the fabled son of Adam, nor by the Egyptian god of wisdom, Teth, Set, Thoth, Tat, Sat, the later Satan, or Hermes, who were all one, but by the sons of the serpent god, or sons of the dragon, the name under which the hierophants of Egypt and Babylon were known before the deluge, as were their forefathers the Atlanteans. What Josephus tells us, therefore, with the exception of the application made of it, must be true allegorically. According to his version, the two famous pillars were entirely covered with hieroglyphics, which, after the discovery, were copied and reproduced in the most secret corners of the inner temples of Egypt, and thus became the source of its wisdom and exceptional learning. These two pillars, however, are the prototypes of the two tables of stone, hewn by Moses at the command of the Lord, hence in saying that all the great adepts and mystics of antiquity such as Orpheus, Hesiod, Pythagoras, and Plato, got the elements of their theology from those hieroglyphics. He is right in one sense and wrong in another. 
The secret doctrine teaches us that the arts, sciences, theology, and especially the philosophy of every nation which preceded the last universally known, but not universal, deluge, had been recorded ideographically from the primitive oral records of the fourth race, and that these were the inheritance of the latter of the early third root race before the allegorical fall. Hence also the Egyptian pillars, the tablets, and even the white oriental Pulphyry stone of the Masonic legend, which Enoch, fearing that the real and precious secrets would be lost, concealed before the deluge in the bowels of the earth, were simply the more or less symbolical and allegorical copies from the primitive records. The Book of Enoch is one of such copies, and is, is moreover, a Chaldean, and now very incomplete compendium. As already said, Enochian means in the Greek the inner eye, or the seer. In Hebrew, with the help of the Masoretic points, it means the initiator and instructor. Enoch is a generic title, and moreover, his legend is that of several other prophets, Jewish and heathen, with changes of made-up details, the root form being the same. Elijah is also taken up into heaven, alive, and the astrologer in the court of Isdubar, the Chaldean Hibani, is likewise raised to heaven by the god He, who was his patron, as Jehovah was of Elijah, whose name means in Hebrew God Jah, Jehovah, and again Elihu, which has the same meaning. This kind of easy death, or euthanasia, has an esoteric meaning. It symbolizes the death of any adept who has reached the power and degree, and also the purification which enabled him to die in the physical body, and still live and lead a conscious life in his astral body. The variations on this theme are endless, but the secret meaning is ever the same. The Pauline expression, that he should not see death, ut non videre mortem, has thus an esoteric meaning, but nothing supernatural in it. The mangled interpretation given of some biblical hints to the effect that Enoch, whose years will equal those of the world of the solar year, 365 days, will share with Christ and the prophet Elijah the honors and bliss of the last advent and of the destruction of Antichrist, signify, esoterically, that some of the great adepts will return in the seventh race, when all error will be made away with, and the advent of truth will be heralded by those shishta, the holy sons of light. The Latin church is not always logical nor prudent. She declares the book of Enoch an apocryphon, and has gone so far as to claim, through Cardinal Cajetan and other luminaries of the Church, the rejection from the canon of even the Book of Jude, who otherwise, as an inspired apostle, would quote from and thus sanctify the Book of Enoch, which is alleged to be an apocryphal work. Fortunately, some of the dogmatics perceived the peril in time. Had they accepted Cajetan's resolution, they would have been forced to reject likewise the Fourth Gospel as St. John borrows literally from Enoch and places a whole sentence from him in the mouth of Jesus. Ludolf, the father of the Ethiopic literature, commissioned to investigate the various Enochian MSS, presented by Perisic, the traveler, to the Mazarin Library, declared that no book of Enoch could exist among the Abyssinians. Further researchers and discoveries worsted this too dogmatic assertion, as all know. Bruce and Rupel did find the Book of Enoch in Abyssinia, and what is more, brought it to Europe some years later, and Bishop Lawrence translated it. But Bruce despised it and scoffed at its contents, as did all the rest of the scientists. He declared it a Gnostic work concerning the age of giants who devour men, and bearing a strong resemblance to the Apocalypse. Giants, another fairy tale. Such, however, has not been the opinion of all the best critics. Dr. Hanneberg places the Book of Enoch along with the third book of the Maccabees, at the head of the list of those whose authority stands in nearest to that of the canonical works. Verily, where the doctors disagree, as usual, however, they are all right and all wrong. To accept Enoch as a biblical character, a single living person, is like accepting Adam as the first man. Enoch was a generic title applied to and borne by scores of individuals, at all times and ages, and in every race and nation. 
This may be easily inferred from the fact that the ancient Talmudists and the teachers of the Midrashim are not agreed generally in their views about Hanok, the son of Yared. Some say Enoch was a great saint, beloved by God and taken alive to heaven, i.e. one who reached Mukti or Nirvana on earth, as Buddha did, and others still do. And others maintain he was a sorcerer, a wicked magician. This shows only that Enoch, or its equivalent, was a term, even during the days of the later Talmudists, which meant seer, adept in the secret wisdom, etc., without any specification as to the character of the title bearer. Josephus, speaking of Elijah and Enoch, remarks that it is written in the sacred books they, Elijah and Enoch, disappeared, but so that nobody knew that they died. It means simply that they had died in their personalities, as yogis die to this day in India, or even some Christian monks to the world. They disappear from the sight of men and die, on the terrestrial plane, even for themselves. A seemingly figurative way of speaking, yet literally true. Hanok transmitted the science of astronomical calculation and of computing the seasons to Noah, says the Midrash, Perka. R. Elazar, referring to Enoch, that which others did to Hermes Trismegistus, for the two are identical in their esoteric meaning. Hanok, in this case, and his wisdom belong to the cycle of the fourth Atlantean race, and Noah to that of the fifth. In this case, both represent the root races the present one, and the one that preceded it. In another sense, Enoch disappeared. He walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. The allegory referring to the disappearance of the sacred and secret knowledge from among men. For God, or Java Alam, the high hierophants and the heads of the colleges of the initiated priests, took him. In other words, the Enochs, or the Enochians, the seers and their knowledge and wisdom, became strictly confined to the secret colleges of the prophets, with the Jews, and to the temples, with the Gentiles. Interpreted with the help of merely the symbolical key, Enoch is the type of the dual nature of man, spiritual and physical. Hence, he occupies the center of the astronomical cross, as given by Eliphas Levi, from a secret work which is a six-pointed star. The Adonai, in the upper angle of the upper triangle, is the eagle, In the left lower angle stands the lion, in the right the bull, while between the bull and the lion, over them and under the eagle is the face of Enoch, or man. Now the figures on the upper triangle represent the four races, omitting the first, the chayas or shadows, and the sons of man. Enos, or Enoch, is in the center, where he stands between the fourth and fifth races, for he represents the secret wisdom of both. These are the four animals of Ezekiel, and of the Revelation. This double triangle which, in Isis unveiled, is faced by the Hindu Ardhanari, is by far the best. For in the latter, only the three, for us, historical races are symbolized. The third, the androgynous, by Ardhanari, the fourth, symbolized by the strong, powerful lion. And the fifth, the Aryan, by that which is most sacred symbol to this day, the bull and the cow. A man of great erudition, a French savant, M. de Sacri, finds several most singular statements in the Book of Enoch, worthy of the most serious examination. He says, for instance, The author, Enoch, makes the solar year consist of 364 days, and seems to know periods of three or five and of eight years, followed by four supplementary days which in his system appear to be those of the equinoxes and solstices, to which he adds later on, I see but one means to palliate them, these absurdities. It is supposed that the author expounds some fanciful system which may have existed before the order of nature had been altered at the period of the universal deluge. Precisely so, and the secret doctrine teaches that this order of nature has been thus altered, and the series of the earth's humanities too. For as the angel Uriel tells Enoch, Behold, I have showed thee all things, O Enoch, and all things I have revealed to thee. Thou seest the sun, the moon, and those which conduct the stars of heaven. 
which cause all their operations, seasons, and arrivals to return. In the days of sinners the years shall be shortened. The moon shall change its laws. In those days also, years before the great deluge that carried away the Atlanteans and changed the face of the whole earth, because the earth, or its axis, became inclined. Nature, geologically, astronomically, and cosmically in general, could not have been the same, just because the earth had inclined. To quote from Enoch, And Noah cried with a bitter voice, Hear me, hear me, hear me, three times. And he said, The earth labors and is violently shaken. Surely I shall perish with it. This, by the way, looks like one of those many inconsistencies if the Bible is read literally. For to say the least, this is a very strange fear in one who had found grace in the eyes of the Lord and been told to build an ark. But here we find the venerable patriarch expressing as much fear as if, instead of a friend of God, he had been one of the giants doomed by the wrathful deity. The earth had already inclined, and the deluge of waters had become simply a question of time, and Noah seems to know nothing of his intended salvation. A decree had come indeed, the decree of nature and the law of evolution, that the earth should change its race, and that the fourth race should be destroyed to make room for a better one. The Manvantara had reached its turning point of three and a half rounds, and gigantic physical humanity had reached the acme of gross materiality. Hence the apocalyptic verse that speaks of a commandment gone forth, that they may be destroyed, that their end may be the end of the race. For they knew, truly, every secret of the angels, every oppressive and secret power of the Satans, and every power of those who commit sorcery, as well as those who make molten images in the whole earth. And now a natural question. Who could have informed the apocryphal author of this powerful vision, no matter to what age he may have assigned before the day of Galileo, that the earth could occasionally incline her axis? Whence did he derive such astronomical and geological knowledge of the secret wisdom, of which the ancient Rishis and Pythagoras had drunk, is but a fancy, an invention of later ages? Has Enoch read prophetically, perchance, in Frederick Klee's work on the Deluge, the lines? The position of the terrestrial globe with reference to the sun has evidently been, in primitive times, different from what it is now, and this difference must have been caused by a displacement of the axis of rotation of the earth. This reminds one of that unscientific statement made by the Egyptian priest to Herodotus, namely that the sun has not always risen where it rises now and that in former times the ecliptic had cut the equator at right angles. There are many such dark sayings, scattered throughout the Puranas, the Bible, and other mythologies, and to the occultists they divulge two facts. A. That the ancients knew as well as, and perhaps better than, the moderns do, astronomy, geognosy, and cosmography in general, and B. That the behavior of the globe has altered more than once since the primitive state of things. Thus, Xenophantes, on the blind faith of his ignorant religion, which taught that Phaeton, in his desire to learn the hidden truth, made the sun deviate from its usual course, asserts somewhere that the sun turned toward another country, which is a parallel, slightly more scientific, however, if not as bold, of Joshua stopping the course of the sun altogether. Yet it may explain the teaching of the northern mythology that before the actual order of things, the sun arose in the south and it's placing the frigid zone, Jerusalem, in the east, whereas now it is in the north. The Book of Enoch, in short, is a resume, a compound of the main features of the history of the third, fourth, and fifth races. A very few prophecies from the present age of the world, a long retrospective, introspective and prophetic summary of universal and quite historical events, geological, ethnological, astronomical and psychic, with a touch of theogony out of the antediluvian records. The book of this mysterious personage is referred to and quoted copiously in the Pisti Sophia, and also in the Zohar and its most ancient Midrashim. Origen and Clement of Alexandria held it in its highest esteem. To say, therefore, that it is post-Christian forgery is to utter an absurdity and become guilty of an anachronism. For Origen, among others, who lived in the second century of the Christian era, mentions it as an ancient and venerable work. 
the secret and sacred name and its potency are well and clearly, though allegorically described in the old volume. From the 18th to the 15th chapter, the visions of Enoch are all descriptive of the mysteries of initiation, one of which is the burning valley of the fallen angels. Perhaps St. Augustine was quite right in saying that the Church rejected the Book of Enoch out of her canon owing to its great antiquity. Ob nimiam antiquitam. There was no room for the events noticed in it within the limit of the 4,004 years B.C. assigned to the world from its creation. Section 8. The Symbolism of the Mystery Names, Io and Jehovah, with their relation to the cross and circle. When the Abbey Louis Constant, better known as Eliphas Levi, said in his Histoire de la Magie that the Sefer Yetzera, the Zohar, and the Apocalypse of St. John are the masterpieces of the occult sciences, he ought, if he had wished to be correct and clear, to have added in Europe. It is quite true that these works contain more significance than words, and that their expression is poetical, while in numbers they are exact. Unfortunately, however, before anyone can appreciate the poetry of the expressions or the exactness of the numbers, he will have to learn the real significance and meaning of the terms and symbols employed. But man will never learn this so long as he remains ignorant to the fundamental principle of the secret doctrine, whether in Oriental esotericism or in the Kabbalistical symbology the key or value in all their aspects of the God names, angel names, and patriarch names in the Bible, their mathematical or geometrical value, and their relations to manifested nature. Therefore, if on the one hand, the Zohar astonishes the mystic by the profundity of its views and the great simplicity of its images, on the other hand, that work misleads the student by such expressions as those used with respect to Ein Suf and Jehovah notwithstanding the assurance that the book is careful to explain that the human form with which it clothes God is but an image of the word, and that God should not be expressed by any thought or any form. It is well known that Origen, Clemens, and the rabbis confessed that the Kabbalah and the Bible were veiled and secret books. But few know that the esotericism of the Kabbalistic books in their present re-edited form is simply another and still more cunning veil thrown upon the primitive symbolism of these secret volumes. The idea of representing the hidden deity by the circumference of a circle and the creative power, male and female or the androgynous word, by the diameter across it, is one of the oldest symbols. It is upon this conception that every great cosmogony has been built. With the old Aryans, the Egyptians, and the Chaldeans, the symbol was complete, as it embraced the idea of the eternal and immovable divine thought in its absoluteness, separated entirely from the incipient stage of the so-called creation, and compromised psychological and even spiritual evolution and its mechanical work, or cosmogonical construction. With the Hebrews, however, though the former conception is to be distinctly found in the Zohar and the Sefer Yetzirah, or what remains of the latter, that which has been subsequently embodied in the Pentateuch proper, and especially in Genesis, is simply this secondary stage, to wit, the mechanical law of creation, or rather of construction, while theogony is hardly, if at all, outlined. It is only in the first six chapters of Genesis, in the rejected Book of Enoch, and the misunderstood and mistranslated poem of Job, that true echoes of the archaic doctrine may now be found. The key to it is lost now, even among the most learned rabbis, whose predecessors in the early period of the Middle Ages, in their national exclusiveness and pride, and especially in their profound hatred of Christianity, preferred to cast it into the deep sea of oblivion, rather than to share their knowledge with their relentless and fierce persecutors. Jehovah was their own tribal property, inseparable from and unfit to play a part in any other but the Mosaic law. Violently torn out of his original frame, which he fitted and which fitted him, the Lord, God of Abraham and Jacob, could hardly be crammed without damage and breakage into the new Christian canon. Being the weaker, the Judeans could not help the desecration. They kept, however, the secret of the origin of their Adam Kadmon, 
or female male Jehovah, and the new tabernacle provided a complete misfit for the old God. They were indeed avenged. The statement that Jehovah was the tribal God of the Jews, and no higher, will be denied like many other things. Yet the theologians are not in a position to tell us, in that case, the meaning of the verses in Deuteronomy, which say quite plainly, when the Most High, not the Lord or Jehovah either, divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds according to the number of the children of Israel. The Lord's, Jehovah's, portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. This settles the question. So prudent have we been, the modern translators of Bibles and scriptures, and so damaging are these verses, that following in the steps traced for them by their worthy church fathers, each translator has rendered these lines in his own way. While the above-cited quotation is taken verbatim from the English authorized version in the French Bible, we find the Most High translated by Sovereign, Sovereign, the sons of Adam, rendered by the children of men and the Lord changed into the Eternal. For impudent sleight of hand, the French Protestant Church seems thus to have surpassed even English ecclesiasticism. Nevertheless, one thing is patent. The Lord's, Jehovah's, portion is his chosen people, and none else, for Jacob alone is the lot of his inheritance. What, then, have other nations who call themselves Aryans to do with this Semitic deity? The tribal God of Israel? Astronomically, the Most High is the Sun, and the Lord is one of his seven planets. Whether it be Io, the genius of the moon, or Ildeboath Jehovah, the genius of Saturn, according to Origen and the Egyptian Gnostics. Let the angel Gabriel, the Lord of Iran, watch over his people, and Michael Jehovah over his Hebrews. These are not the gods of other nations, nor were they ever those of Jesus. As each Persian dev is chained to his planet, so each Hindu deva, a lord, has its allotted portion. A world, a planet, a nation, or a race. Plurality of worlds implies plurality of gods. We believe in the former, and may recognize, but will never worship the latter. It has been repeatedly stated in this work that every religious and philosophical symbol had seven meanings attached to it, each pertaining to its legitimate plane of thought i.e. either purely metaphysical or astronomical, psychic or physiological, etc. These seven meanings and their applications are different enough to learn when taken by themselves, but the interpretation and the right comprehension of them become tenfold more puzzling when, instead of being correlated or made to flow consecutively out of and to follow each other, each or any one of these meanings is accepted as the one and sole explanation of the whole symbolical idea. An instance may be given, as it admirably illustrates the statement. Here are two interpretations given by two learned Kabbalists and scholars, of one and the same verse in Exodus. Moses beseeches the Lord to show him his glory. Evidently, it is not the crude dead-letter phraseology as found in the Bible that is to be accepted. There are seven meanings in the Kabbalah, of which we may give two as interpreted by the said two scholars. One of them translates while explaining, Thou canst not see my face. I will put thee in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And then I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my ahur, i.e. my back. And then the translator adds in a gloss, That is, I will show you my back, i.e. my visible universe, my lower manifestations. But as a man still in the flesh, thou canst not see my invisible nature. So proceeds the Kabbalah. This is correct. And this is cosmo-metaphysical explanation. And now speaks the other Kabbalist, giving the numerical meaning, as it involves a good many suggestive ideas, and is far more fully given. We may allow it more space. The synopsis is from an unpublished MS and explains more fully what it was given in section 3, on the Holy of Holies. The numbers of the name Moses are those of I am that I am so that the names Moses and Jehovah are at one in numerical harmony. The word Moses is 5 plus 300 plus 40, and the sum of the values of its letters is 345. Jehovah, the genius, par excellence, of the lunar year, assumes the value of 543, or the reverse of 345. 
In the third chapter of Exodus, in the 13th and 14th verses, it is said, And Moses said, Behold, I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. The Hebrew words for this expression are Ahi, Asher, Ahi. And in the value of the sums of their letters stand thus 215021. This being his God's name, the sum of the values composing its 215021 is 543, or simply a use of the simple digit numbers in the name of Moses. But now so ordered that the name of 345 is reversed and reads 543. So that when Moses asks, Let me see thy face or glory, the other rightly and truly replies, Thou canst not see my face, but thou shalt see me behind. The true sense, though not the precise words, for the corner and the behind of 543 is the face of 345. This is for checking to keep a strict use of a set of numbers to develop certain grand results for the object of which they are specifically employed. As the learned Kabbalist adds, in the other uses of the numbers, they saw each other face to face. It is strange that if we add 345 to 543, we have 888, which was the Gnostic Kabbalistic value of the name Christ, who was Jehoshua or Joshua. And so also the division of the 24 hours of the day gives three eights as quotient. The chief end of all this system of number checks was to preserve in perpetuity the exact value of the lunar year in the natural measure of days. These are the astronomical and numerical meanings in the secret theogony of Sidereo cosmical gods invented by the Chaldeo Hebrews. Two meanings out of seven. The other five would astonish the Christians still more. The series of Epidus, the series of Oedipuses, who have endeavored to interpret the riddle of the Sphinx is long indeed. For many ages she has been devouring the brightest and the noblest intellects of Christendom. But now the Sphinx is conquered. In the great intellectual struggle which has ended in the complete story of the Oedipus of symbolism, it is, however, not the Sphinx, who, burning with the shame of defeat, has had to bury herself in the sea, but verily the many-sided symbol, named Jehovah, whom Christians, the civilized nations, have accepted for their God. The Jehovah symbol has collapsed under the too close analysis, and is drowned. Symbologists have discovered with dismay that their adopted deity was only a mask for many other gods. A euhemerized extinct planet, at best, the genius of the moon and Saturn with the Jews, of the sun and Jupiter with early Christians. That the Trinity, unless they accepted the more abstract and metaphysical meanings given to it by the Gentiles, was in truth only an astronomical triad, composed of the sun, the father, and the two planets, Mercury, the sun, and Venus, the Holy Ghost. Sophia, the spirit of wisdom, love and truth, and Lucifer as Christ, the bright and morning star. For if the father is the son, the elder brother, in the Eastern inner philosophy, the nearest planet to it is Mercury, Hermes, Buddha, Thoth, the name of whose mother on earth was Maya. Now this planet receives seven times more light than any other, a fact which led the Gnostics to call their Christos and the Kabbalists their Hermes, in the astronomical meaning the sevenfold light. Finally, this god was Bel, the sun being Bel with the Gauls, Helios with the Greeks, Baal with the Phoenicians, El in Chaldean, hence Elohim, Emmanuel, and El, God in Hebrew. But even the Kabbalistic god had vanished in the rabbinical workmanship, and one has now to turn to the innermost metaphysical sense of the Zohar to find in it anything like Ein Suf, the nameless deity and the absolute so authoritatively and loudly claimed by the Christians. But it is certainly not found in the Mosaic books, at any rate by those who try to read without a key to them. Ever since this key was lost, Jews and Christians have tried their best to blend these two conceptions, but in vain. They have only succeeded in finally robbing even the universal deity of its majestic character and primitive meaning. As was said in Isis Unveiled, it would seem, therefore, but natural to make a difference between the mystery god Aya, adopted from the highest antiquity by all who participated in the esoteric knowledge of the priests, and his phonetic counterparts, 
whom we find treated with so little reverence by the Ophites and other Gnostics. In the Ophite Gems of King, we find the name of Io repeated and often confounded with that of Aevil, while the latter simply represents one of the genii antagonistic to Abraxas. But the name Io neither originated with nor was it the sole property of the Jews, even if it had pleased Moses to bestow the name upon the tutelary spirit, the alleged protector and national deity of the chosen people of Israel. There is yet no possible reason why any nationalities should receive him in the highest of the one living God. But we deny the assumption altogether. Besides, there is the fact that Io, or Io, was a mystery name from the beginning, for, and never came into use before the time of King David. Anterior to his time, few or no proper names were compounded with Aya or Yah. It looks rather as though David, being a sojourner among the tyrants, and Philistines, brought thence the name Jehovah. He made Zadok high priest, from whom came the Zadokites and Sadducees. He lived and ruled first at Hebron, Habir on, or Kabir town, where the rites of the four mystery gods were celebrated. Neither David nor Solomon recognized either Moses or the law of Moses. They aspired to build a temple to like structures erected by Hiram and Hercules and Venus, Adon, and Astarte. says first, The very ancient name of God, Yaho, written in the Greek, Iwa, appears, apart from its derivation, to have been an old mystic name of the supreme deity of the Shemites. Hence it was told to Moses when he was initiated at Horeb, the cave, under the direction of Jethro, the Cainite, or Cainite, priest of Medau, In an old religion of the Chaldeans, whose remains are to be found among the Neoplatonists, the highest divinity, enthroned above the seven heavens, representing the spiritual light principle, and also conceived of as Demiurgus, was called Io, who was, like the Hebrew Yaho, mysterious and unmentionable, and whose name was communicated to the initiated. The Phoenicians had a supreme god, whose name was trilateral and secret, and he was Ia. The cross, say the Kabbalists, repeating the lesson of the occultists, is one of the most ancient, nay, perhaps the most ancient of symbols. This has been demonstrated at the very beginning of the Proem of Volume 1. The Eastern initiates show it coeval with the circle of deific infinitude and the first differentiation of the essence, the union of spirit and matter. This interpretation has been rejected and the astronomical allegory alone has been accepted and made to fit into. This interpretation has been rejected, and the astronomical allegory alone has been accepted and made to fit into cunningly imagined terrestrial events. Let us demonstrate this statement. In astronomy, as said, Mercury is the son of Colus and Lux, of the sky and light, or the sun. In mythology, he is the progeny of Jupiter and Maya. He is the messenger of his father Jupiter, the messiah of the sun. In Greek, his name Hermes means, among other things, the interpreter, the word, the logos, or verbum. Now Mercury is born on Mount Silene among shepherds, and is the patron of the latter. As a psychopompic genius, he conducted the souls of the dead to Hades and brought them back again, an office attributed to Jesus after his death and resurrection. The symbols of Hermes, Mercury, determini, were placed along and at the turning points of highways, as crosses are now placed in Italy, and they were the cruciform. Every seventh day, the priests anointed these termini with oil, and once a year hung them with garlands, hence they were the anointed. Mercury, when speaking through his oracle, says, I am whom you call the son of the father, Jupiter, and Maya. Leaving the king of heaven, the son, I come to help you mortals. Mercury heals the blind and restores sight, mental and physical. He was often represented as the three-headed and called Trisophallus, triplex, as one with the sun and Venus. Finally, Mercury as Cornutus shows was sometimes figured under a cubic form, without arms, because the power of speech and eloquence can prevail without the assistance of arms or feet. It is this cubic form which connects the termini directly with the cross. And it is the eloquence or the power of speech of Mercury which made the crafty Isubius say, 
Hermes is the emblem of the word which creates and interprets all. For it is the creative word, and he shows Pophiri, teaching that the speech of Hermes, now interpreted word of God in Pymander, a creative speech, verbum, is the seminal principle scattered throughout the universe. In alchemy, mercury is the radical moist principle, primitive or elementary water, containing the seed of the universe, fecundated by the solar fires. To express this fecundating principle, a phallus was often added to the cross. The male and female, or the vertical and horizontal, united. By the Egyptians, the cruciform termini also represented this dual idea, which was found in Egypt in the cubic Hermes. The author of Source of Measures tells us why. As shown by him, the cube unfolded becomes in display a cross of the Tau, or the Egyptian form. Or again, the circle attached to the Tau gives the ansated cross of the old pharaohs. They had known this from their priests and their king initiates for ages, and also what was meant by the attachment of man to the cross, which idea was made to coordinate with that of the origin of human life, and hence the phallic form. Only the latter came into action aeons and ages after the idea of the carpenter and artificer of the gods. Vishvakarma, crucifying the sun initiate on the cruciform lathe. As the same author writes, the attachment of a man to the cross was made use of in this form of display by the Hindus. But it was made to coordinate with the idea of the new rebirth of man by spiritual, not physical, regeneration. The candidate for initiation was attached to the Tau, or astronomical cross, with a far grander and nobler idea than that of the origin of mere terrestrial life. On the other hand, the Semites seem to have had no other or higher purpose in life than that of procreating their species. Thus, geometrically, and according to the reading of the Bible, by means of the numerical method, the author of the source of measures is quite correct. The entire Jewish system seems to have been anciently regarded as one resting in nature, and one which is adopted by nature, or God, as the basis or law of the exertion practically of created power. I.e., it was the creative design of which creation was practically the application. This seems to be established by the fact that, under the system set forth, measures of planetary times serve coordinately as measures of the size of the planets and of the peculiarity of their shapes, i.e. in the extension of their equatorial and polar diameters. The system, that of creative design, seems to underlie the whole biblical structure, as a foundation for its ritualism and for its display of the works of the deity in the way of architecture. By use of the sacred unit of measure in the Garden of Eden, the Ark of Noah, the Tabernacle, and the Temple of Solomon. Thus, on the very showing of the defenders of this system, the Jewish deity is proved to be, at best, only the manifested duad, never the one absolute all. Geometrically demonstrated, he is a number, symbolically, a humorized priapus, and this can hardly satisfy a mankind thirsting after the demonstration of real spiritual truths, and the possession of a god with a divine, not anthropomorphic nature. It is strange that the most learned of modern Kabbalists can see in the cross and circle nothing but a symbol of the manifested creative and androgyne deity in its relation to, and interference with, this phenomenal world. One author believes that, however man, read the Jew and rabbi, obtained knowledge of the practical measure by which nature was thought to adjust the planets in size to harmonize with the notation of their movements, it seems he did not obtain it, and esteemed its possession as the means of his realization of the deity. That is, he approached so nearly to a conception of a being having a mind like his own, only infinitely more powerful, as to be able to realize a law of creation established by that being, which must have existed prior to any creation, cabalistically called the Word. This may have satisfied the practical Semite mind, but the Eastern occultists had to decline the offer of such a god. Indeed, a deity, a being, having a mind like that of a man, only infinitely more powerful, is no god that has any room beyond the cycle of creation. He has not to do with the ideal conception of the eternal universe. He is, at best, one of the subordinate creative powers, the totality of which is called the Sephiroth, the heavenly man, the Adam Kadmon, the second Logos of the Platonists. 
This very same idea is clearly found at the bottom of the ablest definitions of the Kabbalah and its mysteries. An example by John A. Parker, as quoted in the same work. The key of the Kabbalah is thought to be the geometrical relation of the area of the circle inscribed in the square, or of the cube to the sphere, giving rise to the relation of diameter to circumference of a circle, with the numerical value of this relation expressed in integrals. The relation of diameter to circumference being a supreme one connected with the God names Elohim and Jehovah, which terms are expressions numerically of these relations, respectively, the first being of circumference, the latter of diameter, embraces all other subordinations under it. Two expressions of circumference to diameter and integrals are used in the Bible. One, the perfect, and two, the imperfect. One of the relations between these is such that two, subtracted from one, will leave a unit of a diameter value in terms, or the denomination of the circumference, value of the perfect circle, or a unit straight line having a perfect circular value, or a factor of circular value. Such calculations can lead one no further than to unriddle the mysteries of the third stage of evolution, or the third creation of Brahma. The initiated Hindus know how to square the circle far better than any European. But of this more anon, the fact is that the Western mystics commence their speculation only at the stage when the universe falls into matter, as the occultists say. Throughout the whole series of Kabbalistic books, we have not met with one sentence that would hint in the remotest way at the psychological and spiritual, as well as the mechanical and physiological secrets of creation. Shall we then regard the evolution of the universe as simply a prototype, on a gigantic scale, of the act of procreation, as divine phallicism, and rhapsodize on it, as the evilly inspired author of a late work of his name is done? The writer does not think so, and she feels justified in saying so, since the most careful reading of the Old Testament, esoterically as well as exoterically, seems to have carried the most enthusiastic inquirers no further than a certainty on mathematical grounds that from the first to the last chapter of the Pentateuch, every scene, every character, or every event are shown connected, directly or indirectly, with the origin of birth in its crudest and most brutal form. Thus, however interesting and ingenious the rabbinical methods, the writer, in common with other Eastern occultists must prefer those of the pagans. It is not then in the Bible that we have to search for the origin of the cross and circle, but beyond the flood. Therefore, returning to Eliphas, Levi, and the Zohar, we answer for the Eastern occultists and say that, applying practice to principle, they agree entirely with Pascal, who says that, God is a circle the center of which is everywhere in the circumference nowhere whereas the Kabbalists say the reverse, and maintain it, solely out of their desire to veil their doctrine. By the way, the definition of deity by the circle is not Pascal's at all, as Eliphas Levi thought. It was borrowed by the French philosopher from either Mercury Trismegistus or Cardinal Cusa's Latin work, De Docta Ignorantia, in which he makes use of it. It is moreover disfigured by Pascal, who replaces the words cosmic circle, which stands symbolically in the original inscription, by the word theos. With the ancients, both words were synonymous. A. Cross and circle. In the minds of ancient philosophers, something of the divine and the mysterious has ever been ascribed to the shape of the circle. The old world, consistent in its symbolism and with its pantheistic intuitions, uniting the visible and the invisible infinitudes into one, represented deity and its outward veil alike by a circle. This merging of the two into a unity, and the name Theos being given indifferently to both is explained, and thus becomes still more scientific and philosophical. Plato's etymological definition of the word Theos has been given elsewhere. In his Cratylus, he derives it from the verb Theen, to move, as suggested by the motion of the heavenly bodies which he connects with deity. According to the esoteric philosophy, this deity, during its nights and its days, or cycles of rest and activity, is the eternal perpetual motion, the ever-becoming, as well as the ever-universally present and the ever-existing. The latter is the root abstraction. The former is the only possible conception in the human mind. 
if it disconnects this deity from any shape or form. It is a perpetual, never-ceasing evolution, circling back in its incessant progress through aeons of duration into its original status, absolute unity. It was only the minor gods who were made to carry the symbolical attributes of the higher ones. Thus, the god Shu, the personification of Ra, who appears as the great cad of the basin in Persia in An, was often represented in the Egyptian monument seating and holding a cross, symbol of the four quarters or the elements attached to a circle. In that very learned work, The Natural Genesis by Gerald Massey, under the heading Typology of the Cross, there is more information to be had on the cross and circle than in any other work we know of. He who would feign the proofs of the antiquity of the cross is referred to these two volumes. The author says, The circle and the cross are inseparable. The crux and sata unites this circle and cross of the four corners. From this origin, the circle and the cross came to be interchangeable at times. For example, the chakra, or disk of Vishnu, is a circle. The name denotes the circling, wheeling around, periodicity, the wheel of time. This the god uses as a weapon to hurl at the enemy. In like manner, Thor throws his weapon, the flyfot, a form of the four-footed cross, svastika, and a type of the four quarters. Thus, the cross is equivalent to the circle of the year. The wheel emblem unites the cross and circle in one, as does the hieroglyphic cake and the ankti. Nor was the double glyph sacred with the profane, but only with the initiates, for Raoul Rochette shows that the sign occurs as the reverse of a Phoenician coin, with a ram as the obverse. The same sign, sometimes called Venus, looking glass because it typified reproduction, was employed to mark the hindquarters of a valuable brood, mares of Corinthian, and other beautiful breeds of horses. This proves that, so far back as those early days, the cross had already become the symbol of human procreation, and that oblivion of the divine origin and cross and circle had begun. Another form of the cross is given from the Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society. At each of the four corners is placed a quarter arc of an oviform curve, and when the four are put together they form an oval. Thus the figure combines the cross with the circle, rounded in four parts corresponding to the four corners of the cross. The four segments answer to the four feet of the swastika, cross, and the fly foot of Thor. The four-leaved lotus flower of Buddha is likewise figured at the center of this cross, the lotus being an Egyptian and Hindu type of the four quarters. The four-quarter arcs, if joined together, would form an ellipse, and the ellipse is also figured on each arm of the cross. This ellipse, therefore, denotes the path of the earth. Sir J. Y. Simpson copied the following specimen, which is here presented as the cross of the two equinoxes and the two solstices, placed within the figure of the Earth's path. The same ovoid or boat-shaped figure appears at times in the Hindu drawings when seven steps at each end as a form or a mode of Meru. This is the astronomical aspect of the double glyph. There are six more aspects, however, and an attempt may be made to interpret a few of these. The subject is so vast that it would require in itself alone many volumes. But the most curious of these Egyptian symbols of cross and circle, spoken of in the above-cited work, is the one which revives its full explanation and final color from Aryan symbols of the same nature. Says the author, The four-armed cross is simply the cross of the four quarters, but the cross sign is not always simple. This is the type that was developed from an identifiable beginning which was adapted to the expression of various ideas afterwards. The most sacred cross of Egypt was that carried in the hands of the gods, the pharaohs, and the mummied dead. Is the Ankh, the sign of life, the living, an oath, the covenant. The top of this is the hieroglyphic Ru, set upright on the Tau cross. The Ru is the door, gate, mouth, the place of outlet. This denotes the birthplace in the northern quarter of the heavens, from which the sun is reborn. Hence, the Ru of the Ankh sign is the feminine type of the birthplace, representing the north. It was in the northern quarter that the goddess of the seven stars, called the Mother of the Revolutions, gave birth to time in the earliest cycle of the year. The first sign of this primordial circle and cycle made in the heaven is the earliest shape of the Ankh cross, a mere loop which contains both a circle and the cross in one image. 
This loop or noose is carried in front of the oldest genetrix, Typhon of the Great Bear, as her arc, the ideograph of a period, an ending, a time, shown to mean one revolution. This then represents the circle made in the northern heaven by the Great Bear, which constituted the earliest year of time, from which fact we infer that the loop or rue of the north represents that quarter, the birthplace of time when figured as the rue of the Ankh symbol. Indeed, this can be proved. The noose is an arc or wreck type of reckoning. The rue of the Ankh cross was continued in with the Cypriot, R, and the Coptic Rho. The Rho was carried into the Greek cross, which is formed of the Rho and Chi, or RK. The wreck or arc was the sign of all beginning, arch, on this account, and the arc tie is the cross of the north the hind part of heaven. Now this again is entirely astronomical and phallic. The Puranic version in India gives the whole matter another color. Without destroying the above interpretation, it is made to reveal a portion of its mysteries with the help of the astronomical key, and thus offers a more metaphysical rendering. The Anktai does not belong to Egypt alone. It exists under the name of Pasha a cord which the four-armed Shiva holds in the hand of his right back arm. The Mahadeva is represented in the posture of an aesthetic, as Mahayogi, with his third eye, which is the Ru, set upright on the Tau cross. In another form, the Pasha is held in the hand in such a way that the first finger and hand near the thumb make the cross, or loop and crossing. Our Orientalists would have had it represent a cord to bind refractory offenders with, because... Forsooth, Ka, Shiva's consort, has the same as an attribute. The Pasha has here a double significance, as also has Shiva's Trishula and every other divine attribute. This dual significance lies in Shiva, for Rudra has certainly the same meaning as the Egyptian unsated cross in its cosmic and mystic meaning. In the hand of Shiva, the Pasha becomes Lingyonic. Shiva, as said before, is a name unknown to the Vedas. It is in the white Yajur Veda that Rudra appears for the first time as the great god, Mahadeva, whose symbol is the lingam. In the Rig Veda, he is called Rudra, the howler, the beneficent and the maleficent deity at the same time, the healer and the destroyer. In the Vishnu Purana, he is the god who springs from the forehead of Brahma, who separates into male and female, and he is the parent of the Rudras or Maruts half of whom are brilliant and gentle, others black and ferocious. In the Vedas, he is the divine ego aspiring to return to his pure deific state, and at the same time that divine ego imprisoned in earthly form, whose fierce passions make of him the roarer, the terrible. This is well shown in the Brahadaranyaka Upanishad wherein the Rudras, the progeny of Rudra, god of fire, are called the ten vital breaths, prana, life, with the heart, manas, as eleventh, whereas, as Shiva, he is the destroyer of that life. Brahma calls him Rudra, and gives him besides seven other names, signifying seven forms of manifestation, and also the seven powers of nature which destroy but to recreate or regenerate. Hence the cruciform noose, or pasha, in the hand of Shiva, when he is represented as an aesthetic. The Mahayogin has no phallic significance, and indeed it requires an imagination strongly bent in this direction to find such a signification even in an astronomical symbol. As an emblem of door, gate, mouth, the place of outlet, it signifies the straight gate that leads to the kingdom of heaven, far more than the birthplace in a physiological sense. It is a cross in a circle in crux and sata. Truly, but it is a cross on which all the human passions have to be crucified before the yogi passes through the straight gate, the narrow circle that widens into an infinite one as soon as the inner man has passed the threshold. As to the mysterious seven rishis and the constellation of the great bear, if Egypt made them sacred to the oldest genetrix, Typhon, India has connected these symbols ages ago with time or yuga revolutions and the Saptarshis are intimately connected with our present age, the dark Kali Yuga. The great circle of time, on the face of which Indian fancy has represented the porpoise, or Shisumara, 
has the cross placed on it by nature in its division and localization of stars, planets, and constellations. In the Bhagavata Purana, it is said, At the extremity of the tail of that animal, whose head is directed toward the south, and whose body it is in the shape of a ring, circle, Dhruva, the ex-pole star, is placed. Along its tail are Prajapati, Agni, Indra, Dharma, etc. Across its loins, the seven rishis. This is the first, then, and the earliest cross and circle, formed by the deity, symbolized by Vishnu, the eternal circle of boundless time. Kala, on whose plane lie crossways all the gods, creatures, and creations born in space and time, who, as the philosophy has it, all die at the Mahapralaya. Meanwhile, it is the seven rishis who mark the time and the duration of events in our septenary life cycle. They are the mysterious as the supposed wives, the Pleiades, of whom only one, she who hides, has proven virtuous. The Pleiades, or Kritikas, are the nurses of Kartikeya, the god of war, the Mars of the Western pagans, who is called the commander of the celestial armies, or rather of the Siddhas. Siddhasena, translated yogis in heaven and holy sages on the earth, which would make Kritikeya identical with Michael, the leader of the celestial hosts, and like himself, a virgin Kumara. Verily, he is the Guha, the mysterious one, as much so are the Septarshis and the Kritikas, the seven rishis and the Pleiades, for the interpretation of all these combined revealed to the adept the greatest mysteries of occult nature. One point is worth mention in this question of cross and circle, as it bears strongly upon the elements of fire and water which plays such an important part in the circle and cross symbolism. Like Mars, who is alleged by Ovid to have been born of his mother Juno alone, without the participation of a father, or like the Avatars, Krishna, for instance, in the West as in the East, Kritikya is born, but in a still more miraculous manner, begotten by neither father nor mother, but out of a seed of Rudra Shiva, which was cast into the fire, Agni, and then received by the water, Ganges. Thus he is born from fire and water. A boy bright as the sun and beautiful as the moon. Hence he is called Agnibu, son of Agni, and Gandraputra, son of Ganges. Add this to the fact that Kritika, his nurses, as the Matsya Purana shows, are presided over by Agni, or in the authentic words, The seven rishis are on a line with the brilliant Agni, and hence Kritika has Agnia as a synonym, and the connection is easy to follow. It is then the rishis who mark the time and the periods of Kali Yuga, the age of sin and sorrow. As the Bhagavata Purana tells us, When the splendor of Vishnu, named Krishna, departed for heaven, then did the Kali age, during which men delight in sin invade the world. When the seven rishis were in Maga, the Kali Age, comprising 1,200 divine years, 432,000 common years, began, and when from Maga they shall reach Paravashada, then will this Kali Age attain its growth under Nanda and his successors. This is the revolution of the rishis. When the first two stars of the seven rishis, the great bear, rise in the heavens, and some lunar asterism is seen at night, at an equal distance between them, then the seven rishis continue stationary in that conjunction for a hundred years. As a hater of Nanda makes Parashara say, according to Bentley, it was in order to show the quantity of the procession of the equinoxes that this notion originated among the astronomers. This was by assuming an imaginary line, or great circle, passing through the poles of the ecliptic at the beginning of the fixed maga, which circle was supposed to cut some of the stars in the great bear. The seven stars in the great bear being called the rishis, the circle so assumed was called the line of the rishis, and being invariably fixed to the beginning of the lunar asterism maga. The procession would be noted by stating the degree, etc., of any movable lunar mansion cut by that line or circle as an index. There has been, and there still exists, a seemingly endless controversy about the chronology of the Hindus. Here is, however, a point that could help to determine, approximately at least, 
the age when the symbolism of the seven rishis and their connection with the Pleiades began. When Kritikia was delivered to the Kritika by the gods to be nursed, there were only six, whence Kritikia is represented with six heads. But when the poetical fancy of the early Aryan symbologists made of them the consorts of the seven rishis, they were seven. Their names are given, and these are Amba, Dula, Nitatu, Ebrianti, Magayanti, Varshayanti, and Chupanika. There are other sets of names which differ, however. Anyhow, the seven rishis were made to marry the seven Kritika before the disappearance of the seven Pleiade. Otherwise, how could the Hindu astronomers speak of a star which no one can see without the help of the strongest telescopes? This is why, perhaps in every such case, the majority of the events described in the Hindu allegories is fixed upon as a very recent invention, certainly within the Christian era. The oldest Sanskrit MSS on astronomy began their series of nakshatras, the 27 lunar asterisms, with the sign of Kritika, and this can hardly make them earlier than 2780 BC. This is according to the Vedic calendar, which is accepted even by the Orientalists, though they get out of the difficulty by saying that the said calendar does not prove that the Hindus knew anything of astronomy at that date, and assure their readers that Calendars notwithstanding, the Indian pandits may have acquired their knowledge of the lunar mansions headed by Kritika from the Phoenicians, etc. However that may be, the Pleiades are the central group of the system of sidereal symbology. They are situated in the neck of the constellation Taurus, regarded by Maedler and others in astronomy as the central group of the system of the Milky Way, and in the Kabbalah and Eastern esotericism as the sidereal septinate born from the first manifested side of the upper triangle, the concealed triangle. This manifested side is Taurus, the symbol of one or of the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, bull or ox, whose synthesis is ten, or Yod, the perfect letter and number. The Pleiades, Alcyon especially, are thus considered, even in astronomy, as the central point around which our universe or fixed stars revolves, the focus from which, and into which, the divine breath, motion, works incessantly during the Manvantara. Hence, in the sidereal symbols of the occult philosophy, it is this circle with the starry cross on its face which plays the most prominent part. The secret doctrine teaches us that everything in the universe, as well as the universe itself, is formed created during its periodical manifestations, by accelerated motion set into activity by the breath of the ever-to-be-unknown power, unknown to present mankind, at any rate, within the phenomenal world. The spirit of life and immortality was everywhere symbolized by a circle, hence the serpent biting its tail, represents the circle of wisdom and infinity, as does the astronomical cross. The cross within the circle and the globe with two wings added to it, which then became the sacred scarabaeus of the Egyptians, its very name being suggestive of the secret idea attached to it. For the scarabaeus is called in the Egyptian papyri, koparon, and kopri, from the verb kopron, to become, and has thus been made a symbol and an emblem of human life and of the successive becomings of man through the various pregenerations and metempsychosis or reincarnations of the liberated soul. This mystical symbol shows plainly that the Egyptians believed in reincarnation and the successive lives and existences of the immortal entity. As this, however, was an esoteric doctrine, revealed only during the mysteries by the priest hierophants and the king initiates to the candidates, it was kept secret. The incorporeal intelligences the planetary spirits or creative powers, were always represented under the form of circles. In the primitive philosophy of the Hierophants, these invisible circles were the prototype causes and builders of all the heavenly orbs, which were their invisible bodies or coverings, and of which they were the souls. It was certainly a universal teaching in antiquity, as Proclus says, Before the mathematical numbers, there are the self-moving numbers. Before the figures apparent, 
the vital figures, and before producing the material worlds which move in a circle, the creative power produced the invisible circles. Deus inim et circles e, says Phercides in his hymn to Jupiter. This was a hermetic axiom, and Pythagoras describes such a circular prostration and posture during the hours of contemplation. The devotee must approach as much as possible the form of a perfect circle, prescribes the secret book. Numa tried to spend the same custom among the people. Pieris tells his readers, and Pliny says, During our worship we roll up, so to say, our body in a ring. Totum corpus circumidjimur. The vision of the prophet Ezekiel reminds one forcibly of this mysticism of the circle. When he beheld a whirlwind from which came out of one wheel upon the earth, whose work was, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Spirit whirleth about continually, and returneth again according to its circuits, says Solomon, who is made in the English translation to speak of the wind, and in the original text to refer both to the spirit and the sun. But the Zohar, the only true gloss of the Kabbalistic preacher, in explanation of this verse, which is perhaps rather hazy and difficult to comprehend, says, It seems to say that the sun moves in circuits, whereas it refers to the spirit under the sun, called the Holy Spirit, that moves circularly toward both sides, that they, it and the sun, should be united in the same essence. The Brahmanical golden egg, from within which emerges Brahma, the creative deity, is the circle with the central point of Pythagoras and its fitting symbol. In the secret doctrine, the concealed unity, whether representing Parabrahman or the great extreme of Confucius, or the deity concealed by Ta, the eternal light, or again the Jewish Ein Suf, is always found to be symbolized by a circle or the knot, absolute no thing and nothing, because it is infinite and the all. While the God manifested by its works is referred to as the diameter of that circle, the symbolism of the underlying idea is thus made evident. The right line passing through the center of a circle has, in the geometrical sense, length, but neither breadth nor thickness. It is an imaginary and feminine symbol, crossing eternity, and made to rest on the plane of existence of the phenomenal world. It is dimensional, whereas its circle is dimensionless. Or to use the algebraic term, it is the dimension of an equation. Another way of symbolizing the idea is found in the Pythagorean sacred decad, which synthesizes, in the dual numeral ten, the one and a circle or cipher, the absolute all manifesting itself in the word or generative power of creation. B. The fall of the cross into matter. Those who would feel inclined to argue upon this Pythagorean symbol by objecting that it is not yet ascertained, so far, at what period of antiquity the knot or cipher occurs for the first time, especially in India, are referred to Isis unveiled. Admitting for argument's sake that the ancient world was not acquainted with our modes of calculation or Arabic figures, Though in reality we know it was, yet the circle and diameter idea is there to show that it was first a symbol in cosmogony. Before the trigrams of Fohai, Yang, the unity, and Yin, the binary, explained cunningly enough by Eliphas Levi, China had her Confucius and her Taoists. The former circumscribes the great extreme, within a circle with a horizontal line cross. The latter placed three concentric circles beneath the great circle while the Sung sages showed the great extreme in an upper circle, and heaven and earth in two lower and smaller circles. The Yangs and the Yins are a far later invention. Plato and his school never understood the deity otherwise, notwithstanding the many epithets applied by him to the god overall. Plato, having been initiated, could not believe in a personal god, a gigantic shadow of a man. His epithets of monarch and lawgiver of the universe bear an abstract meaning well understood by every occultist, who, no less than any Christian, believes in the law, the one law that governs the universe, and recognizes it at the same time as immutable. As Plato says, 
beyond all finite existences and secondary causes, all laws, ideas, and principles, there is an intelligence or mind. Nu, the first principle of all principles, the supreme idea on which all other ideas are grounded, the ultimate substance from which all things derive their being and essence, the first and efficient cause of all the order and harmony and beauty and excellence and goodness which pervade the universe. The mind is called, by way of preeminence and excellence, the supreme good, the God, and the God over all. These words apply, as Plato himself shows, neither to the Creator nor to the Father of our modern monotheist, but to the ideal and abstract cause. For as he says, this, the God over all, is not the truth or intelligence, but the Father of it, and its primal cause. It is Plato, the greatest pupil of the archaic sages, a sage himself, for whom there was but a single object of attainment in his life, real knowledge who would ever have believed in a deity that curses and damns men forever on the slightest provocation. Surely not he who considered only those to be genuine philosophers and students of truth, who possessed the knowledge of the really existing in opposition to mere seeming, of the always existing in opposition to the transitory, and of that which exists permanently in opposition to that which waxes, wanes, and is developed and destroyed alternately. Specipus and Xenocrates followed in his footsteps. The one, the original, had no existence in the sense applied to it by mortal men. The, the honored dwells in the center as in the circumference, but it is only the reflection of the deity, the world soul, the plane of the surface of the circle. The cross and the circle are a universal conception, as old as the human mind itself. They stand foremost on the list of the long series of, and to say, international symbols, which expressed very often great scientific truths, besides their direct bearing upon psychological and even physiological mysteries. It is no explanation to say, as does Eliphas Levi, that God, the universal love, having caused the male unit to dig an abyss in the female binary, or chaos, thereby produced the world. In addition to the grossness of the conception, it does not remove the difficulty of conceiving it without losing one's veneration for the rather too human-like ways of the deity. It is to avoid such anthropomorphic conceptions that the initiates never use the epithet God to designate the one and secondless principle in the universe, and that, faithful in this, the oldest traditions of the secret doctrine the world over, They deny that such an imperfect and often not very clean work could ever be produced by absolute perfection. There's no need to mention here the other, still greater metaphysical difficulties. Between speculative atheism and idiotic anthropomorphism, there must be a philosophical mean and a reconciliation. The presence of the unseen principle throughout all nature, and the highest manifestation of it on earth, man can alone help to solve the problem which is that of the mathematician, whose X must ever elude the grasp of our terrestrial algebra. The Hindus have tried to solve it by their avatars. The Christians think they have done so, by their one divine incarnation. Exoterically, both are wrong. Esoterically, both of them are very near the truth. Alone among the apostles of the Western religion, Paul seems to have fathomed, if not actually revealed, the archaic mystery of the cross. As for the rest of those who, by unifying and individualizing the universal presence, have synthesized it into one symbol, the central point in the crucifix, they show thereby that they had never seized the true spirit of the teaching of Christ, but rather that they have degraded it in more than one way by their erroneous interpretations. They have forgotten the spirit of that universal symbol and have selfishly monopolized it as though the boundless and the infinite could ever be limited and conditioned to one manifestation individualized in one man, or even in a nation. The four arms of the cross, or decusated cross, and of the hermetic cross, pointing to the four cardinal points, were well understood by the mystical minds of the Hindus, Brahmins, and Buddhists, hundreds of years before it was heard of in Europe. For that symbol was and is found all over the world. They bent the ends of the cross and made of it their svastika, now the wand of the Mongolian Buddhist. It implies that the central point is not limited to one individual, however perfect, that the principle, God, is in humanity, and humanity, 
as all the rest, is in it. Like drops of water are in the ocean, the four ends being toward the four cardinal points, hence losing themselves in infinity. Isarim, an initiate, is said to have found at Hebron, on the dead body of Hermes, the well-known Smaragdine tablet, which, it is said, contained the essence of hermetic wisdom. Upon it were traced, among others, the sentences, Separate the earth from the fire, the subtile from the gross. Ascend from the earth to the heaven, and then descend again to the earth. The riddle of the cross is contained in these words, and its double mystery is solved to the occultist. The philosophical cross, the two lines running in opposite directions, the horizontal and the perpendicular, the height and breadth, which the geometrizing deity divides at the intersecting point, and which forms the magical as well as the scientific quaternary, when it is inscribed within the perfect square, is the basis of the occultist. Within its mystical precinct lies the master key which opens the door of every science, physical as well as spiritual. It symbolizes our human existence, for the circle of life circumscribes the four points of the cross, which represents in succession birth, life, death, and immortality. Attach thyself, says the alchemist, to the four letters of the tetragram, disposed in the following manner. The letters of the ineffable name are there, although thou mayest not discern them at first. The incommunicable axiom is cabalistically contained therein, and this is what is called the magic arcanum by the masters. Again, the Tau and the astronomical cross of Egypt are conspicuous in several apertures of the remains of Palenque. In one of the basso relievos of the Palace of Palenque, on the west side, sculptured as a hieroglyphic, right under the seated figure, is a Tau. The standing figure, which leans over the first one, is in the act of covering its head with the left hand with the veil of initiation, while it extends its right with the index and middle finger pointing to heaven. The position is precisely that of a Christian bishop giving his blessing or the one in which Jesus is often represented while at the Last Supper. The Egyptian hierophant had a square headdress, which he had to wear always during his functions. These square hats are worn unto this day by the Armenian priests. The perfect how, formed of the perpendicular, descending male ray, and the horizontal line, matter-female principle, and the mundane circle were attributes of Isis and it was only at death that the Egyptian cross was laid on the breast of the mummy. The claim that the cross is purely a Christian symbol, introduced after our era, is strange indeed. When we find Ezekiel stamping the foreheads of the men of Judah who feared the Lord, with the signum fowl, as it is translated in the Vulgate. In the ancient Hebrew, this sign was formed thus cross, but in the original Egyptian hieroglyphics, as a perfect Christian cross, Tat, the emblem of stability. In the Revelation also, the Alpha and Omega, spirit and matter, the first and the last, stamps the name of his father on the foreheads of the elect. Moses orders his people to mark their doorposts and lintels with blood, lest the Lord God should make a mistake and smite some of his chosen people, instead of the doomed Egyptians. And this mark is the Tau, the identical Egyptian handled cross with the half of which talisman Horus raised the dead, as is shown on a sculptured ruin in Phele. Enough has been said in the text about the svastika and the Tau. Verily, may the cross be traced back into the very depths of the unfathomable archaic ages. Its mystery deepens rather than clears, as we find on the statues of Easter Island, in Old Egypt, in Central Asia, engraved on rocks as the Tau and svastika in pre-Christian Scandinavia, everywhere. The author of The Source of Measure stands perplexed before the endless shadow it throws back into antiquity, and is unable to trace it to any particular nation or man. He shows the Targums handed down by the Hebrews, obscured by translation. In Joshua, read in Arabic, and in the Targum of Jonathan, it is said, The king of A, he crucified upon a tree. The Septuagint rendered is of suspension from a double word or cross. Wordsworth on Joshua, the strangest expression of this kind is in numbers, XXV4, 
where by onkelos it is read, Crucify them before the Lord, Jehovah against the Son. The word here is to nail to, rendered properly, furist by the Vulgate, to crucify. The very construction of the sentence is mystic. So it is, but the spirit of it has been ever misunderstood. To crucify before, not against the Son, is a phrase used of initiation. It comes from Egypt, and primarily from India. The enigma can be unriddled only by searching for its key in the mysteries of initiation. The initiated adept, who had successfully passed through all the trials, was attached, not nailed, but simply tied on a couch in the form of a towel, in Egypt, of a swastika, without the four additional prolongations. In India, plunged in a deep sleep, the sleep of Silom, as it is called to this day among the initiates in Asia Minor, in Syria, and even higher Egypt. He was allowed to remain in this state for three days and three nights during which time his spiritual ego was said to confabulate with the gods, descend into Hades, Amenti, or Patala, according to the country, and do works of charity to the invisible beings. Whether souls of men or elemental spirits, his body remained all the time in a temple crypt or subterranean cave. In Egypt it was placed in the sarcophagus in the king's chamber of the Pyramid of Cheops, and carried during the night of the approaching third day to the entrance of a gallery where at a certain hour the beams of the rising sun struck full on the face of the entrance candidate, who awoke to be initiated by Osiris and Thoth, the god of wisdom. Let the reader who doubts the statement consult the Hebrew originals before he denies. Let him turn to some of the most suggestive Egyptian bas reliefs. One especially from the Temple of Philae represents a scene of initiation. Two god hierophants, one with the head of a hawk, the sun, and the other ibis-headed, Mercury, Thoth, the god of wisdom, and secret learning, the assessor of Osiris' son, are standing over the body of a candidate just initiated. They are in the act of pouring on his head a double stream of water, the water of life and of new birth, the streams being interlaced in the shape of a cross and full of small unsated crosses. This is allegorical of the awakening of the candidate who is now an initiate. When the beams of the morning sun, Osiris, strike the crown of his head, his entranced body being placed on the wooden towel so as to receive the rays. Then appeared the Hierophant initiators, and the sacramental words were pronounced, ostensibly to the sun Osiris, in reality to the spirit sun within, enlightened the newly born man. Let the reader meditate on the connection of the sun with the cross from the highest antiquity in both its generative and spiritually regenerative capacities. Let him examine the tomb of Bait Oxley, in the reign of Ramses II, where he will find the crosses of every shape and position, as also on the throne of that sovereign, and finally, on a fragment representing the adoration of Bakan Alir, from the hall of the ancestors of Thotmes III, now preserved in the National Library of Paris. In this extraordinary sculpture and painting, one sees the disc of the sun beaming upon an ansated cross, placed upon a cross, of which those of the cavalry are perfect copies. The ancient MSS mentioned these as the hard couches of those who were in spiritual travail, the act of giving birth to themselves. A quantity of such cruciform couches, on which the candidate, thrown into a dead trance at the end of his supreme initiation, was placed and secured, were found in the underground halls of the Egyptian temples after their destruction. The worthy and holy fathers of the Cyril and Theophilus types used them freely, believing that they had brought and concealed there by some new converts. Alone Origen, and after him Clemens Alexandrinus, and other ex-initiates knew better, but they preferred to keep silent. Again, Let the reader read the Hindu fables, as the Orientalists call them, and remember the allegory of Vishvakarma, the creative power, the great architect of the world, called in the Rig Veda, the all-seeing God, who sacrifices himself to himself. The spiritual egos of mortals are his own essence, one with him, therefore. Remember that he is called Deva Vardika, the builder of the gods, and that it is he who ties the sun, Surya, his son-in-law, on his lave. 
in the exoteric allegory, but on the svastika in the esoteric tradition. For on earth he is the hierophant initiator, and cuts away a portion of his brightness. Vishvakarma, remember again, is the son of Yoga, Siddha, the holy power of Yoga, and the fabricator of the fiery weapon, the magic Agniastra. The narrative is given more fully elsewhere. The author of the Kabbalistic work so often quoted from asks, The theoretical use of the crucifixion, then, must have been somehow connected with the personification of this symbol, the structure of the Garden of Paradise symbolized by a crucified man. But how? And as showing what? The symbol was of the origin of measures, shadowing forth creative law or design. What practically, as regards humanity, could actually crucifixion betoken? Yet that it was held as the effigy of some mysterious working of the same system is shown from the very fact of the use. There seems to be deep below deep as to the mysterious workings of these number values. The symbolization of the connection of 113-355 with 20612-6561 by a crucified man. Not only are they shown to work in the cosmos, but by sympathy, they seem to work out conditions relating to an unseen and spiritual world. And the prophets seem to have held knowledge of the connecting links. Reflection becomes more involved when it is considered the power of expression of the law, exactly by numbers clearly defining a system, was not the accident of language, but was the very essence and of its primary organic construction. Therefore, neither the language nor the mathematical system attached to it could be of man's invention, unless both were founded upon a prior language which afterwards became obsolete. The author proves these points by further elucidation, and reveals the secret meaning of more than one dead-letter narrative, by showing that probably man was the primordial word, the very first word possessed by the Hebrews, whoever they were, to carry the idea, by sound of a man. The essential of this word was 113, the numerical value of that word, from the beginning, and carried with it the elements of the cosmical system displayed. This is demonstrated by the Hindu Vitoba, a form of Vishnu, as has already been stated. The figure of Vitoba, even to the nail marks on his feet, is that of Jesus crucified in all the details save the cross. That man was meant is proved to us further by the fact of the initiate being reborn after his crucifixion on the tree of life. This tree has now become exoterically through its use by the Romans as an instrument of torture and the ignorance of the early Christian schemers, the tree of death. Thus, one of the seven esoteric meanings intended by this mystery of crucifixion, by the mystic inventors of the system, the original elaboration and adoption of which dates back to the very establishment of the mysteries, is discovered in the geometrical symbols containing the history of the evolution of man. The Hebrews, whose prophet Moses was so learned in the esoteric wisdom of Egypt, and who adopted their numerical system from the Phoenicians, and later from the Gentiles, from whom they also borrowed most of their Kabbalistic mysticism, most ingeniously adapted the cosmic and anthropological symbols of the heathen nations to their peculiar secret records. If Christian sacerdotalism has lost the key of this today, the early compilers of the Christian mysteries were well versed in esoteric philosophy and the Hebrew occult metrology, and used it dexterously. Thus they took the word Aish, one of the Hebrew word forms for man, and used it in conjunction with that of Shana or lunar year, so mystically connected with the name Jehovah, the supposed father of Jesus, and embosomed the mystic idea in an astronomical value and formula. The original idea of the man crucified in space certainly belongs to the ancient Hindus. Moore shows this in his Hindu pantheon in the engraving that represents Vitoba. Plato adopted it in his desiccated cross in space, the cross, the second god who impressed himself on the universe in the form of a cross. Krishna is likewise shown crucified. Again, it is repeated in the Old Testament in the queer injunction to crucify men before the Lord, the Son, which is no prophecy at all, but has a direct phallic significance. In that same most suggestive work on the Kabbalistic meanings, we read again, in symbol, the nails on the cross, 
have for the shape of the heads therefore a solid pyramid, and a tapering square obelistical shaft, or phallic emblem, for the nail, taking the position of the three nails in the man's extremities and on the cross, they form a mark, a triangle in shape, one nail being at the corner of the triangle, the wounds or stigmata in the extremities are necessarily four, designative of the square. The three nails with the three wounds are in number six, which denotes the six faces of the cube unfolded, which make the cross or man form, or seven, continuing three horizontal and four vertical squares on which the man is placed, and this in turn points to the circular measure transferred on the edges of the cube. The one wound of the feet separates into two when the feet are separated, making their three together for all, and four when separated, or seven in all, another and most holy with the Jews' feminine base number. Thus, while the phallic or sexual meaning of the crucifixion nails is proven by the geometrical and numerical reading, its mystical meaning is indicated by the short remarks upon it, as given above in its connection with and bearing upon Prometheus. He is another victim, for he is crucified on the cross of love, on the rock of human passions, a sacrifice to his devotion to the cause of the spiritual element in humanity. Now the primordial system, the double glyph that underlies the idea of the cross, is not of human invention. For cosmic ideation and the spiritual representation of the divine ego man are at its basis. Later, it is expanded into the beautiful idea adopted by and represented in the mysteries, that of regenerated man, the mortal, who by crucifying the man of flesh and his passions on the Procrustean bed of torture, became reborn as an immortal, leaving the body, the animal man, behind him, tied on the cross of initiation like an empty chrysalis. The ego soul becomes as free as a butterfly. Still later, owing to the gradual loss of spirituality, the cross became in cosmogony and anthropology no higher than a phallic symbol. With the esotericists from the remotest times, the universal soul or anima mundi, the material reflection of the immaterial ideal, was the source of life, of all things, and of the life principle of the three kingdoms. This was septenary with the Hermetic philosophers, as with all the ancients. For it is represented as a sevenfold cross, whose branches are respectively light, heat, electricity, terrestrial magnetism, astral radiation, motion, and intelligence, or what some call self-consciousness. As we have said elsewhere, long before the cross or its sign were adopted as symbols of Christianity, the sign of the cross was used as a mark of recognition among adepts and neophytes, the latter being called crests, from Christos, the man of tribulation and sorrow. Says Eliphas Levi, the sign of the cross adopted by the Christians does not belong to them exclusively. It is also Kabbalistic and represents the opposition and quaternary equilibrium of the elements. We see by the occult verse of the Patronoster, that there were originally two ways of doing it, or at least two very different formulas to expressing its meaning. One reserved for the priests and initiates, the other given to the neophytes and the profane. Thus, for example, the initiate, carrying his hand to his forehead, said, To thee, then added, Belong, and continued carrying his hand to the breast, the kingdom, then to the left shoulder, justice, to the right shoulder, and mercy. Then he joined the two hands, adding, throughout the generating cycles. Tiba sunt malkut egebera et chest parasonus, an absolutely and magnificently Kabbalistic sign of the cross, which the profanations of Gnosticism made the militant and official church completely lose. The militant and official church did more, having helped herself to what had never belonged to her. She took only that which the profane had, the Kabbalistic meaning of the male and female Sephiroth. She never lost the inner and higher meaning since she never had it. Eliphas Levi's pandering to Rome notwithstanding. The signs of the cross adopted by the Latin church was phallic from the beginning, while that of the Greeks was the cross of the neophytes, the crestoi. Section 9. The Upanishads in Gnostic Literature we are reminded in King's Gnostics and the Remains that the Greek language had but one word for vowel and voice. 
This has led the uninitiated to many erroneous interpretations. On the simple knowledge, however, of this well-known fact, a comparison may be attempted, and a flood of light thrown upon several mystic meanings. Thus, the words so often used in the Upanishads and the Puranas, sound and speech, may be collated with the Gnostic vowels and the voices of the thunders and angels in Revelation. The same will be found in the Pistis Sophia and other ancient fragments in MSS. This was remarked even by the matter-of-fact author of the above-mentioned work. Through Hippolytus, an early church father, we learn what Marcus, a Pythagorean rather than a Christian Gnostic, and a Kabbalist most certainly, had received in mystic revelation. It is said that Marcus had it revealed unto him that the seven heavens sounded each one vowel, which all combined together formed a single doxology, the sound whereof being carried down from these seven heavens to earth becomes the creator and parent of all things that be on earth. Translated from the occult phraseology into still plainer language, this would read, The sevenfold logos have been differentiated into seven logi, or creative potencies, vowels. These, the second logos, or sound, created all on earth. Assuredly, one who is acquainted with Gnostic literature can hardly help seeing in St. John's Apocalypse a work of the same school of thought. For we find John saying, Seven thunders uttered their voices, and I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. The same injunction is given to Marcus, the same to all other semi and full initiates. The very sameness of the expression used and of the underlying ideas always betrays a portion of the mysteries. We must always seek for more than one meaning in every mystery allegorically revealed, especially in those in which the number seven in its multiplication seven by seven or forty-nine appear. Now when in Pistis Sophia the rabbi Jesus is requested by his disciples to reveal to them the mysteries of the light of his father, i.e. of the higher self enlightened by initiation and divine knowledge, Jesus answers, Do ye seek after these mysteries? No mystery is more excellent than they, which shall bring your souls into the light of lights, unto the place of truth and goodness, unto the place where there is neither male nor female, neither form in that place but light, everlasting, not to be uttered. Nothing, therefore, is more excellent than the mysteries which ye seek after, saving only the mysteries of the seven vowels and their forty-nine powers, and their numbers thereof. And no name is more excellent than all these, vowels. As says the commentary, speaking of the fires, the seven fathers and the forty-nine sons blaze in darkness, but they are the life and light and the continuation thereof through the great age. Now it becomes evident that in every esoteric interpretation of exoteric beliefs expressed in allegorical forms, there is the same underlying idea, the basic number seven a compound of three and four, preceded by the divine three, making the perfect number ten. Also, those numbers apply equally to divisions of time, to cosmography, metaphysical and physical, as well as to man and everything else in visible nature. Thus, these seven vowels, with their forty-nine powers, are identical with the three and the seven fires of the Hindus, and their forty-nine fires, identical with the numerical mysteries of the Persian Simorg, identical with those of the Jewish Kabbalists. The latter, dwarfing the numbers, their mode of blinds, made the duration of each successive renewal, or what we call in esoteric parlance, round, 1,000 years only, or of the seven renewals of the globe, 7,000 years, instead of, as is more likely, 7 billion, and assigned to the total duration of the universe, 49,000 years only. Now the secret doctrine furnishes a key which reveals to us on the indisputable grounds of comparative analogy that Garuda, the allegorical and monstrous half-human and half-bird, the Vahana, or vehicle on which Vishnu, as Kala, or time, is shown to ride, is the origin of all such allegories. He is the Indian phoenix, the emblem of cyclic and periodical time, the man-lion, Sinna, of whose representations the so-called Gnostic gems are so full. 
Over the seven rays of the lion's crown, and corresponding to their points, stand often the seven vowels of the Greek alphabet, testifying to the seven heavens. This is the solar lion, and the emblem of the solar cycle, as Garuda is that of the great cycle, the Mahakalpa, co-eternal with Vishnu, and also, of course, the emblem of the sun and solar cycle. This is shown by the details of the allegory. At his birth, Garuda, on account of his dazzling splendor, is mistaken for Agni, the god of fire, and was whence called Gagneshivara, lord of the sky. Its representation as Osiris, on the Abraxas, Gnostic, gems, and by many heads of allegorical monsters, with the head and beak of an eagle, or a hawk, both solar birds, denotes Garuda's solar and cyclic character. His son is Jatayu, the cycle of 60,000 years, as well remarked by C.W. King. Whatever its primary meaning of the gem with the solar line and vowels, it was probably imported in the present shape from India, that true fountainhead of Gnostic iconography. The mysteries of the seven Gnostic vowels, uttered by the thunders of St. John, can be unriddled only by the primeval and original occultism of Aryavarta, brought into India by the primeval Brahmins, who had been initiated in Central Asia. And this is the occultism we study and try to explain, as much as possible, in these pages. Our doctrine of seven races, and seven rounds of life, and evolution around our terrestrial chain of spheres, may be found even in Revelation, when the seven thunders or sounds or vowels, one meaning out of the seven for each such vowel, relates directly to our own earth and its seven root races in each round had uttered their voices, but had forgotten the seer to write them, and made him seal up those things. What did the angel, standing upon the sea and upon the earth, do? He lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth for ever and ever, that there should be time no longer, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of the God of the cycle should be finished. This means, in theosophic phraseology, that when the seventh round is completed, then time will cease. There shall be time no longer, very naturally, since Pralaya shall set in, and there will remain no one on earth to keep a division of time, during that periodical dissolution and arrest of conscious life. Dr. Keneally and others believe that the calculations of the cyclic seven and forty-nine were brought by the Rabbins from Chaldea. This is more than likely. But the Babylonians, who had all those cycles and taught them only at their great initiatory mysteries of astrological magic, got their wisdom and learning from India. It is not difficult, therefore, to recognize in them our own esoteric doctrine. In their secret computations, the Japanese have the same figures in their cycles. As to the Brahmins, their Puranas and Upanishads are good proof of it. The latter may have passed entirely into Gnostic literature and a Brahmin needs only to read Pisti Sophia to recognize his forefather's property, even to the phraseology and similes used. Let us compare. In Pisti Sophia the disciples say to Jesus, Rabbi, reveal unto us the mysteries of light, i.e. the fire of knowledge or enlightenment. For as much as we have heard thee saying that there is another baptism of smoke and another baptism of the spirit of holy light i.e. the spirit of fire. As John says of Jesus, I indeed baptize you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with the fire. The real significance of this statement is very profound. It means that John, a non-initiated ascetic, who can impart to his disciples no greater wisdom than the mysteries connected with the plane of matter, of which water is the symbol, his gnosis was that of exoteric and ritualistic dogma of dead-letter orthodoxy, while the wisdom which Jesus, an initiate of the higher mysteries, would reveal to them, was of a higher character, for it was the fire, wisdom of the true gnosis, or real spiritual enlightenment. One was fire, the other smoke. For Moses, the fire on Mount Sinai, and the spiritual wisdom. For the multitudes of the people below, for the profane, Mount Sinai, in through smoke i.e. the exoteric husks of orthodox or sectarian ritualism. Now, having the above in view, read the dialogue between the sages Narada 
and Divamata, in the Anugita, an episode from the Mahabharata, the antiquity and importance of which one can learn in the sacred books of the East, edited by Professor Max Muller, Narada is discoursing upon the breaths, or the life winds as they are called in the clumsy translations of such words as prana, apana, etc., whose full esoteric meaning and application to individual functions can hardly be rendered in English. He says of this science that it is the teaching of the Veda that the fire verily is all the deities, and knowledge of it arises among Brahmanas, being accompanied by intelligence. By fire, says the commentator, he means the self. By intelligence, the occultist says, Narada meant neither discussion nor argumentation, as Arjuna Mishra believes, but intelligence truly or the adaptation of the fire of wisdom to exoteric ritualism, for the profane. This is the chief concern of the Brahmins, who were the first to set the example to other nations who thus anthropomorphized and carnalized the grandest metaphysical truths. Narada shows this plainly and is made to say, The smoke of that fire, which is of excellent glory, appears in the shape of darkness. Verily so, its ashes are passion, and goodness in that connection with it, in which the offering is thrown. That is to say, that faculty is the disciple which apprehends the subtle truth, the flame which escapes heavenward, while the objective sacrifice remains as a proof and evidence of piety, only to the profane. For what else can Narada mean by the following? Those who understand the sacrifice understand the samana and the yana as the principal offering. The prana and apana are portions of the offering, and between them is the fire. That is the excellent seat of the udana, as understood by brahmanas. As to that which is distinct from these pairs, hear me speak about that. Day and night are a pair. Between them is the fire. That which exists and that which does not exist are a pair. Between them is the fire. And after every such contrast, Narada adds, That is the excellent seat of the Yudana, as understood by the Brahmanas. Now many people do not know the full meaning of the statement, the Samana and Vyana, Prana and Apana, which are explained to be life winds, but which we say are principles and their respective faculties and senses, are offered up to Udana, the soy distant principle life wind, which is said to act at all the joints. And so the reader who is ignorant that the word fire in these allegories means both the self and the higher divine knowledge will understand nothing in this and will entirely miss the point of our argument. As the translator and even the editor, the great Oxford Sanskritist F. Max Muller, have missed the true meaning of Narada's words. Exoterically, this enumeration of life wins has, of course, the meaning approximately, which is surmised in the footnotes, namely, the sense appears to be this. The course of the worldly life is due to the operations of the life winds, which are attached to the self and lead to its manifestations as individual souls. Of these, the samana and vyana are controlled and held under check by the prana and apana. The latter, too, are held in check and controlled by the udana, which thus controls all. And the control of this, which is the control of all, five, leads to the supreme self. The above is given as an explanation of the text, which records the words of the Brahmana, who narrates how he reached the ultimate wisdom of yogism. And in this, wise reached all knowledge, saying that had he perceived by means of the self, the seat abiding in the self, where dwells the Brahma free from all, and explaining that the indestructible principle was entirely beyond the perception of senses, i.e., of the five life winds, he adds that, in the midst of all these life winds, which move about in the body and swallow up one another, blazes the Vaishvanara, fire sevenfold. This fire, according to Nilakantha's commentary, is identical with the I, the self, which is the goal of the ascetic. Vaishvanara being a word often used for the self, then the Brahmana goes on to enumerate that which is meant by the word sevenfold and says the nose or smell and the tongue, taste and the eye and the skin and the ear as the fifth, the mind and the understanding. These are the seven tongues 
of the blaze of Vaishvanara. Those are the seven kinds of fuel for me. These are the seven great officiating priests. These seven priests are accepted by Arjuna Mishra in the sense of meaning, the soul distinguished as so many souls or principles, with reference to these several powers. And finally, the translator seems to accept the explanation and reluctantly admits that they may mean this, though he himself takes the sense to mean the powers of hearing, etc., the physical senses in short, which are presided over by the several deities. But whatever it may mean, whether in scientific or orthodox interpretations, this passage on page 259 explains Narada's statements on page 276 and shows them referring to exoteric and esoteric methods and contrasting them. Thus, the Samana and the Vyana, though subject to the Prana and the Apana, and all the four to Udana in the matter of acquiring the Pranayama of the Hatha Yogi, chiefly, or the lower form of yoga, are yet referred to as the principal offering, for as rightly argued by K. Trimbach, Telang, their operations are more practically important for vitality, i.e. they are the grossest and are offered in the sacrifice, in order that they may disappear, so to speak, in the quality of darkness of that fire or its smoke, mere exoteric ritualistic form. But prana and upana, though shown as subordinate because less gross or more purified, have the fire between them, the self and the secret knowledge possessed by that self. So for the good and evil, and for that which exists and that which does not exist, all these pairs have fire between them, i.e. esoteric knowledge, the wisdom of the divine self. Let those who are satisfied with the smoke of the fire remain wherein they are, that is to say, within the Egyptian darkness of theological fictions and dead-letter interpretations. The above is written only for the Western students of occultism and theosophy. The writer presumes to explain these things neither to the Hindus, who have their own gurus, nor to the Orientalists, who think they know more than all the gurus and rishis past and present put together. These rather lengthy quotations and examples are necessary, if only to point out to the student the works he has to study, so as to derive benefit and learning from comparison. Let him read Pistis Sophia in the light of the Bhagavad Gita, the Anugita, and others. And then the statement made by Jesus in the Gnostic Gospel will become clear, and the dead letter blinds disappear at once. Read the following and compare it with the explanation from the Hindu scriptures just given. And no name is more excellent than all these, a name wherein be contained all names and all lights, and all the forty-nine powers. Knowing that name, if a man quits this body of matter, no smoke, i.e. no theological delusion, no darkness, nor power, nor ruler of the sphere, no personal genius or planetary spirit called God, of fate, karma, shall be able to hold back the soul that knoweth that name. If he shall utter that name unto the fire, the darkness shall flee away. And if he shall utter that name unto all their powers, nay, even unto Barbello and the invisible God, and the three triple-powered gods, So soon as he shall have uttered that name in those places, they shall all be thrown one upon the other, so that they shall be ready to melt and perish, and shall cry aloud, O light of every light that is in the boundless lights, remember us also and purify us. It is easy to see what this light and name are, the light of initiation and the name of the fire self, which is no name, no action, but a spiritual ever-living power higher even than the real invisible God, as this power is itself. But if the able and learned author of the Gnostics and the Remains has not sufficiently allowed for the spirit of allegory and mysticism in the fragments translated and quoted by him, in the above-named work from Pistis Sophia, other Orientalists have done far worse. Having neither his institutional perception of the Indian origin of the Gnostic wisdom, still less of the meaning of their gems, most of them, beginning with Wilson and ending with the dogmatic Weber, have made most extraordinary blunders with regard to almost every symbol. Sir M. Monier Williams and others show a very decided contempt for the esoteric Buddhists. 
as theosophists are now called. Yet no student of occult philosophy has ever mistaken a cycle for a living personage and vice versa, as is very often the case with our learned Orientalists. An instance or two may illustrate the statement more graphically. Let us choose the best known. In the Ramayana, Garuda is called the maternal uncle of Sagara's 60,000 sons. And Umushat, Sagara's grandson, the nephew of the 60,000 uncles, who were reduced to ashes by the look of Kapila, the Purushottama, or infinite spirit, who caused the horses which Sagara was keeping for the Ashvamedha sacrifice to disappear. Again, Garuda's son, Garuda being himself the Mahakalpa or Great Cycle, Jatayu, the king of the feathered tribe, when on the point of being slain by Ravana who carries off Sita, says, speaking of himself, It is 60,000 years, O king, that I am born, after which, turning his head back on the sun, he dies. Jatayu is, of course, the cycle of 60,000 years within the great cycle of Garuda. Hence, he is represented as his son, or nephew, ad libitum, since the whole meaning rests on his being placed in the line of Garuda's descendants. Then again, there is Diti, the mother of the Maruts whose descendants and progeny belonged to the posterity of Hiranyaksha, whose number was 77 crores, or 770 millions of men, according to the Padma Purana. All such narratives are pronounced meaningless fictions and absurdities. But truth is the daughter of time, and time will show. Meanwhile, what could be easier than an attempt, at least, to verify Puranic chronology? There are many Kapilas. But the Kapila who slew King Sagara's progeny, 60,000 men strong, was undeniably Kapila, the founder of the Sankhya philosophy. Since it's so stated in the Puranas, although one of them flatly denies the imputation without explaining its esoteric meaning. It is the Bhagavata Purana which says that the report is not true that the sons of the king were scorched by the wrath of the sage. For how can the quality of darkness, the product of anger, exist in a sage whose body was goodness and who purified the world, the earth's dust, as it were, attributed to heavens. How should mental perturbation distract that sage, identified with the Supreme Spirit, who has steered here on earth that solid vessel of the Sankhya? Philosophy, with the help of which he who desires to obtain liberation crosses the dreaded ocean of existence, that path to death. The Purana is in duty bound to speak as it does. It has a dogma to promulgate and a policy to carry out, that of great secrecy with regard to mystical divine truths, divulged for countless ages only at initiation. It is not in the Puranas, therefore, that we have to look for an explanation of the mystery connected with various transcendental states of being. That the story is an allegory is seen upon its very face. The 60,000 sons, brutal, vicious, and impious, are the personification of the human passions that a mere glance at the sage, the self who represents the highest state of purity, can be reached on earth, reduces to ashes. But it has also other significations, cyclic and chronological meanings, a method of marking the periods when certain sages flourished, found also in other Puranas. Now it is well ascertained, as any tradition can be, that it was at the Hardwar, or Ganjavara, the door or gate of the Ganges, at the foot of the Himalayas, that Kapila sat in meditation for a number of years. Not far from the Siwalak range, the pass of Hardwar is called to this day Kapila's Pass, and the place also is named Kapilathen, by the aesthetics. It is here that the Ganges, Ganja, emerging from its mountainous gorge, begins its course over the sultry plains of India. And it is clearly ascertained by geological survey that the tradition which claims that the ocean washed the base of the Himalayas ages ago is not entirely without foundation, for distinct traces of this still remain. The Sankhya philosophy may have been brought down and taught by the first and written out by the last Kapila. Now Sagara is the name of the ocean, and especially of the Bay of Bengal, at the mouth of the Ganges, to this day in India. Have geologists ever calculated the number of millenniums it must have taken the sea to recede 
the distance it is now from Hardwar, which is at present 1,024 feet above its level. If they had, those Orientalists will show Kapila flourishing from the 1st to the 9th century AD. Might change their opinions, if only for one of two very good reasons. Firstly, the true number of years which had elapsed since Kapila's day is unmistakably in the Puranas, though the translators may fail to see it. And secondly, the Kapila of the Satya and the Kapila of the Kali Yugas may be one and the same individuality without being the same personality. Kapila, besides being the name of a personage of the once living sage and the author of the Sankhya philosophy, is also the generic name of the Kumaras the celestial ascetics, and virgins. Therefore, the very fact of the Bhagavata Purana calling Vat Kapila, whom it had shown just before as a portion of Vishnu, the author of the Sankhya philosophy, ought to have warned the reader of a blind containing an esoteric meaning. Whether he was the son of Vitatha, as the Harivamsha shows him to be, or of anyone else, the author of the Sankhya cannot be the same as the sage of the Satya Yuga. At the very beginning of the Manvantara, when Vishnu is shown in the form of a Kapila, imparting to all creatures true wisdom, for this relates to that primordial period when the sons of God taught to the newly created men these arts and sciences, which have since been cultivated and preserved in the sanctuaries by the initiates. There are several well-known Kapilas in the Puranas. First, the primeval sage, then Kapila one of the three secret Kumaras and Kapila, son of Kashyapa, and Kadru, the many-headed serpent. Besides Kapila, the great sage and philosopher of the Kali Yuga, the latter being an initiate, a serpent of wisdom, a Naga, was purposely blended with the Kapilas of the former ages. Section 10. The Cross and the Pythagorean Decad. The early Gnostics claimed that their science, the Gnosis, rested on a square, the angles of which represented, respectively, sage, silence, bethos, depth, nous, spiritual soul or mind, and aletheia, truth. It is they who were the first to reveal to the world that which had remained concealed for ages, namely the Tao, in the shape of a Procrustean bed, and Christos as incarnating in Crestos he who became, for certain purposes, a willing candidate for a series of tortures, mental and physical. For them, the whole of the universe, metaphysical and material, was contained within, and could be expressed and described by the digits contained in the number 10, the Pythagorean Decad. This Decad, representing the universe and its evolution out of silence and the unknown depths of the spiritual soul, or Anam Mundi, presented two sides or aspects to the student. It could be, and was at first, applied to the macrocosm, after which it descended to the microcosm, or man. There was then the purely intellectual and metaphysical, or the inner science, and the as purely materialistic, or surface science, both of which could be expounded by and contained in the decad. It could be studied, in short, both by the deductive method of Plato and the inductive method of Aristotle. The former started from a divine comprehension. When the plurality proceeded from unity, or the digits of the Decad appeared only to be finally reabsorbed, lost in the infinite circle. The latter depended on sensuous perception alone, when the Decad could be regarded either as the unity that multiplies, or matter which differentiates its study being limited to the plain surface, to the cross, or to the seven which proceeds from the ten, or the perfect number, on earth as in heaven. This dual system was brought, together with the Decad, by Pythagoras from India, that it was that of the Brahmins and Iranians, as they are called by the ancient Greek philosophers, is warranted to us by the whole range of Sanskrit literature, such as the Puranas and the laws of Manu. In these laws, or ordinances of Manu, it is said that the Brahma first creates the ten lords of being, the ten Prajapati, or creative forces, which ten produce seven other Manus, or rather, as some MSS have it, Munin instead of Manun, devotees or holy beings, 
which are the seven angels of the presence in the Western religion. This mysterious number seven, born from the upper triangle, the latter itself born from the apex thereof, or the silent depths of the unknown universal soul. Sige and Bithos is the sevenfold Saptraparna plant, born and manifested on the surface of the soil of mystery, from the threefold root buried deep under that impenetrable soil. This idea is fully elaborated in one of the sections of Volume 1, Part 2, Section 3, Primordial Substance and Divine Thought, which the reader should notice carefully if he would grasp the metaphysical idea involved in the above symbol. In man as in nature, according to the cis-Himalayan esoteric philosophy, which is that of the cosmogony of the original Manu, it is the septenary division that is intended by nature herself. The seventh principle, Purusha, alone is the divine self, strictly speaking. For as said in Manu, he, Brahma, having pervaded the subtile parts of those six, of unmeasured brightness, created or called them forth to self, consciousness or the consciousness of that one self. Of these six, five elements, or principles, or tattvas, as metatati, the commentator thinks, are called the atomic destructible elements. These are described in the above-named section. We have now to speak of the mystery language, that of the prehistoric races. It is not a phonetic, but a purely pictorial and symbolical tongue. It is known at present in its fullness to the very few, having become with the masses for more than 5,000 years an absolutely dead language. Yet most of the learned Gnostics, Greeks, and Jews knew it and used it, though very differently. A few instances may be given. On the plane above, the number is no number, but a knot, a circle. On the plane below, it becomes one, which is an odd number. Each letter of the ancient alphabets had its philosophical meaning and raison d'etre. The number one, signified with the Alexandrian initiates, a body erect, a living standing man, he being the only animal that has this privilege. And by adding to the one a head, it was transformed into P, a symbol of paternity, of the creative potency, while R signified a moving man, one on his way. Hence, Pater Zeus had nothing sexual or phallic either in its sound or the form of its letters, according to Ragon. If we turn now to the Hebrew alphabet, we shall find that while one, or Aleph, has a bull or an ox for its symbol, ten, the perfect number, or one of the Kabbalah, is a yod, and means, as the first letter of Jehovah, the procreative organ and the rest. The odd numbers are divine. The even numbers are terrestrial, devilish, and unlucky. The Pythagoreans hated the binary. With them it was the origin of differentiation. Hence the contrasts, discord, or matter, the beginning of evil. In the Valentinian theogony, Bithos and Sige, depth, chaos, matter born in silence, are the primordial binary. With the early Pythagoreans, however, the duad was that imperfect state into which the first manifested being fell when it got detached from the monad. It was the point from which the two roads, the good and the evil, bifurcated. All that which was double-faced or false was called by them binary. One was alone good and harmony, because no disharmony can proceed from one alone. Hence the Latin word solace in relation to the one and only God, the unknown of Paul. Solus, however, was very soon became Sol, the sun. The ternary is the first of the odd numbers, as the triangle is the first of the geometrical figures. This number is truly the number of mystery par excellence. To study it on the exoteric lines, one has to read Ragon's Corps Philosophique et Interpretatif des Initiations. On the esoteric, the Hindu symbolism of numerals for the combinations which were applied to it are numberless. It is on the occult properties of the three equal sides of the triangle that Ragon based his studies and founded the famous Masonic society of the Trinosophists, those who study three sciences. An improvement upon the ordinary three Masonic degrees given to those who study nothing except eating and drinking at the meetings of their lodges. As the founder writes, 
The first line of the triangle offered to the apprentice for study is the mineral kingdom, symbolized by Tubalk, Tubalkain. The second side on which the companion has to meditate is the vegetable kingdom, symbolized by Shib, Shibaleth. In this kingdom begins the generation of the bodies. This is why the letter G is presented radiant before the eyes of the adept. The third side is left to the master mason, who has to complete his education by the study of the animal kingdom. It is symbolized by Mauban, son of putrefaction. The first solid figure is the quaternary, the symbol of immortality. It is the pyramid, for the pyramid stands on a triangular base and terminates with a point at the top, thus yielding the triad and the quaternary, or the three and four. The Pythagoreans taught the connection and relation between the gods and the numbers in a science called arithmanancy. The soul is a number, they said, which moves of itself and contains the number four. The spiritual and physical man is number three, as the ternary represented for them not only the surface but also the principle of the formation of the physical body. Thus animals were ternaries only, man alone being a septenary, when virtuous, a quinary, when bad, for number five was composed of a binary and a ternary. And of these the binary threw everything in the perfect form into disorder and confusion. The perfect man, they said, was a quaternary and a ternary, or four material and three immaterial elements. And these three spirits or elements we likewise find in five when it represents the microcosm. The latter is a compound of a binary directly relating to gross matter and of the three spirits. Since, as Ragon says, this ingenious figure is the union of two Greek breathings, placed over vowels which have or have not to be aspirated. The first sign is called the strong or superior spiritus, the spirit of God aspired, spiritus, and breathed by man. The second sign, the lower, is the soft spiritus, representing the secondary spirit. The whole embraces the whole man. It is the universal quintessence, the vital fluid or life. The more mystic meaning of the number five is given in an excellent article by Mr. T. Sabarau in Five Years of Theosophy, in an article entitled The Twelve Signs of the Zodiac, in which he gives some rules that may help the inquirer to ferret out the deep significance of ancient Sanskrit nomenclature and the old Aryan myths and allegories. Meanwhile, let us see what has been hitherto stated about the constellation Capricornus in Theosophical Publications and what is known of it generally. Everyone knows that V is the tenth sign of the zodiac, into which the sun enters at the winter solstice, about December 21st. But very few are those who know, even in India, unless they are initiated, the real mystic connection which seems to exist, as we are told, between the names Makara and Kumara. The first means some amphibious animal, flippantly called the crocodile, as some Orientalists think, and the second is the title of the great patrons of yogins, according to the Shaiva Puranas, the sons of, and even one with Rudra, Shiva, who is a Kumara himself. It is through their connection with man that the Kumaras are likewise connected with the Zodiac. Let us try and find out what the word Makara means, says the author of the Twelve Signs of the Zodiac. Makara contains within itself the clue to its correct interpretation. The letter ma is equivalent to number five, and kara means hand. Now in Sanskrit, tribujam means a triangle, bujam or karam, both synonymous, being understood to mean a side. So makaram or punchakaram means a pentagon. Now the five-pointed star or pentagram represents the five limbs of man. Under the old system, we are told, makara was the eighth instead of the tenth sign. The sign in question is intended to represent the faces of the universe, and indicates that the figure of the universe is bounded by pentagons. The Sanskrit writers speak also of ashtirasha, or eight faces bounding space, referring thus to the lo referring thus to the loka palas, the eight points of the compass, the four cardinal and the four intermediate points. From an objective point of view, the microcosm is represented by the human body. Makaram may be taken to represent simultaneously both the microcosm and the macrocosm, as external objects of perception. But the true esoteric sense of the word makara is not 
in truth crocodile at all, even when it is compared with the animal depicted on the Hindu zodiac, for it has the head and the four legs of an antelope and the body and tail of a fish. Hence, the tenth sign of the zodiac has been taken variously to mean a shark, a dolphin, etc. As it is the Vahana of Varuna, the ocean god, and is often called, for this reason, Jalarupa, or water form. The dolphin was the vehicle of Poseidon Neptune with the Greeks, and one with him, esoterically. And this dolphin is the sea dragon, as much as the crocodile of the sacred Nile is the vehicle of Horus, and Horus himself. Says the mummy form god with the crocodile's head, I am the fish and seat of the great Horus of Camur. With the Pereti Gnostics, it is the Kozar, Neptune, who converts the dodecagonal pyramid into a sphere and paints its gate with many colors. He has five androgyne ministers. He is Makara, the Leviathan. As the rising sun was considered the soul of the gods sent to manifest itself to men every day, and as the crocodile rose out of the water at the first sunbeam, that animal came finally to personify a solar fire devotee in India as it personified that fire, or the highest soul with the Egyptians. In the Puranas, the number of the Kumaras changes according to the exigencies of this allegory. For occult purposes, their number is given in one place as seven, then as four, then as five. In the Kurma Purana, it is said of them, These five Kumaras, O Brahman, were yogis, who acquired entire exemption from passion. Their very name shows their connection with the said constellation Makara, and with some of the other Puranic characters connected with the zodiacal signs. This is done in order to veil what was one of the most suggestive glyphs of the primitive temples. The Kumaras are mixed up astronomically, physiologically, and mystically in general, with a number of Puranic personages and events. Hardly hinted at in the Vishnu, They figure in various dramas and events throughout all of other Puranas and sacred literature. So that the Orientalists, having to pick up the threads of connection hither and thither, have ended by proclaiming the Kumaras, due chiefly to the fancy of the Puranic writers. But, Ma, we are told by the author of the Twelve Signs of the Zodiac, is five. Kara, a hand, with its five fingers, as also a five-sided sign or the pentagon. The Kumara, in this case an anagram for occult purposes, as yogis are five in esotericism, because the last two names have ever been kept secret. They are the fifth order of the Brahma Devas, and the fivefold Chohans, having the soul of the five elements in them, water and ether predominating, and therefore their symbols were both aquatic and fiery. Wisdom lies concealed under the couch of him who rests on the golden lotus, Padma floating on the water. In India, this is Vishnu, one of whose avatars was Buddha, as claimed in days of old. The Prajatasas, the worshippers of Narayana, who, like Poseidon, moved or dwelt over not under the waters, plunged into the depths of the ocean for their devotions and remained there for 10,000 years. In the Prajatasas, are ten exoterically, but five esoterically. Prachitasas is in Sanskrit the name of Varuna, the water god, Nereus, an aspect of Neptune. The Prachitasas being thus identical with the five ministers of the female male Chosar, or Poseidon, of the Parate Gnostics. These are respectively called U, Io, Ao, Awab and the fifth, a triple name, making seven and all, being lost, i.e. kept secret. Thus much for the aquatic symbol, the fiery connecting them with the fiery symbol, spiritually. For purposes of identity, let us remember that as the mother of the Pratatasas was Savarna, the daughter of the ocean, so was Amphorite, the mother of Neptune's mystic ministers. Now, the reader is reminded that these five ministers are symbolized both in the dolphin, who had overcome the chaste Amphitrite's unwillingness to wed Poseidon and in Triton, their son. The latter, whose body above the waist is that of a man and below a dolphin, a fish, is again most mysteriously connected with Oanes, the Babylonian Dag, and further also with the Matsya, fish, avatara of Vishnu, both teaching mortals wisdom. 
The dolphin, as every mythologist knows, was placed for his service by Poseidon. Among the constellations and became with the Greeks Capricornus, the goat, whose hind part is that of a dolphin, and is thus identical with Makara, whose head is also that of an antelope, and the body and tail those of a fish. This is why the sign of the Makara was born on the banner of Kamadeva, the Hindu god of love, identified in the Athara Veda with Agni, the fire god, the son of Lakshmi, as correctly given by Harivamsha. For Lakshmi and Venus are one, and Amphitrite is the early form of Venus. Now Kama, the Makara Ketu, is Aja, the unborn, the Atmabu, the self-existent. And Aja is the Logos in the Rig Veda, as he is shown therein to be the first manifestation of the One, for desire first arose in it, which was the primal germ of the mind, that which connects entity with non-entity, or manas, the fifth, with atma, the seventh, esoterically, say the sages. This is the first stage. The second on the following plane of manifestation shows Brahma, whom we select as a representative for all the other first gods of the nations, causing to issue from his body his mind-born sons, Sanadana and others, who in the fifth creation and again in the ninth, for purposes of a blind, become the Kumara. Let us close by reminding the reader that goats were sacrificed to Amphitrite and the Nereids on the seashore, as goats are sacrificed to this day to Durga Kali who is the only black side of Lakshmi, Venus, the white side of Shakti. And by suggesting what connection these animals may have with Capricornus, in which appear 28 stars in the form of a goat, which goat was transformed by the Greeks into Amalthea, Jupiter's foster mother. Pan, the god of nature, had goat's feet and changed himself into a goat at the approach of Typhon. But this is a mystery which the writer dares not dwell upon at length not being sure of being understood. Thus, the mystical side of the interpretation must be left to the intuition of the student. Let us note one more thing in relation to the mysterious number five. It symbolizes at one and the same time the spirit of life eternal and the spirit of life and love terrestrial in the human compound. And it includes divine and infernal magic and the universal and the individual quintessence of being. Thus the five mystic words or vows uttered by Brahma at creation, which forthwith became the Panchtadasa, certain Vedic hymns attributed to that god, are in their creative and magical potentiality, the white side of the black Totric five Makaras, or the five M's. Makara, the constellation, is a seemingly meaningless and absurd name. Yet even besides its anagrammatical significance in conjunction with the term Kumara, The numerical value of its first syllable and its esoteric resolution into five has a very great and occult meaning in the mysteries of nature. Suffice it to say that, as the sign of Makara is connected with the birth of the spiritual microcosm and the death or dissolution of the physical universe, its passage into the realm of the spiritual, so the Yan Chohans called in India Kumaras are connected with both. Moreover, in the exoteric religions, they become the synonyms of the angels of darkness. Mara is the god of darkness, the fallen one, and death. And yet it is one of those names of Kama, the first god in the Vedas, the Logos, for whom have sprung the Kumaras. And this connects them still more with our fabulous Indian Makara and the crocodile-headed god in Egypt. The crocodiles in the celestial Nile are five, and the god Tum the primordial deity creating the heavenly bodies and living beings calls forth these crocodiles in the fifth creation. When Osiris, the defunct son, is buried and enters into Amenti, the sacred crocodiles plunge into the abyss of the primordial waters, the great green one. When the sun of life rises, they reemerge out of the sacred river. All this is highly symbolical and shows how primeval esoteric truths found their expression in identical symbols. But, as Mr. T. Sabarao truly declares, the veil that was dexterously thrown over certain portions of the mystery connected with these zodiacal signs by the ancient philosophers will never be lifted up for the amusement or edification of the uninitiated public. Nor was number five less sacred with the Greeks. The five words of Brahma had become 
with the Gnostics the five words written upon the Akashic shining garment of Jesus at his glorification. The words Zama Zama Oza Rachama Ozai, translated by the Orientalists, the robe, the glorious robe of my strength. These words were, in their turn, the anagrammatic blind of the five mystic powers represented on the robe of the resurrected, initiate after his last trial of three days' trance, the five becoming seven only after his death, when the adept became the full Christos, the full Krishna Vishnu, i.e. merged in Nirvana. The E. Delphicum, a sacred symbol, was the numeral five, again, and how sacred it was is shown by the fact that the Corinthians, according to Plutarch, replaced the wooden numeral in the Delphic temple by a bronze one, and this one was transmuted by Livia Augusta into a facsimile in gold. It is easy to recognize in the two spiritus, the Greek signs, spoken of by Ragon, Atma, and Budi, or divine spirit and its vehicle, the spiritual soul. The six, or the senary, is dealt with later in this section while the septenary will be fully treated in the course of this volume in the section on the mysteries of the Hebdomad. The Ogdode, or eight, symbolizes the eternal and spiral motion of cycles, the eight, and is symbolized in its turn by the Caduceus. It shows the regular breathing of the cosmos, presided over by the eight great gods, the seven from the primeval mother, the one, and the triad. Then comes the number nine, or the triple ternary, it is the number which reproduces itself incessantly under all shapes and figures in every multiplication. It is the sign of every circumference, since its value in degrees is equal to 9, i.e. 3 plus 6 plus 0. It is a bad number under certain conditions and very unlucky. If number 6 was the symbol of our globe ready to be animated by a divine spirit, 9 symbolized our earth and formed by a bad or evil spirit. 10, or the decad, brings all these digits back to unity and ends the Pythagorean table. Hence this figure, circle with a line horizontally through the center, unity within zero, was the symbol of deity, of the universe, and of man. Such is the secret meaning of the strong grip of the lion's paw, of the tribe of Judah, the master mason's grip, between two hands the joint number of whose fingers is ten. If we now give our attention to the Egyptian cross, or the Tau, we may discover this letter which was so exalted by Egyptians, Greeks, and Jews, to be mysteriously connected with the Decad. The Tau is the Alpha and the Omega of secret divine wisdom, which is symbolized by the initial and the final letters of Thought, Hermes. Thought was the inventor of the Egyptian alphabet, and the letter Tau closed the alphabets of the Jews and the Samaritans, who called this character the end, or perfection, culmination, and security. Hence, Ragon tells us the words terminus, end, and tectum, roof, are symbols of shelter and security, which is rather a prosaic definition. But such is the usual destiny of ideas and things in this world of spiritual decadence, though at the same time of physical progress. Pan was at one time absolute nature, and the one in great all. But when history catches a first glimpse of him, Pan has already tumbled down into a godling of the fields, a rural god. History will not recognize him, while theology makes of him the devil. Yet his seven-pipe flute, the emblem of the seven forces of nature, of the seven planets, the seven musical notes, of all the septenary harmony in short, shows well his primordial character. So with the cross. Far earlier than the Jews had devised their golden candlestick of the temple, with three sockets on one side and a fourth on the other, and made of number seven a feminine number of generation, thus introducing the phallic element into religion. The more spiritually minded nations had made of the cross, as three, four equals seven, their most sacred divine symbol. In fact, circle, cross, and seven, the latter being made a base of circular measurement, are the first primordial symbols. Pythagoras, who brought his wisdom from India, left to posterity a glimpse into this truth. His school regarded number seven as a compound of numbers three and four, which they explained in a dual manner. On the plane of the noumenal world, the triangle was, as the first conception of the manifested deity, its image, father, mother, son, and the quaternary, the perfect number 
was the numinal, ideal root of all numbers and things on the physical plane. Some students, in view of the sacredness of the Tetractus and the Tetragrammaton, mistake the mystic meaning of the quaternary. The latter was, with the ancients, only a secondary perfection, so to speak, because it related only to the manifested planes. Whereas it is the triangle, the Greek delta, which was the vehicle of the unknown deity. A good proof of it lies in the name of the deity beginning with delta. Zeus was written, Duus by the Boeotians, thence the Duus of the Latins. This in relation to the metaphysical conception, with regard to the meaning of the septenary in the phenomenal world, but for purposes of profane or exoteric interpretation, the symbolism changed. Three became the ideograph of the three material elements, air, water, earth, and four became the principle of all that which is neither corporeal nor perceptible. But this has never been accepted by the real Pythagoreans. Viewed as a compound of six and one, the centenary and the unity, number seven was the invisible center, the spirit of everything. As there exists no hexagonal body without a seventh property being found as the central point in it, as for instance, crystals and snowflakes and so called inanimate nature. Moreover, number seven, they said, has all the perfection of the unit, the number of numbers. For as absolute unity is uncreated and impartite, hence numberless, and no number can produce it, so is the seven. No digit contained within the decad can beget or produce it. And it is four which affords an arithmetical division between unity and seven, for it surpasses the former by the same number, three, as it is itself surpassed by the seven, since four is by as many numbers above one as seven is above four. With the Egyptians, number seven was the symbol of life eternal, says Ragon, and adds that this is why the Greek letter Z, which is but a double seven, is the initial letter of Zao, I live, and of Zeus, the father of all living. Moreover, figure six was the symbol of the earth during the autumn and winter, sleeping months, and figure seven during spring and summer, as the spirit of life animated her at that time, the seventh or central informing force. We find the same in the Egyptian mythos and the symbol of Osiris and Isis, personifying fire and water metaphysically, and the sun and the Nile physically. The number of the solar year, 365 in days, is the numerical value of the word Nilos, Nile. This, together with the bull, with the crescent and the ansated cross between its horns, and the earth under its astronomical symbol, are the most phallic symbols of later antiquity. The Nile was the river of time with the number of a year, or a year and a day, 364 plus 1 equals 365. It represented the paturient water of Isis, or Mother Earth, the moon, the woman, and the cow. Also the workshop of Osiris, representing the sod Olam of the Hebrews. The ancient name of this river was Eridanus, or the Hebrew Eridan, with the Coptic or Old Greek suffix. This was the door of the Hebrew word Jared, or source, or descent, of the river Jordan, which had the same mythical use with the Hebrews that the Nile had with the Egyptians. It was the source of descent and held the waters of life. It was, to put it plainly, the symbol of the personified earth, or Isis regarded as the womb of that earth. This is shown clearly enough, and Jordan, the river so sacred now to Christians, held no more sublime or poetical meaning in it than the paturient waters of the moon, Isis or Jehovah in his female aspect. Now, as shown by the same scholar, Osiris was the sun and the river Nile, and the year of 365 days, while Isis was the moon, the bed of that river, or Mother Earth, for the perturient energies of which water was a necessity, as also the lunar year of 354 days, the time maker of the periods of gestation. All this then is sexual and phallic, our modern scholars seeming to find in these symbols nothing beyond a physiological or phallic meaning. Nevertheless, the three figures, 365, or the number of days in a solar year, have but to be read with the Pythagorean key, to find in them a highly philosophical and moral meaning. One instance will be sufficient. It can read the earth, 3, animated by 6, the spirit of life, 5. 
simply because three is equivalent to the Greek gamma, which is the symbol of Gaia, the earth, while the figure six is the symbol of the animating or informing principle. And the five is the universal quintessence which spreads in every direction and forms all matter. The few instances and examples brought forward reveal only one small portion of the methods used to read the symbolical ideographs and numerals of antiquity. The system being an extreme and complex difficulty, very few, even among the initiates, could master all seven keys. It is to be wondered, then, that the metaphysical gradually dwindled down into the physical nature, that the sun, once upon a time the symbol of deity, became, as aeons glided by, that of its creative ardor only, and that thence it fell into a glyph of phallic significance. But surely it is not those whose method, like Plato's, was to proceed from universals down to particulars, who could ever have begun to symbolize their religions by sexual emblems. It is quite true, though, uttered by that incarnated paradox, Eliphas Levi, that man is God on earth and God is man in heaven. But this could not and never did apply to the one deity, only to the hosts of its incarnated beams, called by us John Chohans by the ancient gods, and now transformed by the church into devils on the left and into the savior on the right side. But all such dogmas grew out of the one root, the root of wisdom, which grows and thrives on the Indian soil. This is not an archangel that could not be traced back to its prototype in the sacred land of Aryavarta. These prototypes are all connected with the Kumaras, who appear on the scene of acting by refusing as Sanakumara and Sananda, to create progeny. Yet they are called the creators of thinking man. More than once they are brought into connection with Narada, another bundle of apparent incongruities, yet a wealth of philosophical tenets. Narada is the leader of the Gandharvas, the celestial singers and musicians. Esoterically, the reason for this is explained by the fact that the Gandharvas are the instructors of men in the secret sciences. It is they who, loving the women of the earth, disclose to them the mysteries of creation. Or, as in the Veda, the heavenly Gandharva is a deity who knew and revealed the secrets of heaven and divine truths in general. If we remember what is said of this class of angels in Enoch and in the Bible, then the allegory is plain. Their leader, Narada, while refusing to procreate, leads men to become gods. Moreover, all of these, as stated in the Vedas, are chandajas, will-born, or incarnated in different manvantaras of their own will. They are shown in exoteric literature as existing age after age, some being cursed to be reborn, others incarnated as a duty. Finally, as the Sanakadikas, the seven Kumaras who went to visit Vishnu on the White Island, Svetavipa, the island inhabited by the Mahayogins, they are connected with the Shakadvipa and the Lumerians Atlanteans of the third and fourth races. In the esoteric philosophy, the Rudras, Kumaras, Adityas, Gandharvas, Asuras, etc., are the highest Jan Chohans or Devas as regards intellectuality. They are those who, owing to their having acquired by self development the fivefold nature, hence the sacredness of the number five, became independent of the pure Arupa Devas. This is a mystery very difficult to realize and understand correctly. For we see that those who are obedient to law are equally with the rebels, doomed to be reborn in every age. Narada, the Rishi, is cursed by Brahma to incessant peripatiasism on earth, i.e. to be constantly reborn. He is a rebel against Brahma, and yet has no worse fate than the Yayas, the twelve great creative gods produced by Brahma as his assistants in the functions of creation. For the latter, lost in meditation, only forgot to create, and for this they were equally cursed by Brahma to be born in every Mamantara. And still they are termed, together with the rebels, Chandajas, or those born of their own will in human form. All this is very puzzling to one who is unable to read and understand the Puranas except in their dead-letter sense. Hence, we find the Orientalists refusing to be puzzled and cutting the Gordian knot of perplexity by declaring the whole scheme figments of Brahmanical fancy and love of exaggeration. 
but to the student of occultism, the whole is pregnant with a deep philosophical meaning. We willingly leave the rind to the Western Sanskritist, but claim the essence of the fruit for ourselves. We do more. We concede that in one sense, much in these so-called fables refers to astronomical allegories about constellations, asterisms, stars, and planets. Yet while the Gandharva of the Rig Veda may there be made to personify the fire of the sun, the Gandharva devas are entities both of a physical and psychic character, while the Apsarasas with other Rudras are both qualities and quantities. In short, if ever unraveled, the theogony of the Vedic gods will reveal fathomless mysteries of creation and being. Truly, says Parashara, these classes of 33 divinities exist age after age, and their appearance and disappearance is in the same manner as the sun sets and rises again. There was a time when the eastern symbol of the cross and circle, the swastika, was universally adopted. With the esoteric and, for the matter of the exoteric, Buddhist, the Chinaman, and the Mongolian, it means the 10,000 truths. These truths, they say, belong to the mysteries of the unseen universe and primordial cosmogony and theogony. Since Fohat crossed the circle like two lines of flame, horizontally and vertically, the hosts of the Blessed Ones have never failed to send their representatives upon the planets they are made to watch over from the beginning. This is why the swastika is always placed, as the unsated cross was in Egypt, on the breast of the defunct mystics. It is found on the heart of the images and statues of Buddha in Tibet and Mongolia. It is the seal placed also on the hearts of the living initiates, burnt into the flesh forever with some. This because they have to keep these truths inviolate and intact, in eternal silence and secrecy to the day they are perceived and read by their chosen successors. New initiates, worthy of being entrusted with the 10,000 perfections. So degraded, however, has it now become that it is often placed on the headgear of the gods, the hideous idols of their sacrilegious bonds, the Dugpas, or sorcerers, of the Tibetan borderlands, until found out by a Galakpa, and torn off altogether with the head of the god. Though it would be better were it that of the worshipper which was severed from his sinful body. Still, it can never lose its mysterious properties. Throw a retrospective glance, and see it used alike by the initiates and seers, as by the priests of Troy, for many specimens of it have been found by Schleiman on the side of that old city. One finds it with the old Peruvians, the Assyrians, Chaldeans, as well as on the walls of the Old World Cyclopean buildings, in the catacombs of the New World, and in those of the Old, at Rome, where, because the first Christians are supposed to have concealed themselves and their religion, it is called crux dissimulata. According to de Rossi, the swastika from an early period was a favorite form of the cross employed with an occult signification which shows the secret was not that of the Christian cross. One swastika cross at the catacombs is the sign of an inscription which read, Vitalis Vitalia, or Life of Life. But the best evidence to the antiquity of the cross is that which is brought forward by the author of the natural genesis himself. The value of the cross as a Christian symbol is supposed to date from the time when Jesus Christ was crucified, and yet in the Christian iconography of the catacombs no figure of a man appears upon the cross during the first six or seven centuries. There are all forms of the cross except that the alleged starting point of the new religion. That was not the initial but the final form of the crucifix. During some six centuries after the Christian era, the foundation of the Christian religion in a crucified Redeemer is entirely absent from Christian art. The earliest known form of the human figure on the cross is the crucifix presented by Pope Gregory the Great to Queen Theodolonide of Lombardy, now in the Church of St. John at Monza. Whilst no image of the crucified is found in the catacombs at Rome earlier than that of San Giulio, belonging to the 7th or 8th century, there is no Christ and no crucified. The cross is the Christ even as the Storos cross was a type and a name of Horus the Gnostic Christ. The cross, not the crucified, is the primary symbol of the Christian church. The cross, not the crucified, is the essential object of representation and its art and of adoration in its religion. The germ of the whole growth and development can be traced to the cross, 
And that cross is pre-Christian, is pagan, and heathen, and half a dozen different shapes. The cult began with the cross, and Julian was right in saying he waged a warfare with the cross, which he obviously considered had been adopted by the agnostics and mythologists to convey an impossible significance. During centuries, the cross stood for the Christ, and was addressed as if it were a living being. It was divinized as first and humanized at last. Few world symbols are more pregnant with real occult meaning than the swastika. It is symbolized by the figure six. Like that figure, it points in its concrete imagery, as does the ideograph of the number, to the zenith and the nadir, the north, the south, west, and east. One finds the unit everywhere, and that unit reflected in all and every unit. It is the emblem of the activity of Fohat, of the continual revolution of the wheels and of the four elements, the sacred four in their mystical and not alone in their cosmical meaning. Further, its arms, forearms, bent at right angles, are intimately related, as shown elsewhere, to the Pythagorean and Hermetic scales. One initiated into the mysteries of the meaning of the swastika, say the commentaries, can trace on it, with mathematical precision, the evolution of cosmos and the whole period of Sandhya. Also, the relation of the seen to the unseen, and the first procreation of man and species. To the Eastern occultist, the tree of knowledge, in the paradise of man's own heart, becomes the tree of life eternal, and has not to do with man's animal senses. It is an absolute mystery that reveals itself only through the efforts of the imprisoned manas, the ego, to liberate itself from the thraldom of sensuous perception, and see it in the light of the one eternal present reality. To the Western Kabbalist, and far more now to the superficial symbologist, nursed in the lethal atmosphere of materialistic science, the chief explanation of the mysteries of the cross is its sexual element. Even the otherwise spiritualistic modern commentator discerns this feature in the cross and swastika before all others. The cross was used in Egypt as a protecting talisman and a symbol of saving power. Typhon, or Satan, is actually found chained to it and bound by the cross. In the ritual, the Osirian cries, The Apophis is overthrown. Their cords bind the south, north, east, and west. Their cords are on him. Haruba has knotted him. These were the cords of the four quarters, or the cross. Thor is said to smite the head of the serpent with his hammer, a form of swastika, or a four-footed cross. In the primitive sepulchres of Egypt, the model of the chamber had the form of a cross. The pagoda of Mathura, the birthplace of Krishna, was built in the form of a cross. This is perfect, and no one can discern in it that sexual worship with which the Orientalists loved to break the head of paganism. But how about the Jews and the exoteric religions of some Hindu sects, especially the rites of the Vallabhacharyas? For, as said, Shiva worship, with its lingam and yoni, stands too high philosophically, its modern degeneration notwithstanding, to be called a simple phallic worship. But the tree, or cross-worship, of the Jews, as denounced by their own prophets, can hardly escape the charge. The sons of the sorcerers, the seed of the adulterer, as Osiah calls them, never lost an opportunity of inflaming themselves with idols under every green tree, which denotes no metaphysical recreation. It is from these monotheistic Jews that the Christian nations have derived their religion, their God of gods, the one living God, while despising and deriding the worship of the deity of the ancient philosophers. Let such believe in and worship the physical form of the cross by all means. But to the follower of the true Eastern archaic wisdom, to whom who worships in spirit not outside the absolute unity, that every pulsating great heart that beats throughout, as in every atom of nature, each such atom contains the germ from which he may raise the tree of knowledge, whose fruits give life eternal and not physical life alone. For him the cross and circle, the tree or the Tao, even after every symbol relating thereto, has been referred to and read, one after another, still remain a profound mystery in their past. And it is that past alone that he redirects his eager gaze. He cares little whether it be the seed from which grows the genealogical tree of being, called the universe. Nor is it the three-in-one, the triple aspect of the seed, its form, color, and substance that interest him, 
but rather the force which directs its growth, and the ever mysterious and the ever unknown. For this vital force that makes the seed germinate, burst open and throw out its shoots, then form the trunk and branches, which, in their turn, bend down like the boughs of the Ashvada, the holy tree of Bodhi, throw their seed out, take root, and procreate other trees. This is the only life force that has reality for him, as it is the never-dying breath of life. The pagan philosopher sought for the cause. The modern is content with only the effects and seeks the former and the latter. What is beyond he does not know, nor does the modern agnostic care, thus rejecting the only knowledge upon which he can with full security base his science. Yet this manifested force has an answer for him who seeks to fathom it. He who sees in the cross, the decussated circle of Plato, the pagan, not the antitype of circumcision, as Christian St. Augustine did, is forthwith regarded by the church as a heathen, by science as a lunatic. This because, while refusing to worship the god of physical generation, he confesses that he can know nothing of the cause which underlies the so-called first cause, the causeless cause of this vital cause. Tacitly admitting the all-presence of the boundless circle and making of it the universal postulate upon which the whole of the manifested universe is based. The sage keeps a reverential silence concerning that upon which no mortal man should dare to speculate. The Logos of God is the revealer of man, and the Logos, the verb, of man is the revealer of God, says Eliphas Levi in one of his paradoxes. To this, the Eastern occultist would reply, on this condition, however, that man should be dumb on the cause that produced both God and its Logos. Otherwise, he becomes invariably the reviler, not the revealer of the incognizable deity. We now have to approach mystery, the hebdomad in nature. Perchance, all that we may say will be attributed to coincidence. We may be told that this number in nature is quite natural, as indeed we say it is, and has no more significance than the illusion of motion which forms the so-called strobic circles. No great importance was given to these singular illusions when Professor Sylvanus Thompson exhibited them at the meeting of the British Association in 1877. Nevertheless, we should like to learn the scientific explanation why seven should ever form itself as a preeminent number. Six concentric circles around a seventh, and seven rings within one around a central point etc. In this illusion, produced by a swaying saucer, or any other vessel, we give the solution refused by science in the section which follows. Section 11. The Mysteries of the Hebdomad. We must not close this part on the symbolism of archaic history without an attempt to explain the perpetual recurrence of this truly mystic number, the Hebdomad in every scripture known to the Orientalists. As every religion, from the oldest to the latest, reveals its presence and explains it on its own grounds, agreeably with its own special dogmas, this is no easy task. We can therefore do no better or more explanatory work than to give a bird's-eye view of all. The numbers 3, 4, 7 are the sacred numbers of light, life, and union, especially in this present Manvantara, our life cycle of which number seven is a special representative, or the factor number. This has now to be demonstrated. If one should ask a Brahmin learned in the Upanishads, which are so full of the secret wisdom of old, why he, or whom seven forefathers have drunk the juice of the moon plant, is Trisoparna, as Bhopaveda is credited with saying, and why the Somapa, Petris should be worshipped by the Brahmin Trisuparna, very few could answer the question, or if they knew, they would still less satisfy one's curiosity. Let us then hold to what the old esoteric doctrine teaches. As says the commentary, when the first seven appeared on earth, they threw the seed of everything that grows on the land into the soil. First came three, and four were added to these as soon as stone was transformed into plant. Then came the second seven, who guided the yivas of the plants, produced the middle, intermediate natures between plant and moving living animal. The third seven evolved their chayas. The fifth seven imprisoned their essence. Thus man became a saptaparna. A. Saptaparna. 
such as the name given in occult phraseology to man. It means, as shown elsewhere, a seven-leaved plant, and the name has a great significance in the Buddhist legends. So it had also under disguise in the Greek myths. The T, or T, formed from the figure seven, and the Greek letter gamma was, as stated in the last section, the symbol of life and of life eternal. Of earthly life, because gamma is the symbol of the earth, Gaia, and of life eternal, because the figure seven is the symbol of the same life linked with divine life, the double glyph expressed in geometrical figures being a triangle over a square, a triangle and a quaternary, the symbol of septenary man. Now the number six has been regarded in the ancient mysteries as an emblem of physical nature. For six is the representation of the six dimensions of all bodies, the six directions which compose their form, namely the four directions extending to the four cardinal points, north, south, east, and west, and the two directions of height and thickness that answer to the zenith and the nadir. Therefore, while the centenary was applied by the sages to physical man, the septenary was for them the symbol of that man plus his immortal soul. J. M. Ragon gives a very good illustration of the hieroglyphical centenary, as he calls our double equilateral triangle. The hieroglyphical centenary is the symbol of the commingling of the philosophical three fires and three waters, whence results the procreation of the elements of all things. The same idea is found in the Indian double equilateral triangle. For, though it is called in that country the sign of Vishnu, yet in truth it is the symbol of the triad or trimurti. For even in the exoteric rendering, the lower triangle, with the apex downward, is the symbol of Vishnu, the god of the moist principle in water, Narayana, being the moving principle in the Nara, or waters. While the triangle with its apex upward is Shiva, the principle of fire, symbolized by the triple flame in his hand. It is these two interlaced triangles, wrongly called Solomon's seal, which also form the emblem of our society, that produce the septenary and the triad at one and the same time, and are the decad. Whatever may be this star is examined, all the ten numbers are contained therein, for with a point in the middle or center, it is the sevenfold sign or septenary. Its triangles denote number three, or the triad. The two triangles show the presence of the binary. The triangles with the center point common to both yield the quaternary. The six points are the centery, and the central point the unit. The quinary being traced by combination as a compound of two triangles, the even number. And of the three sides in each triangle, the first odd number. This is the reason why Pythagoras and the ancients made the number six sacred to Venus, since the union of the two sexes and the spagorization of matter by triads are necessary to develop the generative forces, that prolific virtue and tendency to reproduction which is inherent in all bodies. Belief in creators, or the personified powers of nature, is in truth no polytheism, but a philosophical necessity. Like all the other planets of our system, the Earth has seven logi, the emanating rays of the one father ray, the protagonos, or the manifested logos, he who sacrifices his s, or flesh, the universe, that the world may live and every creature therein have conscious being. Numbers three and four respectively, male and female, spirit and matter, and their union is the emblem of life eternal and spirit on its ascending arc, and in matter as the ever-recurring element, by procreation and reproduction. The spiritual male line is a vertical line. The differentiated matter line is horizontal, the two forming the cross. The three is invisible, the four is on the plane of the objective perception. This is why all the matter of the universe, when analyzed to its ultimates by science, can be reduced to four elements only. carbon oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. And why the three primaries, the noumena of the four, or graduated spirit of force, have remained a terra incognita, and more speculations, mere names to exact science. Her servants must believe in and study first the primary causes, before they can hope to fathom the nature, and acquaint themselves with the potentialities of the effects. 
Thus, while the men of Western learning had, and still have, the four, or matter, to toy with, the Eastern occultists and their disciples, the great alchemists the world over, have the whole septinate to study from. As those alchemists have it, when the three and the four kiss each other, the quaternary joins its middle nature with that of the triangle, or triad, i.e. the face of one of its plane surfaces becoming the middle face of the other, and becomes a cube. Then only does it, the cube unfolded, become the vehicle and the number of life, the father-mother seven. The following diagram will perhaps assist the students to grasp these parallelisms. Human principles, seven, atma, six, buddhi, five, manas, four, kamarupa, the principle of animal desire, which burns fiercely during life and matter, resulting in satiety. It is inseparable from animal existences. Hydrogen, the principle of physical nature, the lightest of all gases, it burns in oxygen, giving off the most intense heat of any substance in combustion, and forming water. The most stable of compounds, hydrogen, enters largely into all organic compounds. Back to the human principles. 3. Linga Sharia, the inert vehicle or form on which the body is molded, the vehicle of life, it is dissipated very shortly after the disintegration of the body. Nitrogen, an inert gas, the vehicle with which oxygen is mixed to adapt the latter for animal respiration. It is also enters largely into all organic substances. Back to human principles. 2. Prana, life, the active power producing all vital phenomena. Oxygen, principle of physical nature, the supporter of combustion, the life-giving gas, the active chemical agent in all organic life. Back to the human principles. 1. The gross matter of the body, the substance formed and molded over the linga sharia, chaya, by the action of prana. Carbon, principle of physical nature, the fuel par excellence, the basis of all organic substances, the chemical element which forms the largest variety of compounds. Now we are taught that all these earliest forms of organic life also appear in septenary groups of numbers, from minerals or soft stones that hardened, to use the phraseology of the stanzas, followed by the hard plants that softened, which are the product of the mineral, for it is from the bosom of the stone that the vegetation is born. And then to man, all the primitive models in every kingdom of nature begin by being ethereal, transparent films. This, of course, takes place only in the first beginning of life. With the next period, they consolidate, and at the seventh begin to branch off into species, all except men the first of the mammalian animals in the fourth round. Virgil, versed as every ancient poet was, more or less, in esoteric philosophy, sang of evolution in the following strains. First came three, or the triangle. This expression has a profound meaning in occultism, and the fact is corroborated in mineralogy, botany, and even in geology, as has been demonstrated in the section on the chronology of the Brahmins by the compound number seven, the three and the four being contained in it. Salt in solution proves this, for when its molecules, clustering together, begin to deposit themselves as a solid, the first shape they assume is that of triangles, small pyramids and cones. It is the figure of fire whence the word pyramus, while the second geometrical figure in manifested nature is a square or a cube, four and six. For, as Enfield says, the particles of earth being cubical, those of fire are pyramidal. Truly, the pyramidal shape is that assumed by the pines, the most primitive tree after the fern period. Thus, the two opposites in cosmic nature, fire and water, heat and cold, begin their metrographical manifestations, one by a trimetric, the other by a hexagonal system. For the stellate crystals of snow, viewed under a microscope, are all and each of them a double or treble six-pointed star, with a central nucleus, like a miniature star within the larger one, says Mr. Darwin, showing that the inhabitants of the seashore are greatly affected by the tides. The most ancient progenitors in the kingdom of the vertebrata, 
apparently consisted of a group of marine animals, animals living either about the mean high water mark or about the mean low water mark, passed through a complete cycle of tidal changes in a fortnight. Now it is a mysterious fact that in the higher and now terrestrial vertebrata, many normal and abnormal processes have one or more weeks, septinates, as their periods, such as the gestation of mammals, the duration of fevers. The eggs of the pigeon are hatched in two weeks, or fourteen days, those of the fowl in three, those of the duck in four, those of the goose in five, and those of the ostrich in seven. This number is closely connected with the moon, whose occult influence is ever manifesting itself in septenary periods. It is the moon which is the guide of the occult side of terrestrial nature, while the sun is the regulator and factor of manifested life. This truth has ever been evident to the seers and the adepts. Jacob Bohm, by insisting on the fundamental doctrine of the seven properties of everlasting Mother Nature, proved himself thereby a great occultist. But to return to the consideration of the septenary and ancient religious symbolism, to the metrological key of the symbolism of the Hebrews, which reveals numerically the geometrical relations of the circle, all deity, to the square, cube, triangle, and all the integral emanations of the divine area, may be added the theogenic key. This key explains that Noah, the deluge patriarch, is in one aspect the permutation of the deity, the universal creative law, for the purpose of the formation of our earth, its population, and the propagation of life on it in general. Now, bearing in mind the septenary division and divine hierarchies, as in cosmic and human constitutions, the student will readily understand that Yah Noah is at the head of and is the synthesis of the lower cosmic quaternary, the upper Sephirothal triad, triangle of which Jehovah Bina, intelligence, is the left, female angle emanates the quaternary, the square, the latter, symbolizing by itself the heavenly man the sexless Adam Cadmon, viewed as nature in the abstract, becomes a septinate again by emanating from itself the additional three principles, the lower terrestrial or manifested physical nature, matter and our earth, the seventh being Malkuth, the bride of the heavenly man, thus forming with the higher triad, or Kether, the crown, the full number of the Sephirothal tree, the ten, the total in unity, or the universe. Apart from the higher triad, the lower creative Sephiroth are seven. The above is not directly to our point, though it is a necessary reminder to facilitate the comprehension of what follows. The question at issue is to show that Yah Noah, or the Jehovah of the Hebrew Bible, the alleged creator of our earth, of man and all upon it, is A, the lowest septenary, the creative Elohim, in his cosmic aspect, B, the Tetragrammaton, or the Adam Kadmon, of the heavenly man, of the four letters, in his theogenic and Kabbalistic aspects. C, the Noah, identical with the Hindu Shishta, the human seed, left for the peopling of the earth from a previous creation, or Manvantara, as expressed in the Puranas, or the pre-Diluvian period as rendered allegorically in the Bible, in his cosmic character. But whether a quaternary, tetragrammaton, or a triad, the biblical creative God is not the universal ten, unless blended with Ein Suf, as Brahma, with Parabrahman, but a septenary one, of the many septenaries of the universal septenate. In the explanation of the question now in hand, his position and status as Noah may be best shown by placing the three triangle and the four square on parallel lines with the cosmic and human principles. For the latter, the old familiar classification is made use of. Thus, under the triangle, the human aspects or principles, one, universal spirit, atma, two, spiritual soul, buddhi, three, human soul, mind, manas, the triple aspect of the deity, the cosmic aspect of principles is one, the unmanifested logos, two, the universal latent ideation, and three, universal or cosmic active intelligence. And under the square, the human aspects or principles, four, animal soul, kama rupa, five, astral body, linga sharia, six, life essence, prana, seven, body, stula sharira, the spirit of the earth, Jehovah, Noah, 
the space containing life, the waters of the deluge, Mount Ararat. And under the cosmic aspect or principles, four is cosmic, chaotic energy, five, astral ideation, reflecting terrestrial things, six, life essence or energy, and seven, the earth. As an additional demonstration of the statement, let the reader turn to the Kabbalistic works. Ararat equals the Mount of Descent. Hor Jared, Hatho, mentions it out of composition by Erath. Editor of Moses Cherenensis says, By this they say is signified the first place of descent of the Ark. Bryant's Annal, Volume 4, pp. 5-6-15. Under Berge, Mountain, Nork says of Ararat, for, i.e. Ararat, for Arath, Earth, Aramaic, reduplication. Here it is seen that Nork and Hatho make use of the same equivalent in Arath with the meaning of Earth. Noah, thus symbolizing both the root Manu and the seed Manu, or the power which developed the planetary chain, and our Earth, and the seed race, the fifth, which was saved while the last subraces of the fourth, Vevasvata Manu, perished, the number seven will be seen to recur at every step. It is Noah who, as Jehovah's permutation, represents the septenary host of the Elohim, and is thus the father or creator, the preserver of all animal life. Hence the verses of Genesis, Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by heavens, the male and the female, of fowls also of the air by sevens, etc., followed by all the sevening of days and the rest. B. The tetractis in relation to the heptagon. Thus, number seven, as a compound of three and four, is the factor element in every ancient religion, because it is the factor element in nature. Its adoption must be justified, and it must be shown to be the number par excellence. For, since the appearance of the esoteric Buddhism, frequent objections have been made, and doubts expressed as to the correctness of these assertions. And let the student be told at once that in all such numerical divisions the one universal principle, although referred to as the one because the only one, never enters into the calculations. It stands in its character of the absolute, the infinite, and the universal abstraction, entirely by itself and interdependent of every other power, whether noumenal or phenomenal. Says the author of the article Personal and Impersonal God, The entity is neither matter nor spirit, it is neither ego nor non-ego, and it is neither object nor subject. In the language of Hindu philosophers, it is the original and eternal combination of Purusha, spirit, and Prakriti, matter. As the Advaitis hold that an external object is merely the product of our mental states, Prakriti is nothing more than illusion, and Purusha is the only reality. It is the one existence which remains in the universe of ideas. This, then, is the Parabrahman of the Advaitis. Even if there were to be a personal god with anything like a material apati, physical basis or of whatever form, from the standpoint of the Advaiti, there will be as much reason to doubt his noumenal existence as there would be in the case of any other object. In their opinion, a conscious god cannot be the origin of the universe, as his ego would be the effect of a previous cause, if the word conscious conveys but its ordinary meaning. They cannot admit that the grand total of all the states of consciousness in the universe is their deity, as these states are constantly changing, and as cosmic idealism seizes during praleya. There is only one permanent condition in the universe, which is the state of perfect unconsciousness, bare chitakasham, the field of consciousness, in fact. When my readers once realize the fact that this grand universe is in reality but a huge aggregation of various states of consciousness, they will not be surprised to find that the ultimate state of unconsciousness is considered as para-Brahmins by the Advaitis. Although itself entirely out of human reckoning or calculation, yet this huge aggregation of various states of consciousness is a septinate, in its totality, entirely composed of septenary groups, simply because the capacity of perception exists in seven different aspects corresponding to seven different conditions of matter, or the seven properties, or states of matter, and therefore the series from one to seven begins in the esoteric calculations with the first manifested principle, which is number one if we commence from above, and number seven when reckoning from below, or from the lowest principle, 
the Tetrad is esteemed in the Kabbalah, as it was by Pythagoras, the most perfect or rather sacred number, because it emanated from the one, the first manifested unit, or rather the three in one, and the latter has ever been impersonal, sexless, incomprehensible, though within it the possibility of the higher mental perceptions. The first manifestation of the eternal monad was never meant to stand as the symbol of another symbol, the unborn for the element born, or the one logos for the heavenly man. Tetragrammaton, or the tetractus of the Greeks, is the second logos, the demiurgus. The tetrad, as Thomas Taylor thinks, is however the animal itself of Plato, who, as Syrianus justly observes, was the best of the Pythagoreans, subsists at the extremity of the intelligible triad, as is most satisfactorily shown by Proclus in the third book of his Treatise on the Theology of Plato. And between these two triads, the double triangle, the one intelligible and the other intellectual, another order of God exists, which partakes of both extremes. The Pythagorean world, according to Plutarch, consists of a double quaternary. The statement corroborates what is said about the choice by the exoteric theologies of the lower tetractus. For the quaternary of the intellectual world, the world of Mahat, is Tagathan, Nous, Psyche, Heil, while that of the sensible world of matter, which is properly what Pythagoras meant by the word cosmos, is fire, air, water, and earth. The four elements are called by the name rhizomata, the roots or principles of all mixed bodies. That is to say, the lower tetractus is the root of illusion of the world of matter. And this is the tetragrammaton of the Jews, and the mysterious deity over which the modern Kabbalists make such a fuss. This number four forms the arithmetical mean between the monad and the heptad, and this comprehends all powers, both of the productive and produced numbers. For this, of all numbers under ten, is made of a certain number. The dual double makes a tetrad, and the tetrad doubled, or unfolded, makes the hebdomad, the septenary. Two multiplied into itself produces four, and retorted into itself makes the first cube. The first cube is a fertile number, the ground of the multitude and variety, constituted of two and four, depending on the monad, the seventh. Thus the two principles of temporal things, the pyramids and the cube, form and matter, flow from one fountain, the tetragon, on earth, the monad, in heaven. Here. Ruchlin, the great authority on the Kabbalah, shows the cube to be matter, whereas the pyramid or the triad is form. With the Hermesians, the number four becomes the symbol of truth only when amplified into a cube, which unfolded makes seven, as symbolizing the male and female elements and the element of life. Some students have been puzzled to account for the vertical line, which is male becoming in the cross a four partitioned line, four being a female number while the horizontal, the line of matter, becomes three-divisioned. But this is easy of explanation, since the middle face of the cube unfolded is common to both the vertical and the horizontal bar, or double line, it becomes neutral ground, so to say, and belongs to neither. The spirit line remains triadic, and the matter line twofold, two being an even and therefore a female number also. Moreover, according to Theon in his Mathematica, the Pythagoreans, who gave the name of harmony to the Tetractus, because it is a diatessaron in Sequitertia, were of the opinion that the division of the canon of the monochord was made by the Tetractus in the duad, triad, and tetrad, for it comprehends a sesquertia, a sesquilatra, a duple, a triple, and a quadruple proportion, the section of which is 27. In the ancient musical notation, the tetrachord consisted of three degrees of intervals and four terms of sounds called by the Greeks diatessaron and by us a fourth. Moreover, the quaternary, though an even, therefore a female, internal number, varied according to its form. This is shown by Stanley. The four was called by the Pythagoreans the key keeper of nature, but in union with the three, which made it seven, it became the most perfect and harmonious number, nature herself. The four was the masculine of feminine form. When forming the cross, 
and seven is the master of the moon, for this planet is forced to alter her appearance every seven days. It's on a number seven that Pythagoras composed his doctrine on the harmony and music of the spheres, calling a tone the distance of the moon from the earth. From the moon to Mercury half a tone, and thence to Venus the same. From Venus to the sun one and a half tones, from the sun to Mars a tone, from thence to Jupiter half a tone, from Jupiter to Saturn half a tone, and thence to the zodiac a tone, thus making seven tones. The diapason harmony, all the melody of nature, is in those seven tones, and therefore is called the voice of nature. Plutarch explains that the most ancient Greeks regarded the tetrad as the root and principle of all things, since it was the number of the elements which gave birth to all visible and invisible created things. But the brothers of the rosy cross, the figure of the cross, or cube, unfolded, formed the subject of a disquisition in one of the theosophic degrees of Pouvray, and was treated according to the fundamental principles of light and darkness, or good and evil. The intelligible world proceeds out of the divine mind, or unit, after this manner, the tetractis reflecting upon its own essence, the first unit, productix of all things. And on its own beginning, saith thus, once one, twice two, immediately ariseth a tetrad, having on its top the highest unit, and becomes a pyramus, whose base is a plain tetrad, answerable to superficies upon which the radiant light of the divine unity produceth the form of incorporeal fire, by reason of the descent of Juno, matter, to inferior things. Hence ariseth essential light, not burning but illuminating. This is the creation of the middle world, which the Hebrews called the supreme, the world of their deity. It is termed Olympus entirely light, and replete with separate forms, which is the seat of the immortal gods, whose top is unity, its wall trinity, and its surpifices quaternity. The surpifices has thus to remain a meaningless surface, it left by itself, unity only illuminating quaternity. The famous lower four has to build for itself a wall from trinity, or it would be manifested. Moreover, the tetragrammaton, or microposopus, is Jehovah, arrogating to himself very improperly the was, is, will be now translated into the I am that I am, and interpreted as referring to the highest abstract deity. While esoterically and in plain truth, it means only periodically chaotic, turbulent, and eternal matter for all its potentialities. For the Tetragrammaton is one with nature, or Isis, and is the exoteric series of androgyne gods, such as Osiris Isis, Jove, Juno, Brahmavak, or the Kabbalistic Yahovah. All male females, every anthropomorphic god in old nations, as Marcellus Fisson well observed, has his name written with four letters. Thus, with the Egyptians, he was tent, the Arabs, Allah, the Persians, Sire, the Magi, Orsai, the Mamatons, Abdi, the Greeks, Teos, the ancient Turks, Esar, the Latins, Deus, to which John Lorenzo Anania adds the German god, the Sarmatian Bu, etc., the monad being one and an odd number, the ancients therefore said that the odd were the only perfect numbers, and selfishly perhaps, yet as a fact, considered them all as masculine and perfect, being applicable to the celestial gods, while even numbers, such as two, four, six, and especially eight, as being female, were regarded as imperfect, and given only to the terrestrial and infernal deities. Virgil records the fact by saying, Numero deus impar gode, the god is pleased with an odd number, but number seven, or the heptagon, the Pythagoreans considered to be a religious and perfect number. It was called teleforos, because by it all in the universe and mankind is led to its end, i.e. its culmination. The doctrine of the spheres ruled by the seven sacred planets shows from Lemuria to Pythagoras the seven powers of terrestrial and sublunary nature, as well as the seven great forces of the universe, proceeding and evolving in seven tones, which are the seven notes of the musical scale. The heptad, our septenary, was considered to be the number of a virgin, 
because it is unborn, like the Logos or the Aja of the Vedantins, without a father or a mother, but proceeding directly from the monad, which is the origin and crown of all things. And if the heptad is made to proceed from the monad directly, then it is, as taught in the secret doctrine of the oldest schools, the perfect and sacred number of this Mahamanvantara of ours. The septenary, or heptad, was sacred indeed to several gods and goddesses, to Mars, with his seven attendants, to Osiris, whose body was divided into seven and twice seven parts, to Apollo, the sun, amid his seven planets, and playing the hymn to the seven raid on his seven-stringed harp, to Minerva, the fatherless and the motherless, and others, cis-Himalayan occultism with its sevening, and because of such sevening, must be regarded as the most ancient, the original of all. It is opposed by some fragments left by Neoplatonists, and the admirers of the latter, who hardly understand what they defend, say to us, See, your forerunners believed only in triple man, composed of spirit, soul, and body. Behold, the Taraka Raja Yoga of India limits that division to three, we to four, and the Vedantins to five, koshas. To this we of the archaic school ask, Why then does the Greek poet say that it is not four but seven who sing the praise of the spiritual sun? Seven sounding letters sing the praise of me, the immortal God, the almighty deity. Why again is the triune Io, the mystery God, called the fourfold, and yet the triadic and tetradic symbols come under one unified name with the Christians, the Jehovah of the seven letters? Why again in the Hebrew Sheba is the oath, the Pythagorean tetractus, identical with the number seven? Or as Mr. Gerald Massey has it, taking an oath was synonymous with to seven and to ten expressed by the letter Yod was the full number of the Io Sabaoth the ten-lettered god. In Lucian's auction, Pythagoras asks, How do you reckon? The reply is, One, two, three, four. Then Pythagoras says, Do you see? In what you can see four, there are ten, a perfect triangle, and our oath, tetractus four, or seven in all. Why again does Proclus say, The father of the golden verses celebrates the tetractus as the fountain of perennial nature? simply because those Western Kabbalists who quote the exoteric proofs against us have no idea of the real esoteric meaning. All the ancient cosmologies, the oldest cosmographies of the two most ancient people of the fifth root race, the Hindu Aryans and the Egyptians, together with the early Chinese races, the remnants of the fourth or Atlantean race, based the whole of their mysteries on the number ten the higher triangle standing for the invisible and metaphysical world, the lower three and four, or the septinet, for the physical realm. It is not the Jewish Bible that brought number seven into prominence. Hesiod used the words, the seventh is the sacred day, before the Sabbath of Moses was ever heard of. The use of the number seven was never confined to any one nation. This is well testified by the seven vases in the Temple of the Sun near the ruins of Babian in Upper Egypt, the seven fires burning continually for ages before the altars of Mithra, the seven holy fanes of the Arabians, the seven peninsulas, the seven islands, seven seas, mountains, and rivers of India, and of the Zohar, the Jewish Sephiroth, of the seven splendors, the seven Gothic deities, the seven worlds of the Chaldeans and their seven spirits, the seven constellations mentioned by Hesiod and Homer, and all the interminable sevens, which the Orientalists find in every MS. They discover, what we have to say finally is this. Enough has been brought forward to show why the human principles were and are divided in the esoteric schools into seven. Make it four and it will either leave man, minus his lower terrestrial elements, or, if viewed from a physical standpoint, make of him a soulless animal. The quaternary must be the higher or the lower the celestial or terrestrial tetractus, to become comprehensible according to the teachings of the ancient esoteric school. Man must be regarded as a septenary. This was so well understood that even the so-called Christian Gnostics adopted this time-honored system. This remained for a long time a secret, for though it was suspected, no MSS of that time spoke of it clearly enough to satisfy the skeptic. 
But there comes to our rescue the literary curiosity of our age, the oldest and best preserved gospel of the Gnostics, Pistis Sophia. To make the proof absolutely complete, we shall quote from an authority, C.W. King, the only archaeologist who has a faint glimmer of this elaborate doctrine, and the best writer of the day on the Gnostics and their gems. According to the extraordinary piece of religious literature, a true Gnostic fossil, the human entity is the septenary ray from the One, just as our school teaches. It is composed of seven elements, four of which are borrowed from the four Kabbalistical manifested worlds. Thus, from Isaiah it gets the Nepesh, or seed of the physical appetites, vital breath also, from Yetzirah, the Ruach, or seat of the passions, from Briah, the Neshama, or reason, and from Azaloth, it obtains the Chaya, or principle of spiritual life. This looks like an adaptation of the Platonic theory of the souls obtaining its respective faculties from the planets in its downward progress through their spheres. But the Pistis Sophia, with its accustomed boldness, puts this theory into a much more poetical shape. 282. The inner man is similarly made up of four constituents, but these are supplied by the rebellious aeons of the spheres, being the power, a particle of the divine light, divine particular ori, yet left in themselves, the soul, the fifth, formed out of the tears of their eyes and the sweat of their torments. Counterfeit of the spirit, seemingly answering to our conscience, the sixth, and lastly, the fate, karmic ego, whose business it is to lead man to the end appointed for him. If he hath to die by the fire, to lead him into the fire. If he hath to die by a wild beast, to lead him unto the wild beast. The seventh. C. The septenary element in the Vedas. It corroborates the occult teaching concerning the seven globes and the seven races. We have to go to the very source of historical information, if we would bring our best evidence to testify to the facts enunciated. For though entirely allegorical, the Rig Vedic hymns are nonetheless suggestive. The seven rays of Surya, the sun, are therein made parallel to the seven worlds of every planetary chain, to the seven rivers of heaven and earth, the former being the seven creative hosts, and the latter the seven men, or primitive human groups. The seven ancient rishis, the progenitors of all that lives and breathes on the earth, are the seven friends of Agni, his seven horses, or seven heads. The human race has sprung from the fire and water. It is allegorically stated, fashioned by the fathers, or the ancestor sacrificers, from Agni. For Agni, the Ashvins, the Adityas, are all synonymous with those sacrificers, or the fathers, variously called Pitaras or Petris. Angirasas and Sadyas, divine sacrificers, the most occult of all. They are all called Divaputra, Rishaya, or the sons of God, the sacrificers. Moreover, are collectively the one sacrificer, the father of the gods, Vishvakarman, who performed the great Sarvamedic ceremony and ended by sacrificing himself. In these hymns, the heavenly man is called Purusha, the man from whom Viraj was born, and from Viraj, the mortal man. It is Varuna, lowered from his sublime position to be the chief of the lords, Yanis or Devas, who regulates all natural phenomena, who makes a path for the sun for him to follow. The seven rivers of the sky, the descending creative gods, and the seven rivers of the earth, the seven primitive mankinds are under his control, as will be seen. For he who breaks Varuna's laws, Vratani, or courses of natural action, act of laws, is punished by Indra, the Vedic powerful god, whose Vrata, or law, or power, is greater than the Vratani, or any other god. Thus the Rig Veda, the oldest of all the known ancient records, may be shown to corroborate the occult teachings in almost every respect. Its hymns, which are the records written by the earliest initiates of the fifth, our race concerning the primordial teachings, speak of the seven races, two still to come, allegorizing them by the seven streams and the five races, which have already inhabited the world, on the five regions, as also of the three continents that were. It is only those scholars who will master the secret meaning of the 
Purusha Sukta, in which the intuition of the modern Orientalist has chosen to see one of the very latest hymns of the Rig Veda, who may hope to understand how harmonious are its teachings and how corroborative of the esoteric doctrines. He must study, in all the abstruseness of their metaphysical meaning, the relations therein between the heavenly man, Purusha, sacrificed for the production of the universe and all in it, and the terrestrial mortal man, before he realizes the hidden philosophy of the verse. 15. He, man, Purusha, or Vishvakarman, had seven enclosing logs of fuel, and thrice seven layers of fuel. When the gods performed the sacrifice, they bound the man as victim. This relates to the three septenary primeval races, and shows the antiquity of the Vedas, which knew of no other sacrifice probably in these earliest oral teachings, and also to the seven primeval groups of mankind, as Vishvakarman represents divine humanity collectively. The same doctrine is found reflected in the other old religions. It may, it must, have come down to us disfigured and misrepresented, as in the case of the Parsis, who read it in their Vandadad and elsewhere. Though without understanding the illusions therein contained any better than do the Orientalists, yet the doctrine is plainly mentioned in their old works. Comparing the esoteric teaching with the interpretations by Professor James Darmesteeter, one may see at a glance where the mistake is made, and the cause that produced it. The passage runs thus, The Indo-Iranian Asura, Ahura, was often conceived as sevenfold, by the play of certain mythical formulae, and the strength of certain mythical numbers. The ancestors of the Indo-Iranians had been led to speak of seven worlds, and the supreme god was often made sevenfold, as well as the worlds over which he ruled. The seven worlds became in Persia the seven Kashvari of the earth. The earth is divided into seven Kashvari, only one of which is known and accessible to man, the one on which we live, namely Vaniratha, which amounts to saying that there are seven earths. Parsi mythology knows also of seven heavens. Vaniratha itself is divided into seven climes. The same division and doctrine is to be found in the oldest and most revered of the Hindu scriptures, the Rig Veda. Mention is made therein of six worlds, besides our earth, the six Rajamsi, above Prithivi, the earth, or this, Idam, is opposed to that which is yonder, i.e. the six globes on the three other planes or worlds. The italics are ours to point out the identity of the tenets with those of the esoteric doctrine, and to accelerate the mistake that is made. The Magi, or Mazdians, only believed in what other people believed in namely in the seven worlds, or globes of our planetary chain, of which only one is accessible to man at the present time, our earth. And in the successive appearance and destruction of seven continents, or earths on this our globe, each continent being divided in commemoration of the seven globes, one visible, six invisible, into seven islands or continents, seven climes, etc. This was a common belief in those days, when the now secret doctrine was open to all. It is this multiplicity of localities and septenary divisions which has made the Orientalists, who have, moreover, been further led astray by the oblivion of their primitive doctrines of both the uninitiated Hindus and Parsis, feel so puzzled by this ever-reoccurring sevenfold number as to regard it as mythical. It is this oblivion of first principles which has led the Orientalists off the right track and made them commit the greatest blunders. The same failure is found in the definition of the gods. Those who are ignorant of the esoteric doctrine of the earliest Aryans can never assimilate or even understand correctly the metaphysical meaning contained in these beings. Ahura Mazda, or Mazd, was the head and synthesis of the seven Amishaspentas, or Amsha spawns, and therefore an Amisha spent to himself. Just as Jehovah Bina Elohim was the head and synthesis of the Elohim and no more, so Agni Vishnu Surya was the synthesis and head, or the focus whence emanated in physics and also in metaphysics, from the spiritual as well as from the physical sun, the seven rays, the seven fiery tongues, the seven planets or gods. All these became supreme gods and the one God, but only after the loss of the primeval secrets, 
i.e. the sinking of Atlantis or the flood, and the occupation of India by the Brahmins, who sought safety on the summits of the Himalayas. For even the high tablelands of what is now Tibet became submerged for a time. Ahura Mazda is addressed only as the most blissful spirit, creator of the corporeal world. In the Vendadad, Ahura Mazda, in its literal translation, means the wise lord. Ahura, lord, and Mazda, wise. Moreover, this name of Ahura, in Sanskrit Asura, connects him with the Manas Putras, the sons of wisdom who informed the mindless man and endowed him with his mind, Manas. Ahura, Asura, may be derived from the root, Ah, to be, but in its primal signification, it is what the secret teachings shows it to be. When geology shall have found out how many thousands of years ago the disturbed waters of the Indian Ocean reached the highest plateau of Central Asia, when the Caspian Sea and the Persian Gulf made one with it, then only will they know the age of the existing Aryan Brahmanical nation, and also the time of its descent into the plains of Hindustan, which did not take place till millenniums later. Yima, the so-called first man in the Vendadad, as much as his twin brother Yama, the son of Vevasvata Manu, belongs to two epochs of universal history. He is the progenitor of the second human race, hence the personification of the shadows of the Petris, and the father of the post-Diluvian humanity. The Magi said Yima, as we say Man, when speaking of mankind. The fair Yima, the first mortal who converses with Ahura Mazda, is the first man who dies or disappears, not the first who is born. The son of Vivagat was like the son of Vevasvata, the symbolical man, who stood in esotericism as the representative of the first three races, and the collective progenitor thereof. Of these races, the first two never died but only vanished, absorbed in their progeny, and the third knew death only towards its close, after the separation of the sexes and its fall into generation. This is plainly alluded to in the Fargard, two of the Vendadad. Yima refuses to become the bearer of the law of Ahura Mazda, saying, I was not born, I was not taught to be the preacher and the bearer of thy law. And then Ahura Mazda asks him to make his men increase and watch over his world. He refuses to become the priest of Ahura Mazda, because he is his own priest and sacrificer. But he accepts the second proposal. He is made to answer, Yes, yes, I will nourish and rule and watch over thy world. There shall be, while I am king, neither cold wind nor hot wind, neither disease nor death. Then Ahura Mazda brings him a golden ring and a poignard, the emblems of sovereignty. Thus, under the sway of Yima, three hundred winters passed away, and the earth was replenished with fox and herds, with men and dogs and birds, and with red blazing fires. Three hundred winters mean three hundred periods or cycles. Replenished, mark well, that is to say, all this has been on it before, and thus is proven the knowledge of the doctrine about the successive destructions of the world and its life cycles. Once the three hundred winters were over, Ahura Mazda warns Yima that the earth is becoming too full, and men have nowhere to live. Then Yima steps forward, and with the help of Spenta Armeta, the female genius, or spirit of the earth, makes that earth stretch out and become larger by one-third, after which new flocks and herds and men appear on it. Ahura Mazda warns him again, and Yima makes the earth by the same magic power to become larger by two-thirds. Nine hundred winters pass away, and Yima has to perform the ceremony for a third time. The whole of this is allegorical. These three processes of stretching the earth refer to the three successive continents and races issuing one after and from the other, as explained more fully elsewhere. After the third time, Ahura Mazda warns Yima, in an assembly of celestial gods and excellent mortals, that upon the material world the fatal winters are going to fall, and all life will perish. This is the old Mazdean symbolism for the flood, and the coming cataclysm to Atlantis which sweeps away every race in its turn. Like Vevasvata Manu and Noah, Yima makes Avara, an enclosure, an ark, under the gods' direction, and brings thither the seed of every living creature, animals, and fires. It is of this earth, 
or a new continent that Zarathustra became the lawgiver and ruler. This was the fourth race in its beginning, after the men of the third began to die out. Till then, as said above, there had been no regular death, but only a transformation, for men had no personality as yet. They had monads, breaths of one breath, and impersonal as the source from which they proceeded. They had bodies, or rather shadows of bodies, which were sinless, hence karmaless. Therefore, as there were no kamaloka, least of all nirvana, or even devachan, for the souls of men who had no personal egos, there could be no intermediate periods between the incarnations. Like the phoenix, primordial man resurrected out of his old into a new body. Each time and with each new generation, he became more solid, more physically perfect, agreeably with the evolutionary law, which is the law of nature. Death came with the complete physical organism, and with it moral decay. This explanation shows one more old religion agreeing in its symbology with the universal doctrine. Elsewhere, the oldest Persian traditions, the relics of Mazdaism of the still older Magians, are given, and some of them are explained. Mankind did not issue from one solitary couple, nor was there ever a first man, whether Adam or Yima, but a first mankind. It may or may not be mitigated polygenism. Once that both creation ex nihilo, an absurdity, and a superhuman creator or creators, a fact, are made away with by science, Polygenism presents no more difficulties or inconveniences, rather fewer from a scientific point of view than monogenism does. In fact, it is as scientific as any other claim, for in his introduction to Knott and Glidden's Types of Mankind, Agassiz declares his belief in an indefinite number of primordial races of men created separately, and remarks that whilst in every zoological province animals are of a different species, Man, in spite of the diversity of his races, always forms one and the same human being. Occultism defines and limits the number of primordial races to seven, because of the seven progenitors, or prajapatis, the evolvers of beings. These are neither gods nor supernatural beings, but advanced spirits from one lower and another planet, reborn on this planet, and giving birth in their turn in the present round to present humanity. This doctrine is again corroborated by one of its echoes, among the Gnostics. In their anthropology and genesis of man, they taught that a certain company of seven angels formed the first men, who were no better than senseless, gigantic, shadowy forms, as mere wriggling, worm, writes Arrhenius, who takes as usual the metaphor for reality. D. The Septenary in the Exoteric Works we may now examine other ancient scriptures and see whether they contain the septenary classification, and if so, to what degree. Scattered about in thousands of other Sanskrit texts, some still unopened, others yet unknown, as well as in all the Puranas, as much as, if not much more than, even in the Jewish Bible, the numbers 7 and 49, 7 times 7, play a most prominent role. In the Puranas they are found from the seven creations, in the first chapters down to the seven rays of the sun in the final Perlea, which expand into the seven suns and absorb the material of the whole universe. Thus the Matsya Purana has, for the sake of promulgating the Vedas, Vishnu in the beginning of Akalpa, related to Manu the story of Narishma and the events of the seven Kalpas. Then again in the same Purana shows that in all the Manvantaras, classes of rishis appear by seven and seven, and having established a code of law and morality, depart to felicity. The rishis, however, represent many other things besides living sages. In Dr. Muir's translation of the Artharva Veda, we read, 1. Time carries us forward, a steed with seven rays, a thousand eyes, undecaying, full of fecundity. On him intelligent sages mount. His wheels are all the world's. 2. Thus time moves on seven wheels. He has seven knaves. Immortality is his axle. He is at present all these worlds. Time hastens toward the first god. 3. A full jar is contained in time. We behold him existing in many forms. He is all these worlds in the future. 
They call him time in the highest heaven. Now add to this the following verse from the esoteric volumes. Space and time are one. Space and time are nameless. For they are the incognizable that, which can be sensed only through its seven rays, which are the seven creations, the seven worlds, the seven laws, etc. Remembering that the Puranas insist on the identity of Vishnu with time and space, and even that the rabbinical symbol for God is Makom, space, it becomes clear why, for purpose of a manifesting deity, space, matter, and spirit, the one central point became the triangle in the quaternary, the perfect cube, hence seven. Even the Pravana wind, the mystic and occult force that gives the impulse to and regulates the course of the stars and planets, is septenary. The Kerma and the Linga Puranas enumerate seven principal winds of that name. Which winds are the principles of cosmic space? They are the intimately connected with Durva, now Alpha, the pole star, which is connected in its turn with the production of various phenomena through cosmic forces. Thus, from the seven creations, seven rishis, zones, continents, principles, etc., in the Aryan scriptures, the number has passed through Indian, Egyptian, Chaldean, Greek, Jewish, Roman, and finally Christian mystic thought, until it landed in and remained indelibly impressed on every esoteric theology. The seven old books stolen out of Noah's Ark by Ham and given to Cush, his son, and the seven brazen columns of Ham and Chiron are a reflection and a remembrance of the seven primordial mysteries instituted according to the seven secret emanations the seven sounds and seven rays, the spiritual and sidereal models of the seven thousand times seven copies of them in later eons. The mysterious number is once more prominent in the no less mysterious Maruts. The Vayu Purana shows, and the Harivamsha corroborates, concerning the Maruts, the oldest as the most incomprehensible of all the secondary or lower gods in the Rig Veda that they are born in every manvantara, round, seven times seven, or forty-nine, that in each manvantara, four times seven, or twenty-eight, obtain emancipation, but their places are filled up by persons reborn in that character. What are the Maruts in their esoteric meaning, and who those persons reborn in that character? In the Rik and other Vedas, the Maruts are represented as the storm gods and the friends and allies of Indra. They are the sons of heaven and earth. This led to an allegory that makes them the children of Shiva, that great patron of the yogis. The Mahayogi, the great ascetic, in whom is centered the highest perfection of austere penance and abstract meditation, by which the most unlimited powers are attained. Marvels and miracles are worked, the highest spiritual knowledge is acquired, and union with the great spirit of the universe is eventually gained. In the Rig Veda, the name Shiva is unknown. But this corresponding god is called Rudra, a name used for Agni, the fire god, the Maruts being called therein his sons. In the Ramayana and the Puranas, their mother, Diti, the sister or complement, and a form of Aditi, anxious to obtain a son who would destroy Indra, is told by Kashyapa, the sage, if, with the thoughts wholly pious and persons entirely pure, she carries her babe in her womb. For a hundred years, she will have such a son. But Indra foils her in the design. With his thunderbolt, he divides the embryo in her womb into seven portions, and then divides every such portion into seven pieces again, which become the swift-moving deities, the Maruts. These deities are only another aspect, or a development of the Kumaras, who are patronomically Rudras like many others. Diti being Aditi, unless the contrary is proven to us. Aditi, we say, or Akasha in her highest form, is the Egyptian sevenfold heaven. Every true occultist will understand what this means. Diti, we repeat, is the sixth principle of metaphysical nature, the Budai of Akasha. Diti, the mother of the Meruts, is one of her terrestrial forms, made to represent at one and the same time the divine soul in the ascetic and the divine aspirations of mystic humanity toward deliverance from the webs of Maya, and consequent final bliss. Indra is now degraded because of the Kali Yuga, when such aspirations are no more general, but have become abnormal through a general spread of ahamkara, the feeling of egotism, or I amness, and ignorance, 
but in the beginning Indra was one of the greatest gods of the Hindu pantheon, as the Rig Veda shows. Suradipa, the chief of the gods, has fallen down from Jishnu, the leader of the celestial host. The Hindu, St. Michael, to an opponent of aestheticism, the enemy of every holy aspiration, he is shown married to Indri, Indrani, the personification of Indriyaka, the evolution of the element of senses, whom he married because of her voluptuous attractions after which he began sending celestial female demons to excite the passions of holy men, yogis, and to beguile them from the potent penances which he dreaded. Therefore, Indra, now characterized as the god of the firmament, the personified atmosphere, is in reality the cosmic principle Mahat, and the fifth human principle, Manas, in its dual aspect, as connected with the Bodhi, and as allowing itself to be dragged down by the Kama principle, the body of passions and desires. This is demonstrated by Brahma, telling the conquered god that his frequent defeats were due to karma, and were a punishment for his licentiousness and the seduction of various nymphs. It is in the latter character that he seeks, to save himself from destruction, to destroy the coming babe destined to conquer him, the babe, of course, allegorizing the divine and steady will of the yogi, determined to resist all such temptations and thus destroy the passions within his earthly personality. Indra succeeds again because flesh conquers spirit. He divides the embryo of the new divine adeptship, begotten once more by the ascetics of the Aryan fifth race, into seven portions a reference not alone to the seven sub-races of the new root race, in each of which there will be a Manu, but also to the seven degrees of adeptship. And then each portion will be seven pieces, alluding to the Manu rishis of each root race, and even sub-race. It does not seem difficult to perceive what is meant by the Maruts obtaining four times seven, emancipations in every Mamantara, and by those persons who are reborn in that character, viz. of the Maruts in their esoteric meaning, and who fill up their places. The Maruts represent a. the passions that storm and rage within every candidate's breast, when preparing for an aesthetic life, this mystically, b. the occult potencies concealed in the manifold aspects of Akasha's lower principles, her body, or stula sharira, representing the terrestrial lower atmosphere of every inhabited globe. This mystically and sidereally. C. Actual conscious existences, beings of a cosmic and psychic nature. At the same time, Marut in occult parlance is one of the names given to those egos of great adepts who have passed away, and are also known as Nirmanakayas, of those egos for whom, since they are beyond illusion, there is no Devachan, who, having either voluntarily renounced Nirvana for the good of mankind, or who not yet having reached it, remain invisible on earth. Therefore are the Maruts shown firstly as the sons of Shiva Rudra, the patron yogi, whose third eye, mystically, must be acquired by the ascetic before he becomes an adept, then in their cosmic character, as the subordinates of Indra and his opponents under various characters. The four times seven emancipations have reference to the four rounds and the four races that preceded ours, in each of which the Maruta Jivas, monads, have been reborn and would have obtained final liberation, if only they had chosen to avail themselves of it. But instead of this, out of love for the good of mankind, which would struggle still more hopelessly in the meshes of ignorance and misery, were it not for this extraneous help, they are reborn over and over again in that chapter, and thus fill up their own places. Who they are, on earth, every student of occult science knows. And he also knows that the Marutsarudras, among whom also the family of Vashtri, a synonym for Vishvakarman, the great patron of the initiates, is included. This gives us an ample knowledge of their true nature. The same for the septenary division of cosmos and the human principles. The Puranas, along with the other sacred texts, teem with allusions to this. First of all, the mundane egg, which contained Brahma, or the universe, was externally invested with seven natural elements, at first loosely enumerated as water, air, fire, ether, and three secret elements, 
Then the world is said to be encompassed on every side by seven elements, also within the egg, as explained. The world is encompassed on every side, and above, and below, by the shell of the egg, of Brahma, and a Kathata. Around the shell flows water, which is surrounded with fire. Fire by air, air by ether, ether by the origin of the elements, Ahamkara. The latter by universal mind, or intellect, as Wilson translates. It relates to spheres of being as much as to principles. Prativi is not our earth, but the world, the solar system, and means the broad, the wide. In the Vedas, the greatest of all authorities, though needing a key to be read correctly, three terrestrial and three celestial earths are mentioned as having been called into existence simultaneously with Bhumi, our earth. We have been often told that six, not seven, appears to be the number of spheres, principles, etc. We answer that there are in fact only six principles in man, since his body is no principle, but the covering, the shell of a principle. So with the planetary chain, therein, speaking esoterically, the earth, as well as the seventh, or rather fourth plane, one that stands as the seventh, then we count from the first triple kingdom of the elementals that begin its formation may be left out of consideration, being, to us, the only distinct body of the seven. The language of occultism is varied, but supposing that three earths only, instead of seven, are meant in the Vedas, what are those three, since we still know of but one? Evidently, there must be an occult meaning in the statement under consideration. Let us see. The earth that floats on the universal ocean of space, which Brahma divides in the Puranas into seven zones, is Prativi, the world divided into seven principles, a cosmic division, looking metaphysical enough, but in reality physical in its occult effects. Many Kalpas later, our earth is mentioned, and again, in its turn, is divided into seven zones, according to the law of analogy, which guided ancient philosophers, after which we find on it seven continents, seven isles, seven oceans, seven seas and rivers, seven mountains, seven climates, etc. Furthermore, it is not only in the Hindu scriptures and philosophy that one finds references to the seven earths, but in the Persian, Phoenician, Chaldean, and Egyptian cosmogonies, and even in the rabbinical literature. The phoenix, called by the Hebrews Onek, from Fenok, Enoch, the symbol of a secret cycle and initiation, and by the Turks, Kirkis, lives a thousand years, after which kindling a flame, it is self-consumed and then reborn from itself, it lives another thousand years, up to seven times seven. When comes the day of judgment? The seven times seven, or forty-nine, are a transparent allegory, and an allusion to the forty-nine manus, the seven rounds, and the seven times seven human cycles in each round on each globe. The Kirkis and the Onek stand for a race cycle, and the mystical tree Ababel, the father tree, in the Quran, shoots out new branches and vegetation at every resurrection of the Kirkis or Phoenix, the Day of Judgment, meaning a minor pralaya. The author of the Book of God in the Apocalypse believes that the Phoenix is very plainly the same as the Simorg of Persian romance, and the account which is given us of this last bird yet more decisively establishes the opinion that the death and revival of the Phoenix exhibit the successive destruction and reproduction of the world which many believe to be affected by the agency of a fiery deluge, and also a watery one in its turn. When the Semorg was asked her age, she informed Kaharman that this world is very ancient, for it has been already seven times replenished, with beings different from men, and seven times depopulated, that the age of the human race in which we now are is to endure seven thousand years, and that she herself had seen twelve of these revolutions and knew not how many more she had to see. The above, however, is no new statement, from Bailey in the last century down to Dr. Keneally in the present. These facts have been noticed by a number of writers, but now a connection can be established between the Persian oracle and the Nazarene prophet, says the author of the Book of God. The Simorg is in reality the same as the winged Sing of the Hindus, and the Sphinx of the Egyptians. It is said that the former will appear at the end of the world, as a monstrous lion-bird. From these the rabbins have borrowed their mythos 
of an enormous bird, sometimes standing on the earth, sometimes walking in the ocean, while its head props the sky, and with the symbol they have also adopted the doctrine to which it relates. They teach that there are to be seven successive renewals of the globe, that each reproduced system will last 7,000 years, and that the total duration of the universe will be 49,000 years. This opinion, which involves the doctrine of the pre-existence of each renewed creature, they may either have learned during the Babylonian captivity, or it may have been part of the primeval religion, which their priests had preserved from remote times. It shows rather that the initiated Jews borrowed, and their non-initiated successors, the Talmudists, lost the sense and applied the seven rounds and the forty-nine races, etc., wrongly. Not only their priests, but those of every other country, the Gnostics, whose various teachings are the many echoes of the one primitive and universal doctrine, put the same numbers under another form in the mouth of Jesus in the very occult Pisti Sophia. We say more. Even the Christian editor or author of Revelation has preserved this tradition and speaks of the seven races, four of which, with part of the fifth, are gone, and two have to come. It is stated as plainly as can be. Thus saith the angel. And here is the mind with hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains, on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. Who, in the least acquainted with the symbolical language of old, will fail to discern in the five kings that have fallen, the four root races that were, and part of the fifth, the one that is, and in the other, that is not yet to come, the sixth and seventh coming root races, as also the sub-races of this, our present race. Another still more forcible allusion to the seven rounds in the forty-nine root races in Leviticus will be found elsewhere, part three. E. 7. In Astronomy, Science, and Magic Again, number 7 is closely connected with the occult significance of the Pleiades, those seven daughters of Atlas, the six present, the seventh hidden. In India, they are connected with their nursling, the war god, Kartikeya. It was the Pleiades, in Sanskrit, Kritikas, who gave this name to the god, Kartikeya being the planet Mars astronomically. As a god, he is the son of Rudra, born without the intervention of a woman. He is a Kumara, a virgin youth, again, generated in the fire from the seed of Shiva, the Holy Spirit, hence called Agnibu. The late Dr. Keneally believed that, in India, Kartikeya is the secret symbol of the cycle of the Naros, composed of 600, 666, and 777 years, according to whether solar or lunar divine or mortal, years are counted. And that the six visible, or the seven actual sisters, the Pleiades, are needed for the completion of this most secret and mysterious of all the astronomical and religious symbols. Therefore, when intended to commemorate one particular event, Kartikeya was shown, of old, as a Kumara, an ascetic, with six heads, one for each century of the Naros. When the symbolism was needed for another event, then, in conjunction with the seven sidereal sisters, Kartikeya is seen accompanied by Kumari, or Sina, his female aspect. He is then riding on a peacock, the bird of wisdom and occult knowledge, and the Hindu phoenix, whose Greek relation with the six hundred years of the Naros is well known. A six-rayed star, double triangle, a svastika, the six and occasionally seven-pointed crown is on his brow. The peacock's tail represents the sidereal heavens, and the twelve signs of the zodiac are hidden on his body, for which he is also called Vadashakara, the twelve-handed, and Varakshasha, twelve-eyed. It is as Shaktidara, however, the spearholder and the conqueror of Taraka, Tarakajit, that he is shown to be the most famous. As the years of the Narosar in India counted in two ways, either by 100 years of the gods, divine years, or 100 mortal years, we can see the tremendous difficulty the non-initiated have in arriving at a correct comprehension of the cycle, which plays such an important part in St. John's Revelation. It is the truly apocalyptic cycle, because of its being of various lengths and relating to various prehistoric events, 
and in none of the numerous speculations about it we have found any but a few approximate truths. Against the duration claimed by the Babylonians for the divine ages, it has been urged that Suidas shows the ancients counting days for years in their chronological computations. It is to Suidas and his authority that Dr. Sepp appeals in his ingenious plagiarism, which we have already exposed, of the Hindu figures 432. These they give in thousands and millions of years, the duration of their yugas, but Sep dwarfed them to 4,320 lunar years before the birth of Christ, as foredained in the sidereal in addition to the invisible heavens and proved by the apparition of the star Bethlehem. But Suidas had no other warrant for this assertion than his own speculations, and he was not an initiate. He cites as a proof Vulcan and shows him reigning 4477 years or 4477 days, as he thinks, or again rendered in years, 12 years, 3 months, and 7 days. He has, however, 5 days in his original, thus committing an error even in such an easy calculation. True, there are other ancient writers guilty of like fallacious speculations. Callisthenes, for instance, who assigns to the astronomical observations of the Chaldeans only 1903 years, whereas Epigenes recognizes 720,000 years. The whole of these hypotheses made by profane writers are due to a misunderstanding. The chronology of the Western peoples, ancient Greeks and Romans, was borrowed from India. Now it is said in the Tamil edition of Bhagavadam that 15 solar days make a pacham. Two pachams, or 30 days, make a month of mortals, which is only one day of the Pitara Devata. Or Petris. Again, two of these months constitute a Rudu. Three Rudus make an Ayanam, and two Ayanams a year of mortals, which is only a day of the gods. It is from such misunderstood teachings that some Greeks have imagined that all the initiated priests had transformed days into years. This mistake of the ancient Greek and Latin writers became pregnant with results in Europe. At the close of the past and the beginning of the present century, Bailey, Dupuy, and others, relying upon the purposely mutilated accounts of Hindu chronology, brought from India by certain unscrupulous and too zealous missionaries, built quite a fantastic theory on the subject. Because the Hindus had made a half a revolution of the moon a measure of time, and because a month composed of only 15 days, of which Quintus Curtius speaks, is found mentioned in Hindu literature. Therefore, it becomes a verified fact that their year was only half a year, when it was not called a day. The Chinese also divided their zodiac into 24 parts, and hence their year into 24 fortnights. But such computation did not, nor does it, prevent them from having an astronomical year just the same as ours. They also have a period of 60 days, the southern Indian Rudu, to this day in some provinces. Moreover, Diodorus Siculus calls 30 days an Egyptian year, or that period during which the moon performs a complete revolution. Pliny and Plutarch both speak of it. But does it stand to reason that the Egyptians, who knew astronomy as well as any other nations, made the lunar month consist of 30 days, when it is only 28 days with fractions? This lunar period had an occult meaning, surely as well as had also the Ayanam, and the Rudu of the Hindus, the year of two months' duration, and the period of sixty days also, was a universal measure of time in antiquity, as Bailey himself shows in Trait de l'Astronomie Indienne et Orientale. The Chinamen, according to their own books, divided their year into two parts, from one equinox to the other. The Arabs anciently divided the year into six seasons, each composed of two months. In the Chinese astronomical work called Kiwich, it is said that the two moons make a measure of time, and six measures a year, and to this day the Aborigines of Kamshatka have their years of six months, as they had when visited by Abbey Chap. But it is all this any reason for claiming that when the Hindu Puranas say a solar year, they mean one solar day? It was the knowledge of the natural laws which make of seven the root nature number, 
so to say, in the manifested world, or at any rate in our present terrestrial life cycle, and the wonderful comprehension of its workings, that unveiled to the ancients so many of the mysteries of nature. It is these laws again, and their processes on the sidereal, terrestrial, and moral planes which enabled the old astronomers to calculate correctly the duration of the cycles, and their respective effects on the march of events. To record beforehand, to prophecy, it is called, the influence which they would have on the course and development of the human races. The sun, the moon, and planets being the never-erring time measurers, whose potency and periodicity were well known, became thus respectively the great ruler and rulers of our little system in all its seven domains, or spheres of action. This has been so evident and remarkable that even many of the modern men of science, materialists as well as mystics, have had their attention called to this law. Physicians and theologians, mathematicians and psychologists, have repeatedly drawn the attention of the world to this fact of periodicity in the behavior of nature. These numbers are explained in the commentaries in the following words. The circle is not the one, but the all. In the higher heaven, the impenetrable Raja, it, the circle, becomes one, because it is the indivisible, and there can be no Tao in it. In the second, of the three Rajamsi, or the three worlds, the one becomes two, male and female, and three, with the sun, or logos, and the sacred four, the tetractis, or tetragrammaton. In the third, the lower world, or our earth, the numbers become four, and three, and two. Take the first two, and thou wilt obtain seven, the sacred number of life. Blend the latter with the middle Raja, and thou wilt have nine, the sacred number of being and becoming. When the Western occultists have mastered the real meaning of the Rig Vedic divisions of the world, the twofold, the threefold, six and sevenfold, and especially ninefold division, the mystery of the cyclic divisions applied to heaven and earth, gods and men, will become clearer to them than it is now. For there is a harmony of numbers in all nature, in the force of gravity, in the planetary movements, in the laws of heat, light, electricity, and chemical affinity, in the forms of animals and plants, in the perceptions of the mind. The direction, indeed, of modern, natural, and physical science is towards a generalization which shall express the fundamental laws of all, by one simple numerical ratio. We would refer to Professor Wellwell's philosophy of the inductive sciences, and to Mr. Hayes' researches into the laws of harmonious coloring and form. From these, it appears that the number seven is distinguished in the laws regulating the harmonious perception of forms, colors, and sounds, and probably of taste also, if we could analyze our sensations of this kind with mathematical accuracy. So much so, indeed, that more than one physician has stood aghast at the septenary periodical return of the cycles, and the rise and fall of various complaints, and naturalists have felt themselves at an utter loss to explain this law. The birth, growth, maturity, vital functions, healthy revolutions of change, diseases, decay and death of insects, reptiles, fishes, birds, mammals, and even of man, are more or less controlled by a law of completion in weeks, or seven days. By Laycock, writing on the periodicity of vital phenomena, records a most remarkable illustration and confirmation of the law in insects, to all of which Mr. Gratton Guinness remarks very pertinently as he defends biblical chronology, and man's life is a week, a week of decades. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. Combining the testimony for all these facts, we are bound to admit that there prevails in organic nature a law of septiform periodicity, a law of completion in weeks. Without accepting the conclusions, and especially the premises of the learned founder of the East London Institute for Home and Foreign Missions, the writer accepts and welcomes his researches in the occult chronology of the Bible, just as while rejecting the theories, hypotheses, and generalizations of modern science, we bow before its great achievements in the world of the physical, or in all the minor details of material nature. There is most assuredly an occult, chronological system in Hebrew scripture, the Kabbalah being its warrant. Moreover, there is in it a system of weeks, based on the archaic Indian system, which may still be found in the old Yotisha, 
and there are in it cycles of the week of days, of the week of months, of years, of centuries, and even of millenniums, and more of the week of the years of years. But all of this can be found in the archaic doctrine. And if the common source of the chronology in every scripture, however veiled, is denied in the case of the Bible, then it will have to be shown how, in the face of the six days and the seventh, the Sabbath, we can escape connecting the genetic with the Puranic cosmogenies. For the first week of creation shows the septiformity of its chronology and thus connects it with Brahma's seven creations. The able volume from the pen of Mr. Graton Guinness, in which he has collected in some 760 pages, every proof of this septiform calculation is good evidence. For if the biblical chronology is, as he says, regulated by the law of weeks, and if it is septenary, whatever the measures of the creation week and the length of its days may be, and if, finally, the Bible system includes weeks on a great variety of scales, then this system is shown to be identical with all the pagan systems. Moreover, the attempt to show that 4320 years and lunar months elapsed between the creation and the nativity. It is a clear and unmistakable connection with the 4,320,000 years of the Hindu yugas. Otherwise, why make such efforts to prove that these figures, which are preeminently Chaldean and Indo-Aryan, play such a part in the New Testament? This we shall now prove still more forcibly. Let the impartial critic compare the two accounts, the Vishnu Purana and the Bible, and he will find that the seven creations of Brahma are at the foundation of the week of creation in Genesis. The two allegories are different, but the systems are both built on the same foundation stone. The Bible can be understood only by the light of the Kabbalah. Take the Zohar, the book of concealed mystery, however now disfigured, and compare. The seven rishis and the fourteen manus of the seven manvantaras issue for Brahma's head. They are his mind-born sons, and it is with them that begins the division of mankind into its races from the heavenly man, the manifested Logos, who is Brahma Prajapati. Speaking of the skull, head of Macroposophus, the ancient one, in Sanskrit Sanat is an appellation of Brahma, the Ha Idra Rabba Kadisha, or the greatest holy assembly, says that in every one of his hairs is a hidden fountain issuing from the concealed brain, and it shineth and goeth forth through that hair into the hair of the Microposophus, and from it, which is the manifest quaternary, the tetragrammaton, in his brain formed, and thence the brain goeth forth into thirty and two paths, or the triad and duad, or again four three two. And again, thirteen curls of hair exist on the side and one side of the other the skull, i.e. six on one and six on the other, the thirteenth being also the fourteenth, as it is male-female. And through them commenceth the division of the hair, the division of things, of mankind and the races. We six are lights which shine forth from a seventh light, saith Rabbi Abba. Thou art the seventh light, the synthesis of all of us. He adds, speaking of Tetragrammaton and his seven companions, whom he calls the eyes of Tetragrammaton. Tetragrammaton is Brahma Prajapati, who assumed four forms, in order to create four kinds of supernal creatures, i.e. made himself fourfold, or the manifest quaternary, after that, he is reborn in the seven rishis, his Manasaputras, mind-born sons, who became later nine, twenty-one, and so on, and who are all said to be born from various parts of Brahma. There are two tetragrammatons, the Macroposophus and the Microposophus. The first is the absolute perfect square, or the tetractus within the circle, both abstract conceptions, and is therefore called Ein. Non-being, i.e. illimitable or absolute, Venus. But when viewed as Microprosopus, or the heavenly man, the manifested Logos, he is the triangle in the square, the sevenfold cube, not the fourfold or the plain square, for it is written in the greater holy assembly. And concerning this, the children of Israel wished to inquire in their hearts, know in their minds, like as it is written, Exodus, XVII, 7, is the tetragrammaton in the midst of us, or the negatively existent one. Were they distinguished between Microposopus, who is called tetragrammaton, and between Macroposopus, who is called Ein, the negatively existent? Therefore, 
Tetragrammaton is the three made four and the four made three, and is represented on this earth by his seven companions, or eyes, the seven eyes of the Lord. Microprosopus is at best only a secondary manifested deity. For the greater holy assembly elsewhere says, We have learned that there were ten rabbis, companions, entered into the assembly, the sod, mysterious assembly or mystery, and that seven came forth, i.e. ten for the unmanifested, seven for the manifested universe. 1158. And when Rabbi Skimion revealed the arcana, there were found none present save those seven companions. And Rabbi Skimion called them the seven eyes of Tetragrammaton, like as it is written, Zach 3, 9. These are the seven eyes, or principles of Tetragrammaton, i.e. the fourfold heavenly man, or pure spirit, is resolved into septenary man, pure matter and spirit. Thus the tetrad is microprosopus, and the latter is the male-female chakmabina, the second and third sephiroth. The Tetragrammaton is the very essence of number seven, in its terrestrial significance. Seven stands between four and nine, the basis and foundation, astrally, of our physical world and man in the kingdom of Malkuth. For Christians and believers, this reference to Zechariah, and especially to the epistle of Peter, ought to be conclusive. In the old symbolism, man, chiefly the inner spiritual man, is called a stone. Christ is the cornerstone, and Peter refers to all men as lively, living stones. Therefore, a stone with seven eyes on it can only mean a man whose constitution, i.e. his principles, is septenary. To demonstrate more clearly the seven in nature, it may be added that not only does the number seven govern the periodicity of the phenomena of life, but that it is also found dominating the series of chemical elements, and equally paramount in the world of sound and in that of color as revealed to us by the spectroscope. This number is the factor, sin qua non, in the production of occult astral phenomena. Thus, if the chemical elements are arranged in groups according to their atomic weights, they will be found to constitute a series of rows of seven, the first, second, etc., members of each row bearing a close analogy and all their properties to the corresponding members of the next row. The following table, copied from Hellenbach's Magie der Zalen and corrected, exhibits this law and fully warrants the conclusion he draws in the following words. We thus see that The chemical variety, so far as we can grasp its inner nature, depends upon numerical relations, and we have further found in this variety a ruling law for which we can assign no cause. We find a law of periodicity governed by the number seven. The eighth element in this list, as it were, the octave of the first, and the ninth of the second, and so on, each element being almost identical in its properties with the corresponding element in each of the septenary rows. A phenomena which accentuates the septenary law of periodicity. For further details, the reader is referred to Hellenbach's work, where it is also shown that this classification is confirmed by the spectroscopic peculiarities of the elements. It is needless to refer in detail to the number of vibrations constituting the notes of the musical scale. They are strictly analogous to the scale of chemical elements and also to the scale of color, as unfolded by the spectroscope. Although in the latter case, we deal with only one octave, while both in music and chemistry we find series of seven octaves represented theoretically, of which six are fairly complete and in ordinary use in both sciences. Thus, to quote Hellenbach, it has been established that, from the standpoint of phenomenal law, upon which all our knowledge rests, the vibrations of sound and light increase regularly, that they divide themselves into seven columns and that the successive numbers in each column are closely allied, i.e., that they exhibit a close relationship which not only is expressed in the figures themselves, but also is practically confirmed in the chemistry as in music, in the latter of which the ear confirms the verdict of the figures. The fact that this periodicity and variety is governed by the number seven is undeniable, and it far surpasses the limits of mere chance, and must be assumed to have an adequate cause which cause must be discovered. Verily, then, as Rabbi Abba said, we are six lights which shine forth from a seventh light. Thou, Tetragrammaton, art the seventh light, the origin of us all. 
For assuredly there is no stability in those six, save what they derive from the seventh. For all things depend from the seventh. The ancient and modern Western American Zuni Indians seem to have entertained similar views. Their present-day customs, their traditions and records, all point to the fact that from time immemorial, their institutions, political, social, and religious, were, and still are, shaped according to the septenary principle. Thus, all their ancient towns and villages were built in clusters of six, around a seventh. It is always a group of seven, or of thirteen, and always the six surround the seventh. Again, their sacerdotal hierarchy is composed of six priests of the house, seemingly synthesized in the seventh, who is a woman, the priestess mother. Compare this with the seven great officiating priests, spoken of in the Anugita, the name given to the seven senses, exoterically, and to the seven human principles, esoterically. Whence this identity of symbolism? Shall we still doubt the fact of Arjuna going over to Patala, the Antipodes, America, and there marrying Ulipu, the daughter of the Naga, or the Nargo king? But to the Zuni priests, these receive to this day an annual tribute of corn of seven colors, indistinguishable from other Indians during the rest of the year. On a certain day they come out, six priests and one priestess, arrayed in their priestly robes, each of a color sacred to that particular god whom the priest serves and personifies, each of them representing one of the seven regions, and each receiving corn of the color corresponding to that region. Thus, the white represents the east, because from the east comes the first sunlight. The yellow corresponds to the north, from the color of the flames produced by the aurora borealis. The red, the south, as from that quarter comes the heat. The blue stands for the west, the color of the Pacific Ocean, which lies to the west. Black is the color of the nether, underground region, darkness. Corn with grains of all colors on one ear represent the colors of the upper region, of the firmament with its rosy and yellow clouds, shining stars, etc. The speckled corn, each grain containing all the colors, is that of the priestess mother, woman containing in herself the seeds of all races past, present, and future, Eve being the mother of all living. Apart from these was the sun, the great deity, whose priest was the spiritual head of the nation. These facts were ascertained by Mr. F. Hamilton Cushing, who, as many are aware, became a Zuni, lived with them, was initiated into the religious mysteries, and has learned more about them than any other man living now. Seven is also a great magic number. In the occult records, the weapon mentioned in the Puranas and the Mahabharata, the Agniastra, or fiery weapon, bestowed by Urva upon his Chelasagara, is said to be constructed of seven elements. This weapon, supposed by some ingenious Orientalist to have been a rocket, is one of the many thorns in the side of our modern Sanskritists. Wilson exercises his penetration over it on several pages of his specimens of the Hindu theater, and finally fails to explain it. He can make nothing out of the Agniastra, for he argues, these weapons are of a very unintelligible character. Some of them are occasionally wielded as missiles, but in general they appear to be mystical powers exercised by the individual such as those of paralyzing an enemy, or locking his senses fast in sleep, or bringing down storm and rain and fire from heaven. They are supposed to assume celestial shapes, endowed with human faculties. The Ramayana calls them the sons of Krishava. The Shastra Devatas, gods of the divine weapons, are no more agniastras, the weapons, than the gunners of modern artillery are the cannon they direct. But this simple solution did not seem to strike the eminent Sanskritist. Nevertheless, as he himself says of the army form progeny of Krishyashva, the allegorical origin of the Agniastra weapon is undoubtedly the more ancient. It is the fiery javelin of Brahma. The sevenfold Agniastra, like the seven senses and the seven principles, symbolizes by the seven priests, are of untold antiquity. How old is the doctrine believed in by theosophists? The following section will tell. F. The seven souls of the Egyptologists. If one turns to those wells of information, the natural genesis and the lectures of Mr. Gerald Massey, the proofs of the antiquity of the doctrine under analysis become positively overwhelming. 
that the belief of the author differs from ours can hardly invalidate the facts. He views the symbol from a purely natural standpoint, one perhaps a trifle too materialistic, because too much of that of an ardent evolutionist and follower of the modern Darwinian dogmas. Thus, he shows that the student of Bohm's books find much in them concerning these seven fountain spirits and primary powers treated as seven properties of nature in the alchemistic and astrological phase of the medieval mysteries. The followers of Bohm look on such matters as the divine revelation of his inspired seership. They know nothing of the natural genesis, the history and persistence of the wisdom of the past, or the broken links, and are unable to recognize the physical features of the ancient seven spirits beneath their modern metaphysical or alchemist mask. A second connecting link between theosophy of Bohm and the physical origins of Egyptian thought is extant in the fragments of Hermes Trismegistus. No matter whether these teachings are called Illuminatist, Buddhist, Kabbalist, Gnostic, Masonic, or Christian, the elemental types can only be truly known in their beginnings. When the prophets or visionary showmen of Cloudland come to us claiming original inspiration and utter something new, we judge of its value by what it is in itself. But if we find they bring us the ancient matter which they cannot account for, and we can, it is natural that we should judge it by the primary significations rather than the latest pretensions. It is useless for us to read our later thought into the earlier types of expression. And then say the ancients meant that. Subtilized interpretations which have become doctrines and dogmas in theosophy have now to be tested by the genesis and physical phenomena in order that they may explode their false pretensions to supernatural origin or supernatural knowledge. But the able author of the Book of the Beginnings and the Natural Genesis does, very fortunately for us, quite the reverse. He demonstrates most triumphantly our esoteric Buddhist teachings by showing them identical with those of Egypt. Let the reader judge from his learned lecture on the seven souls of man, says the author. The first form of the mystical seven was seen to be figured in heaven by the seven large stars of the Great Bear, the constellation assigned by the Egyptians to the Mother of Time and the seven elemental powers. Just so, for the Hindus place their seven primitive rishis in the great bear, and call this constellation the abode of the Septarshi, Riksha, and Chitra, Sikandinas, and their adepts claim to know whether it is only an astronomical myth or a primordial mystery, having a deeper meaning that it bears on its surface. We are also told that The Egyptians divided the face of the sky by night into seven parts. This primary heaven was sevenfold. So it was with the Aryans. One but has to read the Puranas about the beginnings of Brahma and his egg to see this. Have the Aryans then taken the idea from the Egyptians? But, as the lecturer proceeds, the earliest forces recognized in nature were reckoned as seven in number. These became seven elementals, devils, or later divinities. Seven properties were assigned to nature, as matter, cohesion, fluxion, coagulation, accumulation, station, and division, and seven elements or souls to man. All this was taught in the esoteric doctrine, but it was interpreted and its mysteries unlocked, as already stated, with seven, not two, or at the utmost three keys. Hence the causes and their effects worked in the invisible or mystic as well as in psychic nature, and were made referable to metaphysics and psychology as much as to physiology. As the author says, a principle of sevening, so to say, was introduced, and the number seven supplied a sacred type that could be used for manifold purposes. And it was so used, for the seven souls of the pharaoh are often mentioned in the Egyptian texts. Seven souls or principles in man were identified by our British druids. The Rabians also ran the number of souls up to seven, so likewise do the Karens of India. And then the author, with several misspellings, tabulates the two teachings, the esoteric and the Egyptian, and shows the latter had the same series in the same order. Esoteric, Indian, one, rupa, body, or element of form, two, prana, the breath of life, three, astral body, four, manas, or intelligence, five, kama rupa, or animal soul, six, booty, or spiritual soul, seven, atma, pure spirit. Egyptian, one, ka, body, two, ba, the soul of breath, three, kaba, the shade, 
Four, Aku, intelligence or perception. Five, Seb, ancestral soul. Six, Puta, the first intellectual father. Seven, Atmu, a divine or eternal soul. Further on, the lecturer formulates these seven Egyptian souls as one, the soul of blood, the formative, two, the soul of breath, that breathes, three, the shade or covering soul, that envelops, four, the soul of perception, that perceives, five, the soul of pubescence, that procreates, six, the intellectual soul, that reproduces intellectually, and seven, the spiritual soul, that is perpetuated permanently. From the exoteric, and physiological standpoint, this may be very correct. It becomes less so from the esoteric point of view. To maintain this does not at all mean that the esoteric Buddhists resolve men into a number of elementary spirits, as Mr. G. Massey in the same lecture accuses them of maintaining. No esoteric Buddhist has ever been guilty of any such absurdity, nor has it ever been imagined that these shadows become spiritual beings in another world or seven potential spirits or elementaries of another life. What is maintained is simply that every time the immortal ego incarnates, it becomes, as a total, a compound unit of matter and spirit, which together act on seven different planes of being and consciousness elsewhere, Gerald Massey adds. Seven souls, or principles, are often mentioned in the Egyptian texts. The moon god, Tat Esmun, or the later sun god, expressed the seven nature powers that were prior to himself, and were summed up in him as his seven souls, we say principles. The seven stars in the hand of the Christ in Revelation have the same significance. And a still greater one, as these stars represent also the seven keys of the seven churches, or the Sodalian mysteries, Kabbalistically. However, we will not stop to discuss, but add that other Egyptologists have also discovered that the septenary constitution of man was a cardinal doctrine with the old Egyptians. In a series of remarkable articles in the Sphinx of Munich, Herr Franz Lambert gives incontrovertible proof of his conclusions from the Book of the Dead and other Egyptian records. For details, the reader must be referred to the articles themselves. But the following diagram, summing up the author's conclusions, is demonstrative evidence of the identity of Egyptian psychology with the septenary division in esoteric Buddhism. On the left-hand side, the Kabbalistic names of the corresponding human principles are placed, and on the right hand, the hieroglyphic names with their renderings as in the dogma of Franz Lambert. This is a very fair representation of the number of the principles of occultism but much confused, and this is what we call the seven principles in man, and what Mr. Massey calls souls, giving the same name to the ego or to the monad which reincarnates and resurrects, so to speak, at each rebirth, as the Egyptians did, namely, the renewed. But how can Ruach, spirit, be lodged in Kamarupa? What does Bohm, the prince of all the medieval seers, say? We find seven especial properties in nature, whereby this only mother works all things, which he calls fire, light, sound, the upper three, and desire, bitterness, anguish, and substantiality, thus analyzing the lower in his own mystic way. Whatever the six forms are spiritually, that the seventh, the body or substantiality, is essentially, these are the seven forms of the mother of all beings, from whence all that is in this world is generated. And again, the Creator hath, in the body of this world, generated himself as it were creaturely in his qualifying or fountain spirits. And all the stars are God's powers, and the whole body of the world consisteth in the seven qualifying or fountain spirits. This is rendering in mystical language our theosophical doctrine. But how can we agree with Mr. Gerald Massey when he states that the seven races of men that have been sublimated and made planetary by esoteric Buddhism, may be met with in the Bundahash as 1. The Earth Men, 2. Water Men, 3. Breast Eared Men, 4. Breast Eyed Men, 5. One Legged Men, 6. Bat Winged Men, and 7. Men with Tails. Each of these descriptions, allegorical and even perverted in their later form, is nevertheless an echo of the secret doctrine teaching. They all refer to the pre human evolution of the water men, terrible and bad by unaided nature through millions of years, as previously described. 
But we deny point blank the assertion that these were never real races, and point to the archaic stanzas for our answer. It is easy to infer and to say that our instructors have mistaken these shadows of the past, for things human and spiritual, but that they are neither and never were either, it is less easy to prove. The assertion must never remain on a par with the Darwinian claim that man and the ape had a common pithecoid ancestor. What the lecturer takes for a mode of expression and nothing more in the Egyptian ritual, we take as having quite another and important meaning. Here is one instance, says the ritual, the Book of the Dead. I am the mouse, I am the hawk, I am the ape, I am the crocodile whose soul comes from men, I am the soul of the gods. The last sentence, but one, is explained by the lecturer, who says parenthetically, that is as a type of intelligence, and the last as meaning the Horus or Christ as the outcome of all. The occult teaching answers, it means far more. It gives, first of all, a corroboration of the teaching that, while the human monad has passed on globe A and others in the first round, through all the three kingdoms, the mineral, the vegetable, and the animal, in this, our fourth round, every mammal has sprung from man, in the semi-ethereal, many-shaped creature with the human monad in it, of the first two races, can be regarded as man. But it must be so called, for in the esoteric language it is not the form of flesh, blood, and bones now referred to as man, which is in any way the man, but the inner divine monad with its manifold principles or aspects. The lecture referred to, however, much as it opposes esoteric Buddhism and its teachings, is an eloquent answer to those who have tried to represent the whole as a new fangled doctrine. And there are many such in Europe, America, and even India. Yet between the esotericism of the old Arhats and that which has now survived in India among the few Brahmins who have seriously studied their secret philosophy, the difference does not appear so very great. It seems centered in and limited to the question of the order of the evolution, of cosmic and other principles more than anything else. At all events, it is no greater divergent than the everlasting question of the filioque dogma, which since the 8th century has separated the Roman Catholic from the older Greek Eastern Church. Yet, whatever the differences in the forms in which the septenary dogma is presented, the substance is there, and its presence and importance in the Brahmatical system may be judged by what one of India's learned metaphysicians and Vedantic scholars says of it. The real esoteric sevenfold classification is one of the most important, if not the most important classification, which has received its arrangement from the mysterious constitution of this eternal type. I may also mention in this connection that the fourfold classification claims the same origin. The light of life, as it were, seems to be refracted from the treble faced prism of the Prakriti, having the three gunams for its three faces and divided into seven rays, which develop in course of time the seven principles of this classification. The progress of development presents some points of similarity to the gradual development of the rays of the spectrum. While the fourfold classification is amply sufficient for all practical purposes, this real sevenfold classification is of great theoretical and scientific importance. It will be necessary to adopt it to explain certain classes of phenomena noticed by the occultists, and it is perhaps better fitted to be the basis of a perfect system of psychology. It is not the peculiar property of the trans-Himalayan esoteric doctrine. In fact, it has a closer connection with the Brahmanical Logos than with the Buddhist Logos. In order to make my meaning clear, I may point out here that the Logos has seven forms. In other words, there are seven kinds of Logi in the cosmos. Each of these has become the central figure of one of the seven main branches of the ancient wisdom religion. This classification is not the sevenfold classification we have adopted, I make this assertion without the slightest fear of contradiction. The real classification has all the requisites of a scientific classification. It has seven distinct principles, which correspond with seven distinct states of prana, or consciousness. It bridges the gulf between the objective and subjective, and indicates the mysterious circuit through which ideation passes. The seven principles are allied to seven states of matter, and to seven forms of force. These principles are harmoniously arranged between two poles, which define the limits of human consciousness. The above is perfectly correct, save perhaps on one point. The sevenfold classification 
in the esoteric system has never, to the writer's knowledge, been claimed by anyone belonging to it as the peculiar property of the trans-Himalayan esoteric doctrine, but only as having survived in that old school alone. It is no more the property of the trans than it is of the cis-Himalayan esoteric doctrine, but is simply the common inheritance of all such schools, left to the sages of the fifth root race by the great Siddhas. Of the fourth, let us remember that the Atlanteans became the terrible sorcerers now celebrated in so many of the oldest MSS. Of India, only toward their fall, whereby the submersion of their continent was brought on. What is claimed is simply that the wisdom imparted by the Divine Ones, born through the Kriyashaktic powers of the Third Race before its fall and separation into sexes, to the adepts of the early Fourth Race, has remained in all its pristine purity in a certain brotherhood, the said school or fraternity being closely connected with a certain island of an inland sea, believed in by both Hindus and Buddhists, but called mythical by geographers or, and Orientalists. The less one talks of it, the wiser he will be. Nor can one accept the sevenfold classification as having a closer connection with the Brahmanical Logos than with the Buddhist Logos, since both are identical, whether the one Logos is called Ishvara or Avalokishvara, Brahma or Padmapani. These are, however, very small differences, more fanciful than real, in fact. Brahmanism and Buddhism, both viewed from their orthodox aspects, are as inimical and irreconcilable as water and oil. Each of these great bodies, however, has a vulnerable place in its constitution. While even in their esoteric interpretation, both can agree but to disagree. Once that their respective vulnerable points are confronted, every disagreement must fall, for the two will find themselves on common ground. The Achilles' heel of the orthodox Brahmanism is the Advaita philosophy, whose followers are called by the pious Buddhists in disguise, is that of orthodox Buddhism in northern mysticism, as represented by the disciples of the philosophies of the Yogacarya, school of Aryashanga, and the Mahayana, who are twitted in their turn by their co-religionists as Vedantins in disguise. The esoteric philosophy of both these can be but one if carefully analyzed and compared, as Gautama Buddha and the Shankacharya are most closely connected, if one believes tradition and certain esoteric teachings. Thus, every difference between the two will be found one of form rather than of substance. A most mystic discourse, full of septenary symbology, may be found in the Anagita. There, the Brahmana narrates the bliss of having crossed beyond the regions of illusion in which fancies are the godflies and mosquitoes, in which grief and joy are cold and heat, in which delusion is the binding darkness, in which avarice is the beasts of prey and reptiles, in which desire and anger are the obstructors. The sage describes the entrance into and exit from the forest, a symbol for man's lifetime, and also that forest itself. In that forest are seven large trees, the senses, mind, and understanding, or manas and booty included, seven fruits and seven guests, seven hermitages, seven forms of concentration, and seven forms of initiation. This is the description of the forest. That forest is filled with trees producing splendid flowers and fruits of five colors. The senses, says the commentator, are called trees, as being producers of the fruits, pleasures and pains. The guests are the powers of each sense personified. They receive the fruits above described. The hermitages are the trees in which the guests take shelter. The seven forms of concentration are the exclusion from the self of the seven functions of the seven senses, etc. Already referred to, the seven forms of initiation refer to the initiation into the higher life by repudiating as not one's own the actions of each member out of the group of seven. The explanation is harmless, if unsatisfactory. Says the Brahmana, continued his description. That forest is filled with trees producing flowers and fruits of four colors. That forest is filled with trees producing flowers and fruits of three colors and mixed. That forest is filled with trees producing flowers and fruits of two colors and of beautiful colors. That forest is filled with trees producing flowers and fruits of one color and fragrant. That forest is filled instead of with seven, with two large trees producing numerous flowers and fruits of undistinguished colors, mind and understanding, the two higher senses of, or theosophically, manas and booty. 
There is one fire, the self, here connected with the Brahman, and having a good mind or true knowledge according to Arjuna Mishra. And there is fuel here, namely the five senses or human passions. The seven forms of emancipation, from them are the seven forms of initiation. The qualities are the fruits. There the great sages receive hospitality. And when they have been worshipped and have disappeared, another forest shines forth, in which intelligence is the tree, and emancipation the fruit, and which possesses shade in the form of tranquility, which depends on knowledge, which has contentment for its water, and which has the shetrajna within for the sun. Now all the above is very plain, and no theosophist, even among the least learned, can fail to understand the allegory. And yet we see great Orientalists making a perfect mess of it in their explanations. The great sages who receive hospitality are explained as meaning the senses, which having worked as unconnected with the self are finally absorbed into it. But one fails to understand, if the senses are unconnected with the higher self, in what manner they can be absorbed into it. One would think, on the contrary, that it is just because the personal senses gravitate and strive to be connected with the impersonal self, that the latter, which is fire, burns the lower five and purifies thereby the higher two, mind and understanding, or the higher aspects of manas and booty. This is quite apparent from the text. The great sages disappear after having been worshipped. Worshipped by whom, if they, the presumed senses, are unconnected with the self? By mind, of course. By manas, in this case merged in the sixth sense. Which is not, and cannot be, the Brahman, the self, or Shitrajna, the soul's spiritual son. In the latter, in time, manas itself must be absorbed. It has worshipped the great sages and given hospitality to terrestrial wisdom. But once that another force shone forth upon it is intelligence, booty, the seventh sense, but sixth principle, which is transformed into the tree, that tree whose fruit is emancipation, which finally destroys the very roots of the Ashvata tree, the symbol of life and its elusive joys and pleasures. And therefore those who attain to that state of emancipation have, in the words of the above cited sage, no fear afterwards. In this state, the end cannot be perceived because it extends on all sides. There always dwell seven females there, he goes on to say, carrying out the imagery. These females who, according to Arjuna Mishra, are the Mahat, Ahamkara, and five Tamnatras, have always their faces turned downwards and their obstacles in the way of spiritual ascension. In that same Brahman, the Self, the seven perfect sages, together with their chiefs, abide and again emerge from the same. Glory, brilliance, and greatness, enlightenment, victory, perfection, and power. These seven rays follow after the same sun. The higher self. Shitrajna. Those whose wishes are reduced, the unselfish, whose sins, passions, are burnt up by penance, merging the self in the self, devote themselves to Brahman. Those people who understand the forest of knowledge, Brahman or the self, praise tranquility. And aspiring to that forest, they are reborn so as not to lose courage. Such indeed is his holy forest, and understanding it, they, the sages, act accordingly, being directed by the Shitrajna. No translator among the Western Orientalists has yet perceived in the foregoing allegory anything higher than mysteries connected with sacrificial ritualism, penance, or aesthetic ceremonies, and hatha yoga. But he who understands symbolical imagery and hears the voice of self within self will see in this something far higher than mere ritualism, however often he may err in minor details of the philosophy. And here he must be allowed a last remark. No true theosophist, from the most ignorant up to the most learned, ought to claim infallibility for anything he may say or write upon the occult matters. The chief point is to admit that, in many a way, In the classification of either cosmic or human principles, in addition to mistakes in the order of evolution, and especially on metaphysical questions, those of us who pretend to teach others more ignorant than ourselves are all liable to err. Thus, mistakes have been made in Isis Unveiled, in Esoteric Buddhism, in Man, in Magic, White and Black, etc., and more than one mistake is likely to be found in the present work. This cannot be helped. 
for large or even small work on such abstruse subjects to be entirely exempt from error and blunder it would have to be written from its first to its last page by a great adept, if not by an avatar. Then only should we say, this is verily a work without sin or blemish in it. But so long as the artist is imperfect, how can this work be perfect? Endless is the search for truth. Let us love it and aspire to it for its own sake, and not for the glory or benefit a minute portion of its revelation may confer on us. For who of us can presume to have the whole truth at his finger's ends, even upon one minor teaching of occultism? Our chief point in the present subject, however, has been to show that the septenary doctrine, or division of the constitution of man, was a very ancient one, and was not invented by us. This has been successfully done, for we are supported in this, consciously and unconsciously, by a number of ancient, medieval, and modern writers. What the former said was well said, what the latter repeated has generally been distorted. An instance, read the Pythagorean fragments, and study the septenary man as given by the Reverend G. Oliver, the learned mason in his Pythagorean triangle, who speaks as follows. The theosophic philosophy counted seven properties or principles in man, viz. 1. The divine golden man. 2. The inward holy body from fire and light, like pure silver. 3. The elemental man. 4. The mercurial, the paradisiacal man. 5. The martial soul-like man. 6. The venerine, ascending to the outward desire. 7. The solar man a witness to and an inspector of the wonders of God, the universe. They also had seven fountain spirits or powers of nature. Compare this jumbled account and distribution of Western theosophic philosophy with the latest theosophic explanations by the Eastern School of Theosophy, and then decide which is the more correct. Verily, wisdom hath builded her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. And to the charge that our school has not adopted the sevenfold classification of the Brahmins, but has confused it, this is quite unjust. To begin with, the school is one thing, its exponents to Europeans quite another. The latter have first to learn the ABC of practical Eastern occultism, before they can be made to understand correctly the tremendously abstruse classification based on the seven distinct states of prana or consciousness and above all to realize thoroughly what prana is in Eastern metaphysics. To give a Western student that classification is to try make him suppose that he can account for the origin of consciousness, by accounting for the purpose by which a certain knowledge, though only one of the states of that consciousness came to him, in other words, it is to make him account for something he knows on this plane, by something he knows nothing about on the other planes, i.e. to lead him from the spiritual and the psychological, direct to the ontological. This is why the primary old classification was adopted by the theosophists, of which classifications in truth there are many. To busy oneself after such a tremendous number of independent witnesses and proofs have been brought before the public, with an additional enumeration from the theological sources would be quite useless. The seven capital sins and seven virtues of the Christian scheme are far less philosophical than even the seven liberal and the seven accursed sciences, or the seven arts of enchantment of the Gnostics. For one of the latter is now before the public, pregnant with danger in the present as for the future. The modern name for it is hypnotism, used as it is by scientific and ignorant materialists. In the general ignorance of the seven principles, it will soon become Satanism in the full acceptation of the term. The modern term for it is hypnotism, used as it is by the scientific and ignorant materialists. In their general ignorance of the seven principles, it will soon become Satanism in the full acceptation of the term. Addenda. Science and the Secret Doctrine Contrasted. Section 1. Archaic or Modern Anthropology Whenever the question of the origin of man is offered seriously to an unbiased, honest, and earnest man of science, the answer comes invariably, we do not know. De Quatrefages, with his agnostic attitude, is one of such anthropologists. This does not imply that the rest of the men of science are neither fair-minded nor honest. 
as such a remark would be questionably discreet. But it is estimated that 75% of European scientists are evolutionists. Are these representatives of modern thought all guilty of flagrant misrepresentation of the facts? No one says this, but there are a few very exceptional cases. However, the scientists in their anti-clerical enthusiasm, and in despair of any alternative theory to Darwinism except that of special creation, are unconsciously insincere in forcing a hypothesis the elasticity of which is inadequate, and which resents the severe strain to which is now subjected. Insincerity on the same subject is, however, patent in ecclesiastical circles. Bishop Temple has come forward as a thoroughgoing supporter of Darwinism in his religion and science. This clerical writer goes so far as to regard matter, after it has received its primal impress, as the unaided evolver of all cosmic phenomena. This view only differs from that of Haeckel, in postulating a hypothetical deity at the back of beyond, a deity which stands entirely aloof from the interplay of forces. Such a metaphysical entity is no more the theological god than is that of Kant. Bishop Temple's truce with materialistic science is, in our opinion, impolitic. Apart from the fact that it involves a total rejection of the biblical cosmogony. In the presence of this display of flunkyism before the materialism of our learned age, we occultists can but smile. But how about loyalty to the master? such theological truants profess to serve, Christ and Christendom at large. However, we have no desire for the present to throw down the gauntlet to the clergy, our business being now with materialistic science alone. The latter, in the person of its best representatives, answers to our question. We do not know. Yet the majority of them act as though omniscience were their heirloom, and they knew all things. For indeed, this negative reply has not prevented the majority of scientists from speculating on the question, each seeking to have his own special theory accepted by the exclusion of all others. Thus, from Mallet in 1748 down to Haeckel in 1870, theories on the origin of the human race have differed as much as the personalities of their inventors themselves. Buffon, Bory de Saint Vincent, Lamarck, E. Geoffrey Saint Hilaire, Godry, Nadine, Wallace, Darwin, Owen, Haeckel, Philippi, Voigt, Huxley, Agassiz, etc. Each has evolved a more or less scientific hypothesis of Genesis. De Quatrefages arranges these theories in two principal groups. One based on a rapid and the other based on a very gradual transmutation. The former, favoring a new type, man, produced by a being entirely different, the latter teaching the evolution of man by progressive differentiations. Strangely enough, it is from the most scientific of these authorities that has emanated the most unscientific of all the theories upon the subject of the origin of man. This is now so evident that the hour is rapidly approaching when the current teaching about the descent of man from an ape-like mammal will be regarded with less respect than the formation of Adam out of clay and of Eve out of Adam's rib. For it is evident, especially after the most fundamental principles of Darwinism, that an organized being cannot be a descendant of another whose development is in an inverse order to its own. Consequently, in accordance with these principles, man cannot be considered as the descendant of any simian type whatever. Luce's argument versus the ape theory, based on the different flexures of the bones constituting the axis of the skull, in the case of man and the anthropoids, is fairly discussed by Schmidt. He admits that the ape as he grows becomes more bestial, man more human, and seems indeed to hesitate a moment before he passes on. This flexure of the cranial axis may therefore still be emphasized as a human character, in contradistinction to the apes. The peculiar characteristic of an order can scarcely be elicited from it, and especially as to the doctrine of descent. This circumstance seems in no way decisive. The writer is evidently not a little disquieted by his own argument. He assures us that it upsets any possibility of the present apes having been the progenitors of mankind. 
But does it not also negative the bare possibility of the man and the anthropoid having had a common, though so far an absolutely theoretical ancestor? Even natural selection itself is with every day more threatened. The deserters from the Darwinian camp are many, and those who were at one time its most ardent disciples are, owing to new discoveries, steadily but slowly preparing to turn over a new leaf. In the Journal of the Royal Microscopical Society for October 1886, we may read as follows. Physiological Selection, Mr. G. J. Romanes, finds certain difficulties in regarding natural selection as a theory for the origin of species, as it is rather a theory of the origin of adaptive structures. He proposes to replace it by what he calls physiological selection, or segregation of the fit. His view is based on the extreme sensitiveness of the reproductive system to small changes in the conditions of life, and he thinks that variations in the direction of greater or less sterility must frequently occur in wild species. If the variation be such that the reproductive system, while showing some degree of sterility with the present form, continues to be fertile within the limits of the varietal form, the variation would neither be swamped by intercrossing nor die out on account of sterility. When a variation of this kind occurs, the physiological barrier must divide the species into two parts. The author, in fine, regards mutual sterility not as one of the effects of specific differentiation, but as the cause of it. An attempt is made to show the above to be a complement of and sequence to the Darwinian theory. This is a clumsy attempt at best. The public will soon be asked to believe that Mr. C. Dixon's evolution without natural selection is also Darwinism expanded as the author certainly claims it to be. But it is like splitting the body of a man into three pieces, and then maintaining that each piece of the identical man he was before only expanded. Yet the author states, Let it be clearly understood that not one single syllable in the foregoing pages has been written antagonistic to Darwin's theory of natural selection. All I have done is to explain certain phenomena. The more one studies Darwin's works, the more one is convinced of the truth of his hypothesis. And before this, he alludes to the overwhelming array of facts which Darwin gave in support of his hypothesis, and which triumphantly carried the theory of natural selection over all obstacles and objections. This does not prevent the learned author, however, from upsetting this theory as triumphantly, and from even openly calling his work evolution without natural selection, or in so many words, with Darwin's fundamental idea knocked to atoms in it. As to natural selection itself, the utmost misconception prevails among many present-day thinkers, who tacitly accept the conclusions of Darwinism. It is, for instance, a mere device of rhetoric to credit natural selection with the power of originating species. Natural selection is no entity. It is merely a convenient phrase for describing the mode in which the survival of the fit and the elimination of the unfit among organisms are brought about by the struggle for existence. Every group of organisms tends to multiply beyond the means of subsistence, the constant battle for life, the struggle to obtain enough to eat and to escape being eaten. Added to the environmental conditions, necessitates a perpetual weeding out of the unfit. The elite of any stock, thus sorted out, propagate the species and transmit their organic characteristics to their descendants. All useful variations are thus perpetuated, and a progressive improvement is effected. But natural selection, in the writer's humble opinion, selection as a power, is in reality a pure myth, especially when it is resorted to as an explanation of the origin of the species. It is merely a representative term expressed of the manner in which useful variations are stereotyped when produced. Of itself, it can produce nothing, and only operates on the rough material presented to it. The real question at issue is, what cause, combined with other secondary causes, produces the variations in the organisms themselves? Many of these secondary causes are purely physical, climactic, dietary, etc. Very well. But beyond the secondary aspects of organic evolution, a deeper principle has to be sought for. The materialist's spontaneous variations and accidental divergencies are self-contradictory terms in a universe of matter, force, and necessity. Mere variability of type, apart from the supervisory presence of a quasi-intelligent impulse, is powerless to account for the stupendous complexities and marvels of the human body, for instance. 
The insufficiency of the Darwinist mechanical theory has to be exposed at length by Dr. Von Hartmann, among other purely negative thinkers. It is an abuse of the reader's intelligence to write, as does Haeckel, of blind, indifferent cells, arranging themselves into organs. The esoteric solution of the origin of animal species is given elsewhere. Those purely secondary causes of differentiation, grouped under the head of sexual selection, natural selection, climate, isolation, etc., mislead the Western evolutionist and offer no real explanation whatever of the whence of the ancestral types which served as the starting point for physical development. The truth is that the differentiating causes known to modern science only come into operation after the physicalization of the primeval animal root types out of the astral. Darwinism only meets evolution at its midway point, that is to say, when astral evolution has given place to the play of the ordinary physical forces with which our present senses acquaint us. But even here the Darwinian theory, even with the expansions recently attempted, is inadequate to meet the facts of the case. The cause underlying physiological variation in species, one to which all other laws are subordinate and secondary, is a subconscious intelligence pervading matter, ultimately traceable to a reflection of the divine and John Kohanic wisdom. A not altogether dissimilar conclusion has been arrived at by so well known a thinker as Ed von Hartmann, who, despairing of the efficacy of unaided natural selection, regards evolution as being intelligently guided by the unconscious, the cosmic logos of occultism. But the latter acts only immediately through Fohat, or Janic Kohanic energy, and not quite in the direct manner which the great pessimist describes. It is this divergence among men of science, their mutual and often their self-contradictions, that gives the writer of the present volume the courage to bring to light other and older teachings if only as hypotheses for future scientific appreciation. So evident, even to the humble recorder of this archaic teaching, though not in any way very learned in modern sciences, are the scientific fallacies and gaps, that she is determined to touch upon all these in order to place the two teachings on parallel lines. For occultism, it is a question of self-defense and nothing more. So far, the secret doctrine has concerned itself with metaphysics, pure and simple. It is now landed on earth and finds itself within the domain of physical science and practical anthropology, or those branches of study which materialistic naturalists claim as their rightful domain, coolly asserting, furthermore, that the higher and more perfect the working of the soul, the more amenable it is to the analysis and explanations of the zoologist and the physiologist alone. The stupendous pretensions come from one who, to prove the pithecoid descent, has not hesitated to include the Lemuriad among the ancestors of man. These have been promoted by him to the rank of promisi, incidentuate mammals, to which he very incorrectly contributes a desidud and a discoidal placenta. For this, Haeckel was taken severely to task by de Quatrefages, and criticized by his own brother, materialists and agnostics, Virchow and de bois Raymond as great, if not greater, authorities than himself. Such opposition notwithstanding, Haeckel's wild theories are, to this day, still called by some scientific and logical. The mysterious nature of consciousness, of soul, of spirit in man, being now explained as a mere advance on the functions of the protoplasmic molecules of the lively protista, and the gradual evolution and growth of the human mind and social instincts towards civilization having to be traced back to their origin in the civilization of ants, bees, and other creatures. The chances left for an impartial hearing of the doctrines of archaic wisdom are few indeed. The educated profane are told that the social instincts of the lower animals have, of late, been regarded for various reasons as clearly the origin of morals, even of those of man. And that our divine consciousness, our soul, intellect, and aspirations have worked their way up from the lower stages of the simple cell soul, of the gelatinous bathybius, and they seem to believe it. For such men, the metaphysics of occultism must produce the effect that our grandest oratios produce on the Chinaman, sounds that jar upon the nerves. Yet, 
are our esoteric teachings about angels, the first three pre-animal human races, and the downfall of the fourth on a lower level of fiction and self-delusion than that of the Hekelian pladistular, or the inorganic molecular soul of the protista? Between the evolution of the spiritual nature of man from the above amoebian souls and the alleged development of his physical frame from the protoplastic dweller in the ocean slime, there is an abyss, which will not be easily crossed by any man in the full possession of his intellectual faculties. Physical evolution, as modern science teaches it, is a subject for open controversy. Spiritual and moral development on the same lines is the insane dream of a crass materialism. Furthermore, past as well as present, daily experience teaches that no truth has ever been accepted by learned bodies unless it is dovetailed with the habitually preconceived ideas of the professors. The crown of the innovator is a crown of thorns, said Geoffrey St. Hilaire. It is only that which fits it with popular hobbies and accepted notions that, as a general rule, gains ground. Hence the triumph of the Hekelian ideas, notwithstanding that they are proclaimed by Virchow, Dubois Raymond, and others as the testimonium popatratis of natural science. Diametrically opposed as may be the materialism of the German evolutionists to the spiritual conceptions of esoteric philosophy, radically inconsistent as is their accepted anthropological system with the real facts of nature, the pseudo-idealistic bias now coloring English thought is almost more pernicious. The pure materialistic doctrine admits of a direct refutation and an appeal to the logic of facts. The idealism of the present day not only contrives to absorb, on the one hand, the basic negations of atheism, but lands its votaries in a tangle of unreality, which culminates in a practical nihilism. Argument with such writers is almost out of the question. Idealists, therefore, will still be more antagonistic than even the materialists to the occult teachings now given. But as no worse fate can befall the exponents of esoteric anthropogenesis at the hands of their foes than being openly called by their old and time-honored names of lunatics and ignoramuses, the present archaic theories may be safely added to the many modern speculations and bide their time for their full or even partial recognition. Only, as the very existence of these archaic theories will probably be denied, we have to give our best proofs and stand by them to the bitter end. In our race and generation, the one temple in the universe is in rare cases within us. But our body and mind have been too defiled by both sin and science to be outwardly anything better now than a feign of iniquity and error. And here our mutual position, that of occultism and modern science, ought to be once for all defined. We, theosophists, are willing to bow before such men of learning as the late Professor Balfour Stewart, Messrs. Crooks, Dick Watrafages, Wallace, Agassiz, Butleroff, and others. Though from the standpoint of the esoteric philosophy, we may not agree with all they say. But nothing will make us consent to even a show of respect for the opinions of other such men of science as Haeckel, Karl Voigt, or Ludwig Buckner in Germany, or even Mr. Huxley and his co-thinkers in materialism in England, the colossal erudition of the first named notwithstanding. Such men are simply the intellectual and moral murderers of future generations, especially Haeckel, whose crass materialism often rises to the height of idiotic naivetes in his reasonings. One has to but read this pedigree of man in other essays. Aveling's translation, to feel a desire that, in the words of Job, his remembrance should perish from the earth, and that he shall have no name in the streets. Here the creator of the mythical Suzura, deriding the idea of the origin of the human race, as a supernatural phenomena, as one that could not result from simple mechanical causes, from physical and chemical forces, but requires the direct intervention of a creative personality. Now the central point of Darwin's teaching lies in this, that it demonstrates the simplest mechanical causes, purely physico-chemical phenomena of nature, and wholly sufficient to explain the highest and most difficult problems Darwin puts in the place of a conscious creative force, building and arranging the organic bodies of animals and plants on a designed plan, 
a series of natural forces working blindly, as we say, without aim, without design. In place of an arbitrary act of operation, we have a necessary law of evolution. So had Manu and Kapila, and at the same time guiding conscious and intelligent powers. Darwin, very wisely, had put on one side the question as to the first appearance of life. But very soon the consequence, so full of meaning, so wide-reaching, was openly discussed by able and brave scientific men, such as Huxley, Carl Voigt, and Ludwig Buchner. A mechanical origin of the earliest living form was held as the necessary sequence to Darwin's teaching. We are at present only concerned with a single consequence of the theory, the natural origin of the human race through almighty evolution. To this, unabashed by such a scientific farrago, occultism replies, In the course of evolution, when the physical triumphed over the spiritual and mental evolution, and nearly crushed it under its weight, the great gift of Kriya Shakti remained the heirloom of only a few elect men in every age. Spirit strove vainly to manifest in itself fullness in purely organic forms, as has been explained in part one of this volume, and the faculty which has been a natural attribute in the early humanity of the third race, become one of the class regarded as simply phenomenal by spiritualists and occultists, and as scientifically impossible by materialists. In our modern day, the mere assertion that there exists a power which can create human forms, ready-made sheaths within which can incarnate the conscious monads or nirmankayas of past mambantars, is of course absurd, ridiculous. That which is regarded as quite natural, on the other hand, is the production of a Frankenstein's monster, plus moral consciousness, religious aspirations, genius, and a feeling of his own immortal nature within himself, by physico-chemical forces, guided by blind almighty evolution. As to the origin of that man, not ex nihilo, cemented by a little red clay, but from a living divine entity consolidating the astral body with surrounding materials. Such a conception is too absurd even to be mentioned in the opinion of the materialists. Nevertheless, occultists and theosophists are ready to have their claims and theories compared as to their intrinsic value and probability with those of the modern evolutionists. However unscientific and superstitious these theories may at the first glance appear. Hence, the esoteric teaching is absolutely opposed to the Darwinian evolution, as applied to man and partially so with regard to other species. It would be interesting to obtain a glimpse of the mental representation of evolution in the scientific brain of a materialist. What is evolution? If asked to define full and complete meaning of the term, neither Huxley nor Haeckel will be able to do so any better than does Webster. The act of unfolding, the process of growth, development, as the evolution of a flower from a bud, or an animal from the egg. Yet the bud must be traced through its parent plant to the seed, and the egg to the animal or bird that laid it, or at any rate to the speck of protoplasm from which it expanded and grew. And both the seed and the speck must have the latent potentialities in them for the reproduction and gradual development, the unfolding of the thousand and one forms or phases of evolution through which they must pass before the flower or the animal is fully developed. Hence, the future plan, if not a design, must be there. Moreover, that seed has to be traced, and its nature ascertained. Have the Darwinians been successful in this? Or will the Moneron be cast in our teeth? But this atom of the watery abysses is not homogeneous matter, and there must be something or somebody that had molded and cast it into being. Here, science is once more silent. But since there is no self-consciousness as yet in speck, seed, or germ, according to both materialists and psychologists of the modern school, occultists agreeing in this for once with their natural enemies, what is it that guides the force or forces so unerringly in this process of evolution? Blind force? As well called blind, the brain which evolved in Haeckel, his pedigree of man and other lucubrations? We can easily conceive that the said brain lacks an important center or two, for whoever knows anything of the anatomy of the human, or even of any animal body, and is still an atheist and a materialist, must be hopelessly insane. According to Lord Herbert, 
who rightly sees in the frame of a man's body and the coherence of its parts something so strange and paradoxical that he holds it to be the greatest miracle of nature, blind forces and no design in anything under the sun, when no sane man of science would hesitate to say that, even from the little he knows and has hitherto discovered of the forces at work in cosmos, he sees very plainly that every part, every speck and atom, and in harmony with their fellow atoms, and these with the whole, each having its distinct mission throughout the life cycle. But fortunately, the greatest, the most eminent thinkers and scientists of the day are now beginning to rise against this pedigree, and even against Darwin's natural selection theory. Though its author had never, probably, contemplated such widely stretched conclusions. The Russian scientist N. T. Danilevsky, in his remarkable work, Darwinism, a critical investigation of the theory, upsets such Darwinism completely and without appeal, and so does de Quatrefages in his last work. Our readers are recommended to examine the learned papers by Dr. Borges, a member of the Paris Anthropological Society, read by its author at a recent meeting of that society and called Evolutionary Psychology, the evolution of spirit, etc. In it, he completely reconciles the two teachings, namely of physical and spiritual evolution. He explains the origin of the variety of organic forms, which are made to fit their environments with such evidently intelligent design by the existence and the mutual help of interaction of two principles in manifested nature, the inner conscious principle adapting itself to physical nature and the innate potentialities of the latter. Thus, the French scientists had to return to our old friend Archaeus, or the life principle, without naming it, as Dr. Richardson has done in England in his nerve force. The same idea was recently developed in Germany by Baron Hallenbach in his remarkable work, Individuality in the Light of Biology and Modern Philosophy. We find the same conclusions arrived at yet another excellent volume by a deep-thinking Russian, N. N. Strachoff who says in his Fundamental Conceptions of Psychology and Physiology, The most clear, as the most familiar, type of development may be found in our own mental or physical evolution, which has served others as a model to follow. If organisms are entities, then it is only just to conclude and assert that the organic life strives to beget psychic life, but it would still be more correct and in accordance with the spirit of these two categories of evolution to say, that the true cause of organic life is the tendency of spirit to manifest in substantial forms, to clothe itself in substantial reality. It is the highest form which contains the complete explanation of the lowest, never the reverse. This is admitting, as Bourges does in the memoir above mentioned, the identity of this mysterious, integrally acting and organizing principle within the self-conscious and inner subject, which we call the ego and the world at large the soul. Thus, all the best scientists and thinkers are gradually approaching the occultists in their general conclusions. But such metaphysically inclined men of science are out of court and will hardly be listened to. Schiller, in his magnificent poem on the Vale of Isis, makes the mortal youth who dared to lift the impenetrable covering fall down dead, after beholding the naked truth in the face of the stern goddess. Have some of our Darwinians, so tenderly united in natural selection and affinity, also gazed at the sciatic mother, bereft of her veils? One might almost suspect it after reading their theories. Their great intellects must have collapsed while gouging too closely the uncovered face of nature, leaving only the gray matter and ganglia in their brains to respond to blind physico-chemical forces. At any rate, Shakespeare's lines apply admirably to our modern evolutionist, who symbolizes that proud man who, dressed in a little brief authority, most ignorant of what he most assured, his glassy essence like an angry ape, plays such a fantastic trick before high heaven and make the angels weep. These have not to do with the angels. Their only concern is with the human ancestor, the pithecoid Noah who gave birth to three sons, the tailed Sinocephalus, the tailless ape, and the arboreal Paleolithic man. On this point, they will not be contradicted. Every doubt expressed is immediately set down as an attempt to cripple scientific inquiry. The insuperable difficulty at the very foundation of the evolution theory namely that no Darwinian is able to give an approximate definition of the period at which, and the form in which, the first man appeared, is smoothed down to a trifling impediment, 
which is really of no account. Every branch of knowledge is in the same predicament. We are informed. The chemist bases his most abstruse calculations simply upon a hypothesis of atoms and molecules, of which no one has ever been seen, isolated, weighed, or defined. The electrician speaks of magnetic fluids which have never tangibly revealed themselves. No definite origin can be assigned either to molecules or magnetism. Science cannot and does not pretend to any knowledge of the beginnings of law, matter, or life. And with all, to reject a scientific hypothesis, however absurd, is to commit the one unpardonable sin. We risk it. Section 2 The Ancestors Mankind is Offered by Science The question of questions for mankind, the problem which underlies all others, and is more deeply interesting than any other, is the ascertainment of the place which man occupies in nature and his relations to the universe of things. The world stands divided this day, and hesitates between divine progenitors, be they Adam and Eve, or the lunar Petris, and Bethibius Hekeli, the gelatinous hermit of the briny deep. Having explained the occult theory, it may now be compared with that of modern materialism. The reader is invited to choose between the two after having judged them on their respective merits. We may derive some consolation for the rejection of our divine ancestors in finding that the Hekelian speculations receive no better treatment at the hands of strictly exact science than do our own. Hekel's phylogenesis is no less laughed at by the foes of his fantastic evolution, by other and greater scientists, than our primeval races will be. As Dubois Raymond puts it, we may believe him easily when he says that the Ancestral trees of our race, sketched in the Schopfungeschet, are of about much value as are the pedigrees of the Homeric heroes in the eyes of the historical critic. This settled, everyone will see that one hypothesis is as good as another, and as we find Haeckel himself confessing that neither geology in its history of the past, nor the ancestral history of organisms, will ever rise to the position of a real exact science a large margin is left to the occult science to make its annotations and lodge its protests. The world is left to choose between the teachings of Paracelsus, the father of modern chemistry, and those of Haeckel, the father of the mythical Caesura. We demand no more. Without presuming to take part in the quarrel of such very learned naturalists as Dubois Raymond and Haeckel, a propos of our blood relationship to those ancestors of ours, which have led up from the unicellular classes, Vermes, Arcania, Pisces, Amphibia, Reptilia, to the Aves. We may put a brief question or two for the information of our readers, availing ourselves of the opportunity and bearing in mind Darwin's theories of natural selection, etc. We would ask science, with regard to the origin of the human and animal species, which theory of evolution of the two herewith described is more scientific, or the more unscientific, if so preferred? Number one, is it that of an evolution which starts from the beginning with sexual propagation? Or number two, or that teaching which shows the gradual development of organs, their solidification, and the procreation of each species, at first by simple easy separation from one into two or even several individuals? Then a fresh development, the first step to a species of separate distinct sexes, the hermaphrodite condition. Then again, a kind of parthenogenesis, virginal reproduction, when the egg cells are formed within the body, issuing from it in atomic emanations and becoming matured outside of it. Until finally, after a definite separation into sexes, the human beings begin procreating through sexual connection. Of these two, the first theory, or rather a revealed fact, is enunciated by all the exoteric Bibles, except the Puranas, preeminently by the Jewish cosmogony. The second is that which is taught by the occult philosophy, as has been explained. An answer is found to our question in a volume just published by Mr. Samuel Lang, the best lay exponent of modern science. In chapter 8 of his latest work, A Modern Zoroastrian, The author begins by twitting all ancient religions and philosophies for assuming a male and female principle for their gods. At first sight, he says, 
The distinction of sex appears as fundamental as that of plant and animal. The spirit of God brooding over chaos and producing the world is only a later addition, revised according to monotheistic ideas. Of the far older Chaldean legend, which describes the creation of cosmos out of chaos, by the cooperation of great gods, male and female. Thus, in the Orthodox Christian creed, we are taught to repeat, begotten, not made, a phrase which is absolute nonsense, or nonsense. That is, an instance of using words like counterfeit notes, which have no solid value of an idea behind them. For begotten is a very definite term which implies the conjunction of two opposite sexes to produce a new individual. However, we may agree with the learned author as to the inadvisability of using wrong words, and the terrible anthropomorphic and phallic element in the old scriptures, especially in the Orthodox Christian Bible. Nevertheless, there may be two extenuating circumstances in the case. Firstly, all these ancient philosophies and modern religions are, as has been sufficiently shown in these two volumes, an exoteric veil thrown over the face of esoteric truth. And as a result of this, they are allegorical, i.e. mythological in form, but still they are immensely more philosophical in essence than any of the new scientific theories, so-called. Secondly, from the Orphic theogony down to Ezra's last remodeling of the Pentateuch, Every old scripture, having in its origin borrowed its facts from the East, has been subjected to constant alterations by friend and foe, until of the original version there has remained but the name, a dead shell from which the spirit had been gradually eliminated. This alone ought to show that no religious work, now extent, can be understood without the help of the archaic wisdom, the primitive foundation on which they were all built. But to return to the direct answer expected from science to our direct question. It is given by the same author, when following his train of thought on the unscientific humorization of the powers of nature in ancient creeds. He pronounces a condemnatory verdict upon them in the following terms. Science, however, makes sad havoc with his impression of sexual generation, being the original and only mode of reproduction and the microscopic and dissecting knife of the naturalist introduce us to new and altogether unsuspected worlds of life. So little unsuspected, indeed, that the original asexual modes of reproduction must have been known to the ancient Hindus, at any rate, Mr. Lang's assertion to the contrary notwithstanding. In view of the statement in the Vishnu Purana, quoted by us elsewhere, that Daksha, established sexual intercourse as the means of multiplication only after a series of other modes, which are all enumerated therein. It becomes difficult to deny the fact. This assertion, moreover, is found, note well, in an exoteric work. Next, Mr. Lang goes on to tell us that, by far the larger proportion of living forms, in number at any rate, if not in size, have come into existence, without the aid of sexual propagation. He then instances Haeckel's Moneron, multiplying by self-division. The next stage the author shows in the nucleated cell, which does exactly the same thing. The following stage is that in which organism does not divide into two equal parts, but a small portion it swells out, and finally parts company and starts on a separate existence, which grows to the size of the parent by its inherent faculty of manufacturing fresh protoplasm from surrounding inorganic materials. This is followed by a many-celled organism which is formed by germ buds reduced to spores or single cells which are emitted from the parent. We are now at the threshold of that system of sexual propagation, which has now become the rule in all the higher families of animals. This organism, having advantages in the struggle for life, established itself permanently, and special organs developed to meet the altered conditions. Thus, at length, the distinction would be firmly established of a female organ or ovary containing the egg or primitive cell from which the new being was to be developed, and a male organ supplying the fertilizing spore or cell. This is confirmed by a study of embryology, which shows that in the human and higher animal species, the distinction of sex is not developed until a considerable progress has been made in the growth of the embryo. In the great majority of plants and in some of the lower families of animals, The male and female organs are developed within the same being, and they are what is called hermaphrodites. Another transition form is parthenogenesis, 
or virginal reproduction, in which germ cells, apparently similar in all respects to egg cells, develop themselves into new individuals, without any fructifying element. Of all this, we are perfectly well aware, as we are aware that the above was never applied by the very learned English popularizer of Huxley Haeckelian theories to the genus Homo. He limits this to specks of protoplasm, plants, bees, snails, and so on. But if he would be true to the theory of descent, he must be as true to the ontogenesis, in which the fundamental biogenetic law, we are told, runs as follows. The development of the embryo, ontogeny, is a condensed and abbreviated repetition of the evolution of the race, phylogeny. This repetition is the more complete, the more the true order of evolution. Palingenesis has been retained by continual heredity. On the other hand, this repetition is the less complete, the more by varying adaptations the later spurious development. Anogenesis has obtained. This shows us that every living creature and thing on earth, including man, evolved from one common primal form. Physical man must have passed through the same stages of the evolutionary process in the various modes of procreation as other animals have done. He must have divided himself. Then, hermaphrodite, have given birth parthenogenically on the immaculate principle to his young ones. The next stage would be the oviparous, at first, without any fructifying element, then with the help of the fertility spore, and only after the final and definite evolution of both sexes would he become a distinct male and female, when reproduction through sexual union would grow into universal law. So far, all this is scientifically proven. There remains but one thing to be ascertained, viz. the plain and comprehensively described process of such anti-sexual reproduction. This is done in occult books, a slight outline of which has been attempted by the writer in part one of this volume. Either this, or man is a distinct being. Occult philosophy may call him that, because of his distinctly dual nature. Science cannot do so, once that it rejects every interference save mechanical laws, and admits of no principle outside matter. The former, archaic science, allows the human physical frame to have passed through every form, from the lowest to the very highest, its present one, or from the simple to the complex, to use the accepted terms. But it claims that in this cycle, the fourth, the frame having already existed among the types and models of nature from the preceding rounds, it was quite ready for man from the beginning of this round. The monad had to step into the astral body of the progenitors in order that the work of physical consolidation should begin around the shadowy prototype. What would science say to this? It would answer, of course, that as man appeared on earth as the latest of the mammalians, he had no need any more than these mammals, to pass through the primitive stages of procreation as above described. His mode of procreation was already established on earth when he appeared. In this case, we may reply, since to this day did not the remotest sign of a link between man and the animal has yet been found, then, if the occult doctrine is to be repudiated, he must have sprung miraculously in nature like a fully armed Minerva from Jupiter's brain, and in such case the Bible is right all along with other national revelations. Hence the scientific scorn, so freely lavished by the author of A Modern Zoroastrian upon ancient philosophies and exoteric creeds, becomes premature and uncalled for. Nor would the sudden discovery of a missing link like fossil mend matters at all. For neither one such solitary specimen, nor the scientific inductions therefrom, could ensure its being the long-sought-for relic, i.e., that of an undeveloped, still a once-speaking man. Something more would be required as a final proof. Besides this, even Genesis takes up man, her Adam of dust, only where the secret doctrine leaves her, sons of God and wisdom, and picks up the physical man of the third race. Eve is not begotten, but is extracted out of an Adam in the manner of an amoeba, A, contracting in the middle and splitting into amoeba B by division. Nor has human speech developed from the various animal sounds. Haeckel's theory that speech arose gradually from a few simple crude animal sounds as such, speech still remains amongst a few races of the lowest rank, is altogether unsound, as argued by Professor Max Muller, among others. 
He contends that no plausible explanation has yet been given as to how the roots of language came into existence. The human brain is necessary for human speech, and figures relating to the size of the respective brains of man and ape show how deep is the gulf which separates the two. Voigt says that the brain of the largest ape, the gorilla, measures no more than 30.51 cubic inches, while the average brains of the flat-headed Australian natives, the lowest now of the human races, amounts to 99.35 cubic inches. Figures are awkward witnesses and cannot lie. Therefore, as truly observed by Dr. F. Pfaff, whose premises are as sound and correct as his biblical conclusions are silly, the brain of the apes, most like man, does not amount to quite a third of the brain of the lowest races of men. It is not half the size of the brain of a newborn child. From the foregoing, it is thus very easy to perceive that in order to prove the huxley hickelian theories of the descent of man, it is not one, but a great number of missing links, a true ladder of progressive evolutionary steps, that would have to be the first round and then presented by science to thinking and reasoning humanity before it would abandon belief in gods and the immortal soul for the worship of quadrumanic ancestors. Mere myths are now greeted as axiomatic truths. Even Alfred Russell Wallace maintains with Haeckel that primitive man was a speechless ape creature. To this, Professor Jolly answers, Man never was, in my opinion, this pithecanthropus, Alalus, whose portrait Haeckel has drawn as if he had seen and known him whose singular and completely hypothetical genealogy he has even given, from the mere mass of living protoplasm to the man endowed with speech in a civilization analogous to that of the Australians and Papuans. Haeckel, among other things, often comes into direct conflict with the science of languages. In the course of his attack on evolutionism, Professor Max Muller stigmatized the Darwinian theory as vulnerable at the beginning and at the end. The fact is, that only the partial truth of many of the secondary laws of Darwinism is beyond question. M. de Quatrefages, evidently accepting natural selection, the struggle for existence, and transformation within the species, has proven not once and forever, but only pro tempore. But it may not be amiss, perhaps, to condense the linguistic case against the ape ancestor theory. Languages have their phases of growth, etc., like all else in nature it is almost certain that the great linguistic families pass through three stages. 1. All words are roots and merely placed in juxtaposition, radical languages. 2. One root defines the other and becomes merely a determinative element, agglutinative. 3. The determinative element, the determinating meaning of which has long lapsed, unites into a whole with the formative element infected. The problem then is, Whence these roots, Professor Max Muller argues that the existence of these ready-made materials of speech is a proof that man cannot be the crown of a long organic series. This potentiality of forming roots is the great crux which materialists almost invariably avoid. Von Hartmann explains it as a manifestation of the unconscious and admits its cogency versus mechanical atheism. Hartmann is a fair representative of the metaphysician and idealist of the present age. The argument has never been met by the non-pantheistic evolutionists. To say with Schmidt, forsooth we are to halt before the origin of language, is an avowal of dogmatism and of speedy defeat. We respect those men of science who, wise in their generation, say, the prehistoric past being utterly beyond our powers of direct observation. We are too honest, too devoted to the truth, or what we regard as truth, to speculate upon the unknown giving out our unproven theories along with facts absolutely established in modern science. The borderland of metaphysical knowledge is therefore best left to time, which is the best test as to truth. This is a wise and honest sentence in the mouth of a materialist, but when a Haeckel, after just saying that historical events of past time, having occurred many millions of years ago, are forever removed from direct observation, and that neither geology nor phylogeny can or will rise to the position of a real exact science, then insists on the development of all organisms, from the lowest vertebrate to the highest, from amphixius to man. We ask for a weightier proof than he can give. 
mere empirical sources of knowledge, so extolled by the author of Anthropogeny, when he has to be satisfied with the qualification for his own views, are not competent to settle problems lying beyond their domain, nor is it in the province of exact science to place any reliance on them. If empirical, and Hackel himself declares so repeatedly, then they are no better, nor any more reliable. In the sight of exact research, when extended into the remote past, then are occult teachings of the East, both having to be placed on the same level. Nor are his phylogenetic and palingenetic speculations treated any more favorably than by real scientists, than are our cyclic repetitions of the evolution of the great in the minor races, and the original order of evolution. For the province of exact real science, materialistic though it be, is to carefully avoid anything like guesswork, speculation which cannot be verified, in short, all suppressio veri and all suggestio falsi. The business of the men of exact science is to observe, each in his chosen department, the phenomena of nature, to record, tabulate, compare, and classify the facts, down to the smallest minutiae which are presented to the observation of the senses, with the help of all the exquisite mechanism that modern invention supplies, not by the aid of the metaphysical flights of fancy. All that he has a legitimate right to do is to correct by the assistance of physical instruments the defects or illusions of his own coarser vision, auditory powers, and other senses. He has no right to trespass on the grounds of metaphysics and psychology. His duty is to verify and to rectify all the facts that fall under his direct observation, to profit by the experiences and mistakes of the past in endeavoring to trace the working of a certain concatenation of cause and effect, which by only its constant and unvarying repetition may be called a law. That is which a man of exact science is expected to do. If he would become a teacher of men and remain true to his original program of natural or physical sciences, any side path from this royal road becomes speculation. Instead of keeping to this, what does many so-called man of science do in these days? He rushes into the domain of pure metaphysics, while deriding them. He delights in rash conclusions and calls them a deductive law from the inductive law, of a theory based upon and drawn out of the depths of his own consciousness, that consciousness being perverted by and honeycombed with one-sided materialism. He attempts to explain the origin of things, which are yet embosomed only in his own conceptions. He attacks spiritual beliefs and religious traditions millenniums old, and denounces everything save his own hobbies as superstition. He suggests theories of the universe, a cosmogony developed by blind mechanical forces of nature alone, far more miraculous and impossible than even one based upon the assumption of fiat lux ex nihilo and tries to astonish the world by his wild theory. And this theory, being known to emanate from a scientific brain, is taken, on blind faith, as very scientific, and as the outcome of science. Are these the opponents occultism should dread? Most decidedly not. For such theories are treated no better by real science than are our own by empirical science. Haeckel, hurt in his vanity by Dubois Raymond, is never tired of publicly complaining of the latter's onslaught on his fantastic theory of descent. Rhapsodizing on the exceedingly rich storehouse of empirical evidence, he calls those recognized physiologists, who oppose every speculation of his drawn from the said storehouse, ignorant men, and declares, if many men and among them even some scientists of repute, hold that the whole of phylogeny is a castle in the air, and genealogical trees, from monkeys, are empty plays of fantasy. They only in speaking thus demonstrate their ignorance of that wealth of empirical sources of knowledge, to which reference has already been made. We open Webster's Dictionary and read the definitions of the word empirical. Depending upon experience or observation alone, without due regard to modern science and theory. This applies to the occultists, spiritualists, mystics, etc. Again, an empiric, one who confines himself to applying the result of his own observations only, which is Haeckel's case, one wanting science, an ignorant and unlicensed practitioner, a quack, a charlatan. No occultist or magician has ever been treated to any worse epithets. 
Yet the occultist remains on his own metaphysical grounds and does not endeavor to rank his knowledge the fruits of his personal observation and experience among the exact sciences of modern learning. He keeps within his legitimate sphere, where he is master. But what is one to think of a rank materialist whose duty is clearly traced before him, who uses such an expression as this, the origin of man from other mammals and most directly from the Catarine ape is a deductive law that follows necessarily from the inductive law of the theory of descent. A theory is simply a hypothesis, a speculation, and not a law. To say otherwise is one of the many liberties taken nowadays by scientists. They enunciate an absurdity and then hide it behind the shield of science. The deduction from theoretical speculation is nothing more than a speculation on a speculation. Sir William Hamilton has already shown that the word theory is now used. In a very loose and improper sense, that it is convertible into hypotheses, and hypothesis is commonly used as another term for conjecture, whereas the terms theory and theoretical are properly used in opposition to the terms practice and practical. But modern science puts an extinguisher on the latter statement, and mocks the idea. Materialist philosophers and idealists of Europe and America may agree with the evolutionists as to the physical origin of man, yet it will never become a general truth with the true metaphysician. And the latter defies the materialists to make good their arbitrary assumptions. That the ape theory theme of Voigt and Darwin, on which the Huxley Heckelians have of late composed such extraordinary variations, is far less scientific, because clashing with the fundamental laws of that theme itself, than ours can ever be shown to be, is very easy of demonstration. Let the reader only turn to the excellent work on human species by the great French naturalists, the Quatrefages, and our statement will at once be verified. Moreover, between the esoteric teaching concerning the origin of man and Darwin's speculations, no man, unless he is a rank materialist, will hesitate. This is the description given by Mr. Darwin of the early progenitors of man. They must have once been covered with hair, both sexes having beards. Their ears were probably pointed and capable of movement, and their bodies were provided with a tail, having the proper muscles. Their limbs and bodies were also acted on by muscles which now only occasionally reappear, but are normally present in the quadrumana. The foot was then the prehensile, judging from the condition of the great toe in the fetus, and our progenitors, no doubt, were arboreal in their habits, and frequent in some warm forest-clad land. The males had great canine teeth, which served them as formidable weapons. Darwin connects man with the type of the tailed catarines, and consequently removes him a stage backward in the scale of evolution. The English naturalist is not satisfied to take his stand upon the ground of his own doctrines, and like Haeckel, on this point, places himself in direct variance with one of the fundamental laws which constitute the principal charm of Darwinism. And then the learned French naturalist proceeds to show how this fundamental law is broken. He says, In fact, in the theory of Darwin, transmutations do not take place, either by chance or in every direction. They are ruled by certain laws which are due to the organization itself. If an organism is once modified in a given direction, it can undergo secondary or tertiary transmutations, but will still preserve the impress of the original. It is the law of permanent characterization, which alone permits Darwin to explain the filiation of groups, their characteristics, and their numerous relations. It is by virtue of this law that all the descendants of the first mollusk have been mollusks. All the descendants of the first vertebrate have been vertebrates. It is clear that this constitutes one of the foundations of the doctrine. It follows that two beings belonging to two distinct types can be referred to a common ancestor, but the one cannot be the descendant of the other. Now man and apes present a very striking contrast in respect to type. Their organs correspond almost exactly term for term, but these organs are arranged after a very different plan. In man they are so arranged that he is essentially a walker while in apes they necessitate his being a climber. There is here an anatomical and mechanical distinction. A glance at the page where Huxley has figured side by side a human skeleton and the skeletons of the most highly developed apes is a sufficiently convincing proof. The consequence of these facts 
from the point of view of the logical application of the law of permanent characterizations, is that man cannot be descended from an ancestor who is already characterized as an ape. Any more than a catarine tailless ape can be descended from a tailed catarine. A walking animal cannot be descended from a climbing one. This was clearly understood by Voigt. In placing man among the primates, he declares without hesitation that the lowest class of apes have passed the landmark, the common ancestor, from which the different types of this family have originated and diverged. This ancestor of the apes, occult science sees in the lowest human group during the Atlantean period, as shown before. We must then place the origin of man beyond the last ape, corroborating our doctrine, if we wish to adhere to one of the laws most emphatically necessary to the Darwinian theory. We then come to the prosomai of Haeckel, the Loris, Indris, etc. But these animals are also climbers. We must go further, therefore, and search for our first direct ancestor. But the genealogy by Haeckel brings us from the latter to the marsupials, from men to the kangaroo. The distance is certainly great. Now neither living nor extinct fauna show the intermediate types which ought to serve as landmarks. This difficulty causes but slight embarrassment to Darwin. We know that he considers the want of information upon similar questions as proof in his favor. Haeckel, doubtless, is as little embarrassed. He admits the existence of an absolutely theoretical pithecoid man. Thus, since it has been proved that, according to Darwinism itself, the origin of man must be placed beyond the 18th stage, and since it becomes, in consequence, necessary to fill up the gap between marsupials and man, Will Haeckel admit the existence of four unknown intermediate groups instead of one? Will he complete his genealogy in this manner? It is not for me to answer. But see Haeckel's famous genealogy, the pedigree of man, called by him the ancestral series of man. In the second division, 18th stage, he describes Prosome, allied to the Loris, Stenops, and Mackies, Lemur, without marsupial bones and cloaca, with placenta. And now turn to quatrophages, the human species, and see his proofs based on the latest discoveries to show that the prosimi of Haeckel have no decidua and a diffuse placenta. They cannot be the ancestors of the apes even, let alone man, according to a fundamental law of Darwin himself, as the great French naturalist shows. But this does not dismay the animal theorists in the least, for self-contradiction and paradoxes are the very soul of modern Darwinism. Witness Mr. Huxley, having himself shown with regard to fossil man and the missing link that neither in quaternary ages nor at the present time does any intermediary being fill the gap which separates man from the troglodyte. And that to deny the existence of this gap would be as reprehensible as absurd the great man of science denies his own words in Akshu by supporting with all the weight of his scientific authority that most absurd of all the theories, the descent of man from an ape, says to Quatrophages, This genealogy is wrong throughout and is founded on a material error. Indeed, Haeckel bases his descent on man in the 17th and 18th stages, the marsupialia and prosomai, genus Haeckel applying the latter term to the lemuridae, hence making of them animals with the placenta, he commits a zoological blunder. For after having himself divided mammals according to their anatomical differences into two groups, the indeciduata, which have no decidua, or special membrane uniting the placentae, and the deciduata, those who possess it, he includes the prosomai in the latter group. Now we have shown elsewhere what other men of science had to say to this. As de Quatrefages says, the anatomical investigations of Milne, Edwards, and Grandidier upon the animals place it beyond all doubt that the prosomai of Haeckel have no decidua and a diffuse placenta. They are indeciduata. Far from any possibility of their being the ancestors of the apes, according to the principles laid down by Haeckel himself, they cannot even be regarded as the ancestors of the zooplacental mammals, and ought to be connected with the pachydermata, and the edentata, and the cetacea. And yet Haeckel's inventions pass with some as exact science. The above mistake, if indeed it be one, is not even hinted at in Haeckel's pedigree of man, 
translated by Aveling. If the excuse may stand good at the time the famous genealogies were made, the embryogenesis of the Prosimai was not known. It is familiar now. We shall see whether the next edition of Aveling's translation will have this important error rectified, or if the 17th and 18th stages will remain as they are blind to the profane, as one of the real intermediate links. But as the French naturalist observes, there, Darwin and Haeckel's, process is always the same, considering the unknown as a proof in favor of their theory. It comes to this, grant to man an immortal spirit and soul, endow the whole animate and inanimate creation with the monadic principle, gradually evolving from the latent and passive into active and positive polarity, and Haeckel would not have a leg to stand upon, whatever his admirers may say. But there are important divergencies even between Darwin and Haeckel. While the former makes us proceed from the tailed Caterine, Haeckel traces our hypothetical ancestor to the tailless ape, though at the same time he places him in a hypothetical stage. Immediately preceding this, Menosursa with tails, 19th stage. Nevertheless, we have one thing in common with the Darwinian school. That is the law of gradual and extremely slow evolution, embracing many millions years. The chief quarrel, it appears, is with regard to the nature of the primitive ancestor. We shall be told that the John Tohan, or the progenitor of Manu, is a hypothetical being, unknown on the physical plane. We reply that it was believed in by the whole of antiquity, and is by nine-tenths of the present humanity. Whereas not only is the pithecoid man or ape man a purely hypothetical creature of Haeckel's creation, unknown and untraceable on this earth, but further its genealogy as invented by him, clashes with scientific facts and all the known data of modern discovery in zoology. It is simply absurd, even as a fiction. As de Quatrefages demonstrates in a few words, Haeckel admits the existence of an absolutely theoretical pithecoid man, a hundred times more difficult to accept than any deva ancestor. And it is not the only instance in which he proceeds in a similar manner in order to complete his genealogical table. In fact, he very naively admits his inventions himself. Does he not confess the non-existence of his Suzura, 14th stage, a creature entirely unknown to science, by confessing over his own signature that the proof of its existence arises from the necessity of an intermediate type between the 13th and 14th stages? If so, we might maintain with as much scientific right that the proof of the existence of our three ethereal races and of the three-eyed men of the third and fourth root races, arises also from the necessity of an intermediate type between the animal and the gods. What reason would the Hecalians have to protest in this special case? Of course, there is a ready answer, because we do not grant the presence of the monadic essence. The manifestation of the Logos as individual consciousness in the animal and human creation is not accepted by exact science, nor does it cover the whole ground, of course. But the failures of science and its arbitrary assumptions are far greater on the whole than any extravagant esoteric doctrine can ever furnish. Even thinkers of the school of von Hartmann have become tainted with the general epidemic. They accept the Darwinian anthropology, more or less. Though they also postulate the individual ego as a manifestation of the unconscious, the Western presentation of the Logos or primeval divine thought. They say the evolution of the physical man is from the animal but that mind in its various phases is altogether a thing apart from material facts, though organism, as a a potty, is necessary for its manifestation. But one can never see the end of such wonders with Haeckel and his school, whom the occultists and theosophists have every right to consider as materialistic tramps trespassing on private metaphysical grounds. Not satisfied with the paternity of Bathybius, Hakeli, plus digular souls and atom souls are now invented on the basis of purely blind mechanical forces of matter, we are informed that the study of evolution of soul life shows that this has worked its way up from the lower stages of the simple cell soul, through an astonishing series of gradual stages in evolution, up to the soul of man. Astonishing, truly, based as this wild speculation is on the consciousness of the nerve cells. For as he tells us, Little as we are in a position, at the present time, to explain fully the nature of consciousness, yet the comparative and genetic observation of it clearly shows that it is only a higher and more complex function of the nerve cells. 
Mr. Herbert Spencer's Song on Consciousness is sung, it seems, and may henceforth be safely stored up in the lumber room of obsolete speculations. Where, however, do Haeckel's complex functions of his scientific nerve cells land him? Once more, right into the occult and mystic teachings of the Kabbalah, about the descent of souls as conscious and unconscious atoms, among the Pythagorean monad and the monads of Leibniz, and the gods, monads, and atoms of their esoteric teaching, into the dead letter of occult teachings, left to the amateur Kabbalists and professors of ceremonial magic. For this is what he says in explaining his newly coined terminology. Plastidual souls, the plastidules or protoplasmic molecules, the smallest homogeneous parts of the protoplasm, are, on our plastid theory, to be regarded as the active factors of all life functions. The plastidular soul differs from the inorganic molecular soul in that it possesses memory. This he develops in his mirific lecture on the perigenesis of plastidule, or the wave motions of living particles. It is an improvement on Darwin's theory of pangenesis, and a further approach, a cautious move towards magic. The former is a conjecture that some of the actual identical atoms which form part of the ancestral bodies are thus transmitted through their descendants for generation after generation, so that we are literally flesh of the flesh, of the primeval creature who has developed into man. Explains the author of A Modern Zoroastrian. The latter, occultism, teaches that a. the life atoms of our prana, life principle, are never entirely lost when a man dies, that the atoms best impregnated with the life principle, an independent, eternal, conscious factor, are partially transmitted from father to son by heredity, and are partially drawn once more together and become the animating principle of the new body, in every new incarnation of the monads, because b. As the individual soul is ever the same, so are the atoms of the lower principles, the body, its astral or life double, etc., drawn as they are by affinity and karmic law always to the same individuality in a series of various bodies. To be just and, to say the least, logical, our modern Haeckelians ought to pass a resolution that henceforth the perigenesis of the plastidule and other similar lectures should be bound up with those on esoteric Buddhism and the seven principles in man. Thus, the public will have a chance at any rate of comparing the two teachings and then of judging which is more or less absurd, even from the standpoint of materialistic and exact science. Now, the occultists who trace every atom in the universe, whether an aggregate or single, to one unity, the universal life, who do not recognize that anything in nature can be inorganic, who know of no such thing as dead matter, the occultists are consistent with their doctrine of spirit and soul when speaking of memory of every atom of will and sensation. But what can a materialist mean by the qualification? The law of biogenesis, in the sense applied to it by the Hekelians, is the result of the ignorance on the part of the man's... The law of biogenesis, in the sense applied to it by the Hekelians, is the result of the ignorance on the part of the man of science of occult physics? We know and speak of life atoms, and of sleeping atoms, because we regard these two forms of energy, the kinetic and the potential, as produced by one and the same force, or the one life, and regard the latter as the source and mover of all. But what is it that furnished with energy, and especially with memory, the plastidular souls of Haeckel, the wave motion of living particles, becomes comprehensible on the theory of a spiritual one life, of a universal vital principle independent of our matter, and manifesting as atomic energy only on our plane of consciousness. It is that which, individualized in the human cycle, is transmitted from father to son. Now, Haeckel, modifying Darwin's theory, suggests more plausibility as the author of a modern Zoroastrian thinks, that not the identical atoms, but their peculiar motions and mode of aggregation have been thus transmitted. By heredity? If Haeckel, or any other scientist, knew more than any of them does know of the nature of the atom, he would not have improved the occasion in this way for he only states in more metaphysical language than Darwin. One and the same thing. The life principle, or life energy, which is omnipresent, eternal, indestructible, is a force and a principle as noumenon, while it is atoms, as phenomenon. It is one and the same thing, and cannot be considered as separate except in materialism. Further, Haeckel enunciates, 
concerning the atom souls that which at first sight appears as occult, as the monad of Leibniz. The recent contest as to the nature of atoms, which we must regard as in some form or other the ultimate factors in all physical and chemical processes, seems to be capable of easiest settlement by the conception of these very minute masses possess, as centers of force, a persistent soul, that every atom has sensation and the power of movement. He does not say a word concerning the fact that this is Leibniz's theory, and one that is preeminently a cult nor does he understand the term soul as we do. For with Haeckel, it is simply along with consciousness, the product of the gray matter of the brain, a thing which, as the cell soul, is as indissolubly bound up with the protoplasmic body as is the human soul with the brain and the spinal cord. He rejects the conclusions of Kant, Herbert Spencer, of Dubois, Raymond, and Tyndall. The latter expresses the opinion of all the great men of science, as of the greatest thinkers of this and past ages, in saying that, the passage from the physics of the brain to the corresponding facts of consciousness is unthinkable. Where our minds and senses go, illuminated as to enable us to see and feel the very molecules of the brain, were we capable of following all their motions, all their groupings, electric discharges, we should be far as ever from the solution of the problem. The chasm between the two classes of phenomena would still remain intellectually impassable. But the complex function of the nerve cells of the great German empiric, or in other words, his consciousness, will not permit him to follow the conclusions of the greatest thinkers of our globe. He is greater than they. He asserts this and protests against all. No one has the right to hold that in the future we shall not be able to pass beyond these limits of our knowledge that today seem impassable. And he quotes from Darwin's introduction to the descent of man, the following words which he modestly applies to his scientific opponents and himself. It is always those who know little, and not those who know much, that positively affirm that this or that problem will ever be solved by science. The world may rest satisfied. The day is not far off when the thrice great Haeckel will have shown, to his own satisfaction, that the consciousness of Sir Isaac Newton was, physiologically speaking, but the reflex action, or minus consciousness, caused by the perigenesis of the plastitudes of our common ancestor and old friend, the Moneron, Hekeli. Though the said Bithybius has been found out and exposed as a pretender simulating the organic substance, it is not, and though among the children of men, Lot's wife alone, and even this, only after her disagreeable metamorphosis, could claim as her forefather the pinch of salt it is. All this will not dismay him in the least. He will go on asserting, as coolly as he always done, that it was only the peculiar mode and motion of the ghost of the long-vanished atoms of our father Bithybius which transmitted across aeons of time into the cell tissue of the gray matter of the brains of every great man, caused Sophocles and Esclesius and Shakespeare as well to write their tragedies, Newton his Principia, Humboldt his Cosmos, etc. It also prompted Haeckel to invent Greco-Latin names three inches long and pretending to mean a good deal and meaning nothing. Of course we are quite aware that the true, honest evolutionist agrees with us and that he is the first to say that not only is the geological record imperfect, but that there are enormous gaps in the series of hitherto discovered fossils, which can never be filled. He will tell us, moreover, that no evolutionist assumes that man is descended from any existing ape or any extinct ape either, but that man and apes originated probably aeons back in some common root stock. Still, as de Quatrefages points out, he will urge as an evidence corroborating his claim this wealth of absent proofs as well, saying that all living forms have not been preserved in the fossil series, the chances of preservation being few and far between, even primitive man, burying or burning his dead. This is just what we ourselves claim. It is just as possible that the future may have in store for us the discovery of the giant skeleton of an Atlantean, 30 feet high, as of the fossil of the Pithecoid, missing link. Only the former is more probable. Section 3. The Fossil Relics of Man and the Anthropoid Ape Geological Facts Bearing on the Question of Their Relationship the data derived from scientific research as to primeval man and the ape lend no countenance to theories deriving the former from the latter. Where, then, must we look for primeval man? Still queries Mr. Huxley, after having vainly searched for him in the very depths of the quaternary strata. 
was the oldest Homo sapiens Pliocene or Miocene, or yet more ancient, and still older strata to the fossilized bones of an ape more anthropoid or a man more pithicoid than any yet known, await the researches of some unborn paleontologist? Time will show. It will, undeniably, and thus vindicate the anthropology of the occultists. Meanwhile, in his eagerness to vindicate Mr. Darwin's descent of man, Mr. Boyd Dawkins believes that he has found all but the missing link in theory. It was due to theologians more than to geologists that, till nearly 1860, man had been considered as a relic no older than the Adamic Orthodox 6,000 years. As karma would have it, though, it was left to a French abbey, bourgeois, to give this easy-going theory even a worse blow than had been given to it by the discoveries of Banchet de Perthes. Everyone knows that the abbey discovered and brought to light good evidence that man was already in existence during the Miocene period. For flints of undeniably human making were excavated from Miocene strata. In the words of the author of Modern Science and Modern Thought, They must have either been chipped by man, or, as Mr. Boyd Dawkins supposes, by the Dryopithecus or some other anthropoid ape which had a dose of intelligence so much more superior to the gorilla or chimpanzee as to be able to fabricate tools. But in this case, the problem would be solved in the missing link discovered, for such an ape might well have been the ancestor of Paleolithic man. Or the descent of Eocene man, which is a variant offered to the theory. Meanwhile, the Dryopithecus with such fine mental endowments, is yet to be discovered. On the other hand, Neolithic and even Paleolithic man having been an absolute certainty, and as the same author justly observes, if 100 million years have elapsed since the earth became sufficiently solidified to support vegetable and animal life, the tertiary period may have lasted for 5 million or 10 million years. If the life-sustaining order of things has lasted, as Lyle supposes, for at least 200 million years. Why should not another theory be tried? Let us carry man, as a hypothesis, to the close of the Mesozoic times, admitting argumenti causa that the much more recent higher apes then existed. This would allow ample time for man and the modern apes to have diverged from the mythical ape more anthropoid, and even for the latter to have degenerated into those that are found mimicking man and using branches of trees and clubs and cracking coconuts with hammers and stones. Some savage tribes of hillmen in India build their abodes on trees, just as the gorillas built their dens. The question, which of the two, the beast or the man, has become the imitator of the other, is scarcely an open one, even granting Mr. Boyd Dawkins' theory. The fanciful characteristic of this hypothesis, however, is generally admitted. It is argued that while in the Pliocene and Miocene periods there were true apes and baboons, and man was undeniably contemporaneous with the former of these times, though, as we see, orthodox anthropology still hesitates, in the teeth of facts, to place him in the era of the Dryopithecus, which latter has been considered by some anatomists as in some respects superior to the chimpanzee or the gorilla. Yet, in the Eocene, there have been no other fossil primates unearthed and no pithecoid stocks found to save a few extinct Lumerian forms. And we find it also hinted at that the Dryopithecus may have been the missing link, though the brain of the creature no more warrants the theory than does the brain of the modern gorilla. See also Gaudry's speculations. Now we would ask who among the scientists is ready to prove that there was no man in existence in the early tertiary period. What is it that prevented his presence? Hardly thirty years ago, his existence any farther back than six or seven thousand years was indignantly denied. Now he has refused admission into the Eocene age. Next century it may become a question whether man was not contemporary with the flying dragon, the pterodactyl, the plesiosaurus an iguanodon, etc. Let us listen, however, to the echo of science. Now, wherever anthropoid apes live, it is clear that, whether as a question of anatomical structure or of climate and surroundings, man or some creature which was the ancestor of man might have lived also. Anatomically speaking, apes and monkeys are as much special variations of the mammalian type as man. 
whom they resemble bone for bone and muscle for muscle. And the physical animal man is simply an instance of the quadrumaneous type specialized for erect posture and a larger brain. If he could survive, as we know he did, the adverse conditions and extreme vicissitudes of the glacial period, there is no reason why he might not have lived in the semi-tropical climate of the Miocene period, when a genial climate extended over the Greenland and Spitsbergen. When most of the men of science who are uncomprising in their belief in the descent of man from an extinct anthropoid mammal will not accept the bare tenability that any other theory than an ancestor common to man in the Dryopithecus, it is refreshing to find, in a work of real scientific value, such a margin for compromise. Indeed, it is as wide as it can be made under the circumstances, i.e., without immediate danger of getting knocked off one's feet by the tidal wave of scientific adulation. Believing that the difficulty of accounting for the development of intellect and mortality by evolution is not so great as that presented by the difference as to physical structure between man and the highest animal. The same author says, But it is not so easy to see how this difference of physical structure arose, and how a being came into existence, which had such a brain and hand, and such undeveloped capabilities for an almost unlimited progress. The difficulty is this, the difference in structure between the lowest existing race of man and the highest existing ape is too great to admit of the possibility of one being the direct descendant of the other. The Negro in some respects makes a slight approximation towards the simian type. His skull is narrower, his brain less capacious, his muzzle more projecting, his arm longer than those of the average European man. Still, he is essentially a man and separated by a wide gulf from the chimpanzee or the gorilla. Even the idiot, or cretin, whose brain is no larger and intelligence no greater than that of the chimpanzee, is an arrested man, not an ape. If, therefore, the Darwinian theory holds good in the case of man and ape, we must go back to some common ancestor from whom both may have originated. But to establish this as a fact, and not a theory, we require to find that ancestral form, or at any rate, some intermediate forms tending towards it. In other words, the missing link. Now, it must be admitted that, hitherto, not only have no such missing links been discovered, but the oldest known human skulls and skeletons, which date to the glacial period, and are probably at least 100,000 years old, show no very decided approximation towards any such pre-human type. On the contrary, one of the oldest types, that of the men of the sepulchre cave of Cro-Magnon, is that of a fine race, tall in stature, large in brain, and on the whole superior to many of the existing races of mankind. The reply, of course, is that time is insufficient, and if man and the ape had a common ancestor, that is a highly developed anthropoid ape, certainly, and man probably, already existed in the Miocene period. Such ancestor must be sought still further back at a distance compared with which the whole quaternary period sinks into insignificance. The reply, of course, is that the time is insufficient, and if man and the ape had a common ancestor, that is a highly developed anthropoid ape, certainly, and man probably, already existed in the Miocene period. Such ancestor might be sought still further back at a distance compared with which the whole quaternary period sinks into insignificance. All this is true, and it may well make us hesitate before we admit that man is alone an exception to the general law of the universe, and is the creature of a special creation. This is more difficult to believe, as the ape family which man so closely resembled in physical structure contains numerous branches which graduate into one another, but the extremes of which differ more widely than man does from the highest of the ape series. If a special creation is required for man, must there not have been special creations for the chimpanzee, the gorilla, the orang, and for at least a hundred different species of apes and monkeys which are all built on the same lines? There was a special creation for man and a special creation for the ape, his progeny, only on other lines than ever bargained for by science. Albert Godry and others give some weighty reasons why man cannot be regarded as the crown of an ape stock. When one finds that not only was the primeval savage a reality in Miocene times, but that as de Mortelle shows, the flint relics he has left behind him were splintered by fire in that remote epoch. 
When we learn that the Dryopithecus, alone of the anthropoids, appears in those strata, what is the natural inference? That the Darwinians are in a quandary? The very man like Gibbon is still in the same low grade of development as it was when it coexisted with man at the close of the glacial period. It is not appreciably altered since the Pliocene times. Now there is little to choose between the Dryopithecus and the existing anthropoids, Gibbon, Gorilla, etc. If then the Darwinian theory is all sufficient, how are we to explain the evolution of this ape into man during the first half of the Miocene? The time is far too short for such a theoretical transformation. The extreme slowness with which variation in species supervenes renders the thing inconceivable, more especially on the natural selection hypothesis. The enormous mental and structural gulf between a savage acquainted with fire and the mode of kindling it and a brutal anthropoid is too great to bridge even an idea during so contracted a period. Let the evolutionists push back the process into the preceding Eocene, if they prefer to do so. Let them even trace both man and Dryopithecus to a common ancestor. The unpleasant consideration has, nevertheless, to be faced that in Eocene strata the anthropoid fossils are as conspicuous by their absence as is the fabulous Pithecanthropus of Haeckel. It is an exit out of this cul-de-sac to be found by an appeal to the unknown and a reference with Darwin to the imperfection of the geological record? So be it. But the same right of appeal must then equally accord it to the occultists, instead of remaining the monopoly of puzzled materialism. Physical man, we say, existed before the first bed of the Cretaceous rocks was deposited, in the early part of the tertiary age. The most brilliant civilization the world has ever known flourished at a period when the Hekelian man-ape is conceived as roaming through primeval forests, and Mr. Grant Allen's putative ancestor as swinging himself from bough to bough with his hairy mates. The degenerated Liliths of the Third Race Adam. Yet there were no anthropoid apes in the brighter days of the civilization of the Fourth Race. But karma is a mysterious law, and no respecter of persons. The monsters bred in sin and shame by the Atlantean giants, blurred copies of their bestial sires, and hence of modern men, according to Huxley, now mislead and overwhelm with error the speculative anthropologist of European science. Where did the first man live? Some Darwinists say in Western Africa, some in Southern Asia. Others again believe in an independent origin of human stocks in Asia and America from a simian ancestry. Haeckel, however, advances gaily to the charge. Starting from his Prosimia, the ancestor common to all other Caterini, including man. A link now, however, disposed of for good by recent anatomical discoveries. He endeavors to find a habitat for the primeval Pithecanthropus Alalus. In all probability, the transformation of animal into man occurred in southern Asia in which region many evidences are forthcoming that here was the original home of the different species of man. Probably southern Asia itself was not the earliest cradle of the human race, but Lumeria, a continent that lay to the south of Asia and sank later on beneath the surface of the Indian Ocean. The period during which the evolution of the anthropoid apes into ape-like men took place was probably the last part of the tertiary period, the Pliocene Age, and perhaps the Miocene Age, its forerunner. Of the above speculations, the only one of any worth is that referring to Lemuria, which was the cradle of mankind, of the physical sexual creature who materialized through long eons of the ethereal hermaphrodites. Only if it is proved by that Easter Island is an actual relic of Lemuria, we must believe that according to Haeckel, the dumb ape men, just removed from a brutal mammalian monster, built the gigantic portrait statues two of which are now in the British Museum. Critics are mistaken in terming Haeckelian doctrines abominable, revolutionary, immoral, though materialism is a legitimate outcome of the ape ancestor myth. They are simply too absurd to demand disproof. b. Western evolutionism. The comparative anatomy of man and the anthropoid in no way a confirmation of Darwinism. We are told that while every other hearsay against modern science may be disregarded, this, our denial of the Darwinian theory as applied to man, will be the one unpardonable sin. 
The evolutionists stand firm as a rock on the evidence of similarity of structure between the ape and man. The anatomical evidence, it is urged, is quite overpowering in this case. It is bone for bone and muscle for muscle, even the brain conformation being very much the same. Well, what of that? All this was known before King Herod and the writers of the Ramayana, the poets who sang the prowess and valor of Hanuman, the monkey god, whose feats were great and wisdom never rivaled, must have known as much about his anatomy and brain as does any Haeckel or Huxley in our modern day. Volumes upon volumes have been written upon this similarity, in antiquity as in more modern times. Therefore, there is nothing new given to the world or to philosophy in such volumes as Mivart's Man and Apes, or Messrs. Fisk and Huxley's Defense of Darwinism. But what are these crucial proofs of man's descent from a pithecoid ancestor? If the Darwinian theory is not the true one, we are told, if man and ape do not descend from a common ancestor, then we must explain the reason of, one, the similarity and structure between the two, the fact that the higher animal world, man and beast, is physically of one type or pattern. Two, the presence of rudimentary organs in man, i.e. traces of former organs now atrophied by disuse, some of these organs, it is asserted, could not have had any scope for employment, except in a semi-animal, semi-arboreal monster. Why again do we find in man those rudimentary organs, as useless as its rudimentary wing is to the apatrix of Australia, the vermiform appendix of the cacum, the ear muscles, the rudimentary tail, with which children are still sometimes born, etc.? Such is the war cry and the cackle of the smaller fry among the Darwinians is louder, if possible, than even that of the scientific evolutionists themselves. Furthermore, the latter, with their great leader Mr. Huxley and such eminent zoologists as Mr. Romanes and others, while defending the Darwinian theory, are the first to confess the almost insuperable difficulties in the way of its final demonstration. And there are as great men of science as the above named, who deny most emphatically, the uncalled-for assumption, and loudly denounce the unwarrantable exaggerations on the questions of this supposed similarity. It is sufficient to glance at the works of Broca, Gratolier, Owen, Pruner Bay, and finally, at the last great work of De Quatrefages, Introduction à l'étude de races humanis, questions generales, to discover the fallacy of the evolutionists. We may say more. The exaggerations concerning this alleged similarity of structure between man and the anthropomorphous ape have become so glaring and absurd of late that even Mr. Huxley has found himself forced to protect against the two sanguine expectations. It was that great anatomist, personally who called the smaller fry to order, by declaring in one of his articles that the difference between the structure of the human body and that of the highest anthropomorphous pithecoid were not only far from being trifling and unimportant, but were, on the contrary, very great and suggestive. Every bone of a gorilla bears marks by which it might be distinguished from the corresponding bone of a man. Among the existing creatures, there is not one single intermediate form that could fill the gap between man and the ape. To ignore that gap, he added, would be no less wrong than absurd. Finally, the absurdity of such an unnatural descent of man is so palpable in the face of all the proofs and evidence as to the skull of the pithecoid compared to that of man, that the quatrophages resorted unconsciously to our esoteric theory, by saying that it is rather the apes that can claim descent from man than vice versa. As proven by Gratolier, with regard to the cavities of the brain of the anthropoids, in which species that organ develops in an inverse ratio to what would be the case, were the corresponding organs in man really the product of the development of the said organs in the apes. The size of the human skull and its brain, as well as the cavities, increase with the individual development of man. His intellect develops and increases with age, while his facial bones and jaws diminish and straighten, thus becoming more and more spiritualized, whereas with the ape it is the reverse. In its youth, the anthropoid is far more intelligent and good-natured, while the age it becomes duller, and as its skull recedes, it seems to diminish as it grows, its facial bones and jaws develop, the brain being finally crushed and thrown entirely back to make with every day more room for the animal type. 
the organ of thought, the brain, recedes and diminishes, entirely conquered and replaced by that of the wild beast, the jaw apparatus. Thus, as wittily remarked in the French work, a gorilla could, with perfect justice, address an evolutionist, claiming its right of descent from him. It would say to him, we, anthropoid apes, form a retrogressive departure from the human type, and therefore our development and evolution are expressed by a transition from a human-like to an animal-like structure of organism. But in what way could you, men, descend from us? How could you form a continuation of our genus? For to make this possible, your organization would have to differ still more than ours does from the human structure. It would have to approach still closer to that of the beast than ours does. And in such a case, justice demands that you should give up to us your place in nature. You are lower than we are, once that you insist on tracing your genealogy from our kind. For the structure of our organization and its development are such that we are unable to generate forms of a higher organization than our own. This is where the occult sciences agree entirely with the quatrophages. Owing to the very type of his development, man cannot descend from either an ape or an ancestor common to both apes and men, but shows his origin to be from a type far superior to himself. And this type is the heavenly man, the Jan Chohans, or the Petris, so-called, as shown in the first part of this volume. On the other hand, the pithecoids, the orangutan, the gorilla, and the chimpanzee can, and, as the occult sciences teach, do descend from the animalized fourth human root race, being the product of man and an extinct species of mammal, whose remote ancestors were themselves the product of Lemurian bestiality, which lived in the Miocene age. The ancestry of the semi-human monster is explained in the stanzas as originating in the sin of the mindless races of the third middle race period. When it is borne in mind that all forms which now people the earth, and so many variations on basic types originally thrown off by the man of the third and fourth round, such an evolutionist argument as that insisting on the unity and structural plan characterized all vertebrates loses its edge. The basic types referred to were very few in number in comparison with the multitude of organisms to which they ultimately gave rise. But a general unity of type has, nevertheless, been preserved through the ages. The economy of nature does not sanction the coexistence of several utterly opposed ground plans of organic evolution on one planet. Once, however, that the general drift of the occult explanation is formulated, Inference as to detail may well be left to the intuitive reader. Similarly, with the important question of the rudimentary organs discovered by anatomists in the human organism, doubtless this line of argument, when wielded by Darwin and Haeckel against their European adversaries, proved of great weight. Anthropologists who ventured to dispute the derivation of man from an animal ancestry were solely puzzled how to deal with the presence of gill clefts, with the tail problem, and so on. Here, again, occultism comes to our assistant with the necessary data. The fact is that, as previously stated, the human type is the repertory of all potential organic forms, and the central point from which these latter radiate. In this posture that we find a true evolution or unfolding, in a sense which cannot be said to belong to the mechanical theory of natural selection. Criticizing Darwin's inference from rudiments, an able writer remarks, why is it not just as probable, a true hypothesis to suppose that a man was first created with these rudimentary sketches in his organization, and that they became useful appendages in the lower animals into which man degenerated, as it is to suppose that these parts existed in full development, activity, and practical use in the lower animals out of whom man was generated? Read for Into Which Man Degenerated, the prototypes which man shed in the course of his astral developments and an aspect of the true esoteric solution is before us. But a wider generalization is now to be formulated. So far as our present fourth round terrestrial period is concerned, the mammalian fauna are alone to be regarded as traceable to prototypes shed by man. The amphibia, birds, reptiles, fishes, etc. are the resultants of the third round. Astral fossil forms stored up in the auric envelopment of the earth and projected into physical objectivity subsequent to the deposition of the first Laurentian rocks. 
evolution has to deal with the progressive modifications, which paleontology shows to have affected the lower animal and vegetable kingdoms in the course of geological time. It does not, and from the nature of things cannot, touch on the subject of the pre-physical types which served as the basis for future differentiation. Tabulate the general laws controlling the development of physical organisms. It certainly may, and to a certain extent it has acquainted itself ably to the task. To return to the immediate subject of discussion, the mammalia, whose first traces are discovered in the marsupials of the Triassic rocks of the secondary period, were revolved from purely astral progenitors contemporary with the second race. They are thus post-human, and consequently, it is easy to account for the general resemblance between their embryonic stages and those of man, who necessarily embraces in himself and epitomizes in his development the features of the group he originated. This explanation disposes of a portion of the Darwinist belief. But how to account for the presence of the gill clefts in the human fetus, which represent the stage with which the branch eye of the fish was developed, for the pulsating vessel corresponding to the heart of the lower fishes, which constitutes the fetal heart, for the entire analogy presented by the segmentation of the human ovum, the formation of the blastoderm, and the appearance of the gastrula stage, with corresponding stages in lower vertebrate life, and even among the sponges. For the various types of lower animal life, which the form of the future child shadows forth in the cycle of its growth. How comes it to pass that stages in the life of fishes, whose ancestors swam aeons before the epoch of the first root race, in the seas of the Silurian period, as well as stages in that the later amphibian, reptilian fauna, are mirrored in the epitomized history of the human fetal development? This plausible objection is met by the reply that the third round terrestrial animal forms were just as much referable to types thrown off by the third round man. As that new information into our planet's area, the mammalian stock is the fourth round humanity of the second root race. The process of the human fetal growth epitomizes not only the general characteristics of the fourth, but of the third round terrestrial life. The diapson of type is run through in brief. Occultists are thus at no loss to account for the birth of children with an actual caudal appendage, or for the fact that a tail in the human fetus is at one period double the length of the nascent legs. The potentiality of every organ useful to animal life is locked up in man, the microcosm of the macrocosm, and abnormal conditions may not unfrequently result in the strange phenomena which Darwinists regard as reversion to ancestral features. Reversion indeed, but scarcely in the sense contemplated by our present-day empiricists. C. Darwinism and the Antiquity of Man, the Anthropoids and their Ancestry The public has been notified by more than one eminent modern geologist and man of science that all estimate of geological duration is not merely imperfect, but necessarily impossible, for we are ignorant of the causes, though they must have existed, which quickened or retarded the progress of the sedimentary deposits. And now another man of science, as well known, Kroll, calculating that the tertiary age began either 15 or 2.5 million years ago, the former being a more correct calculation according to esoteric doctrine than the latter. There seems in this case at least no very great disagreement. Exact science refusing to see in man a special creation. To a certain degree, the secret doctrines do the same is at liberty to ignore the first three, or rather two and a half races, the spiritual, the semi-astral, and the semi-human, of our teachings. But it can hardly do the same in the case of the third. At its closing period, the fourth and the fifth races, since it had already divides mankind into Paleolithic and Neolithic man. The geologists of France place man in the mid-Miocene age, Gabriel de Mortelet, and even some in the secondary period. The Quatrefages suggests, while the English savants do not generally accept such antiquity for their species, but they may know better some day. For as says Sir Charles Lyell, if we consider the absence or extreme scarcity of human bones and works of art in all strata, whether marine or fresh water, even in those formed in the intermediate proximity of land, inhabited by millions of humans and beings, we shall be prepared for the general dearth of human memorials and glacial formations, whether recent, Pliocene, or of more ancient date, 
If there were a few wanderers over lands covered with glaciers, or over seas infested with icebergs, and if a few of them left their bones or weapons in moraines or in marine drifts, the chances, after the lapse of thousands of years, of a geologist meeting with one of them must be infinitesimally small. The men of science avoid pinning themselves down to any definite statement concerning the age of man, as indeed they are hardly able to make any, and thus leave enormous latitude to bolder speculations. Nevertheless, while the majority of the anthropologists carry back the existence of man only into the period of the post-glacial drift, or what is called the quaternary period, those of them who, as evolutionists, trace man to a common origin with the monkey, do not show great consistency in their speculations. The Darwinian hypothesis demands, in reality, a far greater antiquity for man than is even dimly suspected by superficial thinkers. This is proven by the greatest authorities on the question, Mr. Huxley, for instance. Those, therefore, who accept the Darwinian evolution, ipso facto, hold very tenaciously to an antiquity of man so very great indeed that it falls not so far short of the occultist's estimate. The modest thousands of years of the Encyclopedia Britannica and the hundred thousand years to which anthropology in general limits the age of humanity seem quite microscopical when compared with the figures implied in Mr. Huxley's bold speculations. The former indeed makes the original race of men ape-like cave dwellers. The great English biologist, in his desire to prove man's pithecoid origin, insists that the transformation of the primordial ape into the human being must have occurred millions of years back. For in criticizing the excellent cranial capacity of the Neanderthal skull, notwithstanding his assertion that it is overlaid with pithecoid bony walls, coupled with Mr. Grant Allen's assurances that this skull possesses large bosses on the forehead, strikingly suggestive of those which give the gorilla its peculiarly fierce appearance. Still, Mr. Huxley is forced to admit that, in the said skull, his theory is once more defeated by the completely human proportions of the accompanying limb bones, together with the fair development of the ingus skull. In consequence of all this, we are notified that these skulls clearly indicate that the first traces of the primordial stock whence man has proceeded need no longer be sought by those who entertain any form of the doctrine of progressive development in the newest tertiaries. But they may be looked for in an epoch more distant from the age of the Alphas primigenius than that is from us. An untold antiquity for man is thus, then, the scientific sine qua non in the question of Darwinian evolution since the oldest Paleolithic man shows as yet no appreciable differentiation from his modern descendant. It is only of late that modern science has with every year begun to widen the abyss that now separates her from ancient science, as that of Pliny and Hippocrates. None of the old writers would have derided the archaic teachings with respect to the evolution of the human races and animal species, as the present-day scientist, geologist, or anthropologist is sure to do. Holding as we do to the mammalian type was a post-human fourth round product. The following diagram, as the writer understands the teaching, may make the process clear. The pedigree of the apes, primeval astral man. To the left, astral mammal prototypes. In the center, second race, astral, third race, semi-astral. Separation into sexes, fourth race, physical, fifth race, Physical lower mammals and the lower apes. This unnatural union was invariably fertile, because the then mammalian types were not remote enough from their root type, primeval astral man, to develop the necessary barrier. Medical science records such cases of monsters, bred from human and animal parents, even in our modern day. The possibility is, therefore, only one of degree, not of fact. Thus it is that occultism solves one of the most strangest problems presented to the consideration of the anthropologist. The pendulum of thought oscillates between extremes. Having now finally emancipated herself from the shackles of theology, science has embraced the opposite fallacy, and in the attempt to interpret nature on purely materialistic lines, she has built up that most extravagant theory of the ages. The derivation of man from a ferocious and brutal ape. So rooted has this doctrine now become, in one form and another, that the most Herculean efforts will be needed to bring about its final rejection. The Darwin anthropology is the incubus 
of the ethnologist, the sturdy child of modern materialism, which has grown up and acquired increasing vigor as the ineptitude of the theological legend of man's creation became more and more apparent. It is thriving on account of the strange delusion that, as a scientist of repute puts it, all hypotheses and theories with respect to the rise of man can be reduced to two. The evolutionist and the biblical exoteric account, there is no other hypothesis conceivable. The anthropology of the secret volumes is, however, the best possible answer to such a worthless contention. The anatomical resemblance between man and the higher ape, so frequently cited by Darwinists as pointing to some former ancestor, common to both, presents an interesting problem. The problem solution of which is to be sought for in the esoteric explanation of the genesis of the pithecoid stocks. We have given it as far as it was useful by stating that the bestiality of the primeval mindless races resulted in the production of a huge man-like monsters, the offspring of human and animal parents. As time rolled on, and the still semi-astral forms consolidated into the physical, the descendants of these creatures were modified by external conditions, until the breed, dwindling in size, culminated in the lower apes of the Miocene period. With these, the later Atlanteans renewed the sins of the mindless this time with full responsibility. The resultants of their crime were the apes now known as anthropoid. It may be useful to compare the very simple theory, and we are willing to offer it merely as a hypothesis to the unbelievers, with the Darwinian scheme, so full of insurmountable obstacles, that no sooner is one of them overcome by a more or less ingenious hypothesis than ten worse difficulties are forthwith discovered behind the one disposed of. Section 4. Duration of the Geological Periods, Race, Cycles, and the Antiquity of Man Millions of years have sunk into Leith, leaving no more recollection in the memory of the profane than the few millenniums of the orthodox Western chronology as to the origin of man and the history of the primeval races. All depends on the proofs found for the antiquity of the human race. If the still-debated man of the Pliocene or even the Miocene period was the Homo primogenius, then science may be right, argumenti causae, in basing its present anthropology, as to the date of the mode of origin of Homo sapiens, on the Darwinian theory. But if the skeletons of man should at any time be discovered in the Eocene strata, while no fossil ape is found there, and the existence of man is thus proved to be prior to that of the anthropoid, then Darwinians will have to exercise their ingenuity in another direction. Moreover, it is said in well-informed quarters that the 20th century will be still in its earliest teens, when such undeniable proof of man's priority will be forthcoming. Even now much evidence is being brought forward to prove that the dates hitherto assigned for the foundations of cities, civilizations, and various other historical events have been absurdly curtailed. This was done as a peace offering to biblical chronology. The well-known paleontologist E. Lartet writes, No date is to be found in Genesis, which assigns a time for the birth of primitive humanity. But chronologists have for 15 centuries endeavored to force the Bible facts into agreement with their systems. Thus, no less than 140 different opinions have been formed about the single date of creation. And between the extreme variations, there is a discrepancy of 3,194 years in the reckoning of the period between the beginning of the world and the birth of Christ. Within the last few years, archaeologists have had also to throw back by nearly 3,000 years the beginnings of Babylonian civilization. On the foundation cylinder deposited by Nabonidus, the Babylonian king, conquered by Cyrus, are found the records of the former in which he speaks of his discovery of the foundation stone that belonged to the original temple built by Nerasim, son of Sargon of Acadia, the conqueror of Babylonia, who says Nabonidus lived 3,200 years before his own time. We have shown in Isis Unveiled that those who based history on the chronology of the Jews, a race which had none of its own and rejected the Western till the 12th century, would lose their way for the Jewish account could only be followed to Kabbalistic computation, and only then, with key in hand. We characterize the late George Smith's chronology of the Chaldeans and Assyrians, 
which he had made to fit in with that of Moses, as quite fantastic. And now, in this respect at least, later Assyriologists have corroborated our denial. For whereas George Smith makes Sargon I, the prototype of Moses, reign in the city of Akkad, about 1600 BC, probably out of a latent respect for Moses, whom the Bible makes to flourish 1571 BC, we now learn from the first of the six Hibbert lectures delivered by Professor A. H. Sace of Oxford in 1887 that old views of the early annals of Babylonia and its religions have been much modified by recent discovery. The first Semitic empire is now agreed was that of Sargon of Akkad, who established a great library, patronized literature, and extended his conquests across the sea into Cyprus. It is now known that he reigned as early as B.C. 3750. The Akkadian monuments found by the French at Talal must be even older, reaching back to about B.C. 4000. In other words, to the fourth year of the world's creation, agreeably with Bible chronology, and when Adam was in his swaddling clothes, perchance in a few years more than 4,000 years may be further extended. The well-known Oxford lecturer remarked in his disquisitions upon the origin and growth of religion as illustrated by the religion of the ancient Babylonians, that the difficulties of systematically tracing the origin and history of the Babylonian religion were considerable. The sources of our knowledge on the subject were almost wholly monumental, with very little help being obtained from classical or oriental writers. Indeed, it was an undeniable fact that the Babylonian priesthood intentionally swaddled up the study of the religious texts in coils of almost insuperable difficulty. That they have confused the dates, and especially the order of events intentionally, is undeniable, and for a very good reason. Their writings and records were all esoteric. The Babylonian priests did no more than priests of other ancient nations. Their records were meant only for the initiates and their disciples, and it is only for the latter who were furnished with the keys to the true meaning. But Professor Sayce's remarks are promising, for he explains the difficulty by saying that as the Nineveh Library contained mostly copies of older Babylonian texts, and the copies pitched upon such tablets only as were of special interest to the Assyrian conquerors, belonging to a comparatively late epoch. This added much to the greatest of all our difficulties, namely, are being so often left in the dark as to the age of our documentary evidence and the precise worth of our materials for history. Thus one has a right to infer that some still fresher discovery may lead to a new necessity for pushing the Babylonian dates so far beyond the year 4000 BC as to make them pre-cosmic in the judgment of every Bible worshipper. How much more would paleontology have learned had not millions of works been destroyed? We talk of the Alexandrian Library, which had been thrice destroyed, namely by Julius Caesar, 48 BC, in AD 390, and lastly in the year AD 640 by the general of Caliph Omar. What is this in comparison with the works and records destroyed in the primitive Atlantean libraries, wherein records are said to have been traced on the tanned skins of gigantic antediluvian monsters? Or again, in comparison with the destruction of the countless Chinese books by command of the founder of the imperial Xin dynasty, Xin Shi Huang Ti, in 213 BC. Surely the brick clay tablets of the imperial Babylonian library and the priceless treasures of the Chinese collections could never have contained such information as one of the aforesaid Atlantean skins would have furnished to the ignorant world. But even with the extremely meager data at hand, science has been able to see the necessity of throwing back nearly every Babylonian date, as has done so quite generously. To learn from Professor Sacy that even the archaic statues of Telo in Lower Babylonia have suddenly been assigned a date contemporary with the Fourth Dynasty in Egypt. Unfortunately, dynasties and pyramids share the fate of geological periods. Their dates are arbitrary and depend on the whims of the respective men of science. Archaeologists know now, it is said, that the aforementioned statues are fashioned out of green diorite that can only be found in the peninsula of Sinai, and they accord in the style of art and in the standard of measurement employed with the similar diorite statues of the pyramid builders of the 3rd and 4th Egyptian dynasties. 
Moreover, the only possible period for a Babylonian occupation of the Sinaitic quarries must be placed shortly after the close of the epoch at which the pyramids were built. And thus only can we understand how this name of Sinai could have been derived from that of Sin, the primitive Babylonian moon god. This is very logical, but what is the date fixed for these dynasties? Sanchoniathans and Manetho's synchronistic tables, or whatever remained of these after Holy Eusebius had the handling of them, have been rejected. And still we have to remain satisfied with the four or five thousand years BC so liberally allotted to Egypt. At all events, one point is gained. There is, at last, a city on the face of the earth which is allowed at least six thousand years, and it is Eridu. Geology has discovered it, according to Professor Sace, again. They are now also to obtain time for the silting up of the head of the Persian Gulf, which demands an elapse of between 5,000 and 6,000 years since the period when Eridu, now 25 miles inland, was the seaport at the mouth of the Euphrates, and the seat of Babylonian commerce with southern Arabia and India. More than all, the new chronology gives time for the long series of eclipses recorded in the great astronomical work called the Observations of Bell. And we were also enabled to understand the otherwise perplexing change in the position of the vernal equinox, which has occurred since our present zodiacal signs were named by the earliest Babylonian astronomers. When the Akkadian calendar was arranged and the Akkadian months were named, the sun at the vernal equinox was not, as now, in Pisces or even in Aries, but in Taurus. The rate of the precession of the equinox is being known. We learn that at the vernal equinox, the sun was in Taurus from about 4,700 years BC, and we thus obtain astronomical limits of date which cannot be impunged. It may make our position plainer if we state at once that we use Sir C. Lyle's nomenclature for the ages and periods, and that when we talk of the secondary and tertiary age, of the Eocene, the Miocene, and Pliocene periods, this is simply to make our facts more comprehensible, since these ages and periods have not yet been allowed fixed and determined durations, two and a half and fifteen million years being assigned at different times to one and the same age, the tertiary, and since no two geologists or naturalists seem to agree on this point, esoteric teaching may remain quite indifferent to the appearance of man in the secondary or the tertiary age. If the latter age may be allowed even so much as 15 million years duration, well and good. For the occult doctrine, jealously guarding its real and correct figures so far as concerns the first, second, and two-thirds of the third root race, gives clear information upon one point only, the age of Vavis Vadamanu's humanity. Another definitive statement is that during the so-called Eocene period, the continent to which the fourth race belonged and on which it lived and perished, showed the first symptoms of sinking, and that it was in the Miocene age that it was finally destroyed, save the small island mentioned by Plato. These points have now to be checked by scientific data. A. Modern scientific speculations about the ages of the globe, animal evolution, and man. May we not be permitted to throw a glance at the works of the specialists? The work on world life, comparative geology by Professor A. Winchell, furnishes us with curious data. Here we find an opponent of the nebular theory smiting with all the force of the hammer of his odium theologicum on the rather contradictory hypothesis of the great stars of science in the matter of the sidereal and cosmic phenomena based on their respective relations to terrestrial durations. The two imaginative physicists and naturalists do not fare very easily under this shower of their own speculative computations, placed side by side and cut rather a sorry figure. Thus he writes, Sir William Thompson, on the basis of the observed principles of cooling, concludes that no more than 10 million years, elsewhere he makes it 100 million, can have elapsed since the temperature of the earth was sufficiently reduced to sustain vegetable life. Hemholtz calculates that 20 million years would suffice for the original nebula to condense to the present dimensions of the sun. Professor S. Newcomb requires only 10 million to attain the temperature of 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Kroll estimates 70 million years for the diffusion of the heat. 
Bischoff calculates that 350 million years would be required for the Earth to cool from a temperature of 2,000 to 200 degrees centigrade. Riyadh, basing his estimate on observed rates of denudation, demands 500 million years since sedimentation began in Europe. Lyell ventured a rough guess of 240 million years. Darwin thought 300 million years demanded by the organic transformations, which his theory contemplates, and Huxley is deposed to demand 1,000 millions. Some biologists seem to close their eyes and leap at one bound into the abyss of millions of years, of which they have no more adequate estimate than of infinity. Then he proceeds to give what he takes to be more correct geological figures. A few will suffice. According to Sir William Thompson, the whole encrusted age of the world is 80 million years. And agreeably with Professor Houghton's calculations of a minimum limit for the time since the elevation of Europe and Asia, three hypothetical ages for three possible and different modes of upheaval are given, varying from the modest figure of 640,730 years through 4,170,000 years to the tremendous figure of 27,491,000 years. This is enough, as one can see, to cover our claims for the four continents and even the figures of the Brahmins. Further calculations, the details of which the reader may find in Professor Winchell's work, bring Houghton to an approximation of the sedimentary age of the globe to 11,700,000 years. These figures are found too small by the author, who forthwith extends them to 37 million years. Again, according to Kroll, two and a half million years represents the time since the beginning of the tertiary age. In one work, and according to another modification of his view, 15 million only have elapsed since the beginning of the Eocene period. This, being with the first of the three tertiary periods, leaves the student suspended between two and a half and 15 millions. But if one has to hold to the further moderate figures, then the whole encrusted age of the world would be 131,600,000 years. As the last glacial period extended from 240,000 to 80,000 years ago, Professor Kroll's view, therefore, man must have appeared on Earth from 100,000 to 120,000 years ago. But as says Professor Winchell with reference to the antiquity of the Mediterranean race, it is generally believed to have made its appearance during the later decline of the continental glaciers. It does not concern, however, the antiquity of the brown and black races, since there are numerous evidences of their existence in more southern regions in times remotely preglacial. As a specimen of geological certainty and agreement, these figures also may be added. Three authorities, Messrs. T. Belt, F. G. S. Robert Hunt, F. R. S. and J. Kroll, F. R. S., in estimating the time that has elapsed since the glacial epoch, give figures that vary to an almost incredible extent. Belt, 20,000 years, Hunt, 80,000 years, and Kroll, 240,000 years. No wonder that Mr. Pengeli confesses that it is at present and perhaps always will be impossible to reduce, even approximately, geological time into years or even into millenniums. A wise word of advice from the occultist to the gentleman geologists. They ought to imitate the cautious example of Masons. As chronology, they say, cannot measure the era of the creation. Therefore, their ancient and primitive rite uses 000,000,000 as the nearest approach to reality. The same uncertainty, contradictions, and disagreement reign on all other subjects. The scientific authorities on the descent of man are again for all practical purposes, a delusion and a snare. There are many anti-Darwinists in the British Association, and natural selection begins to lose ground. Though one at a time the Savior, which seemed to rescue the learned theorists from a final intellectual collapse into the abyss of fruitless hypotheses, it begins to be distrusted. Even Mr. Huxley is showing signs of truancy, and thinks natural selection not the sole factor. We greatly suspect that she, nature, does make considerable jumps in the way of variation now and then, and that these saltations give rise to some of the gaps which appear to exist in the series of known forms. Again, C. R. Bree, M.D., argues in this wise in considering the fatal gaps in Mr. Darwin's theory. 
it must again be called to mind that the intermediate forms must have been vast in numbers. Mr. George Mivart believes that change in evolution may occur more quickly than is generally believed. But Mr. Darwin sticks manfully to his belief, and again tells us, Natura non facit saltum. Here in the occultists are at one with Mr. Darwin. Esoteric teaching fully corroborates the idea of nature's slowness and dignified progression. Planetary impulses are all periodical. Yet this Darwinian theory, correct as it is in minor particulars, agrees no more with occultism than with Mr. Wallace, who in his contributions to the theory of natural selection shows pretty conclusively that something more than natural selection is requisite to produce physical man. Let us meanwhile examine the scientific objections to this scientific theory, to see what they are. Mr. St. George Mivart is found arguing that it will be a moderate computation to allow 25 million for the deposit of the strata down to and including the upper Silurian. If then the evolutionary work done during this deposition only represents a hundredth part of the sum total, we shall require two and a half billion, two thousand five hundred million years for the complete development of the whole animal kingdom to its present state. Even one quarter of this, however, would far exceed the time which physics and astronomy seem able to allow for the completion of the process. Finally, a difficulty exists as to the reason of the absence of rich fossiliferous deposits in the oldest strata. If life was then as abundant and varied as on the Darwinian theory, it must have been. Mr. Darwin himself admits that the case at present must remain inexplicable. And this may be truly urged as a valid argument against the views entertained in this book. Thus, then, we find a remarkable, and on Darwinian principles all but inexplicable, absence of minutely graduated transitional forms. All the most marked groups, bats, pterodactyls, chelonians, ichthyosaurians, amura, etc., appear at once upon the scene. Even the horse, the animal whose pedigree has been probably best preserved, affords no conclusive evidence of specific origin by significant fortuitous variations, while some forms, as the labyrinthodonts and trilobites, which seem to exhibit gradual change, are shown by further investigation to do nothing of the sort. All these difficulties be avoided if we admit the new forms of animal life are all degrees of complexity appear from time to time with comparative suddenness, being evolved according to the laws in part depending on surrounding conditions in part internal, similar to the way in which crystals, and perhaps from recent researches, the lowest forms of life, build themselves up according to the internal laws of their component substance, and in harmony with and correspondence with all environing influences and conditions. The internal laws of their component substance. These are wise words, and the admission of the possibility is prudent. But how can these internal laws ever be recognized? If occult teaching be discarded. As a friend writes, while drawing our attention to the above speculations, in other words, the doctrine of planetary life impulses must be admitted. Otherwise, why are species now stereotyped? And why do we even domesticated breeds of pigeons and many animals relapse into their ancestral types when left to themselves? But the teaching about planetary life impulses has to be clearly defined and is clearly understood, if present confusion is not to be made still more perplexing. All these difficulties would vanish as the shadows of night disappear before the light of the rising sun, if the following esoteric axioms were admitted. A. The existence in the enormous antiquity of our planetary chain. B. The actuality of the seven rounds. C. The separation of human races outside the purely anthropological division into seven distinct root races, of which our present European humanity is the fifth. D. The antiquity of man in this fourth round. And finally, E. That as these races evolve from ethereality to materiality, and from the latter back again into relative physical tenuity of texture, so every living, so called organic species of animals, with vegetation included, changes with every new root race. Were this admitted, even if only along with other, and surely on maturer consideration, no less absurd suppositions, if occult theories have to be considered absurd at present, then every difficulty would be made away with. 
Surely science ought to try and be more logical than it is now, as it can hardly maintain the theory of man's descent from an anthropoidal ancestor, and deny in the same breath any reasonable antiquity to such a man. Once Mr. Huxley talks of the vast intellectual chasm between the ape and the man, and the present enormous gulf between them, and admits the necessity of extending scientific allowances for the age of man on earth for such slow and progressive development, then all those men of science, who are of his way of thinking, at any rate, ought to come to at least some approximate figures, and agree upon the probable duration of those Pliocene, Miocene, and Eocene periods of which so much is said, and about which nothing definite is known, even if they dare not venture beyond. But no two scientists seem to agree. Every period seems to be a mystery in its duration, and a thorn in the side of the geologists. And, as just shown, they are unable to harmonize their conclusions even with regard to the comparatively recent geological formations. Thus, no reliance can be placed on their figures when they do give any. And for them, it is all either millions or simply thousands of years. That which is said may be strengthened by the confessions made by themselves, and the synopsis of these to be found in that circle of sciences, the Encyclopedia Britannica, which shows the mean accepted in the geological and anthropological riddles. In that work, the cream of the most authoritative opinions is skimmed off and presented. Nevertheless, we find in it a refusal to assign any definite chronological date, even to such comparatively speaking late epochs as the Neolithic era though for such a wonder an age is established for the beginnings of the certain geological periods. At any rate, for some few, the duration of which could hardly be any more shortened without an immediate conflicting of facts. Thus, it is surmised in the great encyclopedia that 100 million years have passed since the solidification of our earth, when the earliest form of life appeared on it. But it seems quite as hopeless to try and convert the modern geologists and ethnologists as it is to make Darwinian naturalists perceive their mistakes. About the Aryan root race and its origins, science knows of little as the men from other planets. With the exception of Flammarion, and of a few mystics among astronomers, even the habitableness of other planets is mostly denied. Yet such great adept astronomers were the scientists of the early races of the Aryan stock that they seem to have known far more about the races of Mars and Venus than the modern anthropologist knows of those of the early stages of the Earth. Let us leave modern science aside for a moment and turn to ancient knowledge. As we are assured by archaic scientists that all such geological cataclysms, from the upheaval of the oceans, deluges, and shifting of continents, down to the present years, cyclones, hurricanes, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, tidal waves, and even the extraordinary weather and seeming shifting of seasons which are perplexing all European and American meteorologists are due to and depend on the moon and the planets. Aye, that even the modest and neglected constellations have the greatest influence on the meteorological and cosmical changes over and within our Earth. Let us give one moment's attention to our sidereal despots, the rulers of our globe and men. Modern science denies any such influence. Archaic science affirms it. We will see what both say with regard to this question. B. On chains of planets and their plurality. Did the ancients know of worlds besides their own? What are the data of the occultists in affirming that every globe is a septenary chain of worlds, of which only one member is visible, and that these are, were, or will be man-bearing? just as is every visible star or planet. What do they mean by a moral and physical influence exerted on our globe by the sidereal worlds? Such are the questions often put to us, and they have to be discovered from every aspect. To the first of the two queries, the answer is, we believe it is because the first law in nature is uniformity and diversity, and the second is analogy, as above, so below. The time is gone forever when our pious ancestors believed that our earth was in the center of the universe, and the church and her arrogant servants could insist that the supposition that any other planet could be inhabited should be regarded as blasphemy. Adam and Eve, the serpent in original sin, followed by atonement through blood, have been too long in the way of progress, and universal truth has thus been sacrificed to the insane conceit of us little men. Now what are the proofs thereof? 
beyond indifferential evidence and logical reasoning, there are none for the profane. To the occultists, who believe in the knowledge acquired by countless generations of seers and initiates, the data offered in the secret books are all sufficient. The general public needs other proofs, however. There are some Kabbalists, even some Eastern occultists, who, failing to find uniform evidence upon this point, and all the mystic works of the nations, hesitate to accept the teaching. Even such uniform evidence will be forthcoming presently. Meanwhile, we may approach the subject from its general aspect and see whether belief in it is so very absurd. As some scientists, along with other Nicoda muses, would have it, unconsciously perhaps in thinking of a plurality of inhabited worlds, we imagine them to be like the globe we inhabit and to be peopled by beings more or less resembling ourselves. And in so doing, we are only following a natural instinct. Indeed, so long as the inquiry is confined to the life history of this globe, we can speculate on the question with some profit and ask ourselves, with some hope of at least asking an intelligent question, what were the worlds spoken of in all the ancient scriptures of humanity? But how do we know, A, what kind of beings inhabit the globes in general, and B, whether those who rule planets superior to our own do not exercise the same influence on our Earth, consciously, that we may exercise unconsciously, to say, on other small planets, planetoids or asteroids in the long run, by our cutting the Earth in pieces, opening canals, and thereby entirely changing our climates. Of course, like Caesar's wife, the planetoids cannot be affected by our suspicion. They are too far, etc. Believing in esoteric astronomy, however, we are not so sure of that. But when extending our speculations beyond our planetary chain, we try to cross the limits of the solar system. Then, indeed, we act as do presumptuous fools. For while accepting the old hermetic axiom, as above, so below, as well we may believe that nature on earth displays the most careful economy, utilizing every vile and waste thing in her marvelous transformations, and with all never repeating yourself, so we may justly conclude that there is no other globe in all her infinite system so closely resembling this earth, that the ordinary powers of man's thought should be able to imagine and reproduce its semblance and containment. And indeed, we find in the romances, as in all the so-called scientific fictions and spiritualistic revelations from moon, stars, and planets, merely fresh combinations or modifications of the men and things, the passions and forms of life, with which we are familiar, though even on the other planets of our own system, nature and life are entirely different from those prevailing on our own. Swedenborg was preeminent in inculcating such an erroneous belief. But even more, the ordinary man has no experience of any state of consciousness other than that to which the physical senses link him. Men dream. They sleep the profound sleep which is too deep for its dream to impress the physical brain. And in all these states there must still be consciousness. How then, while these mysteries remain unexplored, can we hope to speculate with profit on the nature of globes which, in the economy of nature, must needs belong to states of consciousness, other and quite different from any which man experiences here? And this is true to the latter, for even great adepts, those initiated of course, trained seers though they may be, can only claim through acquaintance with the nature and appearance of planets and their inhabitants belonging to our solar system. They know that almost all the planetary worlds are inhabited, but even in spirit, they can have access only to those of our system. And they are also aware how difficult it is even for them to put themselves into full rapport even with the planes of consciousness within our system, differing as they do from the states of consciousness possible on this globe. Such, for instance, as those which exist on the chain of spheres on the three planes beyond that of our Earth. Such knowledge and intercourse are possible to them because they have learned how to penetrate the planes of consciousness, which are closed to the perceptions of ordinary men. But were they to communicate their knowledge, the world would be no wiser, because men lack the experience of other forms of perception, which alone could enable them to grasp what they might be told. Still, the fact remains that most of the planets, like the stars beyond our system, are inhabited, a fact which has been admitted by the men of science themselves. Laplace and Herschel believed it, though they wisely abstained from imprudent speculation, 
And the same conclusion has been worked out and supported with an array of scientific considerations by C. Flammarion, the well-known French astronomer. The arguments he brings forward are strictly scientific, and such as appeal to even a materialistic mind, which would remain unmoved by such thoughts as those of Sir David Brewster, the famous physicist, who writes, Those barren spirits, or base souls, as the poet calls them, who might be led to believe that the earth is the only inhabited body in the universe, would have no difficulty in conceiving the earth also to have been destitute of inhabitants. What is more, if such minds were acquainted with the deductions of geology, they would admit that it was uninhabited for myriads of years. And here we come to the impossible conclusion that during these myriads of years there was not a single intelligent creature in the vast domains of the universal king. And that before the protozoic formations, there existed neither plant nor animal in all the infinity of space. Flammarion shows, in addition, that all the conditions of life, even as we know it, are present on some of at least of the planets, and points to the fact that these conditions must be much more favorable on them than they are on our Earth. Thus, scientific reasoning, as well as observed facts, concurs with the statements of the seer and the innate voice in man's own heart in declaring that life, intelligent, conscious life, must exist on other worlds than ours. But this is the limit beyond which the ordinary faculties of man cannot carry him. Many are the romances and tales, some purely fanciful, others bristling with scientific knowledge, which have attempted to imagine and describe life on other globes. But one and all they give but some distorted copy of the drama of life around us. It is either with Voltaire, the men of our own race under a microscope, or with de Bergerac, a graceful play of fancy and satire. But we always find that at the bottom the new world is but the one we ourselves live in. So strong is this tendency that even the great natural, though non-initiated seers, fall victims to it when untrained. Witness Swedenborg, who goes so far as to dress the inhabitants of Mercury, whom he meets with in the spirit world in clothes such as are worn in Europe. Commenting on this tendency, Flammarion says, It seems as if in the eyes of those authors who have written on the subject, the earth were the type of the universe, and the man of the earth, the type of that inhabitants of the heavens. It is, on the contrary, much more probable that since the nature of other planets is essentially varied, and the surroundings and conditions of existing essentially different, while the forces which preside over the creation of beings and the substances which enter into their mutual constitution are essentially distinct, it would follow that our mode of existence cannot be regarded as in any way applicable to other globes. Those who have written on this subject have allowed themselves to be dominated by terrestrial ideas and have therefore fallen into error. But Flammarion himself falls into the very error which he here condemns, for he tacitly takes the conditions of life on earth as the standard by which to determine the degree to which other planets are adapted for habitation by other humanities. Let us, however, leave these profitless and empty speculations, which, though they seem to fill our hearts with a glow of enthusiasm and to enlarge our mental and spiritual grasp, do but in reality cause a fictitious stimulation, and blind us more and more to our ignorance not only of the world we inhabit, but even of the infinitude contained within ourselves. When, therefore, we find other worlds spoken of in the Bibles of humanity, we may safely conclude that they not only refer to other states of our planetary chain and earth, but also to the other inhabited globes, stars, and planets, with all that no speculations were ever made about the latter. The whole of antiquity believed in the universality of life. But no really initiated seer of any civilized nation have ever taught that life on other stars could be judged by the standard of terrestrial life. What is generally meant by earths and worlds relates a to the rebirths of our globe after each Manvantara and a long period of obscuration, and b to the periodical and entire changes of the earth's surface when continents disappear to make room for oceans, and oceans and seas are violently displaced and sent rolling to the poles, to cede their emplacements to new continents. We may begin with the Bible, the youngest of the world scriptures. In Ecclesiastes, we read these words of the king initiate. One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh. But the earth 
abideth forever. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done, is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Under these words, it is not easy to see the reference to the successive cataclysms by which the races of mankind are swept away, or going further back to the various transitions of the globe during the process of its formation. But if we are told that this refers only to our world, as we see it now, then we shall refer to the reader to the New Testament, where St. Paul speaks of the Son, the manifested power, whom God hath appointed heir to of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, plural. This power is chokma, the wisdom and the word. We shall probably be told that by the term worlds, the stars, heavenly bodies, etc. were meant. But apart from the fact that stars were not known as worlds to the ignorant editors of the epistles, even they must have been thus known to Paul, who was an initiate, a master builder. We can quote on this point an eminent theologian, Cardinal Wiseman, in his work, I-309, treating of the indefinite period of the six days, or shall we say, too definite period of the six days, of creation and the six thousand years, he confesses that we are in total darkness as to the meaning of the statement of St. Paul, unless we are permitted to suppose that allusion is made to the period which elapsed between the first and second verses of chapter 1 of Genesis, and thus to those primitive revolutions, i.e., the destructions and the reproductions of the world, indicated in chapter 1 of Ecclesiastes, or to accept with many so others, and in its literal sense, the passage in chapter 1 of Hebrews that speaks of the creation of worlds in the plural. It is very singular, he adds, that all the cosmogonies should agree to suggest the same idea and preserve the tradition of a first series of revolutions, owing to which the world was destroyed and again renewed. Had the cardinal studied the Zohar, his doubts would have been changed into certainties. Thus saith the Idrisutta. There were old worlds which perished as soon as they came into existence, worlds with and without form called scintillas, for they were like the sparks under the smith's hammer, flying in all directions. Some were the primordial worlds which could not continue long, because the aged, his name be sanctified, had not yet as assumed his form. The workman was not yet the heavenly man. Again in the Midrash, written long before the Kabbalah of Simeon Benoiakai, Rabbi Abahu explains, The Holy One, blessed be his name, has successively formed and destroyed sundry worlds before this one. Now this refers to both the first races, the kings of Edom, and to the worlds destroyed. Destroyed means here what we call obscuration. This becomes evident when we read the explanation given further on. Still, when it is said that they, the worlds, perished, it is only meant thereby that they, their humanities, lacked the true form, till the human, our form, came into being, in which all things are comprised, and which contains all forms. It does not mean death, but only denotes a sinking down from their status, that of worlds in activity. When therefore we read the destruction of worlds, the word has many meanings, which are very clear in several of the commentaries on the Zohar and in Kabbalistic treatises. As said elsewhere, it means not only the destruction of many worlds, which have ended their life career, but also that of the several continents which have disappeared, as also their decline and geographical change of place. The mysterious kings of Adam are sometimes referred to as the worlds that had been destroyed, but it is a cloak. The kings who reign in Adam before they reigned a king in Israel, or the Edomite kings, can never symbolize the prior worlds, but only the attempts at men on this globe, the pre-Adamite races, of which the Zohar speaks, and which we explain as the first root race. For as speaking of the six earths, the six limbs of Microprosopus, it is said that the seventh, our earth, came into the computation when the six were created, the six spheres above our globe in the terrestrial chain. So the first seven kings of Edom are left out of the calculation in Genesis. By the law of analogy and permutation, in the Chaldean Book of Numbers, as also in the Book of Knowledge and of Wisdom, the seven primordial worlds meant also the seven primordial races, sub-races of the first root race of the shadows, 
And again, the kings of Edom are the sons of Esau, the father of the Edomites, i.e., Esau represents in the Bible the race which stands between the fourth and the fifth, the Atlantean and the Aryan. Two nations are in thy womb, said to the Lord Rebekah. And Esau was red and hairy. From verse 24 to 34, chapter XXV of Genesis contains the allegorical history of the birth of the fifth race. Says the Zifra, Zenutha, and the king of ancient days died and their chiefs, crowns, were found no more. And the Zohar states, The head of a nation that has not been formed at the beginning in the likeness of the white head, its people is not from this form. Before it, the white head, the fifth race, or ancient of the ancients, arranged itself in its own and present form. All worlds have been destroyed. Therefore, it is written, And Bela, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom. Genesis XXVI Here the worlds stand for races, and he, such or another king of Edom, died and another reigned in his stead. No Kabbalist has hitherto treated of the symbolism and allegory hidden under these kings of Edom seems to have perceived more than one aspect of them. They are neither the worlds that were destroyed, nor the kings that died, alone, but both, and much more, to treat of which there is no space at present. Therefore, leaving the mystic parables of the Zohar, we will return to the hard facts of materialistic science. First, however, citing a few from the long list of great thinkers who have believed in the plurality of inhabited worlds in general and in worlds that preceded our own. These are the great mathematicians, Leibniz, and Bernoulli, Sir Isaac Newton himself, as may be read in his optics, Buffon, the naturalist, Condillac, the skeptic, Bailey, Lavatar, Bernardin, St. Pierre, and as a contrast to the last two named, suspected at least of mysticism, Diderot, and most of the writers of the encyclopedia. Following these come Kant, the founder of modern philosophy, the poet-philosophers Goethe, Krauss, Schelling, and many astronomers, from Bode, Ferguson, and Herschel, to Lalande and Laplace, with their many disciples in more recent years. A brilliant list of honored names indeed. But the facts of physical astronomy speak even more strongly than these names in favor of the presence of life, of even organized life on other planets. Thus, in four meteorites which fell respectively at Alais in France, in the Cape of Good Hope, in Hungary, and again in France on analysis, there was found graphite, a form of carbon known to be invariably associated with organic life on this earth of ours. And that the presence of this carbon is not due to any action occurring within our atmosphere is shown by the fact that carbon has been found in the very center of a meteorite, while in one which fell at Arguel in the south of France in 1857, there was found water and turf, the latter being always formed by the decomposition of vegetable substances. And further, examining the astronomical conditions of the other planets, it is easy to show that several are far better adapted for the development of life and intelligence, even under the conditions which men are acquainted, than is our Earth. For instance, on the planet Jupiter, the seasons instead of varying between wide limits as do ours, change by almost imperceptible degrees, and last twelve times as long as ours. Owing to the inclination of its axis, the seasons on Jupiter are due almost entirely to the eccentricity of its orbit, and hence change slowly and regularly. We shall be told that no life is possible on Jupiter, as it is in an incandescent state. But not all astronomers agree with this. For instance, what we state is declared by M. Flammarion, and he ought to know. On the other hand, Venus would be less adapted for human life, such as exists on Earth, since its seasons are more extreme and its changes of temperature more sudden. Though it is curious that the duration of the day is nearly the same on the four inner planets, Mercury, Venus, the Earth, and Mars. On Mercury, the sun's heat and light are seven times what they are on the Earth, and astronomy teaches that it is enveloped in a very dense atmosphere. And as we see that life appears more active on Earth in proportion to the light and heat of the Sun, it would seem more than probable that its intensity is far, far greater on Mercury than here. Venus, like Mercury, has a very dense atmosphere, as also has Mars. 
and the snows which cover their poles, the clouds which hide their surface, the geographical configuration of their seas and continents, the variations of seasons and climates are all closely analogous, at least to the eye of the physical astronomer. But such facts, and the considerations to which they give rise, have reference only to the possibility of the existence on these planets of human life as known on Earth. That some forms of life, such as we know, are possible on these planets, has been long since abundantly demonstrated. And it seems perfectly useless to go into detailed questions on the physiology, etc., of these hypothetical inhabitants, since... After all, the reader can arrive only at an imaginary extension of his familiar surroundings. It is better to rest content with the three conclusions which M. Flammarion, whom we have so largely quoted, formulates as rigorous and exact deductions from the known facts and laws of science. 1. The various forces which were active in the beginning of evolution gave birth to a great variety of beings on the several worlds, both in the organic and inorganic kingdoms. Two. The animated beings were constituted from the first according to forms and organisms in correlation with the physiological state of each inhabited globe. 3. The humanities of other worlds differ from us as much in their inner organization as in their external physical type. Finally, the reader who may be disposed to question the validity of these conclusions as being opposed to the Bible may be referred to an appendix in M. Flammarion's work dealing in detail with this question. Since, in a work like the present, it seems unnecessary to point out the logical absurdity of those churchmen who deny the plurality of worlds on the ground of biblical authority. In this connection, we may well recall those days when the burning zeal of the primitive church opposed the doctrine of the earth's rotundity. On the ground that the nations at the Antipodes would be outside the pale of salvation. And again, we may remember how long it took for a nascent science to break down the idea of a solid firmament in the grooves of which the stars moved for the special edification of terrestrial humanity. The theory of Earth's rotation was met by a like opposition, even to the martyrdom of its discoverers, because besides depriving our orb of its dignified central position in space, the theory produced an appalling confusion of ideas as to the ascension, the terms up and down being proved to be merely relative, thus complicating not a little of the question of the precise locality of heaven. According to the best modern calculations, there are no less than 500 million stars of various magnitudes, within the range of the best telescopes. As to the distances between them, they are incalculable. Is then our microscopical Earth a grain of sand on an infinite seashore, the only center of intelligent life? Our own sun itself, 1,300,000 times larger than our planet? sinks into insignificance beside the giant sun, Sirius, and the latter in its turn is dwarfed by other luminaries in infinite space? The self-centered conception of Jehovah, as the special guardian of a small and obscure semi-nomadic tribe, is tolerable besides that which confines sentient existence to our microscopic globe. The primary reasons were without doubt. A. Astronomical ignorance on the part of the early Christians coupled with an exaggerated appreciation of man's own importance, a crude form of selfishness, and b. the dread that, if the hypothesis of millions of other inhabited globes were accepted, the crushing rejoinder would ensue. Was there then a revelation to each world, involving the idea of the Son of God eternally going the rounds, as it were? Happily, it is now unnecessary to waste time and energy in proving the possibility of the existence of such worlds. All intelligent persons admit it. That which now remains to be demonstrated is that if it is once proven that there were inhabited worlds besides our own, with humanities entirely different from each other, as from our own, as maintained in the occult sciences, then the evolution of the preceding races have proved. For where is that physicist or geologist who is prepared to maintain that the earth has not changed scores of times in the millions of years which have elapsed in the course of its existence, and that changing its skin, as it is called in occultism, the earth has not had each time her special humanities adapted to such atmospheric and climactic conditions, as were entailed by such change? And if so, 
Why should not our preceding four and entirely different mankinds have existed and thrived before our Adamic fifth root race? Before closing our debate, however, we have to examine the so-called organic evolution more closely. Let us search well and see whether it is quite impossible to make our occult data and chronology agree, up to a certain point, with those of science. C. Supplementary Remarks on Esoteric Geological Chronology It seems possible to calculate the approximate duration at any rate of the geological periods from the combined data of science and occultism now before us. Geology is, of course, able to determine one thing with almost certainty, the thickness of several deposits. Now, it also stands to reason that the time required for the deposition of any stratum on the sea bottom must bear a strict proportion to the thickness of the mass thus formed. Doubtless, the rate of the erosion of land, and of the sorting out of matter onto the ocean beds, has varied from age to age, and cataclysmic changes of various kinds have broken the uniformity of ordinary geological processes. Provided, then, that we have some definite numerical basis on which to work, our task is rendered less difficult than it might at first appear. Making due allowance for variations in the rate of deposit, Professor Lefebvre gives us the relative figures which sum up geological time. He does not attempt to calculate the lapse of years since the first bed of the Laurentian rocks was deposited, but postulating that time as X, he presents us with the relative proportions in which the various periods stand to it. Let us premise our estimate by stating that, roughly speaking, the primordial rocks are 70,000 feet, the primary 42,000 feet, the secondary 15,000 feet, the tertiary 5,000 feet, and the quaternary some 500 feet in thickness. Dividing into a hundred parts the time, whatever its actual length, that has passed since the dawn of life on this earth, lower Laurentian strata, we shall be led to attribute to the primordial age more than half of the whole duration, say 53.5, to the primary 32.2, to the secondary 11.5, to the tertiary 2.3, to the quaternary 0.5, or one half percent. Now, as it is certain and occult data, that the time which elapsed since the first sedimentary deposits is 320 million years, we are able to construct the following table. Rough approximations of length of geological periods in years. Primordial, Laurentian, Cambrian, Silurian, 170 million, 200,000. Primary, Devonian, Coal, Permian, 103 million, 40,000. Secondary, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, 36,800,000. Tertiary, Eocene, Miocene, Pliocene, 7,360,000. And quaternary, 1,600,000. Such estimates harmonize with the statements of esoteric ethnology in almost every particular. The tertiary Atlantean part cycle from the apex of glory of that race, in the early Eocene to the great mid-Miocene cataclysm, would appear to have lasted some three and a half to four million years. If the duration of the quaternary is not, as seems likely, rather overestimated, the sinking of Ruta and Dacia would be post-tertiary. It is probable that the results here given allow somewhat too long a period to both the tertiary and quaternary as the third root race goes back very far into the secondary age. Nevertheless, the figures are most suggestive. But the argument from geological evidence being in favor of only 100 million years, let us compare our claims and teachings with those of exact science. Mr. Edward Claude, in referring to M. de Mortelet's work Materiau pour la histoire de la Homme, which places man in the mid-Miocene period, remarks that it would be in defiance of all that the doctrine of evolution teaches, and moreover when no support from believers in special creation and the fixity of species, to seek for so highly specialized a mammalian as man at an early stage in the life history of the globe. To this, one can answer, a. the doctrine of evolution, as inaugurated by Darwin and developed by later evolutionists, is not only the reverse of infallible, but it is repudiated by several great men of science. Example, de Quatrefages in France, Dr. Wiseman, an ex-evolutionist in Germany, and many others. The ranks of the anti-Darwinist growing stronger with every year. 
and B, truth to be worthy of its name, and remain truth in fact, hardly needs to beg for support from any class or sect. For were it to win support from believers in special creation, it would never gain the favor of the evolutionists, and vice versa. Truth must rest upon its own firm foundation of facts, and take its chance of recognition, when every prejudice in the way is disposed of. Though the question has been already fully considered in its main aspect, it is nevertheless advisable to combat every so-called scientific objection as we go along. When making what are regarded as heretical and anti-scientific statements, let us briefly glance at the divergencies between orthodox and esoteric science on the question of the age of the globe and of man. With the two respective synchronistic tables before him, the reader will be enabled to see at a glance the importance of these divergencies and to perceive at the same time that it is not impossible, nay, it is most likely, that further discoveries in geology and the finding of fossil remains of man will force science to confess that it is esoteric philosophy which is right after all, or at any rate, nearer to the truth. Parallelism of Life Scientific Hypothesis Science divides the period of the globe's history, since the beginning of life on Earth, or the Azoic Age, into five main divisions or periods, according to Haeckel. Esoteric Theory Leaving the classification of the geological periods to Western science, esoteric philosophy divides only the life periods on the globe. In the present Manmantar, the actual period is separated into seven kalpas and seven great human races. Its first kalpa answering to the primordial epoch is the age of the Back to the scientific hypotheses, primordial epoch, Laurentian, Cambrian, Silurian. The primordial epoch, science tells us, is by no means devoid of vegetable and animal life. In the Laurentian deposits are found specimens of the Eozoon canadense, a chambered shell. In the Silurian are discovered seaweeds, algae, mollusks, crustacea, and lower marine organisms, also the first trace of fishes. The primordial epoch shows algae, mollusks, crustacea, polyps, and marine organisms, etc. Science teaches, therefore, that marine life was present from the very beginnings of time, leaving us, however, to speculate for ourselves as how life appeared on earth. If it rejects the biblical creation, as we do, why does it not give us another, approximately plausible, hypothesis? And back to the esoteric theory, primeval. Devas are divine men, the creators and progenitors. The esoteric philosophy agrees with the statement made by science. See parallel column. Demurring, however, to one particular, the 300 million years of vegetable life. See Brahmanical chronology. Preceded the divine men, or progenitors. Also, no teaching denies that there were traces of life within the earth, besides the Eozoan canadense, in the primordial epoch. Only whereas the said vegetation belonged to this round, the zoological relics now found in the Laurentian, Cambrian, and Silurian systems, so-called, are the relics of the third round. At first astral, like the rest, they consolidated and materialized peri passu with the new vegetation. Back to the scientific hypothesis, primary, Devonian, coal, Permian, fern forest, Siligeria, coniferae, fishes, first trace of reptiles, thus saith modern science. Back to the esoteric theory column, primary, divine progenitors, secondary groups, and the two and a half races. The esoteric doctrine repeats that which was said above. These are all relics of the preceding round. Once, however, the prototypes are projected out of the astral envelope of the earth, an indefinite amount of modification ensues. Back to the scientific hypothesis, secondary, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous. This is the age of reptiles, of the gigantic megalosauri. This is the age of the reptiles, of the gigantic megalosauri, ichthyosauri, plesiosauri, etc. Science denies the presence of man in this period, but it still has to explain how men came to know of these monsters and describe them before the age of Cuvier. The old annals of China, India, Egypt, and even of Judea are full of them as demonstrated elsewhere. In this period also appear the first marsupial mammals, insectivorous, carnivorous, phytophagous, and as Professor Owen thinks, a herbivorous, hoofed mammal. Science does not admit the appearance of man before the close of the tertiary period. 
Why? Because man has to be shown younger than the higher mammals. But esoteric philosophy teaches us the reverse. And as science is quite unable to come up to anything like an approximate conclusion as to the age of man, or even as to the geological periods, the occult teaching is therefore more logical and reasonable, even if accepted only as a hypothesis. Back to the esoteric theory. Secondary. According to every calculation, the third race has already made its appearance, as during the Triassic, there were already a few mammals, and it must have separated before their appearance. This, then, is the age of the third race, in which the origins of the early fourth may perhaps also discoverable. We are, however, left entirely to conjecture, as no definite data are yet given out by the initiates. The analogy is but a poor one. Still, it may be argued that as the early mammalia and premammalia are shown in their evolution, merging from one kind into a higher one, anatomically, so are the human races in their procreative processes. A parallel might certainly be found between the monotremata, didelphia, or marasupalia, and the placental mammals, divided in their turn into the three orders, like the first, second, and third root races of men but this would require more space than can now be allotted to the subject. Back to the scientific hypothesis, the tertiary, Eocene, Miocene, Pliocene, no man is yet allowed to have lived during this period, says Mr. E. Claude in Knowledge. Although the placental mammals and the order of primates to which man is related appear in the tertiary times, and the climate Tropical in the Eocene age, warm in the Miocene, and temperate in the Pliocene, was favorable to his presence. The proofs of his existence in Europe before the close of the tertiary epoch are not generally accepted here. Back to the esoteric theory, the tertiary. The third race has now utterly disappeared, carried away by the fearful geological cataclysms of the secondary age, leaving behind it but a few hybrid races. The fourth, born Millions of years before the cataclysm took place, perished during the Miocene period, when the fifth, our Aryan race, had had one million years of independent existence. How much older is it from the origin? Who knows? As the historical period began with the Indian Aryans, with their Vedas for their multitudes, and far earlier in the esoteric records, it is useless to establish here any parallels. Geology has now divided the periods and placed man in the quaternary, Paleolithic man, Neolithic man, historical period, and in the esoteric, if the quaternary period is allowed 1.5 million years, then only does our fifth race belong to it. Yet, Mirabal Dictu, while the non-cannibal Paleolithic man who must have certainly antedated cannibal Neolithic man by hundreds of thousands of years, is shown to be a remarkable artist. Neolithic man is made out to be almost an abject savage, his lake dwellings notwithstanding. For see what a learned geologist, Mr. Charles Gould, tells the reader in his mythical monsters. Paleolithic man were unacquainted with pottery and the art of weaving, and apparently had no domesticated animals or system of cultivation. But the Neolithic lake dwellers of Switzerland had looms, pottery, cereals, sheep, horses, etc. Implements of horn, bone, and wood were a common use among both races. But those of the older are frequently distinguished by their being sculptured with great ability or ornamented with lifelike engravings of the various animals living at the period. Whereas there appears to have been a remarked absence of any similar artistic ability on the part of the Neolithic man. Let us give the reasons for this. 1. The oldest fossil man, the primitive caveman of the old Paleolithic period, and of the pre-glacial period, of whatever length and however far back, is always the same genus man, and there are no fossil remains proving for him. What the Hipparion and Ancatherium have proven for the genus horse, that is, gradual progression, specialization from a simple ancestral type to more complex existing forms. 2. As to the so-called Paleolithic hatchets, when placed side by side with the rudest forms of stone hatchets actually used by the Australian and other savages, it is difficult to detect any difference. 
This goes to prove that there have been savages at all times, and the inference would be that there might have been civilized people in those days as well, cultured nations contemporary with those rude savages. We see such a thing in Egypt 7,000 years ago. 3. An obstacle which is the direct consequence of the two preceding. A man, if no older than the Paleolithic period, could not possibly have had the actual time necessary for his transformation from the missing link into what he is known to have been during that remote geological time i.e. even a finer specimen of manhood than many of the non-existing races. The above lends itself naturally to the following syllogism. 1. The primitive man, known to science, was, in some respects, even a finer man of his genus than he is now. 2. The earliest monkey known, the lemur, was less anthropoid than the modern pithecoid species. 3. Conclusion Even though a missing link were found, the balance of evidence would remain more in favor of the ape being a degenerated man, made dumb by some fortuitous circumstances, than in favor of the descent of man from a pithecoid ancestor. The theory cuts both ways. On the other hand, if the existence of Atlantis be accepted and the statement be believed that in the Eocene age, even in its first very part, the great cycle of the fourth race men, the Atlanteans, had already reached its highest point. Then some of the present difficulties of science might easily be made to disappear. The rude workmanship of the Paleolithic tools proves nothing against the idea that, side by side with their makers, there lived nations highly civilized. We are told that only a very small portion of the Earth's surface has been explored, and of this a very small portion consists of ancient land surfaces or freshwater formations, where alone we can expect to meet with traces of the higher forms of animal life. And even these have been so imperfectly explored that where we now meet with tens of thousands and thousands of undoubted humans remain lying under most of our feet, it is only within the last 30 years that their existence has even been suspected. It is very suggestive, also, that along with the rude hatchets of the lowest savage, explorers meet with specimens of workmanship of such artistic merit as could hardly be found or expected, in a modern peasant belonging to any European country, unless in exceptional cases, the portrait of the reindeer feeding from the Thingen Grotto in Switzerland, and those of the man running with two horses, heads sketched close to him, a work of the reindeer period, i.e. at least 50,000 years ago, are pronounced by Mr. Lang to be not only exceedingly well done, but the former, the reindeer feeding, is described as one that would do credit to any modern animal painter. By no means exaggerated praise, as anyone may see by glancing at the sketch given below from Mr. Gould's work. Now, since we have our greatest painters of Europe side by side with the modern Esquimaux, who also have a tendency like their Paleolithic ancestors of the reindeer period, the rude and savage human species, to be constantly drawing with the point of their knives, sketches of animals, scenes of the chase, etc., why could not the same have happened in those days, compared with the specimens of Egyptian drawing and sketching? 7,000 years ago, the earliest portraits of men, horses, heads, and reindeer made 50,000 years ago are certainly superior. Nevertheless, the Egyptians of those periods are known to have been a highly civilized nation, whereas the Paleolithic men are called savages of the lower type. This is a small matter, seemingly, yet it is extremely suggestive as showing how every new geological discovery is made to fit with certain theories, instead of fitting the theories to include the discovery. Yes, Mr. Huxley is right in saying time will show. It will, and it must vindicate occultism. Meanwhile, the most uncompromising materialists are given by necessity into the most occult-like admissions. Strange to say, it is the most materialistic, those of the German school, who with regard to the physical development come to the nearest to the teachings of the occultists. Thus, Professor Baumgartner believes that the germs for the higher animals could only be the eggs of the lower animals. Besides the advance of the vegetable and animal world in development, there occurred in that period the formation of the new original germs, which formed the basis of the new metamorphosis, etc. The first men who proceeded from the germs of animals beneath them lived first in a larva state. Just so, in a larva state... We say, too, only from no animal germ, and that larva was the soulless astral form of the pre-physical races. And we believe, as the German professor does, with several other men of science in Europe now, that the human races 
have not descended from one pair, but appeared immediately in numerous races. Therefore, when we read Force and Matter, and find the Emperor of Materialists, Buckner, repeating after man and Hermes that, imperceptibly, the plant glides into the animal, the animal into the man. We need only to add, and man into a spirit, to complete the Kabbalistic axiom. The more so, since we read the following in Mission. Evolved by spontaneous generation, that whole rich and multiform organic world has developed itself progressively in the course of endless periods of time by the aid of natural phenomena. The whole difference lies in this. Modern science places her materialistic theory of primordial germs on earth and the last germ of life on this globe, of man, and everything else between two voids. Whence the first germ of both spontaneous generation and the interference of external forces are absolutely rejected now. Germs of organic life, we are told by Sir William Thompson, came to our earth in some meteor. This helps in no way, and only shifts the difficulty from this earth to the supposed meteor. These are our agreements and disagreements with science. About the endless periods, we are, of course, at one with materialistic speculation. For we believe in evolution, though on different lines. Professor Huxley very wisely says, If any form of the doctrine of progressive development is correct, we must extend by long epochs the most liberal estimate that has yet been made of the antiquity of man. But when we are told that this man is a product of the natural forces inherent in matter, force, according to modern views, being a quality of matter, a mode of motion, etc., and when we find Sir William Thompson repeating in 1885 what was asserted by Buckner and his school 30 years ago, we fear all our reverence for real science is vanishing into thin air. One can hardly help thinking that materialism is, in certain cases, a disease. For when men of science, in the face of magnetic phenomena and the attraction of iron particles through insulating substances like glass, maintain that the said attraction is due to molecular motion or to the rotation of the molecules of the magnet, then whether the teaching comes from a credulous theosophist innocent of any notion of physics, or from an eminent man of science, it is equally ridiculous. The individual who asserts such a theory in the teeth of fact is only one more proof that, when people have not a niche in their minds into which to shoot facts, so much the worse for the facts. At present, the dispute between the spontaneous generationists and their opponents is at rest, having ended in the provisional victory of the latter. But even when they are forced to admit, as Buckner did, and Messrs. Tyndall and Huxley still do, that spontaneous generation must have occurred once under special thermal conditions. Virchow refuses even to argue the question. It must have taken place sometime in the history of our planet, and there's an end to it. This seems to look more natural than Sir William Thompson's hypothesis just quoted, that the germ of organic life fell on our earth in some meteor or the other scientific hypothesis coupled with the recently adopted belief that there is no vital principle, whatever, but only vital phenomena, which can all be traced to the molecular forces of the original protoplasm. But this does not help science to solve the still greater problem, the origin and the descent of man, for here is a still worse plaint and lamentation. While we can trace the skeletons of Eocene mammals through several directions of specialization in succeeding tertiary times, man presents the phenomena of an unspecialized skeleton which cannot fairly be connected with any of these lines. The secret could soon be told, not only from the esoteric, but even from the standpoint of every religion the world over, without mentioning the occultists. The specialized skeleton is sought for in the wrong place, where it can never be found. Scientists expect to discover it in physical remains of man, in some pithecoid missing link, with a skull larger than that of the apes, and with a cranial capacity smaller than in man, instead of looking for that specialization in the superphysical essence of his inner astral constitution, which can hardly be excavated from any geological strata. Such a tenacious, hopeful clinging to a self-degrading theory is the most wonderful feature of the day. Meanwhile, the above is a specimen of an engraving made by Paleolithic Savage. Paleolithic meaning the earlier Stone Age man, one supposed to have been as savage and brutal as the brutes he lived with, 
leaving the modern South Sea Islander or even any Asiatic race aside, we defy any grown-up schoolboy or even a European youth, one who has never studied drawing to execute such an engraving or even a pencil sketch as good. And correct lights and shadows without any plain model before the artist, who copy direct from nature, thus exhibiting a knowledge of anatomy and proportion. The artist who engraved this reindeer belonged, we are asked to believe, to the primitive semi-animal savages, contemporaneous with the mammoth and the woolly rhinoceros, whom some overzealous evolutionists once sought to picture to us a distinct approximations to the type of their hypothetical pithecoid man. This engraved antler proves as eloquently as any fact can do that the evolution of the races is ever preceded in a series of rises and falls, that man is perhaps as old as incrustated earth, and, if we can call his divine ancestor man, is far older still. Even de Mortelet himself seems to experience a vague distrust of the conclusions of modern archaeologists when he writes, The prehistoric is a new science, far, very far from having said its last word. According to Lyle, one of the highest authorities on the subject, and the father of geology, the expectation of always meeting with a lower type of human skull, the older the formation in which it occurs, is based on the theory of progressive development, and it may prove to be sound. Nevertheless, we must remember that, as yet, we have no distinct geological evidence that the appearance of what we call the inferior races of mankind has always preceded in chronological order that of the higher races. Nor has such evidence been found to this day. Science is thus offering for sale the skin of a bear, which has hitherto never been seen by mortal eye. This concession of Lyle's reads most suggestively with the subjoined utterance of Professor Max Muller whose attack on Darwinian anthropology from the standpoint of language has, by the way, never been satisfactorily answered. What do we know of savage tribes beyond the last chapter of their history? Compare this with the esoteric view of the Australians, Bushmen, as well as of Paleolithic European man, the Atlantean offshoots retain a relic of a lost culture, which throve when the parent root race was in its prime. Do we ever get an insight into these antecedents? Can we understand what, after all, is everywhere the most important and the most instructive lesson to learn? How they have come to be what they are? Their language proves indeed that these so-called heathens, with their complicated systems of mythology, their artificial customs, their unintelligible whims and savageries, are not the creatures of today or yesterday. Unless we admit a special creation for these savages, they must be as old as the Hindus, the Greeks, and the Romans, far older. They may have passed through ever so many vicissitudes, and what we consider as primitive may be, for all we know, a relapse into savagery or a corruption of something that was more rational and intelligible in former stages. Professor George Rawlinson, M.A., remarks, The primeval savage is a familiar term in modern literature, but there is no evidence that the primeval savage ever existed. Rather, all the evidence looks the other way. In his Origin of Nations, he rightly adds, The mythical traditions of almost all nations place at the beginning of human history a time of happiness and perfection, a golden age which has no features of savagery or barbarism, but many of civilization and refinement. How was the modern evolutionist to meet this consensus of evidence? We repeat the question asked in Isis Unveiled. Does the finding of the remains of the cave of Devon prove that there were no contemporary races? than who were highly civilized? When the present population of the earth has disappeared, and some archaeologists belonging to the coming race of the distant future shall excavate their domestic implements of one of our Indian or Andaman island tribes, will he be justified in concluding that mankind in the 19th century was just emerging from the Stone Age? Another strange inconsistency in scientific theories is that Neolithic man is shown as being far more of a primitive savage than Paleolithic. Either Lubbock's prehistoric man or Evans' ancient stone implements must be at fault, or both. For this is what we learn from these works and others. One, as we pass from Neolithic to Paleolithic man, the stone implements become rude lumbering makeshifts instead of gracefully shaped and polished instruments. Pottery and other useful arts disappear as we descend the scale, and yet the latter can engrave such a reindeer. Number two, 
Paleolithic man lived in caves which he shared with hyenas and lions, whereas Neolithic man dwelt in lake villages and buildings. Everyone who has followed even superficially the geological discoveries of our day knows that a gradual improvement in workmanship is found, from the clumsy chipping and rude chopping of the early Paleolithic hatchets, to the relatively graceful stone Celts of that part of the Neolithic period immediately preceding the use of metals. But this is in Europe, only a few portions of which were barely rising from the waters in the days of the highest Atlantean civilization. There were rude savages and highly civilized people then, as there are now. If 50,000 years hence, pygmy bushmen are exhumed from some African cavern together with a far earlier pygmy elephant, such as were found in the cave deposits of Malta by Milne Edwards, Will that be a reason for maintaining that in our age all men and all elephants were pygmies? Or if the weapons of the Vedas of Ceylon are found, will our descendants be justified in setting us all down as Paleolithic savages? All the articles which geologists now excavate in Europe can certainly never date earlier than those of the Eocene Age, since the lands of Europe were not even above water before that period. Nor can what we have said be in the latest invalidated by theorists telling us that these quaint sketches of animals and men by Paleolithic man were executed only toward the close of the reindeer period. For this explanation would be a very lame one indeed, in view of the geologist's ignorance of even the approximate duration of periods. The esoteric doctrine teaches distinctly the dogma of the rising and falls of civilization. And now we learn that it is a remarkable fact that cannibalism seems to have become more frequent as man advanced in civilization, and that while its traces are frequent in Neolithic times, they become very scarce or altogether disappear in the age of the mammoth and the reindeer. Another evidence of the cyclic law and the truth of our teachings. Esoteric history teaches that idols and their worship died out with the fourth race, until the survivors of the hybrid races of the latter, Chinamen, African Negroes, etc., gradually brought the warship back. The Vedas, continents, no idols. All the modern Hindu writings do. In the early Egyptian tombs, and in the remains of the prehistoric cities, excavated by Dr. Schleiman, images of owl and ox-headed goddesses and other symbolical figures or idols are found in abundance. But when we ascend into Neolithic times, such idols are no longer found or if found, it is so rare that archaeologists still dispute as to their existence. The only ones which may be said with some certainty to have been idols are one or two discovered by M. de Bray in some artificial caves in the Neolithic period, which appear to be intended for female figures of life size. And these may have been simply statues. Anyhow, all this is one among many proofs of the cyclic rise and fall of civilization and religion. The fact that no traces of human relics or skeletons are so far found beyond post-tertiary or quaternary times, though Abbey Bourgeois of Flint's may serve as a warning, seems to point to the truth of another esoteric statement, which runs thus, Seek for the remains of thy forefathers in the high places. The vales have grown into mountains, and the mountains have crumbled to the bottom of the seas. Fourth race mankind, thinned after the cataclysm by two-thirds of its population, instead of settling on the new continents and islands of that reappeared, while their predecessors formed the floors of new oceans, deserted that which is now Europe and parts of Asia and Africa for the summits of gigantic mountains, the seas that surrounded some of the latter having since retreated and made room for the tablelands of Central Asia. The most interesting example of this progressive march is perhaps afforded by the celebrated Kent's Cavern at Torquay. In that strange reset, excavated by water out of the Devonian limestone, we find a most curious record preserved for us in the geological memoirs of the earth. Under the blocks of limestone which heaped the floor of the cavern, were discovered, embedded in a deposit of black earth, Many implements of the Neolithic period, of fairly excellent workmanship, with a few fragments of pottery, possibly traceable to the era of the Roman colonization. There is no trace of Paleolithic man here, no flints or traces of the extinct animals of the Quaternary period. When, however, we penetrate still deeper through the dense layer of stalagmite, beneath the black mold into the red earth, 
which of course itself once formed the pavement of the retreat, things assume a very different aspect. Not one implement fit to bear comparison with the finely chipped weapons found in the overlaying stratum is to be seen. Only a host of the rude and lumbering little hatchets, with which the monstrous giants of the animal world were subdued and killed by little man we have to think, and scrapers of the Paleolithic age mixed up confusedly with the bones of a species now extinct or emigrated, driven away by change of climate. It is now the artificer of these ugly little hatchets, you see, who sculpted the reindeer over the brook, on the antlers shown above. In all cases, we meet with the same evidence from historic to Neolithic, from Neolithic to Paleolithic man. Things slope downwards on an inclined plane from the rudiments of civilization to the most abject barbarism in Europe again. We are made also to face the Mammoth Age, the extreme or earliest division of the Paleolithic Age, in which the great rudeness of implements reaches its maximum, and the brutal appearance of contemporary skulls such as the Neanderthal, points to a very low type of humanity. But they may sometimes point also to something else, to a race of men quite distinct from our fifth race humanity. As said by an anthropologist in modern thought, the theory, scientifically based or not, of Harry may be considered to be equivalent to that which divided man in two species, Broca, Vire, and a number of the French anthropologists have recognized that the lower race of man, compromising the Australian, Tasmanian, and Negro race, excluding the Kafirs and the Northern Africans, should be placed apart. The fact that in this species, or rather subspecies, the third lower molars are usually larger than the second, and the squamosal and frontal bones are generally united by suture, places the Homo afer on the level of being as good a distinct species as many of the kinds of finches. I shall abstain on the present occasion from mentioning the facts of hybridity, whereon the late Professor Broca has so exhaustively commented. The history in the past ages of the world of this race is peculiar. It has never originated a system of architecture or a religion of its own. It is peculiar indeed, as we have shown in the case of the Tasmanians. However it may be, fossil man in Europe can neither prove nor disprove the antiquity of man on this earth nor the age of his earliest civilizations. It is time that the occultists should disregard any attempts to laugh at them, scorning the heavy guns of the satire of the men of science, as much as the pop guns of the profane, since it is impossible so far to obtain either proof or disproof, while their theories can stand the test better than can the hypotheses of the scientists, at any rate. As to the proof of the antiquity which they claim for man, they have Darwin himself and Lyle with them. The latter confesses that they, the naturalists, have already obtained evidence of the existence of man at so remote a period that there has been time for many conspicuous mammalia, once his contemporaries, to die out, and this even before the era of the earliest historical records. This is a statement made by one of England's great authorities upon the question. The two sentences that follow are as suggestive and may well be remembered by students of occultism, for with all others he says, in spite of the long lapse of prehistoric ages during which he, man, must have flourished on earth, there is no proof of any perceptible change in his bodily structure. If therefore he ever diverged from some unreasoning brute ancestor, we must suppose him to have existed at a far more distant epoch, possibly on some continents or islands now submerged beneath the ocean. Thus, lost continents are officially suspected, that worlds, and also races, are periodically destroyed by fire, volcanoes, and earthquakes, and water in turn, and are periodically renewed, is as doctrine as old as man. Manu, Hermes, the Chaldeans, all antiquity believed in this. Twice already has the face of the globe been changed by fire, and twice by water, since man appeared on it. As land needs rest and renovation, new forces, and a change for its soil, so does water. Thence arises a periodical redistribution of land and water, change of climates, etc., all brought on by geological revolution, and ending in a final change in the axis of the earth. Astronomers may poo-poo the idea of a periodical change in the behavior of the globe's axis, and smile at the conversation given in the Book of Enoch between Noah and his grandfather. 
Enoch, the allegory, is nevertheless a geological and an astronomical fact. There is a secular change in the inclination of the Earth's axis, and its appointed time is recorded in one of the great secret cycles. As in many other questions, science is gradually moving toward our way of thinking. Dr. Henry Woodward, FRS, FGS, writes in the Popular Science Review, If it be necessary to call in extra mundane causes to explain the great increase of ice at this glacial period, I would prefer the theory propounded by Dr. Robert Hooke in 1688, since by Sir Richard Phillips and others, and lastly by Mr. Thomas Belt, CE, FGS, namely, a slight increase in the present obliquity of the ecliptic, a proposal in perfect accord with other known astronomical facts the introduction of which involves no disturbance of the harmony which is essential to our cosmical condition as a unit in the great solar system. The following, quoted from a lecture by W. Pengeli, FRS, FGS, delivered in March 1885 on the extinct lake of Bovey Tracy, shows the hesitation in the face of every evidence in favor of Atlantis to accept the fact Evergreen figs, laurels, palms, and ferns having gigantic rhizomes have their existing congeners in a subtropical climate, such it cannot be doubted, as prevailed in Devonshire and Miocene times, and are thus calculated to suggest caution when the present climate of any district is regarded as normal. When moreover Miocene plants are found in Disco Island, on the west coast of Greenland, lying between 69 and 20 and 70 and 30 north latitude, when we learn that among them there were two species found also at Bovi, Sequoia, Kutse, Quercus, Laeli, when, to quote Professor here, we find that the splendid evergreen, Magnolia ingofetti, ripened its fruits so north as on the parallel of 70 degrees. Philip Trans Clicks 457-1869 when also the number, variety, and luxuriance of the Greenland Miocene plants are found to have been such that, had land continued so far, some of them would in all probability have floors to the pole itself. The problem of changes of climate is brought prominently into view, but only to be dismissed apparently with the feeling that the time for its solution has not yet arrived. It seems to be admitted on all hands that the Miocene plants of Europe have their nearest and most numerous existing analogues in North America. And hence arises the question, how was the migration from one area to the other affected? Was there, as some have believed, an Atlantis, a continent or an archipelago of large islands occupying the area of the North Atlantic? There is perhaps nothing unphilosophical in this hypothesis. For since, as geologists state, the Alps have acquired 4,000 and even in some places more than 10,000 feet of their present altitude since the commencement of the Eocene period. Lyle's Principles, 11th ED, page 256, 1872. A post-Miocene depression might have carried the hypothetical Atlantis into almost abysmal depths. But an Atlantis is apparently unnecessarily and uncalled for. According to Professor Oliver, a close and very peculiar analogy subsists between the flora and tertiary Central Europe and the recent floras of the American states and of the Japanese region an analogy much closer and more intimate than it is to be traced between the tertiary and recent floors of Europe. We find the tertiary element of the old world to be intensified towards its extreme eastern margin, and if not in numerical preponderance of genera, yet in features which especially give a character to the fossil flora. This succession of the tertiary element is rather gradual and not abruptly assumed in the Japan islands only. Although it there attains a maximum, we may trace it from the Mediterranean, Levant, Caucasus, and Persia, then along the Himalayan and through China. We learn also that during the tertiary epoch, counterparts of Central European Miocene genera certainly grew in Northwest America. We note further that the present Atlantic Islands flora affords no substantial evidence of a former direct communication with the mainland of the New World. The consideration of these facts leads me to the opinion that botanical evidence does not favor the hypothesis of an Atlantis. On the other hand, it strongly favors the view that at some period of the tertiary epoch, northeastern Asia was united to northwestern America, perhaps by the line where the Aleutian chain of islands now extends. Natural History Review 2, 164-1862, Art, The Atlantis Hypothesis in its Botanical Aspect. 
See, however, on these points, scientific and geological proofs of the reality of several submerged continents. But nothing short of a pithecoid man will ever satisfy the luckless searchers after the thrice hypothetical missing link. Yet if beneath the vast floors of the Atlantic, from the Tenerife pick to the Gibraltar, the ancient emplacement of the lost Atlantis, all the submarine strata were to be broken up miles deep, no such skull as would satisfy the Darwinists would be found. As Dr. C. R. Bree remarks, no missing links between man and ape have been discovered in various gravels and formations above the tertiary strata. If these forms had gone down with the continents now covered with the sea, they might still have been found. In those beds of contemporary geological strata which have not gone down to the bottom of the sea. Yet they are as fatally absent from the latter as from the former. Did not preconceptions fasten vampire like on man's mind? The author of The Antiquity of Man would have found a clue to the difficulty in the same work of his by going ten pages back to page 530 and reading over a quotation of his own professor from G. Rolleston's work. This physiologist, he says, suggests that there is considerable plasticity in the human frame, not only in youth and during growth, but even in the adult. We ought not always to take for granted, as some advocates of the developmental theory seem to do, that each advance in physical power depends upon an improvement in bodily structure. For why may not the soul or the higher intellectual and moral faculties play the first instead of the second part in a progressive scheme? This hypothesis is made in relation to evolution not being entirely due to natural selection, but it applies as well to the case in hand. For we too claim that it is the soul or the inner man that descends on earth first, the psychic astral, that mold on which physical man is gradually built, his spirit, intellectual and moral faculties awakening later on as that physical stature grows and develops. Thus, incorporeal spirits to smaller forms reduced their shapes immense, and became the men of the third and fourth races. Still later, ages after, appeared the men of our fifth race, reduced from what we should call the still gigantic stature of their primeval ancestors, to about half that size at present. Man is certainly no special creation. He is the product of nature's gradual perfective work, like any other living unit on this earth. But this is only with regard to the human tabernacle. That which lives and thinks in man and survives that frame, the masterpiece of evolution, is the eternal pilgrim, the protean differentiation in space and time of the one absolute, unknowable. In his Antiquity of Man, Sir Charles Lyell quotes, perhaps in rather a mocking spirit, what Halm says in his introduction to the literature of Europe. If man was made in the image of God, he was also made in the image of an ape. The framework of the body of him who has weighed the stars and made the lightning his slave approaches to that of a speechless brute who wanders in the forest of Sumatra, thus standing on the frontier land between animal and angelic natures. What wonder that he should partake of both. An occultist would have put it otherwise. He would say that man was indeed made in the image of a type projected by his progenitor, the creating angel force, or Jan Chohan, while the wanderer of the forest of Sumatra was made in the image of man, since the framework of the ape, we say again, is the revival, the resuscitation, by abnormal means, of the actual form of the third round and of the fourth round of man as well, later on. Nothing is lost in nature, not an atom. This is at the least certain on scientific data. Analogy would appear to demand that form should equally be endowed with permanency. And yet what do we find? Says Sir William Dawson, FRS. It is farther significant that Professor Huxley, in his lectures in New York, while resting his case as to the lower animals mainly on the supposed genealogy of the horse, which has often been shown to amount to no certain evidence, avoided altogether the discussion of the origin of man from the apes, now obviously complicated with so many difficulties that both Wallace and Mivert are staggered by them. Professor Thomas, in his recent lectures, Nature, 1876, admits that there is no lower man known than the Australian, and that there is no known link of connection with the monkeys, and Haeckel has to admit the penultimate link in his phylogeny, the ape-like man, is absolutely unknown, history of creation. The so-called tallies found with the bones of the paleocosmic men in European caves, and illustrated in the admirable works of Christie and Lartet, 
show that the rudiments even of writing were already in possession of the oldest race of men known to archaeology or geology. Again, in Dr. C. R. Bree's Fallacies of Darwinism, we read, Mr. Darwin justly says that the difference in physically, and more especially mentally, between the lowest form of man and the highest anthropomorphous ape is enormous. Therefore, the time, which in Darwinian evolution must be almost inconceivably slow, must have been enormous also during man's development from the monkey. The chance, therefore, of some of these variations being found in the different gravels or freshwater formations above the tertiaries must be very great. And yet not one single variation, not one single specimen of a being between a monkey and a man has ever been found, neither in the gravel, nor the drift clay, nor the fresh water beds, and gravel and drift, nor in the tertiaries below them. Has there ever been discovered the remains of any member of the missing families between the monkey and the man, as assumed to have existed by Mr. Darwin? Have they gone down with the depression of the earth's surface and are now covered with the sea? If so, it is beyond all probability that they should not be found also in those beds of contemporary geological strata, which have not gone down to the bottom of the sea. Still more improbable that some portions should not be dredged from the ocean bed, like the remains of the mammoth and the rhinoceros, which are also found in freshwater beds and gravel and drift. The celebrated Neanderthal skull, about which so much has been said, belongs confessedly to this remote period, bronze and stone ages, and yet presents, although it may have been the skull of an idiot, immense differences from the highest known anthropomorphous ape. Our globe being convulsed each time that it reawakens for a new period of activity, like a field which has to be plowed and furrowed before fresh seed for its new crop is thrown into it, it does seem quite hopeless that fossils belonging to its previous rounds should be found in the beds of either its oldest or its latest geological strata. Every new manventar brings along with it the renovation of forms, types, and species. Every type of the preceding organic forms, vegetable, animal, and human, changes and is perfected in the next, even to the mineral, which has received in this round its final opacity and hardness. Its softer portions formed the present vegetation. The astral relics of previous vegetation and fauna were utilized in the formation of the lower animals, and in determining the structure of the primeval root types of the highest mammalia. And finally, the form of the gigantic ape-man of the former round has been reproduced in this one by human bestiality and transfigured into the parent form in the modern anthropoid. This doctrine, even imperfectly delineated as it is under our inefficient pen, is assuredly more logical, more consistent with facts, and far more probable than many scientific theories. That, for instance, of the first organic germ descending on a meteor to our Earth, like Ein Suf on its vehicle, Adam Cadmon, only the latter descent is allegorical, as everyone knows, and the Kabbalist had never offered this figure of speech for acceptance in its dead-letter garb. But the germ in the meteor theory, as coming from such high scientific quarters, is an eligible candidate for axiomatic truth and law, a theory people are in honor bound to accept, if they would be on the right level with modern science. What the next theory necessitated by the materialistic premises will be, no one can tell. Meanwhile, the present theories, as anyone can see, clash far more discordantly among themselves than even with those of the occultist outside the sacred precincts of learning. For what is there, next in order, now that exact science has made even the life principle an empty word, a meaningless term, and insists that life is in effect due to the molecular action of the primordial protoplasm? The new doctrine of the Darwinists may be defined and summarized in a few words, from Mr. Herbert Spencer. The hypothesis of special creation turns out to be worthless, worthless by its derivation, worthless in its intrinsic incoherence, worthless as absolutely without evidence, worthless as not supplying an intellectual need, worthless as not satisfying a moral want. We must therefore consider it as counting for nothing in opposition to any other hypothesis respecting the origin of organic beings. Section 5 Organic Evolution and Creative Centers It is argued that universal evolution, otherwise the gradual development of species in all the kingdoms of nature, works by uniform laws. This is admitted, and the law is enforced far more strictly in esoteric than in modern science. 
But we are also told that it is equally a law that development works from the less to the more perfect, and from the simpler to the more complicated, by incessant changes, small in themselves but constantly accumulating in the required direction. It is from the infinitesimally small that the comparatively gigantic species are produced. Esoteric science agrees with this, but adds that this law applies only to what is known to it as the primary creation, the evolution of worlds from primordial atoms, and the pre-primordial atom at the first differentiation of the former, and that during the period of cyclic evolution in space and time, this law is limited and works only in the lower kingdoms. It did so work during the first geological periods, from simple to complex, on the rough material surviving from the relics of the third round which relics are projected into objectivity when terrestrial activity recommences. No more than science does this esoteric philosophy admit design or special creation. It rejects every claim up to the miraculous and accepts nothing outside the uniform and immutable laws of nature. But it teaches a cyclic law, a double stream of force, or spirit, and of matter, which, starting from the neutral center of being, develops by its cyclic progress and incessant transformations. The primitive germ from which all vertebrate life has developed throughout the ages, being distinct from the primitive germ from which vegetable and animal life have evolved, there are side laws whose work is determined by the conditions in which the materials to be worked upon are found by them, and of which science, physiology, and anthropology especially, seems to be little aware. Its votaries speak of this primitive germ and maintain that it is shown beyond any doubt that the design and the designer if there be any, in the case of man with the wonderful structure of his limbs, and his hands especially, must be placed very much further back, and is in fact involved in the primitive germ, from which all vertebrate life, certainly, and probably all life, animal or vegetable, have been slowly developed. This is as true of the primitive germ, as it is false that the germ is only very much further back than man is, for it is at an immeasurable and inconceivable distance in time, though not in space, from the origin even of our solar system. As the Hindu philosophy very justly teaches, the anayamsam anayasam can be known only through false notions. It is the many that proceed from the one, the living spiritual germs or centers of forces, each in a septenary form, which first generate and then give the primary impulse to the law of evolution and gradual slow development. Limiting the teaching strictly to this our earth, it may be shown that, as the ethereal forms of the first men are first projected on seven zones by seven jhanic kohanic centers of force, so there are centers of creative power for every root or parent species of the host of forms of vegetable and animal life. This is, again, no special creation, nor is there any design except in the general ground plan worked out by the universal law. But there are certainly designers though these are neither omnipotent or omniscient in the absolute sense of the term. They are simply builders or masons, working under the impulse given to them by the ever-to-be-unknown on our plane, Master Mason, the one life and law. Belonging to this sphere, they have no hand in nor possibility of working on any other, during the present Manvantara at any rate, that they work in cycles and on a strictly geometrical and mathematical scale of progression is what the extinct animal species amply demonstrate, that they act by design in the details of minor lives, of the side animal issues, etc., is sufficiently proved by natural history. In the creation of new species, departing sometimes very widely from the parent stock, as in the great variety of the genus Felis, like the lynx, the tiger, the cat, etc., it is the designers who direct the new evolution by adding to or depriving the species of certain appendages, either needed or becoming useless in the new environments. Thus, when we say that nature provides for every animal and plant, whether large or small, we speak correctly. For it is these terrestrial spirits of nature who form the aggregated nature, which, if it fails occasionally in its design, is neither to be considered blind nor to be taxed with the failure since belonging to a differentiated sum of qualities and attributes, it is in virtue of that alone conditioned and imperfect. Were there no such thing as evolutionary cycles, as an eternal spiral progress into matter, with a proportionate obscuration of spirit, though the two are one, 
followed by an inverse ascent into spirit and a defeat of matter, active and passive by turn. How could we explain the discoveries of zoology and geology? How is it that, on the dictum of authoritative science, one can trace the animal life from the mollusk up to the great sea dragon, from the smallest landworm up again to the gigantic animals of the tertiary period? And that the latter were once crossed is shown by the fact of all those species decreasing, dwindling down, and becoming dwarfed. If the seeming process of development, working from the less to the more perfect, and from the simpler to the more complex, were a universal law indeed, instead of being very imperfect generalization of a mere secondary nature in the great cosmic process, and if there were no such cycles as those claimed, then the Mesozoic fauna and flora ought to change places with the latest Neolithic. It is the plesiosauri and the Kithiosauri that we ought to find developing from the present sea and river reptiles, instead of these giving place to their dwarfed modern analogies. It is again our old friend, the good-tempered elephant, that would be the fossil antediluvian ancestor, and the mammoth of the Pliocene age would be in the menagerie. The megalonyx and the gigantic megatherium would be found instead of the lazy sloth in the forests of South America in which the colossal ferns of the Carboniferous periods would take the place of the mosses and the present trees, dwarfs, even the giants of California, in comparison with the titan trees of past geological periods. Surely the organisms of the Megasthenian world of the tertiary and the Mesozoic ages must have been more complex and perfect than those of the Microsthenian plants and animals of the present age. The Dryopithecus, for instance, is more perfect anatomically, is more fit for greater development of brain power than the modern gorilla or gibbon. How is all this, then? Are we to believe that the constitution of all those colossal land and sea dragons, of the gigantic flying reptiles, was not far more developed and complex than the anatomy of the lizards, turtles, crocodiles, and even of the whales? In short, of all those animals with which we are acquainted. Let us admit, however, for argument's sake, that all those cycles, races, septenary forms of evolution, and the tutaquanti of esoteric teaching are no better than a delusion and a snare. Let us agree with science and say that man, instead of being an imprisoned spirit and his vehicle, the shell or body, a gradually perfected and now complete mechanism for material and terrestrial uses, as claimed by the occultists, is simply a more developed animal, whose primal form emerged from one and the same primitive germ on this earth as the flying dragon and the gnat, the whale and the amoeba, the crocodile and the frog, etc. In this case, he must have passed through all the identical developments and through the same process of growth as all the other mammals. If man is an animal, and nothing more, a highly intellectual ex-brute, he should at least be allowed to have been a gigantic mammal of his kind, a meganthropus in his day. This is exactly what esoteric science shows to have taken place in the first three rounds. And in this, as in most other things, it is more logical and consistent than modern science. It classifies the human body with the brute creation and maintains it in the path of animal evolution from first to last, while science leaves man a parentless orphan born of sires unknown, an unspecialized skeleton, truly. And this mistake is due to a stubborn rejection of the doctrine of cycles. A. The Origin and Evolution of the Mammalia, Science and Esoteric Phylogeny Having dealt almost exclusively with the question of the origin of man and the foregoing criticism of Western evolutionism, it may not be amiss to define the position of the occultists with regard to the differentiation of species. The pre-human fauna and flora have been already dealt with generally in the commentary on the stanzas, and the truth of much of modern biological speculation has been admitted. Example, the derivation of birds from reptiles, the partial truth of natural selection, and the transformation theory generally. It now remains to clear up the mystery of the origin of those first mammalian faunae, which M. de Quatrefage so brilliantly endeavors to prove contemporary with the homo primogenius of the secondary age. The somewhat complicated problem relating to the origin of species more especially of the varied groups of fossil or existing mammalian faunae, will be rendered less obscure by the aid of the diagram. It will then be apparent 
to what extent the factors of organic evolution, relied upon by Western biologists, are to be considered as adequate to meet the facts. The line of demarcation between ethereal spiritual, astral, and physical evolution must be drawn. Perhaps if Darwinians deigned to consider the possibility of the second process, they would no longer have to lament the fact that we are referred entirely to conjecture and inference for the origin of mammals. At present, the admitted chasm between the systems of reproduction of the oviparous, vertebrates, and mammalian constitutes a hopeless crux to those thinkers who, with the evolutionists, seek to link all the existing organic forms in a continuous line of descent. Let us take, for instance, the case of the ungulate mammals, since it is said that in no other division do we possess such abundant fossil material. So much progress has been made in this direction, that in some instances the intermediate links between the modern and Eocene ungulates have been unearthed, a notable example being that of the complete proof of the derivation of the present one-toed horse from the three-toed antitherium of the old tertiary. This standard of comparison between Western biology and the Eastern doctrine could not, therefore, be improved upon. The pedigree here utilized as embodying the views of scientists in general is that of Schmidt, based on the exhaustive researches of Rudemeyer. Its approximate accuracy, from the standpoint of evolutionism, leaves little to be desired. At this midway point of evolution, science comes to a standstill. The root to which these two families lead back to is unknown. The root, according to occultism, primeval, physical, astral, and bisexual root types of the mammalian animal kingdom. These were contemporaries of the early Lemurian races and the unknown roots of science. There's a diagram here of the ungulate mammals. Schmidt's diagram represents the realm explored by Western evolutionists, the area in which climactic influences, natural selection, and all the other physical causes of organic differentiation are present. Biology and paleontology find their province here in investigating the many physical agencies which so largely contribute, as has been shown by Darwin, Spencer, and others, to the segregation of species. But even in this domain, the subconscious workings of the yonic kohanic wisdom are at the root of all the ceaseless striving towards perfection, though its influence is vastly modified by those purely material causes, which de Quatrefages terms the milieu and Spencer the environment. The midway point of evolution is that stage where the astral prototypes definitely begin to pass into the physical, and thus become subject to the differentiating agencies now operative around us. Physical causation supervenes immediately on the assumption of the coats of skin, i.e. the physiological equipment in general. The forms of men and of other mammals previous to the separation of the sexes are woven out of the astral matter and possess a structure utterly unlike that of the physical organisms which eat, drink, digest, etc. The known physiological contrivances requisite for these functions were almost entirely evolved subsequently to the incipient physicalization of the seven root types out of the astral, during the midway halt between the two planes of existence. Hardly had the ground plan of evolution been limbed out of these ancestral types, then there supervened the influence of the accessory terrestrial laws, familiar to us, resulting in the whole crop of mammalian species. Eons of slow differentiation were, however, required to effect this end. The second diagram represents the domain of the purely astral prototypes previous to their descent into gross matter. Astral matter, it must be noted, is fourth state matter, having, like our gross matter, its own protyle. There are several protiles in nature corresponding to the various planes of matter. The two sub-physical elemental kingdoms, the plane of mind, manas, or fifth state matter, as also that of booty, sixth state matter, are each and all evolved from one of the six protiles, which constitute the basis of the object universe. The three states, so-called, of our terrestrial matter, known as the solid, liquid, and gaseous, are only, in strict accuracy, substates. As to the former reality of the descent into the physical, which culminated in physiological man and animal, we have a palpable testimony in the fact of the so-called spiritualistic materializations. In all these instances, a complete temporary emergence of the astral into the physical takes place. The evolution of physiological man out of the astral races of the early Lemurian age 
the Jurassic Age of Geology, is exactly paralleled by the materialization of spirits in the seance room. In the case of Professor Crooks, Katie King, the presence of a physiological mechanism, heart, lungs, etc., was indubitably demonstrated. This, in a way, is the archetype of Goeth. Listen to his words. Thus much we should have gained. All the nine perfect organic beings, formed according to an archetype which merely fluctuates more or less in its very persistent parts, and moreover, day by day, completes and transforms itself by means of reproduction. This is a seemingly imperfect foreshadowing of the occult fact of the differentiation of species from the primal astral root types. Whatever the whole posse comitatus of natural selection, etc., may affect, the fundamental unity of structural plan remains partially unaffected by all subsequent modifications. The unity of type, common in sense, to all the animal and human kingdoms is not, as Spencer and others appear to hold, a proof of the consanguinity of all organic forms, but a witness to the essential unity of the ground plan nature has followed in fashioning her creatures. To sum up the case, we may again avail ourselves of a tabulation of the actual factors concerning in the differentiation of species. The stages of the process itself need no further comment here, for they follow the basic principles underlying organic development, and we do not need to enter on the domain of the biological specialist. Factors concerned in the origin of species, animal and vegetable. Basic astral prototypes pass into the physical. 1. Variation transmitted by heredity. 2. Natural selection. 3. Sexual selection. 4. Physiological selection. 5. Isolation. 6. Correlation of growth. 7. Adaptation to environment. Intelligent as opposed to mechanical causation. And in this diagram, that all points to the Jan-Kohanic impulse, constituting Lamarck's inherent and necessary law of development. It lies behind all minor agencies. B. The European Paleolithic races, whence and how distributed. This science opposed to those who maintain that, down to the quaternary period, the distribution of the human races was widely different from what it is now. Is science against those who further maintain that the fossil men found in Europe, although they have almost reached a plane of sameness and unity, which continues till this day, regarded from the fundamental physiology and anthropological aspects, still differ, sometimes greatly, from the type of the now existing populations? The late M. Leiter admits that, in an article published by him in the Revue des Deux Mondes, March 1st, 1859, on the memoir called Antiques Celtiques Antediluvianus by Boucher de Perthes, 1849. Litter therein states that A. In these periods when the mammoths, exhumed in Picardy, in company with man-made hatchets, lived in the latter region, there must have been an eternal spring reigning over all the terrestrial globe. Nature was the contrary of what it is now and thus is left an enormous margin for the antiquity of those periods. He then adds, Spring, professor of the faculty of medicine at Liege, found in a grotto near Namur, in the mountains of Chavot, numerous human bones of a race quite distinct from ours. Skulls exhumed in Austria offer a great analogy with those of Negro races in Africa, according to Litter, while others, discovered on the shores of the Danube and the Rhine, resemble the skulls of the Caribs of the ancient inhabitants of Peru and Chile. Still the deluge, whether biblical or Atlantean, is denied. But further geological discoveries made Godry write conclusively. Our forefathers were positively contemporaneous with the rhinoceros, the hippopotamus major. And he added that the soil, called diluvial in geology, was formed partially at least after man's apparition on earth. Upon this, Litter pronounced himself finally. He then showed the necessity in the face of the resurrection of so many old witnesses, of rehandling all the origins, all the durations, and added that there was an age hitherto unknown to study. Either at the dawn of the actual epoch, or, as I believe, at the beginning of the epoch which preceded it. The types of skulls found in Europe are of two kinds, as is well known. The orthogonothus and the progonothus or the Caucasian and the Negroid types, 
such as now found only among the African and Lower Savage tribes. Professor here, who argues that the facts of botany necessitate the hypothesis of an Atlantis, has shown that the plants of the Neolithic lake villagers are mainly of African origin. How did these plants appear in Europe, if there were no former point of union between Europe and Africa? How many thousand years ago did the 17 men live whose skeletons were exhumed in the department of Hot Garonne, in a squatting posture near the remains of a coal fire, with some amulets and broken crockery around them, and in company with the Ursus Spelaeus, the Elephus Primogenius, the Aurochs, regarded by Cuvier as a distinct species, the Megaceros Hibernicus, all antediluvian mammals. Certainly they must have lived in a most distant epoch, but not in one which carries us further back than the quaternary. A much greater antiquity for man is yet to be proved. Dr. James Hunt, the late president of the Anthropological Society, puts it at nine million years. This man of science, at any rate, makes some approach to our esoteric computation. If we leave out the computation, the first two semi-human ethereal races and the early third race, the question, however, arises, who were these Paleolithic men of the European Quaternary Epoch? Were they Aboriginal, or were they the outcome of some immigration dating back to the unknown past? The latter is the only tenable hypothesis. As all scientists agree in eliminating Europe from the category of possible cradles of mankind, whence then radiated the various successive streams of primitive men. The earliest Paleolithic men in Europe, about whose origin ethnology is silent, and whose very characteristics are but imperfectly known, though expatiated as an ape-like but imaginative writers, such as Mr. Grant Allen, were of pure Atlantean and Africal, Atlantean stocks. It must be borne in mind that by this time the Atlantean continent itself was a dream of the past. Europe in the Quaternary Epoch was a very different from the Europe of today being then only in process of formation. It was united to northern Africa, or rather, to what is now northern Africa, by a neck of land running across the present Straits of Gibraltar. Northern Africa, thus constituting as it were an extension of the present Spain, while a broad sea filled the great basin of the Sahara. Of the vast Atlantis, the main bulk of which sank in the Miocene, there remained only Ruda and Dejia, and a stray island or so. The Atlantean connections of the forefathers of the Paleolithic caveman are evidenced by the upturning of fossil skulls in Europe, reverting closely to the type of the West Indian Carib and ancient Peruvian. A mystery indeed for all those who refuse to sanction the hypothesis of a former Atlantic continent to bridge what is now an ocean. What are we also to make of the fact that while de Quatrefages points to that magnificent race, the tall Cro-Magnon caveman, and to the gaunches of the Canary Islands, as representatives of one type, Virchow also allies the Basques with the latter in a similar way. Professor Ritzius independently proves the relationship of the Aboriginal American Dolichocephalus tribes and the same gaunches. The several links in the chain of evidence are thus securely joined together. Legions of similar facts could be adduced. As to the African tribes themselves, diverging offshoots of Atlanteans modified by climate and conditions, they crossed into Europe over the peninsula which made the Mediterranean an island sea. Fine races were many of those European cavemen, as the Cro-Magnon, for instance. But as was to be expected, progress is almost non-existent through the whole of the vast period allotted by science to the chipped stone age. The cyclic impulse downwards weighs heavily on the stalks thus transplanted. The incubus of the Atlantean karma is upon them. Finally, Paleolithic man makes room for his successor and disappears almost entirely from the scene. Professor Andre Lefebvre asks in this connection Has the polish succeeded the chip stone age by an imperceptible transition, or was it due to an invasion of Brachiocephalus Celts? But whether the deterioration popula. But whether the deterioration produced in the populations of Le Vezer were the result of violent crossings or of a general retreat northwards in the wake of the reindeer is of little moment to us. He continues, Meantime, the bed of the ocean has been upheaved. Europe is now fully formed. Her flora and fauna are fixed. With the taming of the dog begins the pastoral life. 
we enter on those polished stone and bronze periods, which succeed each other at irregular intervals, which even overlap one another in the midst of ethnical migration and fusions, at once more confused and of shorter duration than less advanced and more rudimentary ages. The primitive European populations are interrupted in their special evolution, and without perishing, become absorbed in other races, engulfed, as it were, by the successive waves of migration overflowing from Africa, possibly from an lost Atlantis, too far late by aeons of years, and from prolific Asia. On the one hand came the Iberians, on the other, Pelagians, Ligurians, Sicanians, Etruscans, all forerunners of the great Aryan invasion. Fifth race. Section 6. Giants, Civilizations, and Submerged Continents Traced in History When statements such as are comprised in the above heading are brought forward, the writer is, of course, expected to furnish historical instead of legendary evidence in support of such claims. Is this possible? Yes, for evidence of such a nature is plentiful, and has simply to be collected and brought together, in order to become overwhelming in the eyes of the unprejudiced. Once the sagacious student gets hold of the guiding thread, he may find out such evidence for himself. We give facts and show landmarks. Let the wayfarer follow them. What is adduced here is amply sufficient for this century. In a letter to Voltaire, Bailey finds it quite natural that the sympathies of the grand old invalid of Fernie should be attracted to the representatives of knowledge and wisdom, the ancient Brahmins. He then adds a curious statement. He says, But your Brahmins are very young in comparison with their archaic instructors. Bailey, who knew not of the esoteric teachings, nor of Lemuria, believed nevertheless unreservedly in the lost Atlantis, and also in the several prehistoric and civilized nations which had disappeared without leaving any undeniable trace. He had studied the ancient classics and traditions extensively, and he saw that the arts and sciences known to those we now call the ancients, were not the achievements of any of the now or even then existing nations, nor of any of the historical peoples of Asia. And that, notwithstanding the learning of the Hindus, their undeniable priority in the early part of the race had to be referred to a people or a race still more ancient and more learned than were even the Brahmins themselves. Voltaire, the greatest skeptic of his day, the materialist par excellence, shared Bailey's belief. He thought it quite likely that, long before the empires of China and India, there had been nations cultured, learned, and powerful, which a deluge of barbarians overpowered and thus replunged into their primitive state of ignorance and savagery, or what they call the state of pure nature. That which with Voltaire was the shrewd conjecture of a great intellect was with Bailey a question of historical facts, for he wrote, I make great case of ancient traditions preserved through a long series of generations. It was possible, he thought, that a foreign nation should, after instructing another nation, so disappear that it should leave no traces behind. When asked how it could have happened that this ancient or rather archaic nation should not have left at least some recollection in the human mind, he answered that time was a pitiless devourer of facts and events. But the history of the past was never entirely lost for the sages of old Egypt had preserved it, and it is so preserved to this day elsewhere, the priests of Sais and to Solon according to Plato. You are unacquainted with most noble and excellent race of men, who once inhabited your country, from whom you and your whole present state are descended, though only a small remnant of this admirable people is now remaining. These writings relate what a prodigious force your city once overcame when a mighty warlike power rushing from the Atlantic Sea spread itself with hostile fury over all Europe and Asia. The Greeks were but the dwarfed and weak remnant of that once glorious nation. What was this nation? The secret doctrine teaches that it was the latest seventh subrace of the Atlantean, already swallowed up in one of the early subraces of the Aryan stock, one that had been gradually spreading over the continent and islands of Europe as soon as they had begun to emerge from the seas. Descending from the high plateau of Asia, where the two races had sought refuge in the days of the agony of Atlantis, it had been slowly settling and colonizing in freshly emerged lands. The immigrant subrace had rapidly increased and multiplied on that virgin soil, had divided into many family races, 
which in their turn divided into nations. Egypt and Greece, the Phoenicians, and the northern stocks had thus proceeded from that one subrace. Thousands of years later, other races, the remnants of the Atlanteans, yellow and red, brown and black, began to invade the new continent. There were wars in which the newcomers were defeated, and they fled, some to Africa, others to remote countries. Some of these lands became islands in the course of time, owing to new geological convulsions. Being thus forcibly separated from the continents, the result was that the undeveloped tribes and families of the Atlantean stock fell gradually into a still more abject and savage condition. Did not the Spaniards in the Cibola expeditions meet with white savage chiefs? And has not the presence of African Negro types in Europe in the prehistoric ages been now ascertained? It is this presence of a foreign type associated with that of the Negro and also with that of the Mongolian, which is the stumbling block of anthropology. The individual who lived at an incalculably distant period at La Nolette in Belgium is an example. Says an anthropologist, the caves on the banks of the Lesse in southeastern Belgium afford evident of what is, perhaps the lowest man as shown by the Nolette jaw. Such man, however, had amulets of stone, perforated for the purpose of ornament. These are made of a Samite now, found in the basin of the Gironde. Thus, Belgian man was extremely ancient. The man who was antecedent to the great flood of waters, which covered the highlands of Belgium with a deposit of lem, or upland, gravel 30 meters above the level of the present rivers, must have combined the characters of the Turanian and the Negro. The Canstat, or La Nolette, man may have been black, and he had nothing to do with the Aryan type, whose remains are contemporary with those of the cave bear at Engis. The denizens of the Aquitaine Bone Caves belong to a far later period of history, and may not be as ancient as the former. If the statement be objected on the ground that science does not deny the presence of man on earth from an enormous antiquity, though that antiquity cannot be determined, since such presence is conditioned by the duration of geological periods, the age of which is not ascertained, if it is argued that the scientists object most decidedly to the claim that man preceded the animals, for instance, or that civilization dates from the earliest Eocene period, or again, that there have ever existed giants, three-eyed and four-armed and four-legged men, androgynes, etc., then the objectors are asked in their turn, how do you know? What proof have you besides your personal hypothesis, each of which may be upset any day by new discoveries? And these future discoveries are sure to prove that Whatever this earlier type of man known to anthropologists may have been in complexion, he was in no respect apish. The Constant man, the Ingus man, alike possessed essentially human attributes. People have looked for the missing link at the wrong end of the chain, and the Neanderthal man has long since been dismissed to the limbo of all hasty blunders. Disraeli divided man into the associates of the apes and the angels. Reasons are here given in favor of an angelic theory, as Christians would call it, as applicable to at least some of the races of men. At all events, if man be held to exist only since the Miocene period, even then humanity as a whole cannot be composed of the abject savages of the Paleolithic age, as they are now represented by the scientists. All they say is mere arbitrary speculative guesswork invented by them to answer to and fit in with their own fanciful theories. We speak of events hundreds of thousands of years old, nay, even millions of years old, if man date from the geological periods, not of any of those events which happened during the few thousand years of the prehistoric margin allowed by timid and ever-cautious history. Yet there are men of science who are almost of our way of thinking. From the brave confession of the Abbe Brasseur de Bourbourg, who says that traditions whose traces recur in Mexico, in Central America, in Peru, and in Bolivia, suggest the idea that man existed in these different countries at the time of the gigantic upheaval of the Andes, and that he has retained the memory of it. Down to the latest paleontologists and anthropologists, the majority of scientific men is in favor of just such an antiquity. Apropos of Peru, 
Has any satisfactory attempt been made to determine the ethnological affinities and characteristics of the race which reared those cyclopean erections, the ruins of which display the relics of a great civilization? At Culap, for instance, such are found consisting of a wall of wrought stones, 3,600 feet long, 560 broad, and 150 feet high, constituting a solid mass with a level summit. On this mass was another, 600 feet long, 500 broad, and 150 feet high, making an aggregate height of 300 feet. In it were rooms and cells. A most suggestive fact is the startling resemblance between the architecture of these colossal buildings and that of the archaic European nations. Mr. Ferguson regards the analogies between the ruins of Inca civilization and the Cyclopean remains of the Polygians in Italy and Greece as a coincidence. The most remarkable in the history of architecture, it is difficult to resist the conclusion that there may be some relation between them. The relation is simply explained by the derivation of the stocks who devised these erections, from a common center in an Atlantic continent. The acceptance of the latter can alone assist us to approach a solution of this and similar problems in almost every branch of modern science. Dr. Larte, treating upon the subject, settles the question by declaring that the truth so long contested, of the coexistence of man with the great extinct species, Elephus primigenius, Rhinoceros, Hyena spele, Ursus spelaceus, etc., appear to me to be henceforth unassailable and definitely conquered by science. It is shown elsewhere that such is also de Quatrefage's opinion. He says, Man has in all probability seen Miocene times, and consequently the entire Pliocene epoch. Are there any reasons for believing that his traces will be found further back still? He may then have been contemporaneous with the earliest mammalia, and go back as far as the secondary period. Egypt is far older than Europe as now traced on the map. Atlanto-Aryan tribes began to settle on it when the British Isles, and France were not even in existence. It is well known that the tongue of the Egyptian sea, or the delta of Lower Egypt, became firm land very gradually, and followed the highlands of Abyssinia, unlike the latter, which arose suddenly, comparatively speaking. It was very slowly formed, through long ages and successive layers of sea lime and mud, deposited annually by the soil brought down by a large river, the present Nile. Yet even the delta, as a firm and fertile land, has been inhabited for more than 100,000 years. Later tribes, which still more Aryan blood in them than their predecessors, arrived from the east and conquered it from a people whose very name is lost to posterity, except in the secret books. It is this natural barrier of slime which sucked in slowly and surely every boat that approached those inhospitable shores, that was, till within a few thousand years B.C., the best safeguard of the later Egyptians, who had managed to reach it through Arabia, Abyssinia, and Nubia, led on by Manuvina in the day of Vishvamatra. So evident does the antiquity of man become with every day, that even the church is preparing for an honorable surrender and retreat. The learned Abbe Fabra, professor at the Sorbonne, has categorically declared that prehistoric paleontology and archaeology may, without any harm to the scriptures, discover in the tertiary beds as many traces as they please of pre-Adamite man. Since it disregards all creations, anterior to the last deluge but one, that which produced the deluvium, according to the Abbey, Bible revelation leaves us free to admit the existence of man in the great alluvium, in Pliocene and even Eocene strata. On the other hand, however, geologists are not all agreed on regarding the men who inhabited the glow in these primitive ages as our ancestors. The day in which the Church shall find that its only salvation lies in the occult interpretation of the Bible may not be so far off as some imagine. Already many an abbey and ecclesiastic has become an ardent Kabbalist, and as many appear publicly in the arena, breaking a lance with theosophists and occultists in support of the metaphysical interpretation of the Bible. But they commence, unfortunately for them, at the wrong end. They are advised, before they begin to speculate upon the metaphysical in their scriptures, to study and master that which relates to the purely physical. For example, it hints on geology and ethnology. 
For such allusions to the septenary constitution of the earth and man, to the seven rounds and races, abound in the New as in the Old Testament, and are as visible as the sun in the heavens to him who reads both symbolically. To what do the laws in chapter XXIII of Leviticus apply? What is the philosophy of reason for all such hebdomadal offerings and symbolical calculations as ye shall count? From the morrow after the Sabbath, that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete, and ye shall offer with the bread seven lambs without blemish, etc. We shall be contradicted, no doubt, when we say that all these wave and peace offerings were in commemoration of the seven Sabbaths of the mysteries. These Sabbaths are seven pralayas between seven mamantaras, or what we call rounds. For Sabbath is an elastic word, meaning a period of rest of whatever nature, and explained elsewhere. And if this is not sufficiently conclusive, then we may turn to the verse which adds, Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number fifty days, forty-nine, seven times seven, stages of activity, and forty-nine stages of rest on the seven globes of the chain. And then comes the rest of the Sabbath, the fiftieth, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. That is, Ye shall make an offering of your flesh, or coats of skin, and divesting yourselves of your bodies, ye shall remain pure spirits. This law of offering, degraded and materialized with ages, was an institution that dated from the earliest Atlanteans, came to the Hebrews via the Chaldees, who were the wise men of the caste, not of a nation. A community of great adepts come from their serpent holes, who had settled in Babylonia ages before. And if this interpretation from Leviticus, full of the disfigured laws of Manu, is found too far-fetched, then turn to Revelation. Whatever interpretation profane mystics may give to the famous chapter XVII, with its riddle of the woman in purple and scarlet, whether Protestants nod at the Roman Catholics when reading Mystery, Babylon the Great, the Mother of Harlots, and Abominations of the Earth, or Roman Catholics glare at the Protestants, the occultists pronounce, in their impartiality, that these words have applied from the first to all and every exoteric churchianity. Ceremonial magic, of old with its terrible effects, and now the harmless because distorted farce of ritualistic worship. The mystery of the woman and of the beast are the symbols of the soul-killing churchianity and of superstition. The beast that was and is not, and yet is, and here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains, seven continents and seven races, on which the woman sitteth. The symbol of the exoteric, barbarous, idolatrous faiths which have covered that symbol with blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs, who protested and do protest. And there are seven kings, seven races, five are fallen, our fifth race included, and one is, the fifth continues, and the other, the sixth and the seventh races, is not yet to come. And when he, the race, king, cometh, he must continue a short space. There are many such apocalyptic illusions, but the student has to find them out for himself. If the Bible combines with archaeology and geology to show that human civilization has passed through three more or less distinct stages, in Europe at least, and if man, both in America and Europe, as much as in Asia, dates from geological epochs, Why should not the statements of the secret doctrine be taken into consideration? It is more philosophical or logical and scientific to disbelieve, with Mr. Albert Gaudry in Miocene Man, while believing that the famous Thene Flints were carved from the Dryopithecus monkey, or with the occultist that the anthropomorphous monkey came ages after man. For it is once conceded, and even scientifically demonstrated, that There was not in the middle of the Miocene epoch a single species of mammal identical with species now extant, and that the man was just as he is now, only taller and more athletic than we are. Then where is the difficulty? That they could hardly be the descendants of monkeys, which are themselves not traced before the Miocene epoch, is, on the other hand, testified to by several eminent naturalists. Thus in the savage of quaternary ages, who had to fight against the mammoth with stone weapons for arms, we find all the craniological characters generally considered as the sign of a great intellectual development. Unless man emerged spontaneously, 
endowed with all his intellect and wisdom. From his brainless Caterine ancestor, he could not have acquired such brain within the limits of the Miocene period, if we are to believe the learned Abbey Bourgeois. As to the matter of giants, though the tallest man hath thereto found in Europe among fossils is the Mentoin man, six feet eight inches, others may yet be excavated. Nielsen, quoted by Lubbock, states that, in a tomb of the Neolithic age, a skeleton of extraordinary size was found in 1807. It was attributed to a king in Scotland, Albus Magaldus. And if in our own day we occasionally find men and women from 7 feet to even 9 feet and 11 feet high, this only proves on the law of atavism, or the reappearance of the ancestral features of character, that there was a time when 9 feet and 10 feet was the average height of humanity, even in our latest Indo-European race. But as the subject has been sufficiently treated elsewhere, we may pass on to the Lemurians and the Atlanteans and see what the old Greeks knew of these early races and what the moderns know now. The great nation mentioned by the Egyptian priests, from which descended the forefathers of the Greeks of the age of Troy, and which, as averred, have fought with the had fought with the Atlantic race was then, as we see, assuredly no race of Paleolithic savages. Nevertheless, even in the days of Plato, with the exception of priests and initiates, no one seems to have preserved any distinct recollection of the preceding races. The earliest Egyptians had been separated from the latest Atlanteans for ages upon ages. They were themselves descended from an alien race, and had settled in Egypt some 400,000 years before. But their initiates had preserved all the records. Even so late as the time of Herodotus, they had still in their possession the statues of 341 kings who had reigned over their little Atlanto-Aryan subrace. If we allow only 20 years as an average figure for the reign of each king, the duration of the Egyptian empire has to be pushed back from the days of Herodotus about 17,000 years. Bunsen allowed the Great Pyramid an antiquity of 20,000 years. More modern archaeologists will not give it more than 5,000, or at the utmost 6,000 years, and generously concede to Thebes, with its hundred gates, 7,000 years from the date of its foundation. And yet there are records which show Egyptian priests, initiates, journeying in the northwesterly direction, by land, via what became later the Straits of Gibraltar, turning north and traveling through the future Phoenician settlements of southern Gaul then still further north until reaching Karnak, Moribon. They turned to the west again and arrived still traveling by land on the northwestern promontory of the new continent. What was the object of their long journey, and how far back must we place the date of such visits? The archaic records show the initiates of the second subrace of the Aryan family moving from one land to the other for the purpose of supervising the building of manors and dolmens of colossal zodiacs in stone, and places of sepulchre to serve as receptacles for the ashes of generations to come. When did this occur? The fact of their crossing from France to Great Britain by land may give an idea of the date when such a journey could have been performed on terra firma. It was when the level of the Baltic in the North Sea was 400 feet higher than it is at the present day. The valley of the Somme was not hollowed to the depth as it is now attained. Sicily was joined to Africa, Barbary to Spain, Carthage, the pyramids of Egypt, the palaces of Uxmal and Palenque were not yet in existence, and the, the bold navigators of Tyre and Sidon, who at a later date were to undertake their perilous voyages along the coasts of Africa, were yet unborn. What we now know with certainty is that the European man was contemporaneous with the extinct species of the quaternary epoch, that he witnessed the upheaval of the Alps and the extension of the glaciers, in a word that he lived for thousands of years before the dawn of the remotest historical traditions. It is even possible that man was the contemporary of extinct mammalia of species yet more ancient, of the Elephus meridionalis, of the sands of the St. Prest, or at the least of the Elephus antiquus, assumed to be prior to the Elephus primigenius, since their bones are found in company with carved flints in several English caves associated with those of the rhinoceros and even of the macrodosis letidens, which is of still an earlier date. Mr. Ed Larte, 
is also of the opinion that there is nothing really impossible in the existence of man as early as the tertiary period. If there is nothing impossible, scientifically, in the idea, and it may be admitted that man was already in existence as early as the tertiary period, then it is just as well to remind the reader that Mr. Kroll places the beginning of that period two and a half million years back. But there was a time when he assigned it to 15 million years. And if all this may be said of European man, how great is the antiquity of the Lemurio, Atlantean, and of the Atlanto, Aryan man? Every educated person who knows the progress of science knows how all vestiges of man during the tertiary period are received. The calumnies that were poured on Desnoyers in 1863, when he announced to the Institute of France that he had made a discovery. In the undisturbed Pliocene sands of St. Press near Chartres, proving the coexistence of man and the Elephas Meridionalis, were equal to the occasion. The later discovery in 1867 by Abbey Bourgeois that man lived in the Miocene epoch, and that the reception it was given at the prehistoric congress held at Brussels in 1872 proves that the average man of science will see only that which he wishes to see. The modern archaeologist, though speculating ad infinitum about the dolmens and their builders, knows in fact nothing either of them or their origin. Yet these weird and often colossal monuments of unhewn stones, which consist generally of four or seven gigantic blocks placed together, are strewn over Asia, Europe, America, and Africa in groups or rows. Stones of enormous size are found placed horizontally and variously upon two, three, four, and as a puitu upon six or seven blocks. People name them devil's altars, druidic stones, and giant tombs. The stones of Karnak in Morbihan, Brittany, nearly a mile in length and numbering 11,000 ranged in 11 rows, are twin sisters at those of Stonehenge. The conical men here of Loch Maria Kerr in Moribon measures 20 yards in length and nearly 2 yards across. The Menhir of Champ Dolent near St. Malo rises 30 feet above the ground and is 15 feet in depth below. Such dolmens and prehistoric monuments are met with in almost every latitude. They are found in the Mediterranean Basin in Denmark along the local tumuli from 27 to 35 feet in height in Shetland, in Sweden, where they are called Gangriften, or tombs with corridors, in Germany, where they are known as the giant tombs, Honegraben, in Spain, where there is a dolmen of Antiguera, near Malaga, in Africa, in Palestine, in Algeria, in Sardinia, with the Nuragai and the Sepulture de Giganti, or tombs of giants, in Malabar, in India, where they are called the tombs of the Detias, Giants and of the Rakshasas, the men demons of Lanka, in Russia and Siberia, where they are known as the Kurgan, in Peru and Bolivia, where they are termed the Chulpas or burial places, etc. There is no country from which they are absent. Who built them? Why are they all connected with serpents and dragons, with alligators and crocodiles? Because remains of Paleolithic man were, as it is thought, found in some of them. And because in the funeral mounds of America, bodies of later races were discovered with the usual paraphernalia of bone necklaces, weapons, stone and copper urns, etc. They are therefore ancient tombs. But surely the two famous mounds, one in the Mississippi Valley and the other in Ohio, known respectively as the Alligator Mound and the Great Serpent Mound, were never meant for tombs. Yet one is told authoritatively that the mounds and the mound or dolmen builders are all Palasic in Europe, antecedent to the Incas in America, yet not of extreme distant times. They are built by no race of dolmen builders, who never existed save in the earlier archaeological fancy. Opinion of de Mortele, Bastion, and Westrop. Finally, Virchow's opinion of the giant tombs of Germany is now accepted as an axiom. Says the German biologist, the tombs alone are gigantic and not the bones they contain. And archaeology has but to bow and submit to the decision. That no gigantic skeletons have been hitherto found in the tombs is no reason for saying that the remains of giants were never in them. Cremation was universal till a comparatively recent period. 
some 80,000 or 100,000 years ago. The real giants, moreover, were nearly all drowned with Atlantis. Nevertheless, classical writers, as we have shown elsewhere, often speak of gigantic skeletons being excavated in their day. Moreover, human fossils may be counted on the fingers, as yet. No human ever yet has been found older than between 50,000 or 60,000 years, and man's size was reduced from 15 to 10 or 12 feet. From the time of the third subrace of the Aryan stock, which subrace, born and developed in Europe and Asia Minor, under new climates and conditions, had become European. Since then, as we have said, it has been steadily decreasing. It is truer, therefore, to say that the tombs alone are archaic, and not necessarily the bodies of men occasionally found in them, and that those tombs, since they are gigantic, must have contained giants, or rather the ashes of generations of giants. Nor were all the cyclopean structures intended for sepulchres. It is with the so-called Druidical remains, such as Karnak in Brittany and Stonehenge in Great Britain, that the traveling initiates have alluded to, had to do. And these gigantic monuments are all symbolic records of the world's history. They are not Druidical, but universal. Nor did the Druids build them, for they were only the heirs of the Cyclopean lore left to them by generations of mighty builders and magicians, both good and bad. It will always be a subject of regret that history, rejecting a priori the actual existence of giants, has preserved to us so little of the records of antiquity concerning them. Yet in nearly every mythology, which after all is ancient history, the giants play an important part. In the Old Norse mythology, the giants Skrymir and his brethren, against whom the sons of the gods fought, were potent factors in the histories of deities and men. The modern exegesis that makes these giants the brethren of the dwarfs and reduces the combats of the gods to the history of the development of the Aryan race will only receive credence among the believers in the Aryan theory as expounded by Max Muller. Granting that the Turanian races were typified by the dwarfs, Dwargar, and that a dark, round-headed, and dwarfish race was driven northward by the fair-faced Scandinavians, or Acer, the gods being like unto men, there still exists neither history nor in any other scientific work any anthropological proof whatever of the existence in time or space of a race of giants. Yet that such exists, relatively and de facto side by side with dwarfs. Schweinfurth can testify. The Nyam Nyam of Africa are regular dwarfs, while their next neighbors, several tribes of comparatively fair complexioned Africans, are giants when confronted with the Nyam Nyams, and very tall even among Europeans, for their women are all above six and a half feet high. In Cornwall and in ancient Britain, the traditions of these giants are, on the other hand, excessively common. They are said to have lived even down to the time of King Arthur. All this shows that giants lived to a later date amongst the Celtic than among the Teutonic peoples. If we turn to the New World, we have traditions of a race of giants of Teresia on the eastern slopes of the Andes and in Ecuador who combated gods and men. These old beliefs, which term certain localities Los Campos de los Giantes, the field of giants, are always concomitant with the existence of Pliocene mammalia and the occurrence of Pliocene-raised beaches. All the giants are not under Mount Osa, and it would be poor anthropology indeed that would restrict the traditions of giants to Greek and Bible mythologies. Slavonian countries, Russia especially, teem with legends about the Bogateri, mighty giants of old and Slavonian folklore, most of which has served for the foundation of national histories. The oldest songs and the most archaic traditions speak of the giants of old. Thus we may safely reject the modern theory that would make of the Titans mere symbols standing for cosmic forces. They were real living men, whether twenty or only twelve feet high. Even the Homeric heroes of who, of course, belonged to a far more recent period in the history of the races appeared to have wielded weapons of a size and weight beyond the strength of the strongest men of modern times. Not twice ten men the mighty bulk could raise, such men as live in these degenerate days. If the fossil footprints at Carson, Nevada, USA are human, they indicate gigantic men. And of their genuineness there can remain no doubt. 
It is to be deplored that the modern and scientific evidence for gigantic men should rest on footprints alone. Over and over again, the skeletons of hypothetical giants have been identified with those of elephants and mastodons. But all such blunders before the days of geology, and even the traveler's tale of Sir John Mandeville, who says that he saw giants 56 feet high in India, only show that belief in the existence of giants has never at any time died out of the thoughts of men. That which is known and accepted is that several races of gigantic men have ever existed and left distinct traces. In the Journal of the Anthropological Institute, such a race is shown as having existed at Palmyra and possibly in Maidan, exhibiting cranial forms quite different from those of the Jews. It is not improbable that another such race existed in Samaria, and that the mysterious people who built the stone circles in Galilee hewed Neolithic flints in the Jordan Valley and preserved an ancient Semitic language quite distinct from the square Hebrew character, were of very large stature. The English translations of the Bible can never be relied upon, even in their modern revised forms. They tell us of the Nephilim, translating the word by giants, and further adding that they were hairy men, probably the large and powerful prototypes of the later satyrs, so eloquently described by patristic fancy some of the church fathers assuring their admirers and followers that they had themselves seen these satyrs. Some alive, others pickled and preserved. The word giants being once adopted as a synonym of the Nephilim, the commentators have since identified them with sons of Anak. The filibusters who seized on the promised land found a pre-existing population far exceeding their own in stature, and called it a race of giants. But the races of really gigantic men had disappeared ages before the birth of Moses. These tall people existed in Canaan, and even in Bashan, and may have had representatives in the Nabatheans of Maidan. They were of far greater stature than the undersized Jews. Four thousand years ago, their cranial conformation and large stature separated them from the children of Heber. Forty thousand years ago, their ancestors may have been still more gigantic size and 400,000 years earlier, they may have been in proportion to men in our days, as the Brodigans were to the Lilliputians. The Atlanteans of the Middle Period were called the Great Dragons, and the first symbol of their tribal deities, when the gods and the divine dynasties had forsaken them, was that of a giant serpent. The mystery veiling the origin and the religion of the Druids is as great as that of the supposed fanes to the modern symbologist but not to the initiated occultists. Their priests were the descendants of the last Atlanteans, and what is known of them is sufficient to allow the inference that they were eastern priests, akin to the Chaldeans and Indians, though little more. It may be inferred that the symbolized their deity as the Hindus do their Vishnu, as their Egyptians did their mystery god, and as the builders of the Ohio Great Serpent Mound worshipped theirs, namely under the form of the Mighty Serpent the emblem of the eternal deity, time, the Hindu Kala. Pliny called them the Magi of the Gauls and Britons. But they were more than that. The author of Indian Antiquities finds much affinity between the Druids and the Brahmins of India. Dr. Borlais points to a close analogy between them and the Magi of Persia. Others will see an identity between them and the Orphic priesthood of Thrace, simply because they were connected in their esoteric teachings, with the universal wisdom religion, and thus presented affinities with the exoteric worship of all. Like the Hindus, the Greeks, and Romans, we speak of the initiates, the Chaldees and the Egyptians, the Druids believed in the doctrine of the succession of worlds, as also in that of the seven creations of new continents, and transformations of the face of the earth, and in a sevenfold night and day for each earth or globe. Wherever the serpent with the egg is found, there this tenet was surely present. Their draconcha are a proof of it. This belief was so universal that, if we seek for it in the esotericism of various religions, we shall discover it in all. We shall find it among the Aryan Hindus, and the Mazdians, the Greeks, the Latins, and even among the old Jews and early Christians, whose modern stocks hardly comprehend now what they had read in the scriptures. In the Book of God, we read, The world, says Seneca, being melted and having re-entered into the bosom of Jupiter, 
This God continues for some time totally concentrated in himself and remains concealed, as it were, wholly immersed in the contemplation of his own ideas. Afterwards, we see a new world spring from him. Perfect in all its parts, animals are produced anew, an innocent race of men is formed. And again, speaking of a mundane dissolution as involving the destruction or death of all, he teaches us that when the laws of nature shall be burned in the ruin, and the last day of the world shall come, the southern pole shall crush. As it falls, all the regions of Africa and the north pole shall overwhelm all the countries beneath its axis. The affrighted sun shall be deprived of its light. The palace of heaven falling to decay shall produce at once both life and death. And some kind of dissolution shall equally seize upon all the deities, who thus shall return into their original chaos. One might imagine oneself reading the Puranic account by Parashara of the great Pralaya. It is nearly the same thing. Idea for idea. Had Christianity nothing of the kind? It has, we say. Let the reader open any English Bible and read chapter 3 on the second epistle of Peter, and he will find there the same ideas. There shall come in the last days scoffers, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water whereby the world that was then being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire. The heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nonetheless we look for new heavens and a new earth. If the interpreters choose to see this as a reference to the creation, the deluge, and the promised coming of Christ, when they shall live in a new Jerusalem in heaven. There is no fault of Peter. What the writer of the epistle meant was the destruction of this fifth race of ours by subterranean fires and inundations, and the appearance of new continents for the sixth root race. For the writers of the epistles were all learned in symbology, if not in science. It has been mentioned elsewhere that the belief in the septenary constitution of our chain was the oldest tenet of early Iranians, who got it from the first Zarathustra. It is time to prove it to those Parsis, who have lost the key to the meaning of their scriptures. In the Avesta, the earth is considered septempartite and tripartite at one and the same time. This is regarded by Dr. Giger as an incongruity for the following reasons, which he calls discrepancies. The Avesta speaks of the three-thirds of the earth because the Rig Veda mentions three earths, three strata or layers, one lying above the other, are said to be meant by this. But he is quite mistaken, as are all exoteric profane translators. The Avesta has not borrowed the idea from the Rig Veda, but simply repeats the esoteric teaching. The three strata or layers do not refer to our globe alone, but to the three layers of the globes of our terrestrial chain, two by two, on each plane, one on the descending, the other on the ascending arc. Thus, with reference to the six spheres or globes above our earth, the seventh and the fourth, the earth is semtopartite. While with regard to the planes over our plane, it is tripartite. This meaning is carried out and corroborated by the text of the Avesta, and even by the speculations, most laborious and unsatisfactory guesswork, of the translators and commentators. It thus follows that the division of the earth, or rather the earth's chain into seven karsharvas, is not in contradiction with the three zones if this word is read plains, as Giger remarks, this septenary division is very old, the oldest of all, since the Gathas already speak of the septempartite earth. For, according to the statements of the later Parsi scriptures, the seven Kirshvars are to be considered as completely disconnected parts of the earth, which they surely are, for between them there flows the ocean, so that it is impossible, as stated in several passages, to pass from one Kirshvar to the other. The ocean is space, of course, for the latter was called waters of space before it was known as ether. Moreover, the word Karshvar is consistently rendered as Vipa, and Hevnivrafa is rendered by Yambuvipa. But this fact is not taken into account by the Orientalists, and therefore we find 
Even such a learned Zoroastrian, and Parsi by birth as the translator of Dr. Giger's work, passing unnoticed and without a word of comment. Sundry remarks on the former on the incongruities of this kind abounding in the Mazdean scriptures. One of such incongruities and coincidences concerns the similarity of the Zoroastrian with the Indian tenant with regard to the seven vipas, islands or continents rather, as met within the Puranas, namely, the vipas form concentric rings which separated by the ocean surround Yambuvipa, which is situated in the center, and according to the Iranian view, the Kirshvar Kanirafa is likewise situated in the center of the rest. They form no concentric circles, but each of them, the six other Karshvars, is a peculiar individual space, and so they group themselves round above Kaniratha. Now, Kaniratha, better Vaniratha, is not, as believed by Geiger and his translator, the country inhabited by the Iranian tribes, and the other names do not mean the adjacent territories of foreign nations in the north, south, west, and east, but signify our globe or earth. For that which is meant by the sentence which follows the last quoted, namely that two, Vorubarshti and Vorujarshti lie in the north, two, Vedashafsu and Tradahafsu in the south, Savari and Azari in the east and the west. It is simply the very graphic and accurate description of the chain of our planet, the earth, represented in the book of Jan. Thus, the Mazdean names given above have only to be replaced by those used in the secret doctrine to present us with the esoteric tenet. The earth, our world, is tripartite because the chain of the worlds is situated on three different planes above our globe. And it is septumpartite because of the seven globes or spheres which compose the chain, hence the further meaning given in the Vendadad, XIX39, showing that Kanaratha alone is combined with Imat, this earth, while all other Karshvars are combined with the word Avat, that, or those upper earths. Nothing could be plainer. The same may be said of the modern comprehension of all other ancient beliefs. The Druids, then, understood the meaning of the sun in Taurus. When all other fires being extinguished on the 1st of November, their sacred and inextinguishable fires alone remained to illumine the horizon, like those of the Magi and the modern Zoroastrians. And like the early fifth race of the later Chaldees, like the Greeks, and again like the Christians, who do the same to this day, without suspecting the real meaning, they greeted the morning star, the beautiful Venus Lucifer. Strabo speaks of an island near to Britannia, where Ceres and Persephone were worshipped with the same rites as in Samothrace, and this island was sacred Ierna where a perpetual fire was lit, the Druids believed in the rebirth of man, not as Lucian explains, that the same spirit shall animate a new body, not here but in a different world. But in a series of reincarnations in this same world, for as Diodorus says, they declared that the souls of men, after determinate periods, would pass into other bodies. These tenants came to the fifth race, Arians, from their predecessors of the fourth race, the Atlanteans. They had piously preserved the teachings, which told them of how their parent root race, becoming with every generation more arrogant, owing to the acquisition of superhuman powers, had been gradually gliding toward its end. Those records reminded them of the giant intellect of the preceding races, as well as of their giant size. We find the repetition of those records in every age of history, in almost every old fragment which has descended to us from antiquity. Elian preserved an extract from Theophrastus, written during the days of Alexander the Great. It is a dialogue between Midas, the Phrygian, and Selenius. The former is told of a continent that had existed in times of old. So immense that Asia, Europe, and Africa seemed like poor islands compared with it. It was the last to produce animals and plants of gigantic magnitudes. There, said Selenius, Men grew to double the size of the tallest man in his, the narrator's, time, and they lived till they were twice as old. They had wealthy cities with temples, and one of such cities held more than a million of inhabitants in it, gold and silver being found there in great abundance. Grote's suggestion that Atlantis was but a myth arisen from a mirage, clouds on a dazzling sky taking the appearance of islands on a golden sea, is too disingenuous to be further noticed. 
A. Some statements about the sacred island and continents in the classics, explained esoterically. All that which precedes was known to Plato, and to many others. But as no initiate had the right to divulge and declare all he knew, posterity got only hints. Aiming more to instruct as a moralist than as a geographer and ethnologist or historian, the Greek philosopher merged the history of Atlantis, which covered several millions years, into one event which he located on one comparatively small island, 3,000 stadia long by 2,000 wide, or about 350 miles by 200, which is about the size of Ireland. Whereas the priests spoke of Atlantis as a continent vast as all Asia and Libya put together, but however altered in its general aspect, Plato's narrative bears the impress of truth upon it. It was not he who invented it at any rate, since Homer, who preceded him by many centuries, also speaks in his Odyssey of the Atlantes, who are our Atlanteans, and of their island. Therefore the tradition was older than the bard of Ulysses. The Atlantes and the Atlantides of mythology are based upon the Atlantes and the Atlantides of history. Both Sanchoniathon and Diodorus have preserved the histories of those heroes and heroines, however much their accounts have may have been mixed up with the mythical element. In our own day, we witness the extraordinary fact that such comparatively recent personages as Shakespeare and William Tell are all but denied an attempt being made to show one to be a nom de plume and the other a person who never existed. What wonder, then, that the two powerful races, the Lemurians and the Atlanteans, have been merged into and identified in time with a few half-mythical peoples who all bore the same patronomic. Herodotus speaks of the Atlantes, a people of Western Africa, who gave their name to Mount Atlas, who were vegetarians and whose sleep was never disturbed by dreams, and who moreover daily cursed the sun at its rising and at its setting because his excessive heat scorched and tormented them. These statements are based upon moral and psychic facts and not on physiological disturbance. The story of Atlas gives the key to this. If the Atlanteans never had their sleep disturbed by dreams, it is because that particular tradition is concerned with the earliest Atlanteans, whose physical frame and brain were not yet sufficiently consolidated, in the physiological sense, to permit the nervous centers to act during sleep. With regard to the other statement, that they daily cursed the sun, this again had nothing to do with the heat, but with the moral degeneration that grew with the race. It is explained in our commentaries. They, the sixth sub-race of the Atlanteans, used magic incantations even against the sun. Failing in which they cursed it, the sorcerers of Thessaly were credited with the power of calling down the moon, as Greek history assures us. The Atlanteans of the later period were renowned for their magic powers and wickedness, their ambition and defiance of the gods. Thence the same traditions, taking form in the Bible, about the antediluvian giants in the Tower of Babel, and found also in the Book of Enoch. Diodorus records another fact or two. The Atlanteans boasted of possessing the land in which all the gods had received their birth, as also of having had Uranus for the first king he being also the first to teach them astronomy. Very little more than this has come down to us from antiquity. The myth of Atlas is an allegory easily understood. Atlas is the old continents of Lemuria and Atlantis, combined and personified in one symbol. The poets attribute to Atlas as to Proteus a superior wisdom and a universal knowledge, and especially a thorough acquaintance with the depths of the ocean. For both continents bore races instructed by divine masters and both were transferred to the bottom of the seas, where they now slumber until their next reappearance above the waters. Atlas is the son of an ocean nymph, and his daughter is Calypso, the watery deep. Atlantis has been submerged beneath the waters of the ocean, and its progeny is now sleeping its eternal sleep on the ocean floors. The Odyssey makes of him the guardian and the sustainer of huge pillars that separate the heavens from the earth. He is their supporter, and as both Lemuria destroyed by submarine fires and Atlantis submerged by the waves, perished in the open deeps. Atlas is said to have been compelled to leave the surface of the earth and join his brother Iapetus at the depths of Tartarus. 
Sir Theodore Martin is right in interpreting this allegory as meaning Atlas, standing on the solid floor of the inferior hemisphere of the universe, and thus carrying at the same time the disk of the earth and the celestial vault, the solid envelope of the superior hemisphere. For Atlas is Atlantis, which supports the new continents and their horizons on its shoulders. Descharm, in his Mythology de la Grise Antique, expresses a doubt as to the correctness of Pierre Hon's translation of the Homeric word by Sustenet, as it is not possible to see how Atlas can support or bear at once several pillars situated in various localities. If Atlas were an individual, it would be an awkward translation. But as he personifies a continent in the West said to support heaven and earth at once, i.e. the feet of the giant tread the earth while his shoulders support the celestial vault, an allusion to the gigantic peaks of the Lemurian Atlantean continents. The epithet supporter becomes very correct. The term conservator for the Greek word, which de Charme, following Sir Theodore Martin, understands as meaning, does not render the same sense. The conception was certainly due to the gigantic mountain chain running along the terrestrial border or disk. These mountain peaks plunge their roots into the very bottom of the seas, while they raise their heads heavenward, their summits being lost in the clouds. The ancient continents had more mountains and valleys on them. Atlantis and the Tenerife Peak, now two of the dwarfed relics of the lost two continents, were thrice as lofty during the day of Lemuria, and twice as high in that of Atlantis. Thus the Libyans called Mount Atlas the Pillar of Heaven, according to Herodotus and Pindar qualified the later Etna as the celestial pillar. Atlas was an inaccessible island peak in the days of Lemuria, when the African continent had not yet been raised. It is the sole western relic which survives, independent, belonging to the continent on which the third race was born, developed, and fell, for Australia is now a part of the eastern continent. Proud Atlas, according to esoteric tradition, having sunk one-third of its size into the waters, its two parts remained as an heirloom of Atlantis. This again was known to the priests of Egypt and to Plato himself. The solemn oath of secrecy, which extended even to the mysteries of Neoplatonism, alone preventing the whole truth from being told. So secret was the knowledge of the last island of Atlantis indeed on the account of the superhuman powers possessed by its inhabitants. The last direct descendants of the gods, or divine kings, as it was thought, that to divulge its whereabouts and existence was punished by death. Theopompus says as much in his ever-suspected Meropus, when he speaks of the Phoenicians as being the only navigators in the seas which washed the western coast of Africa who did it with such mystery that very often they sunk their own vessels, to make the two inquisitive foreigners lose all trace of them. There are Orientalists and historians, and they form the majority, who, while feeling quite unmoved at the rather crude language of the Bible, and some of the events narrated in it, show great disgust at the immorality in the pantheons of India and Greece. We may be told that before Euripides, Pindar, and even Plato expressed the same disgust, They too felt too irritated with the tales invented, those miserable stories of the poets, as Euripides phrases it. But there may have been another reason for this, perhaps. To those who knew that there was more than one key to theogonic symbolism, it was a mistake to express it in a language so crude and misleading. For if the educated and learned philosopher could discern the kernel of wisdom under the coarse rind of the fruit— and knew that the latter concealed the greatest laws and truths of psychic and physical nature, as well as the origin of all things, not so with the uninitiated profane. For him the dead letter was religion, the interpretation, sacrilege, and this dead letter could neither edify nor make him more perfect, seeing that such an example was given him by his gods. But to the philosopher, especially the initiate, Hesiod's theogony is as historical as any history can be. Plato accepts it as such, and gives out as much of its truths as his pledges permitted. The fact that the Atlantes claimed Uranus for their first king, and that Plato commences his story of Atlantis by the division of the great continent by Neptune, the grandson of Uranus, shows that there were continents before Atlantis and kings before Uranus. 
for Neptune, to whose lot the great continent fell, finds on a small island only one human couple made of clay, i.e. the first physical human man, whose origin began with the last sub-races of the third root race. It is their daughter Cleto and the god Marys. It is their daughter Cleto that the god marries, and it is his eldest son Atlas who receives for his part the mountain and the continent which were called by his name. Now all the gods of Olympus, as well as those of the Hindu pantheon and the Rishis, were the septiform personations, one of the noumena and the intelligent powers of nature, two of cosmic forces, three of celestial bodies, four of gods or John Chohans, five of psychic and spiritual powers, six of divine kings on earth, or the incarnations of the gods, and seven of terrestrial heroes and men. The knowledge how to discern among these seven forms the one that is intended belonged at the times to the initiates, whose earliest predecessors had created this symbolical and allegorical system. Thus, while Uranus, or the host representing this celestial group, reigned and ruled over the second race and then their continent, Kronos or Saturn governed the Lemurians, and Jupiter, Neptune, and others fought in the allegory for Atlantis, which was the whole earth in the day of the fourth race. Poseidonus, or the last island of Atlantis, the third step of Idaspati or Vishnu in the mystic language of the secret books, lasted till about 12,000 years ago. The Atlantes of Diodorus were right in claiming that it was their country, the region surrounding Mount Atlas, where the gods were born, i.e. incarnated. But it was after their fourth incarnation that they became, for the first time, human kings and rulers. Diodorus speaks of Uranus as the first king of Atlantis, confusing, either consciously or otherwise, the continents. But as we have shown, Plato indirectly corrects the statement. The first astronomical teacher of men was Uranus, because he is one of the seven Dian Chohans of the second period or race. Thus also in the second Manvantara, that of Svarochisha, among the seven sons of the Manu the presiding gods or rishis of that race. We find Yotis, the teacher of astronomy, Yotisha, one of the names of Brahma, and thus also the Chinese revered Tian, or the sky, Uranus, and name him as their first teacher of astronomy. Uranus gave birth to the titans of the third race, and it is they, personified by Saturn, Kronos, who mutilated them. For as it is the titans who fell into generation when creation by will was superseded by physical procreation, they needed Uranus no more. And here is a short digression must be permitted and pardoned. In consequence of the last scholarly production of Mr. Gladstone in the 19th century, The Greater Gods of Olympos, the ideas of the general public about Greek mythology have been still further perverted and biased. Homer is credited with an inner thought, which is regarded by Mr. Gladstone as the true key to Homeric conception, whereas this key is merely a blind. Poseidon is indeed essentially of the earth earthy, strong and self-asserting, sensual and intensely jealous and vindictive. But this is because he symbolizes the spirit of the fourth root race, the ruler of the seas, that race which lives above the surface of the seas, which is composed of the giants, the children of Eurymedon, the race which is the father of Polyphemus, the titan, and the one-eyed Cyclops. Though Zeus reign over the fourth race, it is Poseidon who rules, and who is the true key to the triad of the Cronid brothers, and to our human races. Poseidon and Nereus are one, the former the ruler or spirit of Atlantis before the beginning of its submersion, the latter after. Neptune is the titanic strength of the living race, Nereus the spirit, reincarnated in the subsequent fifth or Aryan race and this is what the Greek scholar of England has not yet discovered, or even dimly perceived. And yet he makes many observations upon the artfulness of Homer, who never names Nereus, at whose designation we arrive only through the patronymic of the Nereids. Thus the tendency of even the most erudite Hellenists is to confine their speculations to the exoteric images of mythology, and to lose the sight of their inner meaning. And it is remarkably illustrated in the case of Mr. Gladstone, as we have shown. While almost the most conspicuous figure of our age as a statesman, he is at the same time one of the most cultured scholars to whom England has given birth. 
Grecian literature has been the beloved study of his life, and he has found time amid the bustle of public affairs to enrich contemporary literature with contributions to Greek scholarship, which will make his name famous through the coming generations. At the same time, as his sincere admirer, the present writer cannot but feel a deep regret that posterity, while acknowledging his profound erudition and splendid culture, will yet, in the greater light, which must then shine upon the whole question of symbolism and mythology, judge that he has failed to grasp the spirit of the religious system, which he has so often criticized from the dogmatic Christian standpoint. In that future day, it will be perceived that the esoteric key to the mysteries of the Christian, as well as the Grecian theogenies and sciences, is the secret doctrine of the prehistoric nations, which, along with others, he has denied. It is that doctrine alone which can trace the kinship of all human religious speculations, or even of so-called revelations, and it is this teaching which infuses the spirit of life into the lay figures on the mounts of Meru, Olympus, Walhalla, and Sinai. If Mr. Gladstone were a younger man, his admirers might hope that his scholastic studies would be crowned by the discovery of this underlying truth. As it is, he but wastes the golden hours of his declining years in futile disputations with that giant free thinker Colonel Ingersoll, each fighting with the weapons of exoteric temper, drawn from the arsenals of ignorant literalism. These two great controversialists are equally blind to the true esoteric meaning of the texts which they hurl at each other's heads, like iron bullets, while the world alone suffers by such controversies, since the one helps to strengthen the ranks of materialism and the other, those of blind sectarianism of the dead letter. And now we may return once more to our immediate subject. Many a time Atlantis is spoken of under another name, one unknown to our commentators. The power of names is great, and has been known since the first men were instructed by the divine masters. And as Solon had studied it, he translated the Atlantean names into names devised by himself. In connection with the continent of Atlantis, it is desirable to bear in mind that the accounts which have come down to us from the old Greek writers contain a confusion of statements, some referring to the great continent and others to the last small island of Poseidonus. It has become customary to take them all as referring to the latter only, but that this is incorrect is evident from the incompatibility of the various statements as to the size, etc., of Atlantis. Thus, in the Critias, Plato says that the plain surrounding the city was itself surrounded by mountain chains, and the plain was smooth and level, and of an oblong shape, lying north and south, 3,000 stadia in one direction and 2,000 in the other. They surrounded the plain by an enormous canal or dike, 101 feet deep, 606 feet broad, and 1,250 miles in length. Now in other places, the entire size of the island of Poseidonus is given as about the same as that assigned here to the plain around the city alone. Obviously, one set of statements refers to the great continent, and the other to its last remnant, Plato's island. And again, the standing army of Atlantis is given as upwards of a million men, its navy as 1,200 ships and 240,000 men. Such statements are quite inapplicable to a small island state of about the size of Ireland. The Greek allegories give to Atlas, or Atlantis, seven daughters. Seven sub-races, whose respective names are Maya, Electra, Tageta, Asteropi, Merope, Asidon, and Seleno. This ethnologically as they are credited with having married gods and with having become the mothers of famous heroes, the founders of many nations and cities. Astronomically, the Atlantides have become the seven Pleiades. In occult science, the two are connected with the destinies of nations, those destinies being shaped by the past events of their early lives according to karmic law. Three great nations claimed in antiquity a direct descent from the kingdom of Saturn, or Lemuria, confused with Atlantis several thousands of years before our era. And these were the Egyptians, the Phoenicians, Sench and Niathan, and the old Greeks, Diodorus after Plato. But the oldest civilized country of Asia, India, can likewise be shown to claim the same descent. Subraces, guided by karmic law or destiny, repeat unconsciously the first steps of their respective mother races. 
As the comparatively fair Brahmins, when invading India with its dark-colored Dravidians, have come from the north, so the Aryan fifth race must claim its own origin from northern regions. The occult sciences show that the founders, the respective groups of the seven Prajapatis, of the root races, have all been connected with the pole star. In the commentary we find, he who understands the age of Durva, who measures 99 immortal years, will understand the times of the Pralayas, the final destiny of nations, O Lanu. Moreover, there must have been a good reason why an Asiatic nation should locate its great progenitors and saints in Ursa Major, a northern constellation. It's 70,000 years, however, since the pole of the earth pointed to the further end of Ursa Minor's tail, and many more thousand years since the seven Rishis could have been identified with the constellation of Ursa Major. The Aryan race was born and developed in the far north. Though after sinking of the continent of Atlantis, its tribes emigrated further south into Asia. Hence, Prometheus is the son of Asia, and Deucalion his son, the Greek Noah. He who created man out of the stones of Mother Earth is called a northern scythe by Lucian, and Prometheus is made the brother of Atlas and is tied down to Mount Caucasus amid the snows. Greece had her Hyperborean as well as her southern Apollo. Thus, nearly all the gods of Egypt, Greece, and Phoenicia, as well as those of other pantheons, are of a northern origin and originated in Lumeria, towards the close of the third race, after its full physical and physiological evolution had been completed. All the fables of Greece would be found to be built on historical facts. If that history had only passed to posterity unadulterated by myths, the one-eyed Cyclops, the giants fabled as the sons of Colus and Terra, three in number, according to Hesiod, were the last three sub-races of the Lemurians. The one-eyed, referring to the wisdom eye for the two front eyes, were fully developed as physical organs only in the beginning of the fourth race. The allegory of Ulysses, whose companions were devoured, while the king of Ithaca himself were saved by putting out the eye of Polyphemus with a firebrand, is based upon the psychophysiological atrophy of the third eye. Ulysses belonged to the cycle of the heroes of the fourth race, and though a sage in the sight of the latter, must have been a profligate in the opinion of the pastoral cyclopes. His adventure with the latter, a savage, gigantic race, the antithesis of cultured civilization in the Odyssey, is an allegorical record of the gradual passage from the cyclopean civilization of stone and colossal buildings to the more sensual and physical culture of the Atlanteans which finally caused the last of the third race to lose their all-penetrating spiritual eye. The other allegory which makes Apollo kill the Cyclopes to avenge the death of his son, Asclepius, does not refer to the three sub-races represented by the three sons of heaven and earth, but to the Hyperborean Aramaspian Cyclopes, the last of the race endowed with the wisdom eye. The former have left relics of their buildings everywhere, in the south as much as in the north. The latter were confined to the north solely. Thus Apollo, preeminently the god of the seers, whose duty it is to punish desecration, killed them, his shafts representing human passions, fiery and lethal, and hid his shaft behind a mountain in the Hyperborean regions. Cosmically and astronomically, this Hyperborean god is the sun personified, which during the course of the sidereal year, 25,868 years, changes the climates on the Earth's surface, making frigid regions of tropical and vice versa. Psychically and spiritually, his significance is far more important, as Mr. Gladstone pertinently remarks in his Greater Gods of Olympus. The qualities of Apollo, jointly with Athena, are impossible to be accounted for without repairing to the sources, which lie beyond the limit of the traditions most commonly explored for the elucidation of the Greek mythology. The history of Latona, Leto, Apollo's mother, is most pregnant in various meanings. Astronomically, Latona is the polar region in the night, giving birth to the sun, Apollo, Phoebus, etc. She is born in the Hyperborean countries, wherein all the inhabitants were priests of her son, celebrating his resurrection and descent to their country every 19 years at the renewal of the lunar cycle. Latona is the Hyperborean continent and its race, geologically. When the astronomical meaning cedes its place to the spiritual and divine, 
Apollo and Athene transforming themselves into the form of birds, the symbol and glyph of the higher divinities and angels. Then the bright god assumes divine creative powers. Apollo becomes the personification of seership when he sends the astral double of Enos to the battlefield and has the gift of appearing up to his seers without being visible to other persons present, a gift, however, shared by every high adept. The king of the Hyperboreans was, therefore, the son of Boreas, the north wind, and the high priest of Apollo. The quarrel of Latona with Niobe, the Atlantean race, the mother of seven sons and seven daughters, personifying the seven sub-races of the fourth race and their seven branches, allegorizes the history of the two continents. The wrath of the sons of God, or of will and yoga, at seeing the steady degradation of the Atlanteans was great, and the destruction of the children of Niobe by the children of Latona, Apollo and Diana, the deities of light, wisdom and purity, or the sun and moon astronomically whose influence causes changes in the Earth's axis, deluges and other cosmic cataclysms, is thus very clear. The fable about the never-ceasing tears of Niobe, whose grief causes Zeus to change her into a fountain, Atlantis covered with water, is no less graphic as a symbol. Niobe, let it be remembered, is the daughter of one of the Pleiades, or Atlantides, the granddaughter of Atlas, therefore, because she represents the last generations of the doomed continent. A true remark, that of Bailey, which says that Atlantis had an enormous influence in antiquity. He adds, If these mythical names are mere allegories, then all they have of truth comes from Atlantis. If the fable is a real tradition, however altered, then the ancient history is wholly their history. So much so that all ancient writings, prose and poetry, are full of the reminiscences of the Lemurio-Atlanteans, the first physical races though the third and the fourth in number of the evolution of fourth-round humanity on our globe. Hesiod records the tradition about the men of the Age of Bronze, whom Jupiter had made out of ash wood, and who had hearts harder than diamond. Clad in bronze from head to foot, they passed their lives in fighting, monstrous in size, endowed with a terrible strength, invincible arms and hands descended from their shoulders, says the poet. Such were the giants of the first physical races. The Iranians have a reference to the later Atlanteans in Yasna, IX-15. Tradition maintains that the sons of God, or the great initiates of the sacred island, took advantage of the deluge to rid the earth of all the sorcerers among the Atlanteans. The said verse addresses Zarathustra as one of the sons of God. It says, Thou, O Zarathustra, didst make all demons, sorcerers, who before roamed the world in human forms, Conceal themselves in the earth? Help them to submersion? The Lemurians, and also the early Atlanteans, were divided into two distinct classes, the sons of night, or darkness, and the sons of the sun, or light. The old books tell us terrible battles between the two, when the former, leaving their land of darkness, whence the sun departed for long months, descended from their inhospitable regions and tried to wrench the lord of light from their better-favored brothers of the equatorial regions. We may be told that the ancients knew nothing of the long night of six months' duration in the polar regions. Even Herodotus, more learned than the rest, only mentions a people who slept for six months in the year and remained awake for the other half. Yet the Greeks knew well that there was a country in the north where the year was divided into a day and a night each of six months' duration. For Pliny distinctly says so, They speak of the Sumerians and the Hyperboreans and draw a distinction between the two. The former inhabited the Paulus Maertus between 45 degrees and 50 degrees latitude. Plutarch explains that they were but a small portion of a great nation driven away by the Scythians, which nation stopped near the Tanae after having crossed Asia. These warlike multitudes lived formerly on the ocean shores in dense forests, and under a tenebrous sky. There the pole is almost touching the head. Their long nights and days divide the year. As to the Hyperboreans, these peoples, as expressed by Solanus, Polyhistor, sow in the morning, reap at noon, gather their fruits in the evening, and store them during the night in their caves. Even the writers of the Zohar knew this fact, as it is written, In the book of Hananuna, the old, or the ancient, we learn, 
There are some countries of the earth which are lightened, whilst others are in darkness. These have the day, when for the former it is night. And there are countries in which it is constantly day, or in which at least the night continues only some instants. The island of Delos, the Asteria of Greek mythology, was never in Greece, for this country in that day was not yet in existence, not even in its molecular form. Several writers have shown that it represented a country or an island far larger than the small dots of land which became Greece. Both Pliny and Diodorus Siculus place it in the northern seas. One calls it Basilia, or royal. The other, Pliny, names it Osericta, a word which, according to Rubbeck, had a significance in the northern languages, equivalent to the island of the divine kings or god kings. Or again, the royal island of the gods. Because the gods were born there, i.e. the divine dynasties of the kings of Atlantis proceeded from that place. Let geographers and geologists seek for it among that group of islands discovered by Nordenskold on his Vega voyage in the Arctic regions. The secret books inform us that the climate has changed in those regions more than once, since the first men inhabited those now almost inaccessible latitudes. There were a paradise before they became hell. The dark Hades of the Greeks, and the cold realm of shades where the Scandinavian hell, the goddess queen of the country of the dead, holds sway deep down in Helheim and Niflheim. Yet it was the birthplace of Apollo, who was the brightest of gods in heaven, astronomically as he was the most enlightened of the divine kings who ruled over their early nations, and his human meaning. The latter fact is borne out in the Iliad, wherein Apollo is said to have appeared four times in his own form, as the god of the four races, and six times in human form, i.e., as connected with the divine dynasties of the earlier unseparated Lemurians. It is those early mysterious peoples, their countries, which have now become uninhabitable, as well as the name given to man, both dead and alive, which have furnished an opportunity to the ignorant church fathers for inventing a hell, which they have transformed into a burning instead of a freezing locality. It is, of course, evident that it is neither the Hyperboreans, nor the Sumerians, the Aramaspes, nor even the Siths, known to and communicating with the Greeks, who were our Atlanteans but they were all the descendants of their last sub-races. The Pelagians were certainly one of the root races of future Greece, and were a remnant of a sub-race of Atlantis. Plato hints as much in speaking of the latter, whose name, it is averred, came from Pelagus, the Great Sea. Noah's deluge is astronomical and allegorical, but it is not mythical, for the story is based upon the same archaic tradition of men, or rather of nations, who were saved during the cataclysms, in canoes, arks, and ships. No one would presume to say that the Chaldean Zisuthras, the Hindu Vavasveda, the Chinese Perun, the beloved of the gods, who rescued him from the flood in a canoe, or the Swedish Belgamer, for whom the gods did the same in the north, are all identical as personages. But their legends have all sprung from the catastrophe which involved both the continent and the island of Atlantis. The allegory about the antediluvian giants and their achievements in sorcery is no myth. Biblical events are revealed indeed. But it is neither by the voice of God amid thunder and lightning on Mount Sinai, nor by a divine finger tracing the record on tablets of stone, but simply through tradition via pagan sources. It was not surely the Pentateuch that Diodorus was repeating when he wrote about the Titans, the giants born of heaven and earth or rather born of the sons of God who took to themselves for wives the daughters of men who were fair. Nor was fair Cedes, quoting from Genesis when giving details on those giants which are not to be found in the Jewish scriptures. He says that the Hyperboreans were of the race of the Titans, a race which descended from the earliest giants, and that it was the Hyperborean region which was the birthplace of the first giants. The commentaries of the sacred books explain that the said region was the far north, the polar lands now, the pre-Lumerian earliest continent, embracing once upon a time the present Greenland, Spitsbergen, Sweden, Norway, etc. But who were the Nephilim of Genesis, VI4? There were 
Paleolithic and Neolithic men in Palestine ages before the events recorded in the Book of the Beginnings. The theological tradition identifies these Nephilim with hairy men or satyrs, the latter being mythical in the fifth race, and the former historical in both the fourth and the fifth races. We have stated elsewhere what the prototypes of these satyrs were, and have spoken of the bestiality of the early and later Atlantean race. What is the meaning of Poseidon's amours under such a variety of animal forms? He became a dolphin to win Aphrodite, a horse to seduce Ceres, a ram to deceive Theophane, etc. Poseidon is not only the personification of the spirit and race of Atlantis, but also of the vices of these giants. Jesineus and others devote an enormous space to the meaning of the word Nephilim and explain very little. But esoteric records show these hairy creatures to be the last descendants of the Lemuro-Atlantean races, which begot children on female animals, of species now long extinct, thus producing dumb men, monsters as the stanzas have it. Now mythology built upon Hesiod's theogony, which is but a poeticized record of actual traditions, or oral history, speaks of three giants called Briareus, Cotus, and Gyges living in a dark country where they are imprisoned by Kronos for the rebellion against him. All the three are endowed by myth with a hundred arms and fifty heads, the latter standing for races, the former for sub-races and tribes. Bearing in mind that in mythology every personage almost is a god or demigod, and also a king or simple mortal in his second aspect, and that both stand as symbols for lands, islands, powers of nature, elements, nations, races, and sub-races, the esoteric commentary, will become comprehensible. It says that the three giants are three polar lands, which have changed form several times, at each new cataclysm, or disappearance of one continent to make room for another. The whole globe is convulsed periodically, and has been so convulsed since the appearance of the first race four times. Yet, though the whole face of the earth was transformed thereby each time, the conformation of the Arctic and Antarctic poles has but little altered. The polar lands unite and break off from each other into islands and peninsulas, yet remain ever the same. Therefore, northern Asia is called the eternal and perpetual land, and the Antarctic the ever-living and the concealed, while the Mediterranean, Atlantic, Pacific, and other regions disappear and reappear in turn, into and above the great waters. From the appearance of the great continent of Lemuria, the three polar giants have been imprisoned in their circle by Kronos. Their goal is surrounded by a wall of bronze, and the exit is through gates fabricated by Poseidon, or Neptune, hence by the seas, which they cannot cross. And it is in that damp region where eternal darkness reigns that the three brothers languish. The Iliad makes it Tartarus, when the gods and titans rebelled in their turn against Zeus, the deity of the fourth race. The father of the gods bethought himself of the imprisoned giants that they might help him to conquer the gods and titans, and to precipitate the latter into Hades, or in clearer words, to have Lemuria hurled amid thunder and lightning to the bottom of the seas, so as to make room for Atlantis, which was to be submerged and perish in its turn. The geological upheaval and deluge of Thelacy was a repetition on a small scale of the great cataclysm and remaining impressed on the memory of the Greeks, was merged by them into, and confused with, the general fate of Atlantis. So also the war between the Rakshasas of Lanka and the Baratians, the melee of the Atlanteans and Aryans in their supreme struggle, or the conflict between the Devas and the Izeds, or Paris, became ages later the struggle of Titans, separated into two inimical camps, and still later the war between the angels of God and the angels of Satan. Historical facts became theological dogmas. Ambitious scoliasts, men of small subrace born but yesterday, and one of the latest issues of the Aryan stock, took upon themselves to overturn the religious thought of the world, and succeeded. For nearly 2,000 years they impressed thinking humanity with the belief in the existence of Satan. But as it is now the conviction of more than one Greek scholar, as it was that of Bailey and Voltaire, that Hesiod's theogony is based upon historical facts. It becomes easier for the occult teachings to find their way into the minds of thoughtful men. 
And therefore are these passages from mythology brought forward into our discussion upon modern learning in this addendum. Such symbols are found in all the exoteric creeds are so many landmarks of prehistoric truths. The sunny, happy land, the primitive cradle of the earliest human races, has become several times since then Hyperborean and Saturnine, thus showing the golden age and reign of Saturn from multiform aspects. It was many-sided in its character indeed, climactically, ethnologically, and morally. For the third, Lemurian race, must be physiologically divided into the early androgynous and the later bisexual race, and the climate of its dwelling places and continents into that of an eternal spring and eternal winter, into life and death, purity and impurity. The cycle of legends is ever being transformed on its journey by popular fancy. Yet it may be cleansed from the dross it has picked up on its way through many nations and through the countless minds which have added their own exuberant additions to the original facts. Leaving for a while the Greek interpretations, we may seek for some more corroborations of the latter in the scientific and geological proofs. Section 7. Scientific and Geological Proofs of the Existence of Several Submerged Continents It may not be amiss, for the benefit of those who resolve the tradition of a lost Miocene Atlantis into an antiquated myth, to append a few scientific admissions on this point. Science, it is true, is largely indifferent to such questions. But there are scientists ready to admit that, in any case, a cautious agnosticism as to geological problems concerning the remote past is far more philosophical than a priori denial or even hasty generalizations on insufficient data. Meanwhile, two very interesting instances that have been lately met with may be pointing out as confirming certain passages. In the letter of a master published in Esoteric Buddhism, the eminence of the authorities will not be questioned. We italicize the corresponding passages. Extract from Esoteric Buddhism, page 70. Number 1. The Sinking of Atlantis, The group of continents and isles began during the Miocene period, and it culminated first in the final disappearance of the largest continent, an event coincident with the elevation of the Alps, and second with that of the last of the fair islands mentioned by Plato. And in comparison, an extract from a lecture by W. Pengali, FRS, FGS, number one, Was there, as some have believed, an Atlantis, a continent or archipelago of large islands occupying the area of the North Atlantic? There is, perhaps, nothing unphilosophical in the hypothesis, for since, as geologists state, the Alps have acquired 4,000 and even in some places more than 10,000 feet in their present altitude, since the commencement of the Eocene epoch. Lyle's Principles, page 256, second edition. A post-Miocene depression might have carried the hypothetical Atlantis into almost abysmal depths. And then, back to the extract from Esoteric Buddhism, page 64, 65, number 2, Lemuria should no more be confounded with the Atlantis continent than Europe with America. Both sank and were drowned with their high civilizations and gods. Yet between the two catastrophes, a period of about 700,000 years elapsed. Lemuria, flourishing and ending her career just about that lapse of time before the early part of the Eocene Age, since its race was the third. Behold the relics of that once great nation and some of the flat-headed aborigines of your Australia. And then in comparison, the extract from an article in the Popular Science Review, version 18, by Professor Seaman, PhD, FLS, VPAS, number 2, It would be premature to say, because no evidence has yet been adduced, that men may not have existed in the Eocene Age, especially as it can be shown that a race of men the lowest we know of coexists with that remnant of the Eocene flora, which still survives on the continent and islands of Australia. Extract from the Pedigree of Man, page 81. Heckel, who fully accepts the reality of a former Lemuria, also regards the Australians as direct descendants of the Lemurians. Persistent forms of both, his Lumerian stems, are in all probability still surviving, of the former in the Papuans and the Hottentots, of the latter in the Australians and in one division of the Malays. 
With regard to a former civilization, of which a portion of these degraded Australians are the last surviving offshoot, the opinion of Gerland is strongly suggestive. Commenting upon the religion and mythology of the tribes, he writes, The statement that Australian civilization indicates a higher grade is nowhere more clearly proved than here, in the province of religion, where everything resounds like the expiring voices of a previous and richer age. The idea that the Australians have no trace of religion or mythology is thoroughly false. But this religion is certainly quite deteriorated. As to Haeckel's view of the relationship between the Australians and the Malays, as two branches of a common stock, he is in error when he classes the Australians with the rest. The Malays and Papuans are a mixed stock, resulting from the intermarriages of the Low Atlantean subraces with the seventh subrace of the third root race. Like the Hottentots, they are of indirect Lemurio Atlantean descent. It is a most suggestive fact to those concrete thinkers who demand a physical proof of karma that the lower races of men are now rapidly dying out, a phenomenon largely due to an extraordinary sterility setting in among the women. From the time that they were first approached by the Europeans, a process of decimation is taking place all over the globe, among those races whose time is up among just those stocks, be it remarked, which esoteric philosophy regards as the senile representatives of the lost archaic nations. It is inaccurate to maintain that the extinction of a lower race is invariably due to cruelties or abuses perpetrated by colonists. Change of diet, drunkenness, etc. have done much. But those who rely on such data as offering an all-sufficient explanation of the crux cannot meet the phalanx of facts now so closely arrayed. Even the materialist Lefebvre says, Nothing can save those that have run their course. It would be necessary to extend their destined cycle. The peoples that have been relatively most spared, those who have defended themselves most valiantly, Hawaiians or Maoris, have been no less decimated than the tribes massacred or tainted by European intrusion. True, but it is not the phenomena here confirmed, an instance of the operation of cyclic law, Difficult to account for on materialist lines? Whence the destined cycle and the order here testified to? Why does this karmic sterility attack and root out certain races at their appointed hour? The answer that it is due to a mental disproportion between the colonizing and aboriginal races is obviously evasive, since it does not explain the sudden checks to fertility which so frequently supervene. The dying out of the Hawaiians, for instance, is one of the most mysterious problems of the day. Ethnology will sooner or later have to recognize, with occultists, that the true solution has to be sought for in a comprehension of the workings of karma. As Lefebvre remarks, the time is drawing near when there will remain nothing but three great human types. The time is before the sixth root race dawns. The three types are the white, Aryan, fifth root race, the yellow, and the African Negro with their crossing Atlanto-European divisions, Redskins, Eskimos, Papuans, Australians, Polynesians, etc. are all dying out. Those who realize that every root race runs through a gamut of seven subraces with seven branchlets, etc. will understand the why. The tide wave of incarnating egos has rolled past them to harvest experience in more developed and less senile stocks, and their extinction is hence a karmic necessity. Some extraordinary and unexplained statistics as to race extinction are given by de Quatrefages. No solution except on occult lines is able to account for these. But we have digressed from our direct subject. Let us hear now what Professor Huxley has to say on the subject of former Atlantic and Pacific continents. He writes in Nature, There is nothing, as far as I am aware, in the biological or geological evidence at present accessible to render untenable the hypothesis that an area of the mid-Atlantic or Pacific seabed as big as Europe should have been upheaved as high as Mount Blanc, and have subsided again at any time since the Paleozoic epoch, if there were any grounds for entertaining it. That is to say, that there is nothing to mitigate against positive evidence of the fact, nothing therefore against the geological postulates of the esoteric philosophy. Dr. Berthold Seaman assures us in the Popular Science Review that the facts which botanists have accumulated for reconstructing these lost maps of the globe are rather comprehensive. 
and they have not yet been backward in demonstrating the former existence of several large tracts of solid land in parts now occupied by great oceans. The many striking points of contact between the present floors of the United States and Eastern Asia induced them to assume that, during the present order of things, there existed a continent connection between southeastern Asia and Western America. The singular correspondence of the present floor of the United States and the South with that of the lignite floor of Europe induces them to believe that, in the Miocene period, Europe and America were connected by land passage, of which Iceland, Madeira, and other Atlantic islands are remnants. That, in fact, the story of an Atlantis which an Egyptian priest told to Solon, is not purely fictitious, but rests upon solid historical basis. Europe in the Eocene period received the plants which spread over mountains and plains, valleys and riverbanks, from Asia generally, neither exclusively from the south nor from the east. The west also furnished additions, and if at that period these were rather meager, they show, at all events, that the bridge was already building which, at a later period, was to facilitate communication between the two continents in such a remarkable manner. At that time, some plants of the western continent began to reach Europe by means of the island of Atlantis, then probably just, just, rising above the ocean. And in another number of the same review, Mr. W. Dupa Crotch, M.A., F.L.S., in an article entitled The Norwegian Lemming and Its Migrations, alludes to the same subject. Is it probable that the land could have existed where now the broad Atlantic rolls? All tradition says so. Old Egyptian records speak of Atlantis, as Strabo and others have told us. The Sahara itself is the sand of an ancient sea, and the shells which have been found upon its surface prove that, no longer ago than the Miocene period, a sea rolled over what is now desert. The voyage of the Challenger has proved the existence of three long rides in the Atlantic Ocean, one extending for more than 3,000 miles, and lateral spurs may, by connecting these ridges, account for the marvelous similarity of the fauna of the Atlantic islands. The submerged continent of Lemuria, in what is now the Indian Ocean, is considered to afford an explanation of many difficulties in the distribution of organic life, and I think the existence of a Miocene Atlantis will be found to have a strong elucidative bearing on subjects of greater interest. Truly so than the migration of the lemming. At all events, it can be shown that the land existed in former ages where the North Atlantic now rolls. Not only is a motive found for these apparently suicidal migrations, but also a strong collateral proof that what we call instincts are but the blind and sometimes even prejudicial inheritance of previously acquired experience. At certain periods we learn multitudes of these animals swim to the sea and perish. Coming as they do from all parts of Norway, the powerful instinct which survives throughout ages as an inheritance from the progenitors impels them to seek a continent, once existing but now submerged beneath the ocean, and to court a watery grave. In an article containing a criticism of Mr. A. R. Wallace's Island Life, a work devoted largely to the question of the distribution of animals, etc., Mr. Starkey Gardner writes, by a process of reasoning supported by a large array of facts of different kinds, he arrives at the conclusion that the distribution of life upon the land as we now see it has been accomplished without the aid of important changes in the relative positions of continents and seas. Yet, if we accept his views, we must believe that Asia and Africa, Madagascar and Africa, New Zealand and Australia, Europe and America, have been united at some period not remote geologically and that seas to the depth of a thousand fathoms have been bridged over. But we must treat as utterly gratuitous and entirely opposed to all the evidences at our command. The supposition that temperate Europe and temperate America, Australia and South America, have ever been connected, except by way of the Arctic or Antarctic circles, and that lands now separated by seas of more than a thousand fathoms of depth have ever been united. Mr. Wallace, it must be admitted, had succeeded in explaining the chief features of existing life distribution, without bridging the Atlantic or Pacific, except towards the poles. Yet I cannot help but thinking some of the facts that might perhaps be more easily explained by admitting the former existence of the connection between the coast of Chile and Polynesia, and Great Britain and Florida, shadowed by the submarine banks which stretch between them. 
Nothing is urged that renders the more direct connections impossible, and no physical reason is advanced why the floor of the ocean should not be upheaved from any depth. The route by which, according to the anti-Atlantean and Lemurian hypothesis of Wallace, the floors of South America and Australia are supposed to have mingled, is beset by almost insurmountable obstacles, and the apparently sudden arrival of a number of subtropical American plants in the Eocenes necessitates a connection more to the south than the present 1,000-fathom line. Forces are unceasingly acting, and there is no reason why an elevated force once set in action in the center of an ocean should cease to act until a continent is formed. They have acted and lifted out of the sea, in comparatively recent geological time, the loftiest mountains on earth. Mr. Wallace himself admits repeatedly that seabeds have been elevated a thousand fathoms, and islands have risen up from the depths of three thousand fathoms. And to suppose that the upheaving forces are limited in power, it seems to me, to again quote from island life, utterly gratuitous and entirely opposed to all the evidences at our command. The father of English geology, Sir Charles Lyell, was a uniformitarian in his views of continental formation. We find him saying that, Professors Unger and here have advocated on botanical grounds the former existence of an Atlantic continent during some part of the tertiary period, as affording the only plausible explanation that can be imagined of the analogy between the Miocene flora of Central Europe and the existing flora of Eastern America. Professor Oliver, on the other hand, after showing how many of the American types found fossil in Europe are common to Japan, inclines to the theory first advanced by Dr. Asa Gray, that the migration of species to which the community of types in the eastern states of North America and the Miocene flora of Europe is due, took place when there was an overland communication between America to eastern Asia between the 50th and 60th parallels of latitude, or south of Bering's Straits, following the direction of the Aleutian Islands. By this course they may have made their way at any epoch, Miocene, Pliocene, or post-Pliocene, antecedently to the glacial epoch, to Amurland, on the east coast of northern Asia. The unnecessary difficulties and complications here incurred in order to avoid the hypothesis of an Atlantic continent are really too apparent to escape notice. If the botanical evidences stood alone, skepticism would be partially reasonable. But in this case, all branches of science converge to one point. Science has made blunders and has exposed itself to greater errors than it would be exposed to by the admission of our two now invisible continents. It has denied even the undeniable from the days of the mathematician Laplace down to our own, and that only a few years ago. We have Professor Huxley's authority for saying that there is no a priori improbability whatever against possible evidence supporting a belief. But now that the positive evidence is brought forward, will that eminent scientist admit the corollary? Touching on the problem in another place, Sir Charles Lyell tells us, Respecting the cosmogony of the Egyptian priests, we gather much information from writers of the Grecian sects, who borrowed almost all their tenets from Egypt, and amongst others, that of our former successive destruction and renovation of the world, continental, not cosmic, catastrophes, we learn from Plutarch that this was the theme of the one of the hymns of Orpheus, so celebrated in the fabulous ages of Greece. It was brought by him from the banks of the Nile, and we even find in his verses, as in the Indian systems, a definite period assigned for the duration of every successive world. The returns of great catastrophes were determined by the period of the Annus Magnus, or Great Year, a cycle composed of the revolution of the sun, moon, and planets, and terminating when these returned together to the same sign whence they were supposed to, at some remote epoch, have been set out. We learn particularly from the Timaeus of Plato that the Egyptians believed the world to be subject to occasional conflagrations and deluges. The sect of Stoics adopted most fully the system of catastrophes destined at certain intervals to destroy the world. These, they taught, were of two kinds. The cataclysm, or destruction by deluge, which sweeps away the whole human race and annihilates all the animal and vegetable products of nature. And the ekpyrosis, or conflagration, which destroys the globe itself, submarine volcanoes. From the Egyptians they derived the doctrine of the gradual debasement of man from a state of innocence, 
nascent simplicity of the first sub-races of each root race. Towards the termination of each era, the gods could no longer bear with the wickedness of men. Degeneracy into magical practices and gross animality of the Atlanteans, and a shock of the elements, or a deluge, overwhelmed them, after which calamity Astria again descended on the earth to renew the golden age, dawn of a new root race. Astria, the goddess of justice, is the last of the deities to forsake the earth, when the gods are said to abandon it and to be taken up again into heaven by Jupiter. But no sooner does Zeus carry from earth Ganymedes, the object of lust, personified, than the father of the gods throw down Astria on the earth again, on which she falls upon her head. Astria is Virgo, the constellation of the zodiac. Astronomically, it is very plain significance, and one which gives the key to the occult meaning. But it is inseparable from Leo, the sign that precedes it, and from the Pleiades and their sisters, the Hades, of which Aldebaran is the brilliant leader. All these are connected with the periodical renovations of the Earth, with regard to its continents, even Ganymedes, who in astronomy is Aquarius. It has already been shown that while the South Pole is the pit, or the infernal regions figuratively and cosmologically, the North Pole is geographically the first continent, while astronomically and metaphorically the celestial pole, with its pole star in heaven, is Meru, or the seat of Brahma, the throne of Jupiter, etc. For in the age when the gods forsook the earth and were said to ascend into heaven, the ecliptic had become parallel with the meridian, and part of the zodiac appeared to descend from the north pole to the north horizon. Aldebaran was in conjunction with the sun then, as it was 40,000 years ago, at the great festival in commemoration of that Anus Magnus, of which Plutarch spoke. Since that year, 40,000 years ago, there had been a retrograde motion of the equator, and about 31,000 years ago, Aldebaran was in conjunction with the vernal equinoctial point. The part assigned to Taurus, even in Christian mysticism, is too well known to need repetition. The famous Orphic hymn on the great periodical cataclysm divulges the whole esotericism of the event. Pluto in the pit carries off Eurydice, bitten by the polar serpent. Then Leo, the lion, is vanquished. Now when the lion is in the pit, or below the south pole, then Virgo, as the next sign, follows him. And when her head, down to the waist, is below the southern horizon, she is inverted. On the other hand, the Hades are the rain or deluge constellations. And Aldebaran, he who follows or succeeds the daughters of Atlas, or the Pleiades, looks down from the eye of Taurus. It is from this point of the ecliptic that the calculations of the new cycle were commenced. The student has to remember also that when Ganymedes, Aquarius, is raised to heaven, or above the horizon of the North Pole, Virgo, or Astria, who is Venus, Lucifer, descends head downwards, below the horizon of the South Pole, or the Pit, which Pit, or the Pole, is also the Great Dragon, or the Flood. Let the student exercise his intuition by placing these facts together. No more can be said. Lyle remarks, the connection between the doctrine of successive catastrophes and repeated deteriorations is the moral character of the human race, is more intimate and natural than might at first be imagined. For in a rude state of society, all great calamities are regarded by the people as judgments of God on the wickedness of man. In like manner in the account given to Solon by the Egyptian priests of the submersion of the island of Atlantis under the waters of the ocean, after repeated shocks of an earthquake, we find that the event happened when Jupiter had seen the moral depravity of the inhabitants. True. But was it not owing to the fact that all esoteric truths were given out to the public by the initiates of the temples under the guise of allegories? Jupiter is merely the personification of that immutable cyclic law, which arrests the downward tendency of each root race after attaining the zenith of its glory. We must admit allegorical teaching, unless we told, with Professor John Fiske's singularly dogmatic opinion that a myth is an explanation by the uncivilized mind of some natural phenomena, not an allegory, not an esoteric symbol, for the ingenuity is wasted, which strives to detect in myth the remnants of a refined primeval science, but an explanation. Primitive man had no profound science to perpetuate by means of allegory. 
How does Mr. Fisk know? Nor were they such sorry pedants as to talk in riddles when plain language would serve their purpose. We venture to say that the language of the initiated few was far more plain and their science philosophy far more comprehensive and satisfying alike to the physical and spiritual wants of man than even the terminology and system elaborated by Mr. Fisk's master, Herbert Spencer. What, however, is Sir Charles Lyell's explanation of the myth? Certainly, be in no way countenances the idea of its astronomical origin as asserted by some writers. The two interpreters are entirely at variance with one another. Lyle's solution is as follows. A disbeliever in cataclysmal changes from the absence of any reliable historical data on the point, as well as from a strong bias to the uniformitarian conceptions of geological changes. He attempts to trace the Atlantis tradition to the following sources. 1. Barbarous tribes connect catastrophes with an avenging god, who is assumed in this way to punish immoral races. 2. Hence the commencement of a new race is logically a virtuous one. 3. The primary source of the geologic basis of the tradition was Asia, a continent subject to violent earthquakes. Exaggerated accounts would thus be handed down the ages. 4. Egypt, being herself free from earthquakes, nevertheless based her not inconsiderable geologic knowledge on these cataclysmal traditions. An ingenious explanation as all such are. But proving a negative is proverbially a difficult task. Students of esoteric science, who know what the resources of the Egyptian priesthood really were, need no such labored hypothesis. Moreover, while an imaginative theorist is always able to furnish a reasonable solution of problems which, in one branch of science, seems to necessitate the hypothesis of periodical cataclysmic changes on the surface of our planet. The impartial critic, who is not a specialist, will recognize the immense difficulty of explaining away the cumulative evidences, namely the archaeological, ethnological, geological, traditional, botanical, and even biological, in favor of former continents now submerged. When each science is fighting for its own hand, the cumulative force of the evidence is almost invariably lost sight of. In The Theosophist we wrote... We have as evidence the most ancient traditions of various and wide separated peoples, legends in India, in ancient Greece, Madagascar, Sumatra, Java, and all the principal isles of Polynesia, as well as the legends of both Americas. Among savages, and in the traditions of the richest literature in the world, the Sanskrit literature of India, there is an agreement in saying that ages ago there existed in the Pacific Ocean a large continent which by geological upheaval was engulfed by the sea, Lemuria. And it is our firm belief that most, if not all, of the islands from the Malayan archipelago to Polynesia are fragments of that once immense submerged continent. Both Malacca and Polynesia, which lie at the two extremities of the ocean, and which, since the memory of man never had nor could have any intercourse with or even a knowledge of each other, have yet a tradition common to all the islands and islets that their respective countries extended far, far into the sea. That there were in the world but two immense continents, one inhabited by yellow, the other by dark men, and that the ocean, by command of the gods, and to punish them for their incessant quarreling, swallowed them up. Notwithstanding the geographical fact that New Zealand and Sandwich and Easter Islands are at a distance from each other of between 800 and 1,000 leagues, and that, according to every testimony, neither these nor any other intermediate islands, for instance, the Marquesian Society, Fiji, Tahitian, Samoan, and other islands, could, since they became islands, ignorant as their people were of the compass, have communicated with each other before the arrival of Europeans. Yet they one and all maintain that their respective countries extended far toward the west on the Asian side. Moreover, with very small differences, they all speak dialects evidently of the same language, and understand each other with little difficulty, have the same religious beliefs and superstitions, and pretty much the same customs. And as a few of the Polynesian islands were discovered earlier than a century ago, and the Pacific Ocean itself was unknown to Europe until the days of Columbus, and these islanders have never ceased repeating the same old traditions since the Europeans first set foot on their shores. 
It seems to us as logical inference that our theory is nearer to the truth than any other. Chance would have it to change its name and meaning. Were all this due but to chance alone? Professor Schmidt, writing in defense of the hypothesis of a former Lemuria, declares, A great series of animal geographical facts is explicable only on the hypothesis of the former existence of a southern continent, of which the Australian mainland is a remnant. The distribution of species points to a vanished land of the south, where perhaps the home of the progenitors of the Maki and Madagascar may also be looked for. Mr. A. R. Wallace, in his Malay Archipelago, arrives at the following conclusion after a review of the mass of evidence at hand. The inference that we must draw from these facts is undoubtedly that the whole of the islands eastward beyond Java and Borneo do essentially form a part of a former Australian or Pacific continent, although some of them may never have been actually joined to it. The continent must have been broken up not only before the western islands were separated from Asia, but probably before the extreme southeastern portion of Asia was raised above the waters of the ocean. For a great part of the land of Borneo and Java is known to be geologically of quite recent formation. According to Haeckel, probably southern Asia itself was not the earliest cradle of the human race. But Lemuria, a continent that lay to the south of Asia and sank later beneath the surface of the Indian Ocean. In one sense, Haeckel is right as to Lemuria, that the cradle of the human race the continent was the home of the first physical human stock, the later third race men. Previous to that epoch, the races were far less consolidated and physiologically quite different. Haeckel makes Lemuria extend from Sunda Island to Africa and Madagascar and eastwards to Upper India. Professor Rudemeyer, the eminent paleontologist, asks, Need the conjecture that almost exclusively graminivorous and insectivorous marsupials, sloths, armadillos, anteaters, and ostriches once possessed an actual point of union in a southern continent of which the present flora of Terra do Fuego and Australia must be the remains? Need this conjecture raise difficulties at a moment when, from their fossil remains, here restores to our sight the ancient force of Smith's Sound and Spitsbergen? Having now dealt generally with the broad scientific attitude on the two questions, it will perhaps conduce to an agreeable brevity. If we sum up the more striking isolated facts in favor of that fundamental contention of esoteric ethnologists, the reality of Atlantis, Lemuria is so widely accepted that further pursuit of the subject is unnecessary. With regard, however, to the former, it is found that 1. The Miocene florae of Europe have their most numerous and striking analogues in the florae of the United States. In the forests of Virginia and Florida are found the magnolias, tulip trees, evergreen oaks, plane trees, etc., which correspond with European tertiary flora, term for term. How is the migration affected? If we exclude the theory of the Atlantic continent bridging the ocean between America and Europe, the proposed explanation to the effect that the transition was by way of Asia and the Aleutian Islands is a mere uncalled-for theory, obviously upset by the fact that a large number of these florae only appear east of the Rocky Mountains. This also negatives the idea of a trans-Pacific migration. They are now superseded by European continents and islands to the north. Number two, skulls exhumed on the banks of the Danube and Rhine bear a strikingly similar to those of the Caribs of the old Peruvians. Litter. Monuments have been exhumed in Central America, which bear representations of undoubted Negro heads and faces. How are such facts to be accounted for except on the Atlantean hypothesis? What is now Northwest Africa was once connected with Atlantis by a network of islands, few of which now remain. 3. According to Farrar, the isolated language of the Basques has no affinities with the other languages of Europe, but with the Aborigines language of the vast opposite continent, America, and those alone. Professor Broca is also of the same opinion. Paleolithic European man of the Miocene and Pliocene times was a pure Atlantean. As we have previously stated, the Basques are, of course, of a much later date than this, but their affinities, as shown here, 
go far to prove the original extraction of the remote ancestors. The mysterious affinity between their tongue and that of the Dravidian races of India will be understood by those who have followed our outline of continental formations and shiftings. Four, stones have been found in the Canary Islands bearing sculptured symbols similar to those found on the shore of Lake Superior. Bethuat was induced by such evidence to postulate the unity of race of the early men of the Canary Islands in America. The gaunches of the Canary Islands were lineal descendants of the Atlanteans. This fact will account for the great stature evidenced by their old skeletons, as well as by those of their European congeners, the Cro-Magnon Paleolithic men. 5. Any experienced mariner has but to navigate the fathomless ocean along the Canary Islands to ask himself the question when or how that group of volcanic and rocky little islands has been formed, surrounded on every side by that vast watery space. Frequent questions of this kind led finally to the expedition of the famous Leopold von Buch, which took place in the first quarter of the present century. Some geologists maintained that the volcanic island had been raised right from the bottom of the ocean, the depth of which in the immediate vicinity of the island varies from 6,000 to 18,000 feet. Others were inclined to see in these groups, including Madeira, the Azores, and the islands of Cape de Verde, the remnants of a gigantic but submerged continent which had once united Africa and America. The latter men of science supported their hypothesis by a mass of evidence in its favor, drawn from ancient myths. Hoary superstitions, such as the fairy-like Atlantis of Plato, the Garden of the Hesperides, Atlas supporting the world on his shoulders, all of them mythoi connected with the peak of Tenerife, did not go far with skeptical science. The identity of animal and vegetable species, showing either a previous connection between America and the remaining groups of the islands, the hypothesis of their having been drifted from the New World to the Old World, by waves was too absurd to stand long, found more serious consideration. But it is only quite lately after the Donnelly's books have been published several years that the theory has had a greater chance of ever becoming an accepted fact. Fossils found on the eastern coast of South America have now been proved to belong to the Jurassic formations, and are nearly identical with the Jurassic fossils of Western Europe and of Northern Africa. The geological structure of both coasts is also almost identical. The resemblance between the smaller marine animals dwelling in the more shallow waters of the South American, the Western African, and the South European coasts is also very great. All such facts are bound to bring naturalists to the conclusion that there has been, in distant prehistoric ages, a continent which extends from the coast of Venezuela across the Atlantic Ocean, to the Canaries Islands and North Africa, and from Newfoundland nearly to the coast of France. 6. The great resemblance between the Jurassic fossils of South America, North America, and Western Europe is a striking enough fact in itself, and admits of no explanation unless the ocean is bridged with an Atlantis. But why also is there so marked a similarity between the fauna of the now-isolated Atlantic islands? Why did the specimens of Brazilian fauna dredged up by Sir C. Wyville Thompson resemble those of Western Europe? Why does a resemblance exist between the many of the West African and West Indian animal groups? Again, when the animals and plants of the Old and New World are compared, one cannot be struck with their identity. All or nearly all belong to the same generation. While many, even of the species, are common to both continents, indicating that they radiated from a common center, Atlantis. The horse, according to science, originated in America. At least a large proportion of the once missing links connected with it, inferior forms have been exhumed from American strata. How did the horse penetrate into Europe and Asia? if no land communication bridged the oceanic interspaces. Or if it is asserted that the horse originated in the old world, how did such forms as the Hyperion, etc., get into America in the first instance on the migration hypothesis? Again, Buffon had remarked the repetition of the African and the American fauna. How, for example, the llama is the juvenescence and feeble copy of the camel, and how the puma of the new represents the line of the old world. 7. The following quotation runs with number 2, but its significance is such, and the writer cited is so authoritative, 
that it deserves a place to itself. With regard to the primitive thalicocephalae of America, I entertain a hypothesis still more bold, namely that they are nearly related to the gaunches of the Canary Islands and to the Atlantic populations of Africa, the Moors, Torix, Copts, which Latham comprises under the name of Egyptian Atlantidae. We find one and the same form of skull in the Canary Islands, in front of the African coast, and in the Carib Islands, on the opposite coast which faces Africa. The color of the skin on both sides of the Atlantic is represented in these populations as being of a reddish brown. If then Basques and Cro-Magnon caveman are of the same race as the Canarese gaunches, it follows that the former are also allied to the Aborigines of America. This is the conclusion necessitated by the independent investigations of Ritzius, Virchow, and de Quatrefages. The Atlantean affinities of these three types become patent. 8. The sea soundings undertaken by HMS Challenger and the Dolphin have established the fact that a huge elevation some 3,000 miles in length projected upwards from the abysmal depths of the Atlantic extends from a point near the British Islands southwards, curving round near Cape de Verde, and running in a southeasterly direction along the West African coast. This elevation averages some 9,000 feet in height and rises above the waves of the Azores, Ascension, and other places. In the ocean depths around the neighborhood of the former ribs of a once massive piece of land have been discovered. The inequalities, the mountains and valleys of its surface could never have been produced in accordance with any known laws for the deposition of sediment, nor by submarine elevation, but on the contrary must have been carved by agencies acting in above the water level. It is the most probable that necks of land formerly existed knitting Atlantis to South America, somewhere above the mouth of the Amazon, to Africa near Cape de Verde, while a similar point of juncture with Spain is not unlikely, as contended for by Donnelly. Whether the latter existed or not is of no consequence, in view of the fact that what is now northwest Africa was, before the elevation of the Sahara and the rupture of the Gibraltar connection, an extension of Spain. Consequently, no difficulty can be raised as to how the migration of the European fauna, etc., took place. Enough has now been said from the purely scientific standpoint, and it is needless, in view of the manner in which the subject has already been developed on the lines of esoteric knowledge, to swell the mass of testimony further. In conclusion, the words of one of the most intuitive writers of the day may be cited as admirably illustrative of the opinions of the occultist, who awaits in patience the dawn of the coming day. We are but beginning to understand the past. One hundred years ago, the world knew nothing of Pompeii or Herculaneum, nothing of the lingual tie that binds together the Indo-European nations, nothing of the significance of the vast volume of inscriptions upon the tombs and temples of Egypt, nothing of the meaning of the arrow-headed inscriptions of Babylon, nothing of the marvelous civilizations revealed in the remains of the Yucatan, Mexico, and Peru. We are on the threshold. Scientific investigation is advancing with giant strides. Who shall say that 100 years from now, the great museums of the world may not be adorned with gems, statues, arms, and implements from Atlantis, while the libraries of the world shall contain translations of its inscriptions, throwing new light upon all the past history of the human race, and all the great problems which now perplex the thinkers of today? And now, to conclude. We have concerned ourselves with the ancient records of the nations, with the doctrine of chronological and psychic cycles, of which these records are the tangible proof, and with many other subjects, which may, at first sight, seem out of place in this volume. But they are necessary in truth, in dealing with the secret annals and traditions of so many nations, whose very origins have never been ascertained on more secure grounds than inferential suppositions, in giving out the beliefs and philosophy of more than prehistoric races. It is not quite as easy to deal with the subject matter as it would be only if philosophy and evolution of one special race were concerned. The secret doctrine was the common property of the countless millions of men born under various climates, in times with which history refuses to deal, and to which esoteric teachings assign dates incompatible with the theories of geology and anthropology. The birth and evolution of the sacred science of the past are lost in the very night of time, and that even which is historic i.e. that which is found scattered hither and thither throughout ancient classical literature, 
is in almost every case attributed by modern criticism to lack of observation in the ancient writers, or to superstition born out of the ignorance of antiquity. It is therefore impossible to treat this subject as one would the ordinary evolution of an art or science in some well-known historical nation. It is only by bringing before the reader an abundance of proofs, all tending to show that in every age, under every condition of civilization and knowledge, the educated classes of every nation made themselves the more or less faithful echoes of one identical system and its fundamental traditions, that he can be made to see that so many streams of the same water must have had a common source from which they started. What was this source? If coming events are said to cast their shadows before, past events cannot fail to leave their impress behind them. It is then by those shadows of the hoary past and their fantastic silhouettes on the external screen of every religion and philosophy, that we can, by checking them as we go along and comparing them, trace out finally the body that produced them. There must be truth and fact in that which every people of antiquity accepted and made the foundation of its religions and its faith. Moreover, as Halliburton said, hear one side and you will be in the dark, hear both sides and all will be clear. The public has hitherto had access to, and has heard but one side, or rather the one-sided views of two diametrically opposed classes of men, whose prima facie propositions of respective premises differ widely, but whose final conclusions are the same, the men of science and theology. And now our readers have an opportunity of hearing the other, and so of learning the defendant's justification and the nature of our arguments. If the public is to be left to its old opinions, namely on one side that occultism, magic, the legends of old, etc., are all the outcome of ignorance and superstition, and on the other, that everything outside the orthodox groove is the work of the devil, what will be the result? In other words, had no theosophical and mystic literature obtained a hearing for the last few years, the present work would have had but a poor chance of impartial consideration. It would have been proclaimed, and by many will still be proclaimed, a fairy tale woven out of abstruse problems, poised in and based on thin air, built of soap bubbles bursting at the slightest touch of serious reflection, with no foundation to stand upon. Even the ancient superstitious and credulous. Classical writers have no word of reference to it in clear and unmistakable terms, and the symbols themselves fail to yield a hint of the existence of such a system. Such would be the verdict of all. But when it comes undeniably proven that the claim of the modern Asiatic nations to a secret science and an esoteric history of the world is based on fact, that though hitherto unknown to the masses, and a veiled mystery even to the learned, because they have never had the key to a right understanding of the abundant hints thrown out by the ancient classics, it is still no fairy tale, but an actuality, then the present work will become but the pioneer of many more such books. The statement that hitherto even the keys discovered by some great scholars have proved too rusty for use, and that they are but the silent witnesses, that there do exist mysteries behind the veil which are unreachable without a new key, is borne out by too many proofs to be easily dismissed. An instance may be given as an illustration out of the history of Freemasonry. In his Macaroni Occult, Ragon, an illustrious and learned Belgian mason, rightly or wrongly reproaches the English Masons with having materialized in dishonored Masonry, once based upon the ancient mysteries by adopting, owing to a mistaken notion of the origin of the craft, the name of Freemasonry and Freemasons. The mistake is due, he says, to those who connect Masonry with the building of Solomon's Temple. He derides the idea and says, the Frenchman knew well, when he adopted the title of Freemason, that it was no question of building the smallest wall, but that initiated into the mysteries veiled under the name of Freemasonry, which could only be the continuation or the renovation of the ancient mysteries. He has to become a Mason after the manner of Apollo or Amphion. And do not we know that the ancient initiated poets, when speaking of the foundation of a city, meant thereby the establishment of a doctrine? Thus Neptune, god of reasoning, and Apollo, god of hidden things, presented themselves as Masons before Lemadon, Priam's father, to help him to build the city of Troy, that is to say, to establish the Trojan religion. Such veiled sentences with double meaning abound in ancient classical writers. Therefore, if an attempt had been made to show that, for instance, Lamadon was the founder of a branch of archaic mysteries, 
in which the earthbound material soul, the fourth principle, was personified in Menelaus' faithless wife, the fair Helen, and if Ragon had not come to corroborate what we asserted, we might have been told that no classical author speaks of it, and that Homer shows Lamadon building a city, not founding an esoteric worship or mysteries. Who are those left now, save a few initiates, who understand the language and correct meaning of such symbolical terms? But though we have pointed to many a misconceived symbol bearing on our thesis, there still remains more than one difficulty to be overcome. Most important among several such obstacles is that of chronology. But this could hardly be helped, wedged in between theological chronology and that of the geologists, backed by all the materialistic anthropologists who assign dates to man and nature which fit within their own theories alone. What could the writer do except what she has done? Since theology places the deluge 2448 BC and the world's creation only 5,890 years ago, and since the accurate researchers by the methods of exact science have led the geologists and physicists to assign to the encrusted age of our globe between 10 million and 1,000 million of years, a trifling distance, verily, and since the anthropologists, to vary their divergence of opinion as to the appearance of man, ask for between 25,000 and 500,000 years. What can one who studies the occult doctrine do but bravely present the esoteric calculations before the world? But to do this, corroboration by even a few historical proofs has been necessary, though all know the real value of the so-called historical evidence. For whether man appeared on earth 18,000 or 18 million years ago can make no difference to profane history, since it only begins about a couple of thousand years before our era, and since, even then, it grapples hopelessly with the clash and din of contradictory and mutually destroying opinions around it. Nevertheless, unless the esoteric teachings were corroborated and supported on the spot, whenever possible, by references to historical names of a so-called historical period, this is the only guide that can be given to the beginner, before he is permitted to start among the to him, unfamiliar windings of that dark labyrinth called the prehistoric ages. This necessity has been complied with. It is only hoped that the desire to do so, which has led the writer to be constantly bringing ancient and modern evidence as a corroboration of the archaic and quite unhistoric past, will not bring on her the accusation of having sorely jumbled up, without order or method, the various and widely separated periods of history and tradition. But literary form and method had to be sacrificed to the greater clearness of the general exposition. To accomplish the proposed task, the writer has had to resort to the rather unusual means of dividing each volume into three parts, the first of which is only the consecutive, though very fragmentary, history of cosmogony and the evolution of man on this globe, in treating of cosmogony and then of the anthropogenesis of mankind. It was necessary to show that no religion, from the very earliest, has ever been based entirely on fiction, that none was the object of special revelation, and that its dogma alone, which has never been killing primeval truth. Finally, that no human-born doctrine, no creed, however sanctified by custom and antiquity, can compare in sacredness with the religion of nature, the key of wisdom that unlocks the massive gates leading to the arcana of the innermost sanctuaries can be found hidden in her bosom only. And that bosom is in the countries pointed to by the great seer of the past century, Emanuel Swedenborg. There lies the heart of nature, that shrine whence issued the early races of primeval humanity, and which is the cradle of physical man. Thus far have proceeded the rough outlines of the beliefs and tenets of the archaic, earliest races, contained in their hitherto secret scriptural records. But our explanations are by no means complete, nor do they pretend to give out the full text, or to have been read by the help of more than three or four keys out of the sevenfold bunch of esoteric interpretation. And even this has only been partially accomplished. The work is too gigantic for any one person to undertake, far more to accomplish. Our main concern has been simply to prepare the soil. This we trust we have done. These two volumes only constitute the work of a pioneer who has forced his way into the well-nigh impenetrable jungle of the virgin forest of the land of the occult. A commencement has been made in felling and uprooting the deadly upas trees of superstition, prejudice, and conceited ignorance, so that these two volumes should form for the student a fitting prelude for other works. 
until the rubbish of the ages is cleared away from the minds of the theosophists, to whom these pages are dedicated, it is impossible that the more practical teaching contained in the third volume should be understood. Consequently, it entirely depends upon the reception with which volumes one and two shall meet at the hands of theosophists and mystics, whether the last volume will ever be published. Satyat, nasty, paro, dharma. There is no religion higher than truth. End of Volume 2 Thanks for listening to The Secret Doctrine, Volume 2 by Helena Blavatsky Read by Graham Dunlop This has been a production by Adult Brain Audiobook Publishing. Please visit adultbrain.ca for more titles like this.